Hello everyone, in today's video I will be narrating stories that I found off of reddit. If you enjoyed this video make sure you subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But without further ado, let's get straight into these stories. It was the middle of the summer and my parents had left for the weekend to go to our house in the Cape Cod. It's about a two hour drive away so it's no big deal for them to leave me alone for a few days. My mom had some pulled pork and pasta for me to heat up to eat whenever I had some money if I wanted to order a pizza. Things were all good. The first night I was alone, I stayed up till 3 in the morning playing Xbox, so I woke up really late the next day. I checked my phone when I woke up and saw it was a little past 1. I had made plans to play some street hockey with my friends at 3, so I threw myself out of bed and stumbled into the shower. I take really long showers, so when my parents are gone I go mental. I was in there for about 45 minutes on my phone scrolling through Reddit and Twitter and whatnot, when I heard my front door open. The bathroom is directly up the stairs from the back door, and the thing is pretty loud when it opens and closes. I immediately froze, since obviously I was supposed to be alone. I waited for about two minutes, ears trained and trying to hear anything else. Nothing. I figured it was just the wind or maybe my parents were home early, so I turned off the shower, wrapped my towel around myself, and slowly walked down the stairs to check it out. Even though my house is old and each step on the stairs makes a super loud creak, I still took my time and tried to be as quiet as possible. I probably took 45 seconds walking down all 12 of the stairs. So when I get to the second to last stair, right before I could see around the corner to the kitchen, I take a little breath to compose myself. In my mind, I knew I was being stupid. There obviously wasn't anything in the kitchen. There's no way I wouldn't have heard another noise and there's no reason for them to still be in the kitchen even if they were burglars or something in the house. After sort of mentally chastising myself for being such a wuss, I sort of chuckled to myself for being so stupid and just normally walked the last two stairs and turned the corner to the kitchen. Standing about two feet away from me in the middle of my kitchen is a man staring straight at me, perfectly still, with a massive smile across his face, just staring at me. The thing I remember most vividly wasn't his face or his smile but his arms. They weren't just at his side, he held them in the strangest most abnormal position I've ever seen. They were where one would normally hold their arms, but he had rotated them to the point where they were almost completely reversed as well as lifting them up and a little behind himself. Honestly, I think I almost had a heart attack right there. Looking back, I can realize how creepy the situation was, but in the moment, I just took a step towards him and punched him as hard as I could in the jaw, sort of half slapping slash pushing him towards the ground. The second I connected, I beelined up the stairs, dropping my towel in the kitchen with my heart beating out of control. I sprinted into my room and locked the door behind me. I quickly put a chair up against the doorknob like you see in TV. Almost without thinking, I immediately called 911 and nearly in tears told the operator what happened. As I sat on the floor of my room, in practically the fetal position, staring at the door praying that a cop would be here soon, I noticed the light coming from the gap between my door had stopped. The guy was standing outside of my door. There's no words to describe the feeling I had. I was paralyzed with fear, watching the shadow across the bottom of the door shift in tiny ways. I stayed balled up, staring at the gap, praying the man would go away for what seemed like an hour. All the while, the 911 operator was asking, Hello, sir? Sir, are you there? Hello? I didn't want to make a noise, and even if I wanted to move my arms to bring the phone to my mouth, I don't think I could have. Eventually, the light returned to the gap, and I heard the faintest of footsteps, slowly creaking the wooden floorboards as he walked down the hall. It was silent for minutes as I just sat there curled up, unable to even speak. I heard banging on the front door and the sound of two officers entering my house. I finally felt safe, and I opened the door to the two of the men standing there as I almost cried. Nowadays, my parents don't even leave me alone home anymore, and I check every lock on the house before going to bed. Even working with sketch artists in a few lineups, the police never found whoever was in my house. I have no idea what he wanted or who he was, but regardless, let's not meet again, ever. I'm 29 now. The story happened 10 years ago at the time I was jobless and I found a job as a security guard in an office building. The office building was in a forested area, away from any busy streets like secluded. The person who had the job before me had a car accident and apparently was paralyzed from the waist down. Nobody was interested in the job since you worked during the night and the office building was so big, it was just really boring. But hey, a job is a job. Once I started, a supervisor worked me in for a week, what to do, etc. This was my first night working by myself. I came to work and took the shift over from my colleague at 9pm and he told me there will still be some people left in the building. Before I went up to the 15th floor, I closed the main entrance in such a way you could only exit when you're inside, so no outsiders could come in. After I did this, I went up to the 15th floor where these people still worked, to ask them if they needed to go anywhere else in the building, and if not, I could make my round and close off all the other floors, which I did. So I made my rounds and found nothing peculiar. I went back to my front desk, this was around 11.30pm, and the last people who were working on the 15th floor were just leaving. 
and the guy told me he was the last one to leave and wished me good night. Once the last person left, I went up to the 15th floor, checked all the offices and locked it down. I went down to my front desk again since there were no people left. I put on the alarms which work on motion detection and also when you open a fire exit on every floor except the ground floor where my desk was. Within 5 minutes I put the alarm on, on all floors. The alarm went off on the 10th floor and there was nobody on the building. The rule is if an alarm goes off, you first call the security company before you take action. I told them I would investigate the alarm and I would call them back once I checked it out. Otherwise, if I don't call back, they would send a police car to check it out, just as a precaution. I checked the whole 10th floor and I found nothing. Went back to call the security company telling them it was a false alarm. I kid you not, the alarm on the 10th floor went off like 7 times in an hour. And every time I checked the floor, I couldn't find anything out of order or even that there was someone there. Since this was my first day working alone and the alarm went off so many times, the security company thought I was screwing things up and wanted to file a complaint to my boss, which would mean I would lose my job I just had for a week. In retrospect, the following was the dumbest thing I could ever do, because the alarm went off again, since I didn't want to call the security company again and cry wolf, I went up to the 10th floor without informing the security company. The only thing I had on me was a mag light, since security guards in the Netherlands are not allowed to carry guns. I went up to the 10th floor, checked the floor, and as before, found nothing. The only difference now was I pretended to leave, turned off the lights, and stayed on the 10th floor, listening if someone was there. In about 5 minutes, I heard someone or something moving. I was relieved and anxious at the same time. Relieved I wasn't wrong and that there was something on the floor. Anxious because of what was on the floor. I turned on the lights and tried to sound as manly as possible saying something in the line of, I know there is someone here, show yourself. As you can imagine, no response. So stupid I didn't go down to call for help, but stupid me went looking to whatever it was I heard on the 10th floor. I walked to the office I heard the sound from, turned on the lights, and found a little girl who couldn't be older than 13 with long brown hair, in white pajamas squatting and rocking front to back on a desk, looking straight at me. The scary thing was there was no emotion in her face or in her eyes. I collected my nerves and took the girl by the hand. I took her down to the front desk, offered her a coke but she didn't respond whatsoever. The only thing I could do was call my supervisor and told him about what I encountered. My supervisor's response was, stay there I'll be right over. The time I hung up on the phone until my supervisor came, I just had this underbelly feeling with this girl, that there was something really wrong with her. Before my supervisor turned up, he called me and told me to call an asylum which was pretty close to the office building I worked at, just to check if someone was missing. Why would there be a 13 year old girl in an office building with no houses nearby whatsoever? So that's what I did, I called the asylum, asking them if there was someone missing from the asylum, and I got the scariest response you can get. Yes, as a matter of fact, someone is missing. I gave them a description of the girl sitting next to me, and it was in fact the girl who was missing from the asylum. They told me she was really dangerous, and that I should watch my back at all costs. They immediately sent people over to take the little girl with them. A week later, my supervisor told me the story of the girl I found, since he talked with the people from the asylum. It turns out the girl killed her mom and dad and little brother whilst they were asleep, when she was 11. Even in the asylum, she wounded staff members, either by stabbing them with a pencil or in another case biting a piece of an ear off. To this day, we still have no clue how she ever came in the building. We checked all the cameras and there was no footage of her ever entering the building. I grew up in a very safe, very affluent neighborhood. It was unheard of for anyone to lock their cars or houses, and when someone new moved to the neighborhood, it was mere moments before they were welcomed with open arms and open doors. Despite being surrounded by what could be described as one large neighborhood family, my mom was very particular about house rules being followed, one of which was never going out alone. Walking to a friend's house, three of us had to go, so two could walk home together after dropping you off. It was rare, but occasionally just two of us would be able to sneak out from under her watchful eye and run to the corner store a few blocks down for some candy or soda. One sweltering day during the summer, I turned nine. I found myself home alone and restless. I decided to take my sister's cool new 10 speed for a spin around the block a few times. Now, even though I was tall for my age, the bike was still a few inches too big for me. I decided that didn't matter, jumped on and started pedaling. My first stop around the neighborhood went off without a hitch. Birds were chirping, sun was shining, and the wind blowing through my curled hair felt wonderful. Second lap around the block I passed an older, unfamiliar car parked on the side of the road, and the sun reflecting off the huge scrape down the side temporarily shocked my vision into bright blue stripes which I furiously tried to blink away. The third lap, I saw the car pull off the side of the road heading towards me, and a tiny pit of unease began to grow my stomach as the driver slowed when he passed me. I chalked it up to being scared of being caught out being alone, and continued on my way. I picked up speed as I rounded the corner towards my house and I decided to go for one more time around the block, but to make it quick so I'd beat my mom home and avoid the trouble I knew I'd be in if she caught me out alone. I hit the bottom of the hill next to our house with some speed and started to climb to the top, 
slowing more and more the closer I got. By the time I reached the top of the hill, I had to stop and catch my breath, teetering the too tall back at my hip. As I struggled to catch my breath, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up, my arms locked on the handlebars, and every inch of my body froze. I had been caught, I just knew it. I heard a car creeping up behind me, and it just had to be my mom, but it wasn't. When relief should have washed over me, the unknown dread only deepened, further stiffening my frozen still limbs. I turned to see the same old car, with the same blinding scratch down the side, slowing down right next to me. The man stopped the car right next to my bike on the wrong side of the street, and through his opening driver door started to ask me if I had seen a stray dog running around, because his had come off the leash and run off. I froze. This cliché question is the one they warned us about in school, the one every kidnapper supposedly uses. I decided if I answered him firmly and rode my bike away that he would know his plan wouldn't work on me. Plus, he might just really be looking for his dog. This was my plan. My terrified body betrayed that plan and a trembling no is all I could manage. As I fumbled my feet to the pedals of this too big bike, his car door flew open and out he lunged. No, I said again as I wobbled my way past his open car door, his hand brushing the back of my shirt and knocking my back tires I pedaled as fast as I could the 50 feet to the next driveway I saw. I pedaled, legs burning up the drive, running my front tire so hard to my neighbor's front tire that it bent the wheel. My body catapulted over the handlebars and I burst through the neighbor's front door. Eddie, Eddie help. My neighbor was not home. I ran into the kitchen, still calling in hopes I was wrong. What are you doing? A man's voice behind me and I froze. I slowly turned around, not knowing what else to do, and there stood my neighbor's son, home from college. I dissolved into tears, gulping out what happened. He tossed the bent bike into the back of his truck and drove me around the corner to the safety of my home. My mom was home and had the look of death in her eyes until she saw my tear-streaked face. The police were called. The neighbors were called. The car had been spotted frankly circling the block the few minutes following our encounter, but he was gone by the time police arrived. To this day, 20 years later, I still have a hard time riding my bike alone. This all happened when I was 19. I'm not the best looking dude so I've never had much luck with women and I ended up on Tinder. I wasn't having much luck there either until the third month of using it when a blonde woman named Katie messaged me. She was pretty enough that I just dismissed her as a bot. It wasn't until three days later that she messaged me again which was odd because bots almost never messaged more than once. I clicked on her chat and replied, then looked at her profile. What I saw was pretty generic, but it definitely wasn't a bot's profile. We had been talking for like a month when she proposed the idea that I come see her. I was pretty reluctant as she lived nearly 8 hours from me by car, but I had to admit I really did like her quite a bit and I had been thinking about asking her if I could come see her for a while now. After a bit more badgering from her, I finally said that I would take the drive to go see her. At this point, I had no reason to doubt she said who she said she was. We had video chatted every other week and called most days, and I just assumed I got really lucky. Things did get a little weird on the way there though. She kept messaging me, asking me where I was, and making sure I was still coming. At some points, when I took more than 30 minutes to respond, she would send me a slew of annoyed texts. Admittedly, I had chalked this all up to her being nervous about me coming to see her. I was pretty nervous too, so I couldn't blame her. I had a hard time finding the house at first. The directions she gave me were pretty confusing and it was back through a series of gravel and dirt roads and a large thicket of trees. It was still about midday when I came onto an old looking house. A window on the second floor was boarded up but it didn't look abandoned, just worse for wear. Katie's red buggy that she liked to talk about was parked in front of the garage. I took out my phone and texted her that I was here. She only sent a smiley face in return. When I got out of my car to go knock on the door, I noticed someone was looking at me from one of the second floor windows. I found it a little creepy but figured it was just her father or something. She had told me that he comes to stay with her every now and again, so I ignored it and knocked on her door. She answered with a smile and even gave me a kiss which surprised me and I followed her inside. We sat down on her couch and started talking about our plans when I asked her about her dad. You didn't tell me your dad was here, I said. Was that going to be a surprise or... Katie looked confused and told me that her dad wasn't here. I still thought she was keeping up the act and I told her that she didn't have to keep pretending and that I had seen him looking at me through the upstairs window. Katie went pale and said that we had to get out of there now. We both ran out to our cars and when I questioned Katie she informed me that her dad wasn't there and that she had been home alone until I showed up. I called the police and while I was on the phone giving the address, Katie gasped and pointed to the window where I had seen the guy last. He was looking at us from out the window again. I got a better look of him and he seemed older and frail, almost like he hadn't eaten anything in a while. He left the window after he saw that we saw him. The police took half an hour to show up and the whole time Katie was crying and mumbling about how she was an idiot for not keeping her doors locked. When the police finally did show up, one started asking me and Katie questions and the other two searched the house. 
They came back out a little later and told me and Katie that, while they didn't find anyone, they did find that the back door was hanging open. Whoever it was had ran out into the woods, but the cops were sure the house was empty. After the cops left, Katie asked me to stay the night because she was too scared to be in her house alone right now. I gladly did and we slept downstairs on the couch as Katie's bed was the room next to the one the man had been in. Katie had also brought out the shotgun that her father had given her but she never used. I told her it was fine, the man's gone but she insisted, saying she'd feel safer if we had it out. I'm glad she did. Later that night I was still wide awake, watching TV. Katie had somehow managed to fall asleep. From the kitchen I heard the sound of a doorknob being turned. At this point I wasn't even scared, I was just pissed. I flipped on the light in the kitchen and pointed the gun at the kitchen door and there he was. The guy that had been in the house before was standing on the other side of the glass door. He looked shocked and I'm glad we had locked the door. The man unfroze and yet again ran into the woods. I woke up Katie and told her what happened and called the police yet again. When they arrived they did a sweep of the woods and found no one yet again. They told Katie and me that it'd probably be a good idea to stay at somewhere else for the night. Me and Katie said our goodbyes. She was going to stay at her friend's house and I was going home. I left a little after Katie did and I was on the phone with my brother telling him about what happened. My headlights were on. As I was talking something caught my eye. That man was standing at the corner of the house just watching me. I gunned it out of there and didn't even bother calling the police again, but I did text Katie and she said she was going to call them again. I don't think Katie ever even went back into the house alone. I had to fly out to a small town I've never been to in order to look for a place to live. I'm moving there in the fall to start grad school. My boyfriend flew with me, and before the trip I researched all sorts of apartments on Craigslist and set up a bunch of appointments. Now, our first appointment was in the afternoon in this sort of remote residential area. The landlord sent it fine over email and asked me to call him an hour before the appointment to confirm that I was coming. I called, he didn't answer, so my boyfriend and I started walking to the house and just hoped that he would show up. Maybe 10 minutes before the appointment, he called me. Are you coming? He asked. He sounded like an older man and had this very strange, slow way of talking, but I just thought that he was just older. Yes, we're in front of the house now. He got extremely upset. We? Oh yes, my boyfriend's with me. You never told me you had a boyfriend. You never said that. It had never crossed my mind to tell him this information. Since my boyfriend would not be coming to live with me, he was just helping me look for apartments on the trip. I told the man so and after a very long pause he said, I'm sorry, it's just sometimes people don't tell me when they're married and it surprises me, I'll see you soon. Then he hung up. I told my boyfriend about what the man had said and he was immediately weirded out. He wanted to leave but they were slim pickings in terms of real estate at this point so I stupidly said that we had to stay in case this place was the place. As we're discussing it, we see a man leave the house we're going to view. This man was young and extremely sketchy looking, greasy hair, furtive eyes. He took one look at us and ran out of the house to his car and pulled away from the curb with a screech. Okay, so now we're really weirded out, but this isn't enough for us to bail just yet. And as we look at each other wondering what to do, the landlord arrives. He's in his 50s, very tall and very strong looking. His eyes are completely blank and empty of warmth or emotion. He slowly walks up to us and says, I'd shake your hands but mine are dirty. What from? My boyfriend asked. Work is the flat reply. He asks us a lot of questions about me, completely ignoring my boyfriend. The entire time he stares into my eyes without blinking. What am I going to school for? What are the places am I considering for living? Is my boyfriend moving to this town too? I try to give answers that are as vague as possible. Meanwhile, my boyfriend asks the landlord questions of the same kind, which he refuses to answer. Then he says, I propose of nothing. Let me show you the basement. At this point, I should have noped out of there, but I didn't. I kept thinking this was an eccentric old man from a small town, we're city folk and that we were just feeling paranoid. My boyfriend, on the other hand, wanted out of there, but he followed us as the man led us back to the house, away from the street to this sort of detached shed. He opened the door and we saw that there were stairs leading down into the utter darkness. He flipped the switch at the top of the stairs and the light didn't come on. Normally the response for this is, oh, the lights are out, or something like that, but he just said, hmm, and so they walked down into the darkness. Then he stood there without moving in the dark and said, aren't you coming down? There's nothing to see if the light's out, says my boyfriend. The landlord just stands there for a long time, then slowly walks up the stairs and closes the basement door without saying anything. He took us into the house. Weird and increasingly creepy things ensued. The front door, the only exit to the house, locked automatically. And when my boyfriend tried to fiddle with it, the man got really upset and told him to leave it alone. He managed to get it open secretly though. The man kept trying to box us into small rooms and, according to my boyfriend, kept reaching his hands into his pockets, only to take them away when he caught us looking. On Craigslist and in person, the man claimed that there was a grad student already living in the house. 
but the evidence of that seemed arranged. There were neat piles of generic textbooks on the table, but not other things a 20-something might read. There was a bowl of fruit on the table, but no other food in the fridge or pantry, or utensils. There were maybe three teachers in the closet. This supposed grad student wasn't out of town, but the landlord couldn't say what school he went to or how long he'd been renting the house. Finally, the man had showed us every single room in the house but one. This one he refused to open, claiming it was just the attic and we didn't need to see anything up there. He gave us several reasons when we inquired. It was unfinished, there was furniture up there, it would smell bad. This last one I believed, because standing near the door, it smelled terrible. Finally, we made our excuses and bolted out of there. A man walked us out, pretended to go into his car to leave, and when he thought we had turned the corner, slowly sauntered back into the house. My boyfriend, fixated on the idea that there was something wrong with this guy, googled the man that night. We found out three things that he was a pillar of the community, known by a lot of the townspeople, and that there was no evidence of him owning or managing a real estate company, as he claimed on Craigslist, and he had listed his home address as the very house we had been touring, the house where the grad student lived. Yeah, we won't be renting this place. This happened sometime in 2011. I had been married for a little over a year and had given birth to a son a couple months prior. I was 23 and had just started working in a hospital while I took classes to finish my degree and hopefully apply for the police academy. I had met one of the security guards named Joe a few times as I frequently assisted in the ER with various tasks. As I got to know him he had a son a little younger than mine and was a veteran also applying to police academies and we formed a friendship. We exchanged numbers as he offered to help me train and give me pointers for the physical portion of the police test since I was out of shape after having a baby. One day while talking to him I mentioned how where I would study when on break was so loud and wish I could find a quiet place to sit. He offered to give me a tour and show me some all the hidden places employees would use. It was a Sunday so the hospital was quiet and I met up with him. We walked around and he showed me gray areas and offered to show me where the helipad was. We went through areas that were blocked to most staff. As we climbed the stairs and got closer to the roof, I started to get anxious and felt my stomach drop. I couldn't explain it and felt fear as we got closer. I'll admit, I'm afraid of heights and thought maybe that was it, but when we got on the roof, the fear got stronger but it was directed towards Joe. Something was off, and I had this feeling that at any moment he might try something and push me over the edge of the building. I just had to get out of there. Fortunately at that moment, the phone I carried rang and my coworker wanted to know where I was and if I'd be back soon to help her with something. I told him I had to get back and followed him back out making sure he was never behind me. After that day I avoided Joe at work and would only keep text messages short. I felt bad at first thinking I was overreacting because he had never done anything to me to make me feel that way. As time went on though the text became more frequent and he would try to ask me what I was wearing. I told him it was inappropriate as we were both married. I started seeing him more frequently and felt he was everywhere just lingering like he was waiting for me. Finally, one of my co-workers, Stan, asked me about it and I confided in him what was going on. I told him how I was scared to report him because he was part of security. I also mentioned how I would see him sometimes when I would leave at night around midnight and was scared that one night he'd be waiting by my car even though he didn't know what kind I drive. After that, Stan walked to my car every night I worked since we had the same shifts together. After he noticed I was never alone, he stopped bothering me. A few months later, I found out that he was fired for harassing another girl, who had the courage I didn't have to report him. I feel bad that I didn't speak up at the time and someone else had to experience it. So Joe, I hope we never meet again and I hope you never got into a police academy. I grew up in a small town in the Midwest where you left your doors unlocked and came home when the street lights turned on at dusk. After moving away for college, I decided to move back to my quiet, sleepy hometown in one of the two apartment buildings. I'm living there for roughly three months when one night I go to sleep early on a Friday night. Now, I'm a reasonably hard sleeper, so when I wake in the middle of the night to noises, I'm immediately alarmed. I'm going to describe my apartment layout for a better understanding. As you walk in the front door, the kitchen is to the left and the living room is to the right. There's a hallway straight ahead with one bedroom at the end. A bathroom is to the left in the hall and my bedroom to the right. I get up from my bed, walk around the end of my bed, and peek my head out of the bedroom door. I look to the left to see my front door open to the outside hallway. There's a loud voice coming from my enlightened kitchen. From my vantage point, I'm unable to see into my kitchen. I froze. I come to my senses after realizing that I've stopped unconsciously breathing. I take a shallow breath to study my mind and gather my bravery. There's no thought process about what to do at this point. I let my body and my instincts take over. I turn around and head back to the far side of my bed. I grab my phone from the nightstand and quietly remove it from the charger. Luckily my bed frame is high enough for me to squeeze under without much difficulty. I immediately realize that there is no escape from my hiding spot if things turn south. I'll have to rely on luck to get me through this. 
I dial 911 and a woman answers and asks about my emergency. I briefly explain in a whisper that an unknown man is in my apartment and that I am currently safe. I lay there, listening to the chaos of my home, reassured by the presence of my cat, Marcy, laying under the bed with me. It seems to me that he's in a phone call based on the one set of rambling. I tell the operator this fact and explain my fear that he's going to bring other people into my home. He was making enough sound to allow me to give a play-by-play -play on the call. He starts screaming about killing someone. I'm unsure at this point whether he's talking to the person on the phone or if he knows I'm there. The voice is unfamiliar, but this does little to ease my terror. He then starts ringing the doorbell in the outside hallway and yelling for me to come out. My blood runs cold as I realize that he might come try to find me. Marcy is alarmed by the doorbell that hasn't ceased ringing and she creeps out from under the bed. I panic. What if he hurts her? I start whispering as loudly as possible to get her attention without letting him know my location. She senses my unease and crawls back under the bed with me. At this point, it's felt like an eternity and I ask the operator how long until the police arrive. She is unsure but assures me that they are on their way. My town is roughly a 30 minute drive to the nearest city police but I assumed there's a highway patrol that would be coming soon. Little did I know that safety was in a rush to get to me. I hear him walking around my apartment and enters my extra bedroom, which is a storage room with a bed. He hasn't stopped yelling. I'm still unaware whether he's on the phone or not. I hear him mention that it must be a kid's room. I shush the operator because he's ceased his screaming for the moment. I hear more noises like he's going through boxes and throwing things. Then my fear is realized, as I hear him quietly enter my room. I see his feet walk closest to my vantage point. He starts going through my clothes and emptying my hamper onto the floor. He turns around and walks to my bed and sits down. I stopped breathing. I think he lays down at this point since the pressure of the bed lessens on top of me. He's deadly silent and I'm still holding my breath. They're shuffling and moving around and he gets up and walks out of my room. I take a shallow breath and steady my conviction. He starts making noise again like he's throwing and punching things. I inform the operator that he was just in my room and the police need to hurry. I don't know how long I can keep Marcy under the bed and concerned about what could happen if he finds me. He walks back into the kids room quietly. I shush the operator again because she is continually asking for a play-by-play. -play. I hear him breathing from the other room. After the quietest few minutes of my life, he yells, Who's there? I freeze again listening for movement, nothing. I'm starting to get lightheaded from my shallow breathing. The silence is deafening, and I fear he's trying to detect me. After a live time, I hear footsteps entering my apartment. I hear a man's voice say, Hey bud, you're in the wrong house. I've never felt more relief in my life before this night or since. I hear my door close and I crawl from under the bed and break down. The adrenaline and anxiety take over as soon as the feeling of safety washes over me. A female officer comes around to my side of the bed and puts her hands on my shoulders. I'm trying to keep it together and failing miserably. She let me put my clothes on and I could hear three male voices coming from my apartment. The woman left and came back with a handful of clothes asking if any weren't mine. They all were and I answered in kind. She shut the door behind her as she left again. I turned and looked out my window and see no lights from the cop car on the street. I look on my phone and realize the call to 911 took 19 minutes. I can't explain the feelings I had at this time since many hit me all at once. The door opened and the officer motioned to have me exit. Taking a first look at my home was almost as anxious as the event itself. My apartment was a complete mess. Clothes were everywhere mixed with garbage and other belongings from my shelves and counters. This man had removed items that he intended on taking and placed them in the outside hallway. They tell me that they found him on the floor in the second room completely naked, holding a bottle of lotion. In his vicinity, there was a winter hat with an unknown substance inside. They tell me to look and see if any of the clothes in the apartment do not belong to me. I tell them no. This man entered my home completely naked and destroyed my home. I noticed that the lid of my garage can was filled with cat poop. It seems that it had been separated from the rest of the bag. The rest of the garbage was littered across the outside hallway. They asked me if I would like to stay here or go elsewhere. They claimed my parents lived on the street and I had an officer drive me there. I explained to my parents what had just happened and in the next few days, I have to explain the situation to what felt like half the town. The ridiculousness of the story catches people's attention and becomes a slight joke. Now I should feel better knowing that he's in custody, but the events after the break-in do little to comfort me. An officer shows up with a subpoena to appear in court to testify, but I receive a call for a postponement. I just want this to be behind me. After a month, I call the phone number on the paper I received and ask when they are rescheduling for since I hadn't heard anything. The woman informs me that they mailed another and I had not shown up. I asked where was it since I have not received a summons. She tells me that they sent it to my address, but the wrong town. It has been two years since this happened and I've since moved three times. I don't know if I'll ever be content and happy anywhere, but I'm hoping that is not the case. He was released six months after his conviction for some reason or another on parole. He immediately disappeared and fled from his parole officer. So naked man, I hope to never meet you again. 
So about six years ago, I was 21 and I was home from college for the summer and living with my parents. This is deep Texas suburbs, so the houses are all cookie cutter houses built around the same time by the same developer. Every few blocks there's a pool or a park of some sort. Well every year, the community people, I honestly don't know how this gets organized or by whom, have a rock the park event at one of the pools slash parks within walking distance of my house. Some old guys bring their garage band and cover songs by Aerosmith and the Eagles, etc. The pool stays open late, there's a playground, and you can hear the music from every corner of the park. It wasn't too loud though, unless you were nice and close. Well, my parents went on a dinner date that night so I decided, with my 21 year old brain, to pour some vodka into my coca cola bottle and walk up to the park for some tunes and have a good time. It's only about a block away from me, so I get there pretty quick and down a good amount of vodka coke along the way. I'm feeling pretty good by the time I get there, so I head right up to the closest bench, to the stage. They were just standing within some cones and speakers on the grass. There's a person sitting on the far edge of the bench, but I don't really pay attention to him first. There's a good four feet of empty bench between us. It didn't take long, however, for him to strike up a conversation. He had a bony face and looked to be about at least 30. He said hello, how are you, etc. I was polite back, but pulled out my phone so he might get the message that I didn't really want to talk. He asks if I'm having a good time, and like a fool, I tell him that of course I am. I'm a couple shots worth of vodka in. I shook my coke bottle at the small amount left and it fizzed. That was when he started to ease his way in. I stayed on the far edge of the bench, but as he kept talking to me, he kept moving closer. He asked if I lived around here and I said, yeah, don't worry, I walked. I honestly thought he was asking because I was not sober enough to drive. He told me he lived in some vague direction and then asked if he could have my number. I started getting uncomfortable because for the first time in my life, I was alone somewhere and in a compromised state. I told him I didn't know him that well and he said something like, okay well, get to know me. I told him I needed to walk around because the music was too loud and I had to make a phone call. I ventured to the other side of this large playground equipment with lots of climbable walls and tubes. I make sure he can't see me, but I know he watched me where I went. I texted a bunch of my friends from college, telling them what was going on and asking for advice. They told me to leave, but I knew he could see me and I didn't want him to follow. I started hitting up my friends from high school, hoping some might be home for the summer already. And luckily one of my friends was. I told her what was happening and asked if she could save me. She said she could, but that she couldn't make it for another 20 to 30 minutes, which was still well before the event ended. I went over to a different part of the playground where the swings were and took a seat where I could see the stage, hoping maybe he'd forget about me and leave me alone. Sure enough, the moment I sit, he's approaching the swings. He takes the one next to me and starts trying to be like, what did you want to know about me? What do you need to know? I was like, actually, I'm getting really tired. I am probably going to go home soon. I just want to enjoy the music a bit longer without talking. That was when he became adamant about walking me home. It was a suggestion at first, but the more I told him no and that I'd be fine, the more aggressive he got about it. My parents wanted to be home for another few hours, so if I did go home and followed, he'd know where I live and have me alone. He asked which direction I lived in and I pointed in the opposite direction of my parents' house. He got up and took a few steps in that direction, then turned back to me like he expected me to follow. I told him that I wasn't ready to go home, but it became very clear that if I was walking home that night, he was coming whether I wanted him to or not. He stayed near me for the next 10 minutes or so until my friend arrived. I saw her car pull up and immediately got to my feet like, hey, that's my friend, and I sped off towards her car. She parked and got out and started heading back towards the park. I was like, no, hey, we gotta go now, but it was too late. He followed me and touched my shoulder. He said, hey wait, you promised to give me your number. I hadn't, but I felt rather trapped and figured that if I gave him a fake number, he'd be satisfied enough to let me leave. Sure enough, immediately after I spot it off, he calls it and starts looking at my phone, expecting it to ring. That's when my friend goes, hey, didn't your phone die? And I was like, oh yeah, I forgot, I'll get you later man, text me. And I waved to him and we both sped walked back to her car. He didn't follow, but he watched us drive away. I told her to go to the opposite direction of my house and to take the long way around. So weird guy from the party that wanted to walk me home, let's not meet again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I am a 21 year old senior in college, living with three other girls in an old one story house. We are located about a 15 minute walk from main campus and the majority of our neighbors are college students. 
That being said, this town is notorious for being a little, well, sketchy. Millie is home to one of the first insane asylums built in America. After the majority of it being closed down slash abandoned for years, the final building was shut down about a month ago and the remaining patients were released. Now, I doubt this is directly correlated with my creepy experience, but I am not the only one who has interesting encounters with strangers since the release in this town. Two nights ago, after getting off work around 11.30, I came home to my roommates getting ready to go for a night out. I realized now how stupid it was, but we often had an open door policy, free for anyone to come over and visit as they please. We would lock the door at night, but the one time we forgot to really came to bite us. Around midnight, I was hopping in the shower as my roommates were heading out the door. We said our goodbyes and I told them I would be meeting up with them later. I had just stepped out of the shower when I heard what sounded like the front door slamming shut. I automatically assumed one of the girls had forgotten something, so I called out their names, no response. I then hear footsteps in the hallway. I call out again, no response. Fear and dread came over me, and I immediately grabbed my clothes and ran into my bedroom. I threw my clothes on, leaned my ear to the door, and waited in silence to hear if someone was in the house. I hear nothing. I decided that it must have been one of the roommates grabbing something and leaving again. So I head into the living room to get my phone. Six missed calls and it's still ringing. My roommate, Carrie, was on the other end. I answered immediately could hear the panic in her voice. Lay, are you in the house? Me? Yes. Why? Carrie? You need to get out. Sam drove by and he said he saw a man walking through the front door. He called the police but you need to leave. Nothing was going through my head besides pure adrenaline and fear. I wasn't sure of the man's intentions but I sure wasn't going to wait and find out. While remaining on the phone with my roommate, I bolted out the front door and hid behind my car. I watched the house from afar, waiting anxiously to see any movement. As my friends approached in a truck, I sprinted out from behind my car and jumped in the back of their truck bed. Just as I did that, a dark figure scurried off into the woods running in the opposite direction. I can only assume he had been inching closer to as I was waiting for them to arrive. I screamed and we floored it out of there. I refused to go back into the house until the police arrived and had been triple checked. There were no signs of anything being touched or stolen, which makes me wonder what the man's intentions were. You can guarantee that I've locked my door every night since, and to the stranger who walked into my house while I was in the shower, let's not meet again. Back when I was 18 years old, I started working at a gas station. This was my first job. Near the end of my first shift, I was cleaning the hot dog rollers and a man walked in. He was rough looking, not in a bad way, but like he had been working outside all day. As soon as I set eyes on him, I got the gut feeling that I needed to stay away from him. Since I wasn't the one at the register, there was no reason for him to talk to me. However, the moment he saw me, he walked over and asked if I was new. I said yes, and he told me I was doing a good job and went on his way to check out. I noticed that he had a Jamaican accent which was weird to hear since I lived in Michigan. Honestly at that point, I thought that my gut was wrong about him. I was right the first time. During my next shift he once again came in and again I was cleaning. He came over to me and I still got the bad feeling in my gut. He asked me how my day was and I told him that it was okay. He then looked at my hand, I was wearing my high school class ring and I had put it on my left hand ring finger because I didn't want to scruff it up while cleaning with my right hand. He asked if I was married. I said no and I told him it was my class ring. He then asked if I was dating and I lied and said yes. He started asking me questions about my boyfriend, like how old he was, did I want to marry him, and if we were in a physical relationship. I told him I wasn't comfortable with answering that and he got mad but dropped the conversation. He would continue to ask me questions about my love life every time he would come in. After about a month and a half of this, I noticed that he would come in every day that I was working. This was weird because the days and hours that I worked changed from week to week. I asked my co-workers if he came in when I wasn't here and all of them said no. I also asked if any of them had told him what shifts I had been working but again they said no. This honestly freaked me out and I'd start to feel nervous when I would see his car pull in. One day he tried to give me his phone number and I politely told him that I wasn't interested in it. He got mad and was telling me that I needed to take it. My co-worker at this point told him that he needed to leave. The next day he came in and asked me on a date and when I declined he told me that I was going to regret it. He asked me several more times and each time I said no. After a while of him asking I told him that it was never going to happen and that I had absolutely no interest in him and never would. This only made things worse. He told me that I didn't have a choice and that he would be here when I got off work and that I was going to go with him. When he left I called my father and told him what happened and asked if mom and he could come to pick me up at the end of my shift. He said yes. I didn't get off until midnight and about 10 minutes before my dad walked in and told me to act like I was going to go to my car as normal but he was going to be in there. A few minutes after the the guy pulled in and got out of his car and was just standing there. As my shift was over, I hurriedly walked over to my car. He started approaching me and I jumped into the passenger seat and slammed the door shut. When he got to my door, my dad rolled down the window and pointed his gun at him. 
The man ran off and I thought that it was the end of it since he didn't come back into my work the next few days. However, it wasn't. About a week later, I was at the store with my mom when I got the feeling that someone was following us and sure enough, it was him. We got out of there as fast as we could and from then on out, my mom and I were not allowed to leave without my dad. Everywhere I would go, he would show up. Even when I went to my friend's house, who lived about a half hour from me. We caught him driving by the house several times. My mother also caught him following her several times, which freaked her out. We contacted the police and told them what was going on, but they said there wasn't enough evidence and that there was nothing they were able to do. To this day, I am still mad at the police for not doing anything. He started coming back into my workplace, and I asked my boss to ban him from the store, but she said no. Later, I would find out that they were friends, and that is how he always knew when I was working. I also believe that she was the one to give him my phone number, because it was around this time that I started receiving strange messages about how I looked, about my parents, and other creepy things. I got to the point where I was so paranoid that I wouldn't leave my house without my father. I had to have him drop me off and pick me up from work, and when I was at work any time I had seen a car that even somewhat looked like his, I would run and hide in the back room. Even my poor mother was paranoid and wouldn't go outside without someone with her. Finally, my father had enough and told me to quit my job and that he would help me pay the few bills that I had. Even after quitting my job, I was freaked out and decided to go stay with my aunt and uncle, who was a police officer, who live about six hours away from me. When I got there, it was the first time in nearly six months that I was able to relax. It didn't last for long. One night, my uncle and I went to pick up a pizza. Less than a minute after he walked in, the glass on my door was broken and hands were grabbing me. It was the Jamaican man and another guy. They got the door open and were pulling me out. I fought them as hard as I could. I got a few good hits on them, but it didn't do much good. Thankfully, my uncle came out and both of them ran after my uncle when he announced who he was and my uncle chased down the Jamaican man after I shot at which man he was. That day, he was arrested. Later on, I found out that he was illegally here and was deported. It took me about two years before I would go anywhere by myself. Honestly, it wasn't until I got my CPO that I was comfortable going places without someone with me. So Jamaican man, let's not meet again. I was in college and I lived in a house with five roommates. I lived on the second floor and the way it was set up is important. There were four bedrooms on the second floor and two bathrooms. Two of the bedrooms each shared a bathroom, which was accessible only by the bedrooms, not the hall. So, I could walk through the bathroom into my roommate's room and vice versa. My door had both a handle lock and a deadbolt, which I used every single night because it was a habit I'd had since freshman year. Because in dorms, drunk roommates or floor mates tend to wander in and wreak havoc if you don't. The door to the bathroom, however, didn't have a lock, so I could never secure that. One of my roommates had her boyfriend visiting, and he'd brought a friend with him. I hadn't spoken to the friend or gotten to know him at all, and I didn't really have any opportunities to since I didn't hang out in any of the common areas of the house, and frequently didn't even sleep there because I was casually seeing someone at the time. My first interaction with him was about two days into his visit. I was coming home around 6am from the house of the guy I was seeing, and I walked into the living room. When I came in, the visitor was alone and shirtless in my kitchen, which is open to the living room. He didn't even say hello, he just angrily asked me, where were you, which I was taken aback by, because he sounded like a jealous boyfriend, but I told him I had been at my boyfriend's house and he said, you didn't tell me you had a boyfriend. Well of course I hadn't told him, I've never spoken to him. I made a weird face at him and went upstairs and didn't see him again for the rest of the day. I slept in my own room that same night, deadbolt secure. I woke up at around 7 in the next morning to him entering my room from the bathroom. Before I could say anything, he saw that he woke me up and said, sorry, I was looking for the bathroom. I replied, well, you're standing in it, so, and he retreated and closed the door. I didn't think much of it at the time because I was groggy and I just fell back to sleep. Now, despite all that, up to this point he didn't really creep me out, he just seemed weird. But later that day is when it got worse. I came home from my classes and went up to my room. He followed me and let himself into my room without knocking. The door had been closed, and I made it clear that that wasn't okay but he was being friendly, so we chatted normally for a couple of minutes because I didn't want to be rude. Then he decided to say, I think you're the one. The first moment I saw you, I knew you were the one and you're gonna marry me. Obviously, I was taken aback by this as this was only our third interaction and we'd spoken for maybe two minutes total. I told him that I had no interest in marrying him, that I wasn't even attracted to him, and told him to leave me alone now. I decided to leave and called the guy I was seeing and told him what was going on and he told me I could stay over at his house until this weirdo left. A couple of days go by and the weirdo was supposed to have left for good, so I went back to my house. I slept in my room that night with the door locked as usual. I woke up to hear someone trying to come in through my main door, but thought it was just one of my many roommates. Then, I hear the bathroom door open and someone walking into my room. I rolled over and he was standing maybe a foot away from my bed and said, Hey beautiful, where have you been? I said, weren't you supposed to leave? Why are you in my room? 
He said, I wanted to wait for you to come home. I couldn't leave without saying goodbye. And then he tried to climb into my bed with me and kept touching me while saying, scoot over, I want to say goodbye properly. To which I started yelling, get out of my room. I didn't invite you in, leave now. I smacked his hands away from me and he got upset but left without much of a fight. I immediately left my house and went to my boyfriend's. The guy did finally leave later that morning. The next day, despite me yelling profanities at him and telling him how creepy he was when I last seen him in my bedroom, the guy still decided to find me on Facebook and try to add me. Nope, blocked immediately. So, creepy guy, let's not meet again. This is back in November of 2018 and takes place in North Carolina. I was 14 at the time. My family and I just moved across states. We had just gotten to the city where we planned on living after a long road trip. We were all hungry so decided to go grab dinner before we went to pick up the keys to our new house. We went to this local pizza shop. Since we had our dogs with us, we hadn't moved into our house yet. We decided to eat in the car. I'm a pretty fast eater compared to the rest of my family so I finished way before them. After I was done, I decided to bring my puppy out to do her business. We were standing just a little ways up from the car, playing in the leaves on the ground. I grew up in Florida so I wasn't used to seeing piles of autumn leaves, so it was just living my best life, not paying attention to my surroundings. When a man taps on my shoulder, my dog notices him and immediately tries to jump on him as she does with anyone, so I pull her back while I'm backing away from him. He looks to me in his mid 40s to 50s, he smiles creepily at me like it was forced. He says in his scruffy southern voice, you have my dog, my border collie. Immediately a red flag goes off in my mind, as my dog looks very obviously like a boxer, nothing like a border collie. I just say nervously, I think you're mistaken sir, this is my dog. Not even telling him how my dog does not look anything like he was describing. I look over to my parents car that was just a couple feet ahead of me, unsure of what to do. They hadn't even noticed the man approach me. They were on their phones. The man now asked me, well you would be able to come help me look for my dog, right? I can feel my stomach drop in that moment. I still don't want to make a scene as I'm probably overreacting. He then says something along the lines of, I have some money in my truck for you if I went with him. My hands are sweating at this point. He points over to a very sketchy, run down looking truck. I tell him I'm busy and I have to go, but best of luck to finding his dog. Still trying to keep him on my good side. Looking back on it now, I don't know why I didn't tell him my parents were right there. If I would have, I think he would have backed off. He then decides to grab my dog's leash and says he has dog treats at his truck and starts to walk away with my dog. I pull the leash away from him and say sternly, I have to go now. As I start walking away, he then grabs my wrist and rips the leash out of my hands, throwing it to the ground. He starts pulling me with him, mumbling something like, just come see what I have for you. My dog, the sweet girl she is, follows after us and starts barking. While he starts to drag me with him, I am pretty small 5 foot 4 and have no upper body strength, so I just start screaming to let go of me. My parents are alarmed, hearing me scream and our dog chasing after me barking, see this man pulling their daughter against their will. They immediately start sprinting after me. I start screaming, Mom, Dad. I think he got alarmed when he heard me yell out Mom, as she starts running towards us. The sudden realization that my parents were right there in their car the whole time. He makes a run for it and we didn't run after him. My parents were just glad they had me. This is definitely not a good way to start off our new life in North Carolina, not even have lived there a day yet. I do not wish this to ever happen to anyone, as it was terrifying, but my advice is for you, don't be afraid to use your words, even if they offend the person. I like to begin by describing myself, because I believe it's relevant to the story. I'm 25, male, and a bit above average height. I have been doing sports 5-6 to six times a week since I've graduated high school, gym, running, crossfit, squash, swimming, and any team sport my friends decide to play at any given time. My favorite hobbies are mountaineering, hiking, and bouldering. I've just recently purchased a new pair of high altitude mountaineering boots because it's near the end of the summer season and they were on sale. The plan is to wear them in the Alps next summer on a few ascents. I live in a European capital, one that's surrounded by wonderful nature with many trails and opportunities for hiking. I decided to break in my boots last Saturday, more specifically because it would have been my granddad's birthday and he also loved hiking before he died. These boots are overkill for these woods, but I needed to try them. I selected a nice route that's around 25 kilometers and set off at about 9 in the morning. It rained just the day before, so I expected a fair amount of mud and not so many people as they were easy scared off by the weather. Since the summer was extremely hot, it was a nice change of temperature, especially between trees and such, where it's a few degrees cooler than in the city. In the not so distant past, my dog would have definitely joined me on this hike, but she's turning 14 this year and she doesn't enjoy long distance walks anymore. 
My girlfriend had to do something for work on short notice, so I knew from the moment I woke up I would be doing the hike alone. The first half of the hike was perfect, the altitude difference along the trail is minimal, I barely broke a sweat and I misjudged how many people would be out due to the storm the day before. I met at most 6-7 to seven people during the first 2-3 to three hours and most of them were cross-country runners. It's worth mentioning that I wasn't walking quickly. I stopped on many occasions to take pictures or study some animal tracks. There are deer and wild boars in these woods, nothing more menacing, not animals anyway, but I won't get ahead of myself. Between 12 and 1, the path ran into an actual road, one where cars can go. This road is asphalt, but deep in the forest it can only be used to reach certain landmarks that are also in the forest, so cars seldom go here. My trail required me to take this road for a few hundred meters. As I was walking along the road, I heard a car approach from behind me. It went past me, not too quickly or too slowly. It was an older, green SUV with a fresh registration. You could tell by the license plate. Probably an import. Anyway, I thought nothing of it at the time. Then I heard it come back. It drove me past for the second time, now very slowly, and I could clearly see two men sitting in the front seats, wearing baseball caps and sunglasses. Both had stubble beard game going on as well. I assumed they were gamekeepers, even though their cars have a crest on the hood and on both front doors. As I hike a fair amount, I know these things, I see them around quite a bit. They would also not be driving a car like this, they have jeeps which are more suitable for the forest. Still, I felt no discomfort and again, I thought nothing of it. Then, my trail left the asphalt road and began snaking in the woods again. I walked ahead sincerely, gazing at trees and whatnot. Then, I suddenly had the strange sensation that something or someone was behind me. An engine sound was becoming more and more clear as well. At this point, the trail was quite narrow, but if, for whatever reason, if you want to drive a car on it, you could, just about. Now when I turned around, the aforementioned SUV was basically in my face. It was an arm's length away from me, and it stopped just as I had. I looked at the driver, who was staring back, as I can only assume as he was wearing sunglasses. I calmly asked him, what's wrong, shall I let you go, in a polite tone as his window was rolled down. He didn't speak. He slowly started reversing, and he soon disappeared behind a curve. Now I was quite uncomfortable. I also noticed that he was alone in the car, unlike earlier. I listened intently, standing still, since I wasn't sure what was going on. At this point, I was not scared, but there was a faint feeling of unease in the air and bad thoughts began gathering in the back of my mind. I heard the car and the engine stop just behind the curve. I heard a door open and shut, but nothing from that point on. I turned around and began walking towards my destination, at a much faster pace than before. Now I was a bit scared. I didn't understand why he didn't answer, and why he just reversed and left without a word. I wasn't sure what to make of it, and I had no desire to ask him again, or to see him again for that matter. I had just walked enough for these unpleasant thoughts to slowly be erased from my mind. As I had been drinking a lot of water as I usually do, I decided to use the bathroom. I saw a perfect spot, a very narrow path off my trail that led quite clearly to a little hunting tower. I walked over to the tower, put my bag down by the ladder that led up to it and began peeing. I was also interested in checking Google Maps to see where I was, but since there was no signal, I decided to check my map. I also had a sip of water. I had been camping there for a good few minutes before I headed back at the trail from where I deviated to pee. Right before I arrived back to the main trail, I thought to myself how extremely quiet it was. No wind, no noise of any kind, absolutely nothing. This made me realize, just a moment later, how alone I was. Except for the man who was standing maybe 50 meters away from me on the trail, in the direction where I was headed. I only saw this as soon as I stepped back on the trail, since the small one to the tower was well hidden by trees and you couldn't see the main trail, as it was running perpendicularly to the small one. I looked at him and I was instantly chilled to the very bone. He was dressed in tactical clothing, with a baseball hat on his head. The only reason he was standing still, I believe, was a moment of surprise that I had appeared from a place where he didn't expect me to appear from. At this point, I was fully and utterly alarmed. He was holding a rifle that had a scope on it. Had this happened without the incident with the SUV, I would have probably walked along the trail thinking he's a hunter. However, in light of the strange encounter with the SUV from which the second man was missing, something in me snapped instantly. In hindsight, it's also illegal to hunt in these woods this time of year. I figured, in the matter of two seconds, that I was going to sprint through the woods until exhaustion, towards and past the tower, as it seemed natural to do at the time. If there was no malicious intent on this man's behalf, or the others, he'll just think I'm an idiot and forget about me in two minutes. If I'm right, it's the best call I will ever have made. He began running towards me, adrenaline blossoming within me, I began sprinting away. I sprinted past the tower and deep into the bushes, not sparing my legs as I was wearing shorts and a thermal jumper. I crashed through branches, small trees, and slipped on several occasions. I really did sprint until I was exhausted, it must have been several kilometers. 
I even crossed some smaller trails but didn't even bother to look either way. My pulse was a billion the whole time. I began checking my phone for a signal, but nothing. I was already really angry at myself for not memorizing the license plate. After a while I began power walking, but still off trail straight ahead in a direction that I knew would sooner or later lead me out of the woods. When my phone got a signal, I told the story to several people frantically, but no one took me too seriously. They said I was overreacting and whatnot. You must have misunderstood the situation. Finally, I reached a trail that led directly to a cute little town that borders this rather large forest. It felt like an eternity, but I walked the last kilometer to the main square, took off my jumper and put it in my bag. At least I looked a little different from far away. I waited for a bus that took me back to the station near my car, rather anxiously. After the bus ride, during which I studied each car on the road, I walked back to my car, got in and drove home. My dog welcomed me like I was coming back from a two-year deployment. Dogs are just amazing, she must have felt that something shook me up. The boots destroyed my feet, but they aren't meant to be sprinted in for long periods of time. I called the forest gameskeeper's office. I inquired about whether they have such cars in service as the one I come across. They do not. Their gamekeepers also don't typically work in pairs, like 99.9% .9 of the time they are alone. I told them my story and they took me a lot more seriously than my friends, but they assured me that the police wouldn't. No one could have been legally hunting in the area during summer either. I've been reading local news but nothing extraordinary has been reported yet. I really hope nothing will be reported either. Gentlemen in the empty forest at lunchtime, let's not meet again. This happened a couple years ago. In 2016, I had just turned 18 and was in my second semester of community college. I was lucky to get to take a few specialized classes that were requirements for my major. These classes required me to drive about 45 minutes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to the main campus of my community college system. This is relevant because I was going to a town that I didn't know much about and didn't know anyone who lived there. There was a man in my class named Eddie. He was a big guy in his late 40s. We spent a lot of time in the lab for these classes and he was stationed right across from me. I was a bit more naive and unsuspecting at the time and wanted to be nice so I talked with him and my other classmates quite a bit and was a lot friendlier to him than I would be nowadays. He started being overly friendly to me and would stand too close and ask too many personal questions. He'd flirt with me in class to the point it seemed to make other people uncomfortable to watch. He also started staring at me a lot with an intense look that scared me. Of course, being young and not wanting to hurt his feelings, I decided to ignore it as best as I could. I told my boyfriend about it, but again, Eddie hasn't actually done anything to me so there wasn't a lot I felt like I could do. A few weeks after that started, all of us were hanging out in a small break room type area, studying for an exam in our next class, which was about 30 minutes away. I was sitting at one table chatting with some middle aged women in my class, and Eddie was at the next table over messing with his phone. I noticed that I was going to get something from the vending machine and stood up. As I did, he tried and failed to discreetly turn his phone toward me and snapped pictures of me as I walked in the machine, got my drink, and bent over to pick it up. I realized what was going on as I was walking back to my seat with him still taking photos and I shot him a look. He put his phone away and just sat there staring at me. I was trying to look pissed but honestly I was just really freaked out. I excused myself from the table and called my boyfriend near tears, telling him what happened. He was angry and said that I need to tell someone but I said no, I didn't want to make a scene. He tried to comfort me as much as he could but I had to go to class soon afterwards. Our last class finished at about 9pm and since it was January, it was completely dark out when we all walked to our cars. I was actually texting one of my guy friends about what had happened when Eddie walked up to my car, stopped for a second and looked at me through my windshield, then slowly kept walking, watching me through my driver's side window the whole time. He was parked nowhere near me and the windshield was below zero so he had to have made a point to walk by my car like that. I was terrified and with my hands shaking I started my car and drove home as fast as I could, calling my boyfriend on the way and crying. After that, I decided I needed to talk to my professor about what was going on. I was so nervous, but I asked her the next week if I could talk to her privately when class was over. We went to her office and I told her about Eddie and what he had done and how he acted weird toward me. She told me that she had noticed tensed up and went quiet when he got close to me, and had noticed paying a lot of attention to me and told me she believed me about the pictures. She was honestly amazing with how she handled it. She promised me that she would move things around where I'd be away from him in the lab and asked if I wanted her to talk to him about it. I said no, that I didn't want to make him angry and she said that she'd respect that, but she was going to have the security guard stand at the door and watch me go to my car every night and that she'd tell the program director what was going on but Eddie wouldn't know that I had talked to her. By the time we had got done it had been around 30 minutes since class had ended and she offered to walk me outside. I'm glad that she did because when we came out the elevator to the first floor, Eddie was sitting there in the foyer alone. Everyone else had gone home. My blood ran cold but I tried to act as normal as I could. He seemed as surprised to see her professor there as she was to see him. 
She asked why he was still here and he said he noticed my car was still parked out front and wanted to make sure I didn't have to walk out by myself. I'm pretty sure I was as pale as a ghost but my professor gave him a look that I couldn't read and said not to worry. She's walking me to my car from now on and the security guard will be there every night. He said that was good and quickly said goodnight and left. It still chills me to think about what could have happened if my professor didn't walk me down to my car that night. I have no idea what he was capable of doing. After this, she rearranged our seating, made sure we were never grouped together, and I started making sure I walked out to my car at the same time as a few other women in my class. The security guard was usually in the foyer and we only had a couple months left of class, so there weren't really any other incidents, but I still caught him staring at me sometimes and he looked like pure rage. It's been a few years, and I don't go to that school anymore, and I'm moving to a completely different city soon. But Eddie, let's not meet again. I recently ran into an old coworker from our time we worked at the sandwich shop in the truck stop. We chatted for a while before he had to leave, but I started thinking about my stint at that place, specifically the creepy sandwich guy. In college, I worked some overnights at the truck stop. It was a pretty safe place in a smaller town, and there had only been three incidents in the four years the place had been open before I got hired in. One trucker got robbed, one group of ladies arrested for, servicing the truckers, and one OD. I was never really worried, even though my coworkers seemed a little concerned that I was a young girl working overnights at a truck stop when there was only one other employee in the whole place. Usually it was really slow, most of the time I'd get 3 or 4 truckers come in within the first hour, a couple people came in with the munchies and ordered 3 dozen cookies one time, but usually it was maybe 1 or 2 people an hour, if that, so I'd spend about 3 hours cleaning ovens, finishing dishes, deep cleaning the lobby, that kind of thing. And then I get to spend whatever time between customers doing homework. The overnight boss on the other side, the gas station side, was cool as long as everything was cleaned and tipped regularly. A few weeks before I inevitably left this place, a guy came in about 20 minutes before my shift was over. So it's about 5am by this point. My coworker had arrived early so he could fill out some paperwork he had to get done. So he was sitting in the back office already. I started making this customer sandwich, making chit chat like usual. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary. He told me he was driving from New York to Wisconsin, asked me a little bit about how my night had been. Nothing crazy. I wrapped up his sub, rang it up, and threw in a small discount for him since he seemed nice and I was just happy I was getting ready to go home for a few hours of sleep before I headed to campus. When I went to take his change, things went wrong. He dropped the coins in my hand, but suddenly he had his grip tight around my wrist. The next thing I knew, I'm on the other side of the counter on the floor. He had yanked me across the counter and still had a tight grip around my wrist. Thank god my coworker was there. The manager on the other side had slipped into the bathroom, so to this guy's knowledge I was the only one there at the moment. But my coworker, while filling out his papers, was looking at the cameras and had seen everything. He was out of the back just seconds after I hit the ground, and before I really knew what was going on, he had chased the guy outside. He didn't pursue him far, afraid that someone else was nearby who would come after me. So he ran back inside, locked the door to our side of the store, and shouted to the manager to call the police. The cops came, they searched the area and watched the security videos, but nothing ever came from it. The guy disappeared and I never really heard anything about him. I put in my two weeks notice the following day after my nerves had calmed down. I was switched around so I worked during the day around my classes for my last few days, and they made it a policy that two people were to be working both sides of the truck stop and overnights from that point on. I still live about an hour or half away from there, and honestly I haven't went back since my last day just because that memory is still in my mind almost 8 years later. So creepy sub guy, let's not meet again. This took place about 8 years ago. I had been single for a very long time. My kids kept telling me to get back into the swing of things, but I just kept making excuses. My nephew told me about this dating site. He said that there was no harm in talking to people, so I did it. I put everything out there so there were no surprises when or if they met me. I thought that if they still contacted me after reading all I had described myself and we matched, then maybe I would have coffee with them. I met with one gentleman who was way too regimental for my crazy life and kindly declined any more involvement with him. Another guy seemed too pushy and acted like I should be honored to be in his presence, but then there came, we will call him Richard. Now please keep in mind I had very low self esteem at the time. That being said, Richard seemed great. We carried on conversations for hours. He lived an hour and a half away, so all we could really do was talk to each other. We talked about our kids, dreams, goals, my daughter even friended one of his sons on Facebook. I was a secretary for some self-help meetings in my town and he was going to school to be a counselor. Perfect, right? We talked for at least four months but after a while, I noticed that he kept having small problems come up. Arguments with his mom with whom he was living, no money for gas, his truck broke down, his oldest boy was mad at him, just little things, you know? Not anything that would set me off but it was his poor me to heck with it attitude. I tried to let that go and really be a positive influence in his life. His mother and boys loved me and told me that they had never seen him so happy. Time went on and we were still talking every day. 
I had an opportunity to come see him and of course, my daughter went with me so she could meet his son in person as well. I took him and his son out to eat at the only little coffee shop in that town. He knew I was on a fixed income but I paid anyway because he was going to school and didn't have an income as of yet. We had a good time. We met at his son's house on a hilltop town. We were having such a good time that we didn't notice that the snow was coming down hard and the roads were icing up so my daughter and I stayed the night in one of the rooms. It seemed like the closer we got to his family, the more distant they became to him. It was odd. The next day the roads were clear so we said our goodbyes and went home but before we left I received one extra hug from his son's mother-in-law. She whispered in my ear, don't fall for him. I thought that maybe there was something she didn't like about me. That came out of the left field. The next few days we didn't talk. I thought that was odd. Did I do something wrong? Someone from the self-help meeting told me that there was a man looking for me. She said he looked disheveled and smelled like alcohol. This wasn't a surprise to me because I helped quite a few people get back on their feet and maybe this one fell off the wagon and just needed to talk. As I was driving down my street, I saw a truck in my driveway I didn't recognize at first. It was him. He found out where I lived and was sitting in the front of my house. At first I was happy until I looked in his truck and saw him slumped over reeking of booze. At that point my fixed mood set in and I asked him in for some strong coffee. He told me that he had a blowout with his mother and she kicked him out and his boys won't talk to him. I got him some clean clothes and told him to take a shower. I figured we could sort it out the next day, in the meantime I was taking him to a meeting. He sobered up and agreed to go but the whole time at the meeting my friends were acting like I had lost my mind. Did they see something I was blind of? He went back to my house and he seemed okay, almost 2k like nothing at all happened. My son pulled me aside and told me he didn't like him much but I thought that maybe he was just being overprotective. I should have paid more attention. We went to the store because I wasn't prepared for the extra mouth and I bought 4 2 liters of soda, a gallon of milk, and 2 monsters for both of him and my son, some chips and other things for dinner. After we ate we all watched some TV and headed off to bed. I let him sleep on the spare bed in my room but in the middle of the night he tried to get frisky. At that point no, my grown kids were in the other room and something just didn't sit well with me, like he wasn't the same man he was before. The next morning my daughter came running out of the bathroom angry, she said in a loud voice, someone peed all over the toilet, he didn't say a word. Later we were all eating breakfast and he started to let food drop out of his mouth onto the table and floor and was spitting food while he was talking. He took three two liters and drank them back to back letting some run down his chin. Then, yes there is more, he took the remote and started to set future recordings for his favorite shows and deleting a few of my grandchildren's. He set recordings for weeks in advance. Wait wait wait, what are you doing my friend, this is not cool. I told him but he acted like I said nothing. Then he went to the refrigerator and told me that I had to go to the store and buy more soda and stuff because it was all gone. Like it was gone, he even drank my son's monster and the whole gallon of milk. One day mind you, only one. At this point my daughter was also livid so she contacted his son and he proceeded to tell her that Richard's mother kicked him out because he wouldn't get a job and was stealing money and eating her out of house and home. His other son won't talk to him because he keeps asking for money and won't pay it back. He himself was mad at him for lying to me by telling him that he was going to school when he wasn't and using me as his next big meal ticket. Well that was it. I got all of his stuff together and took it to his truck and asked him to leave. It doesn't end there. He had loosened some bolts on his transmission making it impossible to move. He he begged and pleaded for me to let him stay. He was at that point snot was coming out of his nose. He said that he just wanted to be close to me and if that meant sleeping in his truck he would do that and he couldn't live without me. Well no, I called his oldest son and told him that if they didn't come with a tow truck and get their dad his fate was not going to be nice. They arrived two hours later apologizing for their father's actions. We found out that through his son that for many years he had gone through quite a few unhealthy relationships and took advantage of a lot of women that fell for his lies. He still tries to friend me on Facebook to this day. When I was 16 years old, I decided to surprise my parents with a bouquet of flowers for Valentine's Day. We've always celebrated this as a family holiday rather than a romantic one. I didn't have a car to drive to a florist, but my high school was within walking distance of a hospital boasting a gift shop that sells floral arrangements. Between classes during the week of Valentine's Day, I set off for the hospital by my lonesome, cutting across campus to walk through a network of side roads populated with specialty doctor's offices that kept odd hours. The sort of buildings where traveling doctors mainly hold surgery consultations or perform small procedures a few times a month. The trip there passed without incident. As I was walking back through said deserted roads with a vase of flowers in a tow, I noticed an unkept 1990s car close behind me. While my memory of the car is hazy, I am left with the impression that there were at least two men within whose faces I could not see. Initially, I assumed that the driver was simply afraid of hitting me, the reason they weren't passing by, so I made a point of dramatically trudging further into the grassy shoulder of the road, demonstrating to them that they could drive safely ahead. They still refused to pass me by, continuing to creep along behind at a slow pace. Beginning to suspect that the driver was more interested in me than a destination, I began to walk faster. The car confirmed my suspicions by matching my speed. Despite the impracticality of my shoes and the threat of spilling water from my vase, 
I commenced to run as fast as I possibly could. They hit the gas and again matched my speed. I realized at this point that the car was following me, that there was no one in sight to notice, and I needed to get away. I bolted into the first parking lot that I saw. The car turned in after me. Despite there being only two or three cars in the spacious front parking lot and there being no other set of activity at the office, this car did not stop to park in the numerous spaces available there. The driver instead opted to pursue me in the partially under construction back portion of the slot, behind the office. It passed every available parking space to corner me against a pile of debris and rubble from the construction, coming to a diagonal stop less than three feet away. Before anyone could emerge from the vehicle, I somehow managed to scale the small prominence of rubble against my back. Face in hand, it jumped from its peak to land painfully on the other side, which fortunately was a plot of undeveloped lamp within sight of my high school campus. I took a quick peek back over my shoulder to see if they were still in pursuit, but the car had sped off after I reached the top of the rubble pile and was nowhere in sight. They had not parked in the lot at all. They had no business there. The driver was following me. I sprinted at top speed and didn't stop until I was soaked with sweat in the dead of winter and panting in the student lounge on one of my classmates, who didn't seem to care when I told them. In retrospect, I should have told an adult, alerted campus security, and called the non-emergency line at the local police station, but I was young, foolish, insecure, and afraid of getting in trouble for leaving campus when I didn't have assigned permission from permitting me to do so. I kept trying to convince myself that I had misread the situation or was overreacting. I don't know what I would have even told the police had I called them, as I was entirely ignorant of the subject of cars and it couldn't have identified the make of it if I had been asked, and I couldn't see the faces of the occupants. I was also worried that my parents would restrict my already extremely limited free if they knew I had been in any danger. Whoever followed and tried to trap a 16-year-old girl with flowers at a doctor's office just before Valentine's Day of 2016, let's not meet again. So when I was in probably second or third grade, we had an early dismissal. For those of you who don't know, that's when school goes for longer than half a day but we still get out an hour or so early. I remember sitting silently in class working on math problems when the phone rang. I joked to my friend next to me that I hoped it was for me. We all watched the teacher answer the phone because we knew that 90% of the time it meant someone was leaving class. When the teacher's eyes met with mine, I suddenly got pretty worried. My teacher said something into the phone and then asked me, when are you getting off the bus today? I thought this was really weird. My mom knew I would be getting home because she had to leave work early so she'd be home when I got home. I just told the teacher the normal time. The teacher talked for a few more seconds and then hung up the phone. I asked her what it was about and she told me that my parent just wanted to double check what time I got off the bus. I didn't really think about it too much for the rest of the day. Later I got off the bus and walked home without incident. When I walked in the front door my mom asked me about my dad and took my coat. I remember the look on her face when I asked her, why did you call the school to see what time I was getting off the bus? She looked shocked. She said that she hadn't called the school. I told her the whole story and she immediately started making frantic phone calls. I knew that something was wrong. I watched some TV while my mom talked. About 20 minutes later, my stepdad came home early from work. About 10 minutes after that, a state trooper pulled up. I was pretty scared because I thought that somehow I was in trouble. The state trooper asked me a few questions like, has anyone tried to talk to you while you've walked from the bus stop? Have you seen anyone parked at the bus stop who didn't have a kid get into their car? Has anyone tried giving you a ride? The answer to all of his questions was no. I had never seen anyone suspicious as we lived in a pretty nice neighborhood and it was mostly old retired folk who live around us. My mom asked me to go upstairs to pack my bag as it was my dad's weekend for visitation. When my dad got there to pick me up, he was questioned pretty heavily by the state trooper. I had been eavesdropping from upstairs. My mom called me back down and I left with my dad for the weekend. My dad ended up teaching some basic self-defense, which I thought was pretty cool. I never heard anything about the situation and eventually I forgot about it. Fast forward to today. I was watching a horror movie when I then remembered the whole incident. I asked my mom about it and what she told me chilled me to the core. She told me that someone had called my school posing as my dad. This man knew my dad's full name, my full name, and my mom's full name. He kept saying that my mother wanted him to pick me up from the bus stop because she wasn't going to be able to leave work early. The school didn't even bother calling my mother. I believe that the only thing that saved me from being abducted was the fact that I had told the man that I'd be getting off the bus at the normal time, which was around 3.15. I had actually gotten off the bus at around 1.45. So creepy guy who wanted to abduct me, let's not meet. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. For context, I am a 19 year old girl and was taking summer classes at a community college this summer. One of the classes I took was public speaking, which met Tuesdays and Thursdays. This guy, I don't even know his name, immediately gave off weird vibes. To get from our classroom that was on the second floor, he had to go down a hallway, down a stairwell to the first floor, through the main lobby, and out the sliding doors. He started waiting for me after class and followed me all the way down this route to my car. Didn't matter if I pretended to be on the phone, had both earbuds in, kept my head down, literally power walked away from him, 
gave him bare minimum responses, etc. He would wait for me, follow me slash try to walk with me, and the whole way would be talking to me and asking me questions. Like asking me about each of the cars I drove to the school, since my family has to share cars. Even after I suddenly dropped I had a boyfriend. So he definitely knows my car. I got a very bad feeling after a while of this happening and told the class's professor. She immediately took it seriously, notified camp security, and told me to always stay after class so she could walk me to my car. However, true to form, the guy stopped showing up to class, for at least two weeks or so, so I thought it was fine and that the crisis was averted. And it was, until one day he showed up to class again. As soon as I saw him enter the room, my heart dropped. During this class, I slipped a note to my professor telling her he's the kid in the blue shirt, and she told me to hang around after class. I did, and so did the guy and another female student. Before he tried to talk to the professor about why he should pass the class despite never showing up or doing the work, the professor asked me and the other girl to wait in the hall. From the hall, we could hear him yelling aggressively at the professor. He eventually left and came out into the hallway we were waiting in and pointed at me and said, wait for me. Mind you, I have no idea who this kid is. I instantly got the creeps and rushed back into the room to tell my professor, who was equally creeped out. Having overheard our conversation, the other female student came back into the room approximately 10 minutes later and told me and the professor that the guy was just standing in the hall waiting for me. The professor called campus security multiple times, phoned the front desk multiple times, but she received no responses. So, we took it to our own hands and came up with a plan to leave the classroom together, pretending to be in a very deep conversation with each other, walk past the guy without even looking at him, and walk down the stairwell to the main lobby. His eyes bore into us as we passed him, and we entered the stairwell he stood up and followed us. The professor and I exchanged looks of terror but kept her cool act up, stopping at the main desk in the lobby and pretending to converse with the secretary. The guy passed us, still staring at us, and walked out the sliding doors where he was out of our field of vision. We literally had to track down the campus security ourselves and tell them everything that had happened, and my professor was furious. After we saw security camera footage of him lurking around, she contacted the local police because she and I both had that very strong gut feeling that this kid was not right and that we weren't safe around him. So that public speaking class was from 3 to 5 p.m. and I had another class from 6 to 8 p.m. So I would usually drive to Wawa or something in that hour gap. However, there was no way I was going anywhere because I knew the guy was waiting for me to do so. For over an hour, we, me, the professor, security, and secretary, tried to figure out who this kid was. None of us knew his name because he literally didn't come to class, there weren't photo IDs next to the class roster, and approximately half the original class stopped showing up so we couldn't use process of elimination. All we had was the security footage of him. I was escorted to and from my next class into my car at the end of the night. The security officer asked me to point out my car and when I did he said, oh wow, so he was parked right next to you. Confused, I asked what he meant and he told me that he had been watching more security footage and the guy got into the car parked right next to me, waited in there for a long time, and then eventually left. The thing is, I knew for a fact that I hadn't parked next to anyone when I arrived at the school because the lot was practically empty since it was summer. After finally getting home that night, I was the only person home for a few weeks, go figure. Local police did drive-bys by my home all night in a well check. When I returned to the school two days later for my Thursday classes, I was informed of chilling information. Footage showed him waiting for me in his car on Tuesday after our shared class, which I had already been told, but it also showed him coming back to the parking lot at around 8pm when my last class got out and sitting in his car. I never told him about my schedule or any other classes I was taking. This whole time, my public speaking professor was filing reports, making complaints against the school for their incompetency, and even got a lawyer because she felt so uneasy about the kid that if he showed up again, she would walk out. I was in contact with the president of the entire college, the director of security of the entire college, police, etc. for days. They told me that he was banned from campus and everyone was on watch for him, and that if he was spotted he would be asked to leave until the director of campus security, middle-aged man, called me and told me that he identified the kid and talked to him, via telephone call, mind you. And he told me that the guy, and I quote, just wanted to be my friend, and told me that whatever I was doing with the guy, you know, literally running away from him, probably made him think I was flirting with him. My professors were absolutely furious and excused me from physically attending class for the rest of the semester. I still don't know his name, and I hope I never have to learn it. My new year resolution 2012 was to get in shape again. After my first kid was born, I lost my athletic interest but I had every intention of getting it back. So I started running 4 days a week with my friend Hannah who is a great runner slash motivator. We would run after work, 5 to 10 kilometers, usually favoring the forest trail. It's the kind of trail that got lighting in the darker months of the year so you could run there anytime really. Once you turn on the lights, you got 45 minutes to run the shorter trails, and longer to run the longer ones. Then the lights shut off automatically. We had been running for about 2 months when we started seeing the same man hanging around the parking lot every time we got there. 
thin man, 25 to 30 years of age, always dressed in sports clothes, but never actually running. He never looked you in the eye either. We speculated that he could be homeless camping nearby because he was constantly there. We got used to seeing him, sitting somewhere close by, silently and always on his own. We felt sorry for him. He never seemed to talk to anyone or interact at all, but there was something about him that made us hesitate to talk to him or ask if he was okay. Can't pinpoint what it was, but something wasn't completely right with him. One evening, Hannah didn't make it to our run and I decided to go on my own. I arrived at the parking lot, my car being the only car there. I did some stretching, turned on the lights, and set off on the 5 kilometer trail. I hadn't seen the thin silent man when I started my run. Perhaps it was getting too cold to sit there now since it was autumn, dark, and getting closer to the freezing point. He must have been here though, somewhere in the shadows, because when I got to the top of the first steep hill, I could hear heavy breathing somewhere behind me. I look over my shoulder and I see him. He is running like a man obsessed. In regular shoes, not running shoes, with his arms moving in a really strange, stiff manner as he was made of metal. His hands like arrows, straight in an upward inward angle, sort of like a spreadsheet but more extreme, moving like a robot. He had never done anything to harm me, or anyone else as far as I knew, but the look in his eyes alone was enough to let me know that I needed to go. I started running faster, trying to create distance between us, and I could hear his heavy breathing getting even more strained. I ran like my life depended on it, adrenaline pumping through my body and giving me new strength. I tore off my necklace and threw it on the ground thinking, I must leave a trace if he takes me, something must be left behind. I tried screaming, hoping someone would be close enough to hear me, but I couldn't scream my lungs out and keep up the phase at the same time. He was still behind me, maybe 100 meters behind now, but I figured that if I trip and fall, or run out of energy, or fumble with the car keys once I reach the parking lot, then I'm screwed. So once I reached the sharp turn on the trail, I went off the trail and ran straight into the dark woods. I ran only a short distance and then I laid down flat on my stomach, my hands searching for a rock to defend myself with if he found me. I realized that I was wearing bright running clothes with reflexes and neon coloring. I had ever felt so visible in the dark before. I could hear him reach the turn and thankfully he kept on running. I started to move slowly and as silently as possible move further into the darkness. My heart sank again as soon as I heard rapid footsteps closing in from the trail. He realized that I must have got off the trail once he saw that there was no sign of me ahead. He stopped and I stopped. I could imagine him listening for any sound and I held my breath and prayed to make him go away. After a while I heard him say something in a language I didn't recognize and walk off. I didn't move. I feared that he would wait for me by the car and realize that I had to get off the trail and onto the main road and stop someone. I couldn't go back to the parking lot. I started to make my way further into the woods, knowing that I would eventually end up on the last part of the long trail and close to the main road. The lights on the trail suddenly shut off. That made me calmer at first. The dark was a comfort and protection, but then, after only a few moments, it switched on again. This could mean that another person had just started their run, and soon I would have someone there to help me, or that he was out looking for me. I decided against waiting to find out and continued my way towards the main road. It was dark and I fell multiple times, my clothes getting wet from the damp vegetation and I started to get cold. After what felt like a lifetime, I could see the 10 kilometer trail ahead and I knew I was close to the main road. Soon I could hear the traffic. Once I made it to the road, I must have looked like I had been in a terrible accident. Blood from several small cuts from the falling and my clothes dirty. My bright runner shirt soon attracted the attention of a passing car. My waving and desperate shouting made it stop. The driver, a 40-ish man with his two kids in the back seat, spent the next 10 minutes or so trying to make sense of what I tried to say between the sobbing and the crying. He asked if I wanted to lift back to the parking lot and I told him no, please take me home instead. At home, my husband insisted on going to the parking lot to retrieve the car and calling the police. My husband went back for the car. The driver's seat window was smashed and my phone was gone. So was the photo of my daughter that I had been hanging from the mirror. I don't know what he was trying to do or why he chased me the way he did, but the look in his eyes, there was no doubt he had bad intentions. So creepy forest trail man, let's never meet again. This is a story from when I was 18, I'm 25 now. My mom and I were regular attendees of our local church. We both attended different midweek groups. I met with some of the younger ones and my mom went to one with some of the middle aged people. Anyway, my mom's group was about half a mile from our house and we didn't own a car so she would often walk there on our own. For the 7.30 start, this was fine in summers because it wasn't getting dark until around 9ish. When her group ended at 10, she would call me and I would start walking slash running to meet her to walk her home. We would usually meet not too far away from her group but we would always stay on the phone until we met. On the night in question, all was usual, she called, I got my trainers on, and locked the house and began jogging to meet her. I usually ran because it was good training for my rugby. In order to meet my mom, I had to cross up her local park and go through a dark patch of trees behind some of the local houses. It was usually just before these trees that we met. Anyway, I'm running and my mom's walking. We are talking about her evening and who was there when she suddenly says, Joe, hurry up, I think someone's following me. 
My heart rate goes through the roof and I start to panic, so I start sprinting still with some way to go until I meet her. I tell her to stay calm and keep her updated on my position. My mom is tough, but short. I hear my mom scream through the phone and also hear it in the distance ahead. Get away from me, what do you want? I don't have any money and you can have my phone if you want. This panicked me. I ran like I had never run before. The distance I had to cover usually took me a good 45 to 60 seconds to run, but I did it so much faster. By now I can see them in the distance. My mom's screams were piercing through me. I could see the guy has her by the hair and is dragging her about. She was fighting him all the way. I shouted get off of my mom and charged in. He was tall and lean but had hardly any weight to him. What happened next is something of a blur and only through me and my mom talking about it have we come to some conclusion on what really happened. And the guy's injuries of course. He saw me and immediately let go of her. She fell to the ground sobbing and tried to run. I caught him fairly easy and took him to the ground hard. My mom says I took him clean off the ground before smashing his head slash shoulder into the ground. He grunted and we rolled but I beat him up. It's at this point that I blank out but apparently I hopped over the guy, headbutted him and repeatedly beat his face. Someone from the houses behind had heard the screams and called the police. One guy from the street was a policeman and had come out to investigate. I remember him dragging me off the guy and it was then that I saw the blood and scratch marks on my arms. He had called me but I hadn't noticed it. The police arrived quickly and we had to be interviewed by them which is all still a bit blurry. Apparently the off duty cop had thought I was the attacker as I suppose anyone would have seen me beat up the guy. The guy was on their records as a thief. He had mugged a girl in town not that long before. When police interviewed him he claimed that he was just robbing her but I'm not sure. He's in prison now thankfully. You never think a bad stuff will happen to the ones you love until it happens. So, guy who attacked my mom, let's not ever meet again. In 2012, I worked at a tanning salon in a strip mall. It was across the street from a Walmart that was always crawling with strange people. The strip mall that my salon was located in was poorly lit at night. There was a sushi restaurant and an auto zone, but other than that, the other stores were vacant. We were open until 10pm while the other two businesses closed around 8 or 9. The salon was never overwhelmingly busy, so there was always only one person working at a time. My best friend also worked at the company, and the salon she worked at was a 50 minute drive from mine. This detail is important later. I'm a night owl, so I worked the 3 to 10 p.m. shift every weeknight. At some point in time, I started getting strange phone calls at 8 p.m. every night. It started off strange, but nothing to be alarmed about. The first time he called went something like this. Caller, hi, I am conducting a survey on women's shopping habits and I figured calling a tanning salon run by women would be a good place to start. We also send out a gift if you participate in our surveys. Okay, caller, do you typically wear jeans, yoga pants, leggings, skirts, shorts, or dresses? Feel free to list which of each you wear. Me, I wear all of those. Caller, great. Now when you wear dresses or skirts, do you ever wear pantyhose? Me, not unless it's winter. Caller, so how many tights or pantyhose do you own? Me, I have no idea, like five. Caller, that is great, so would you be interested in us sending you some free pantyhose? Me, I'm not really interested, I don't wear them enough to care. Caller, okay, totally understand. Would it be okay if I call you for a survey in the future? Me, sure. Caller, when do you typically work? Me, every weeknight. Caller, okay, great, talk soon. I shouldn't have given some random person my work schedule but they were already calling my job so there was no denying this person could find me if they wanted. Honestly, I didn't think anything weird about the call at the time. Later in the month we had a store meeting and the weekend sales associate said she had gotten a few weird calls from a guy breathing heavily and asking her questions. She didn't go into detail so I didn't make a connection. The next few times he called me it seemed normal enough. One survey was on skirts and skirt length and brands. The next was about dresses and their links and brands. He kept offering to send me pantyhose though. I kept telling him I don't wear them. He always said okay I just want to make sure I am offering them after every call as it is protocol. Then the last survey he called to have me do really scared me. Caller, when you wear dresses and skirts, do you wear panties? Me, yes. Caller, what material are they? Silk, satin, cotton, lace? Me, I'm not really comfortable with this. I think I'm done with the surveys. Caller, come on, I just want to know what you wear under that dress. I'll bring you some panties and nylons right now. Me, no thank you, please do not come here, goodbye. I hung up and freaked out. I called my friend at the other salon and told her about what just happened. She told me the same guy had been calling her location trying to talk to girls about pantyhose and panties too. She said he had even described to one girl what she was doing while she was on the phone with him. The salon she worked at had glass front windows with a desk facing toward the window. My salon also had a glass store front with the desk face the wall. 
The next few nights were not great. He realized we weren't picking up the calls anymore unless he blocked the number. We had to answer blocked calls because if it was another customer and they complained, we would be in trouble. He started changing up the time of night he called, spoofing numbers, etc. His calls were getting creepier and creepier. Heavy breathing, telling us what we were wearing, saying he was picturing our panties. Really creepy stuff. I was afraid to be at work. I made sure to be on the phone with my friend from the other salon every night for my last hour or so. One day though, the calls just stopped. My salon had a waiting area by the desk when you walked in and then it had a very long hallway with 20 rooms. The last two rooms were the spray tan rooms which needed to be sprayed down each night at close. At the very end of the hallway was a door leading to the dumpsters in the back. To the left of that door was the washer and dryer for used towels and such. This particular night, 20 minutes to close, a weird guy walked in. I had the most intense feeling that this was the creep. I acted normal and asked him his last name. I've never been here before. Okay. I explained to him how much a single tan on a regular night cost, like $24. I explained our packages, etc., but I knew my words were falling on deaf ears. He just stared at me with his mouth wide open, breathing heavily. He asked for the most basic bed for 5 minutes. Okay, huge red flag. Why even come in? I put him in the bed and immediately got on the phone with my friend from the other salon. She was the manager at her salon so she decided to close shop early and race over to me just in case I needed her. I had the back door propped open as it was hot in the salon and I wanted to get a cross breeze going while I cleaned the rooms. The dryer was also running which could have impacted my hearing. I was in one of the rooms near the front sweeping when I realized it had been 15 minutes and I hadn't heard this guy walk toward the front door yet. I had hoped he would just leave while I was sweeping up in a room so I wouldn't have to deal with him. So I go down the hall to listen outside the room he was in. The room was empty, he clearly had not used the bed as there were no marks or anything and the glass remained clean. I called out to see if he was still in the salon. Sir, no response. I called my friend so fast. I had a horrible feeling of dread. Where are you? I yelled into the phone. I'm pulling up, relax. Did he leave yet? She asked. I frantically explained to her what happened and told her loudly so he would hear if he was still in the store. Bring your bat. My friend comes in about three minutes later with a steel bat. Together we started going in rooms one by one. When we got to the sixth room, we heard the back door slam shut hard. We ran to it and locked it. We still checked the other rooms, but we both knew what had happened. He had been hiding in one of the empty rooms and bolted when he realized what we were doing. I don't know what the guy's plans were for me that night, but I'm also thankful my friend was there to save me. So, tanning salon perv, let's not meet. About seven years ago, when I was 17, my parents were out of town for a weekend and left me at home. This is a pretty common occurrence. My parents trusted me. I would usually spend these weekends away staying with friends or family, as my parents' house is a bit creepy to be alone in, even during the day. We live in a small rural town where everyone knows each other, and generally it's pretty quiet and pretty safe. Saturday I was supposed to stay with a friend, but her parents decided at the last minute not to let me stay. It wasn't a big deal that I had to leave, I was somewhat prepared to have to go home because her parents got weird about company sometimes. I left her house, which is about 15 minutes away from my parents' house, at around 9.30 or 9.45. While I was on the way home, I got a weird feeling that I can't really explain. I just knew that I didn't want to go stay at my parents alone. I called my brother and asked if I could stay with him. At the time, he was living with a woman who had a small child. He told me it would be quieter and easier for him to just come stay with me, since his dog would bark if I tried to come in the house. He said he would be at our parents' house in 20 minutes. After hanging up, I decided to stop at a gas station and grab a snack before going home so that my brother would be there when I got there. I pulled into the gas station. There were only a few cars in the lot, which is typical because this is a small town in the rural south where everything pretty much stops after 8pm. I parked and walked up to the door. There was a man standing outside the door smoking. He opened the door for me without saying anything. This is normal southern hospitality. I smiled and thanked him. Inside there was another man standing by the door. I noticed him staring at me as soon as I came in. He gave me that gross up and down look and said something to the effect of, Hey, what are you doing alone? Creepy. I just ignored him and walked towards the back of the store. He yelled after me and called me a name. I still ignored him, I figured he was drunk or high, or just a jerk. Most people around here talk a big game but rarely back it up. I wasn't scared, just annoyed. I got my snacks and paid at the counter. When I walked back up to the door, both of the men were gone. I was happy to not have to deal with any more catcalling. I began walking across the lot towards my car, which was probably around 100 feet away from my door. As I was walking, I looked down on my phone to see if enough time had passed for my brother to be at my parents. When I looked up, the guy who had hit on me was standing at the pump staring. I looked at him for a second and continued walking. Hey, you know you're supposed to answer a man when he speaks to you, he said. I remember saying something snarky back to him and getting in my car. He looked pissed at my sarcasm. I locked my doors as soon as I was in the car, started it, It was thinking of nothing but getting home to eat my snacks and hang out with my brother. I put my car in gear and realized the man had disappeared. 
I looked around before pulling out of my parking spot only to realize that both men were sitting in a car facing mine across the lot. They were both staring at me and talking, occasionally even pointing toward me. I just stared at them, defiant and pissed. I didn't want them to think they scared me at all. While we were sitting having our staring contest, the man who had opened the door for me smiled and gave me the finger across the throat gesture, as in, you're dead. I rolled my eyes and pulled out the gas station, annoyed. To my dismay, they pulled out behind me. I hadn't been scared up until this point because, as I said, most people here are a lot of talk with no follow through. Instead of going home, I took a few back roads that connect back in a sort of circle to see if they were really following me, which of course they were. When they realized I was testing them, they drove up really close to me and started laying on the horn. I couldn't see their headlights, they were so close. I called my brother and told him what was going on. He told me to come home and he would handle it. I started driving home. The two guys were still in my car blowing the horn. Even with my detours, I was only about 3-4 to four minutes from my parents house. I slowed down to pull in the driveway and was immediately relieved. At the end of my driveway, my brother was standing hands crossed in front of his stomach, clearly holding a pistol. I drove around him into the yard. The two guys actually started to pull in behind me until they saw my brother, then they hightailed it out of there. I have no idea what they would have done if I had stopped somewhere alone or kept driving. I'm thankful my brother was there. This past New Year's Eve, I went away for the night with my two best friends and one of their moms. I was home for the holidays from college, and my friend Sarah invited me to go to Palm Springs to celebrate New Year's with her mom and our friend Rachel. I didn't have any other plans, so I decided to go with them. We went to a cool city about an hour from where we live that is big on shopping and resorts. We planned to have a pretty calm night, watch the ball drop at a block party thing downtown, have a few drinks at a bar. Since we're on the west coast, the ball drop is at 9, so at around 8, we ventured from our hotel, walking to the block party about a mile away. On the way, we passed by a very lively bar. We decided to stop by and spend 15 minutes dancing, but didn't get any drinks. We continued on to the block party, get some dinner, a glass of champagne. The ball dropped and they had a DJ, so we spent about an hour there dancing. After we got tired of it, we decided to head back to the bar and hang out there until midnight. Once we get there, Sarah's mom pays for a drink for each of us, but leaves soon after that because she was tired. It's about 10.30 at this point and Sarah, Rachel, and I are enjoying our drinks and having fun dancing. Rachel tried some of my drink since it was the one she hadn't had before. I went back to the bar to get a second drink and that's the last thing I remember. The rest I've gathered from Sarah and Rachel. Almost immediately after getting my second drink, I asked Rachel to go to the bathroom with me because I wasn't feeling well, even though I was completely fine 10 minutes before. Once in the bathroom, I just collapsed on the floor, and I was almost unresponsive. Rachel now worried, somehow drags my half-lifeless body out to where Sarah was waiting for us. Security, seeing my condition and assuming I was wasted, asked us to leave. Sarah and Rachel decided to take me back to the hotel about a half a mile away. By this point, I was unconscious and there were barely any sounds escaping from my mouth. They saw someone leave the bar at the same time as us, who was walking near us, but they were preoccupied with trying to keep my lifeless body off the ground. At one point, I threw up all over myself, the both of them, and the sidewalk, etc. The next part of the story we had to get from Sarah, and Rachel doesn't have any memory of this. Still struggling to carry me, the man they saw leave the bar approached them. He was hitting on Rachel, trying to get her to go grab a drink with him. She was very agitated and told him to leave. Her friend needed help right now. He didn't take no for an answer and continued to follow us down the street, asking if they wanted to get drinks with him, if he could help carry me and such. A middle-aged woman witnessing this came up and told the man off. Something along the lines of, stop harassing these young women or I'm going to call the police. He left after that. Next, by some miracle, an EMT and his wife that joined the holiday ran into us on the street. He checked me out to make sure something wasn't majorly wrong and then carried me the rest of the way to my hotel and into the room, since my friends could barely hold me up. They thanked him profusely and him and his wife left. This is where Rachel's memory kicks back in. Five minutes later, they get a knock on the door, and it's the EMT and his wife again. They came to let us know that a man followed us to the hotel, and they just saw him pop the gate and start to make his way to our room. My friends called hotel security, but they were unable to find him. My friends didn't get a glimpse of him, but I'm sure it was the same man from earlier. I spent the rest of the night vomiting everything in my body, and dry heaving after that. I woke up the next morning in a pile of pillows and blankets on the bathroom floor. My last memory was at the bar getting a second drink, and my friends filled me in on everything that had happened. Feeling bad, I thought I must have drank way too much, but I had never blacked out before in my life. And the amount of drinks I had, two and two hours, since I didn't get to drink my second at the bar, didn't add up to me being completely unconscious. We decided my first drink had to have been drugged, since Rachel had some of it and had no memory of our walk home, even though she was fully functional. I'm sure that man that was talking to Rachel and then followed us back was the one that slipped something in my drink. To this day, I don't really know how it could have been slipped something. I got my drink from the bar and never set it down. My best guess was that it was already in the cup. Thankfully, I had good friends and kind strangers protecting me that night. 
This happened back when I was in 4th grade. It's always stuck out to me as odd, but when I became an adult, it dawned on me just how dangerous it was. I had been invited to a friend's birthday party, which was to be held at a popular pizza joint that had a bunch of arcade games and stuff. This pizza place was right next door to a small movie theater, and the movie Titanic just had come out, so there was a decent amount of people in this part of the shopping center. My mom had to run some errands to pick up one of my other brothers, so she dropped me off along the way. She said she was going to stay until others arrived for the party, but I knew she had a lot to do. The place was familiar to me, and I knew my friends were either already inside or would be there shortly, so I just told her to drop me off and I went inside. My mom had also arranged a ride home for me from one of my friend's parents. No one had gotten there yet, so I had to look around at the different games and then went outside the restaurant to wait for my friends to show up. There were a bunch of people outside the theater, lined up waiting to get inside for the early evening showing of Titanic. That's when I noticed that a couple, a guy and a girl, were standing by a car smoking cigarettes and looking over at me. A chunk of time had passed, probably like 20 minutes, and I was super confused why my friends hadn't showed up yet. I knew for a fact that I was at the right place and that I showed up at the right time. I was going over all the reasons why they might be late when the cigarette smoking couple came over to me and started talking to me. They asked me what or who I was waiting for. Obviously at first, I was hesitant to talk to strangers, but they looked to be my oldest brother's age, late teens, early 20s, so I had been around older people and wasn't too bashful or shy around them, conversationally. I explained to them I was waiting for my friends to show up for my birthday party, but they hadn't showed up yet, and they were all pretty late. The couple made some other small talk, they told me they were wanting to see Titanic, but when they showed up, all the tickets had sold off for the showing they wanted, so they were just going to hang out until the next showing, which they had successfully gotten tickets for. After a little while longer of waiting and talking with this couple, they asked if I was hungry. I said I was, and they offered to buy me pizza. As a hungry kid who was seriously looking forward to pizza, but was unsure if the party was still going to happen, I wasn't about to pass it up. We went inside and ordered and sat down. I ended up hanging out with this couple for a long time. They were being super nice to me, gave me money for the arcade games, bought me as much pizza and soda as I wanted. I had almost completely forgot about my friends and the party that was supposed to happen, until I saw what time it was. Almost two hours had passed, and I started to get pretty nervous slash anxious. I wasn't sure how I was going to get home. I didn't have a cell phone, this was 1997, and neither did my parents. My mom would be furious that A, no one showed up to the party, and B, I didn't seek out help from the restaurant or some kind of security guard or police officer, and C, I'd spend the two last hours with strangers, accepting food and money from them. I decided to ask this couple what I should do. This is where things started to get really strange. The guy turned to me and said flatly, you don't need to go home. Thinking back, I definitely couldn't fully comprehend the weight of what he said. I didn't know what to say, so I kind of shrugged in confusion and said I needed to find a phone. I went up to the counter and asked if I could use their phone, and they let me. I called home, but no one answered. I tried again, still nothing. I then told the people at the counter that I was trying to get picked up, but no one was answering the phone at home. I must have looked pretty panicked, because just then the guy from the couple came over and put his hand on my shoulder and said, don't worry, we'll get this figured out. He then gave me some more money to play a few more arcade games while he figured it out with the guys behind the counter. No idea what they talked about specifically, but I ended up playing another game and then went back to the table we were at. The guy came back over and said that they were going to take me home. He was being super positive and upbeat about it and was insisting that it was no problem whatsoever. His girlfriend was also being very insistent and supportive of the idea. Part of me was super hesitant because I was taught stranger danger and all that, but the other part of me was wanting to believe it was all really innocent and I was really grateful that these people had been so nice to me, fed me, and kept me entertained. They had even missed their movie to stay with me. I said that I wanted to try calling home a few more times. So over the next 15 to 20 minutes, I tried calling home a bunch but there was still no answer. I decided that I would say yes to these people and have them take me home. Again, I was young, impressionable, naive, etc. The people behind the counter must have been seeing this from the more rational side and realized something seriously fishy was going on. One of them had gone on break and called the police to come over and address the situation. Policeman shows up and comes over to figure out what's going on. I don't remember everything about the conversation, but what it ended up coming down to was who was going to take me home. The couple was still really insistent. Thinking about this as an adult, I find it strange that the cop was even considering letting this whole thing to be an option. As an adult, there is no question in my mind that the cops should have shut the conversation down and taken me home, but for some odd reason, they let me decide. I felt like I was being pressured. I remember going back and forth in my mind. These people had been so nice to me and had hung out with me and I didn't want to be rude, and I also felt really intimidated by the police officer. I remember this part as if it was yesterday. As I was thinking, the cop went over to talk to some of the guys behind the counter, and while he was away, the guy from the couple looked at me with a smile and asked, do you want to go with him or us? 
I told him I would go with them. Again, in hindsight, I still can't believe the cop let this happen. As we were getting our things to go, the officer did say that he was going to follow us the whole way, which was a redemptive assurance. The officer asked for my address and my parents' names. I got in the couple's car and told them where I lived and we were on our way. The girl was driving and the guy was in the front passenger seat. The entire drive, the guy was looking over his shoulder out the back window, glancing back and forth between me and the cop following behind us. We pulled up to my house and I went up to the front door while both the couple and the cop were parked on the street. Opened the door, went inside, and saw that my mom was looking out the window with a very confused and concerned look on her face. She went outside and found out all that had happened. It was furious. I didn't tell her the specific things that the couple had said to me. Again, I didn't understand the full gravity of the whole situation until years later. Going through the whole scenario in my head, if the cop hadn't followed us, I more than likely would have been abducted. Thinking about all the things that they had said and done, befriending me and feeding me and giving me money to play games, was them totally trying to come across as disarming and trusting and friendly. A totally screwed up situation that could have been so much worse. Hard to think about. I'm almost 30 now and have kids of my own and thinking about them in this kind of situation makes my blood boil. At about 8pm last night I was walking with a friend of mine, Sally, about a mile to the closest cafe. We're both girls in our early 20s, neither of us own cars, and Sally didn't have her Opal card, which is an automatic ticketing system for public transport. So walking was our only option. It's summer over here, so it was still fairly well lit and we were walking down main roads so we weren't too concerned. We finally arrived at this cafe and sit down. I was paying but I only had my credit card and sure enough, it was cash only. Sally was on the phone when I got back from the counter, so I just gestured for her to stay put and guard the spot while I went to go get cash. This is my home suburb so I know there's no ATMs around and my best bet is a gas station about a block away. I'm doing a light jog so I don't keep Sally waiting and when a balding, sweating guy probably in his late 40s with a tank top and no shoes come pacing behind me as I pass the corner of the block. He walks behind me for about 100 meters. I didn't really think much of it. The gas station was the next building along. It seemed like he had just come out of a nice suburban house along the street and it wasn't the witching hour so I just assumed he was going to the station like me. He didn't even cross my mind as I entered the tiny convenience store, nor did he follow me in. In my peripheral, I saw him walk past the door and out of sight. I looked around for an ATM they sometimes have inside. No such luck, so I go up to this man in his 30s at the desk and reluctantly ask if they're able to do cash out. He smiles and says, of course, and then asks, is he with you? I have no idea who he's talking about at first, and then he points to the man from earlier, pacing around outside the store. Keep in mind, he didn't look at all menacing. He wasn't going back and forth just outside the door. He was drifting in the space outside, from the pavement to the gas pumps to the storefront seemingly aimlessly. I assumed he was on drugs. I tell the clerk no, not thinking much of it at all. He says, oh, he was staring at you before. I thought he might have been your dad. I laugh it off. I honestly wasn't concerned at all. He was still ambling around outside and I couldn't imagine him having a fixed gaze on anything. I thank the clerk for the cash, but before I turn away to leave, he says, just wait and see if he leaves first. We wait for a few minutes in silence and the guy begins to pace back and forth directly against the front wall of the store, looking straight ahead and never into the store. It still looked like the man was just on a drug-induced amble and seemed harmless. Not once did I catch his gaze, so I figured it would be safe to just slip out the door and walk back to the cafe in the fairly bright light of dusk, especially since Sally was texting me at this point asking, where are you? I thank the guy at the desk once again for his concern and assure him that I don't know the guy and I'm not involved in some weird scheme to rob the store and head for the door. The clerk asks if I want him to walk out with me, I say that I should be alright, and begin walking away from the block. As I leave the store, the drifting man stops pacing and makes a beeline for me from the other end of the building. I seriously didn't think much of the guy at all until this point but for the first time he was briskly walking in a straight line towards me. The hairs on the back of my neck stand up and I start power walking so that he doesn't think I'm actively trying to escape him, still trying to convince myself that I'm just being paranoid and should be more casual. I don't look behind me to see how close he is. I've reached the pavement on the other side of the gas pumps when I heard the clerk run outside. He's yelling at me, go, run, run. I make a break for it, looking over my shoulder. He's grabbed the man by his shoulders from behind. The baldy man isn't even glancing behind him or trying to escape. He's just watching me run away. I keep running until I've crossed the road and then turn around, standing still. The clerk is still holding onto the odd, staring man. The clerk and I are just looking at each other in bewilderment, not really knowing what to do. He makes a hand gesture to go and I gesture my hands thanks, you know, to clasp your hands together and shake them a bunch of times. I got back to Sally with the cash and bought food, before walking back home a different way. Overall, odd guy at the gas station, let's not me. Nice gas station attendant who went well out of his way to help my naive self, I'm definitely glad we met. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. 
I was selling my old car as I had bought a new one. I posted it on a couple of selling sites and Facebook. I arranged two visits that day and was home alone. It was broad daylight so I assumed everything would be fine. The first one that came made an offer a little lower than what I was looking for so I said I would get back to him later as I had another viewing. The guy from Facebook pulled up in a blacked out Range Rover and three other guys got out. I opened the car and explained why I was selling the car. You know when you just get a bad feeling? I wasn't sure why four people would need to come view an eight year old car. He asked if he could take the car for a drive. At this point, I was not going to get in the car with him so I said, yeah, take it, I'll wait here with your friends. He asked me to get in the car. What if you just took it? I said, well, it wouldn't matter. That's what insurance was for. I was not getting in the car with them. The three guys left and didn't even speak to me, just to themselves, and I found that odd, but it made me feel very unsure if the car would come back. The car was not putting up a fight for or arguing over. He then pulled back up. He got out and offered the same price as the other guys earlier buying the car for his daughter. He wanted me to get in the car with him to go collect the cash. I said it was fine, his friends could take him if he needed to go, but I had another viewing and I would contact him later. I didn't want to walk back to my house as I had not decided to sell to the other guy as they were just giving me the creeps. He then offered more than honestly the car was worth if I went with him now. I said no and locked the car and started walking towards the main street as I had seen my neighbor walking down and shouted to him and his dog. They spoke to each other and drove off. I texted the other guy and told him the car was his and he was welcome to come over anytime to get it. I sorted and filled out the V5 and off he went. That night from my living room the Black Range Rover came back and parked outside. I live in a cul-de-sac so I am set back to where we had been. I told my husband and he looked out and he said that was strange and then my phone started blowing up. I politely said the car had gone and that I was sorry but I couldn't help. The car drove off and came back again 30 minutes later. This happened about 3 times that night and was a bit strange but thought nothing more of it as the next few days nothing happened. On the Friday 4 days later I finished work early and get back and get the dog ready to go out. We were going to head straight to the park and run like the wind. As I got to the end of the cul-de-sac the same car pulled up and one of the guys jumped out and said hello. I held the lead tighter and my dog was thoroughly unimpressed. She gave a bit of a grumble and he asked if he could pet her. I said no she is a guard dog and doesn't like to be touched and went to walk up to me. He then grabbed my arm and the dog latched into his forearm. He was screaming there was only one other guy with him in the car and he jumped out and started to shout. This is the most placid and loving dog you will ever see and to be honest it was a warning nip as if she had meant to really hurt him she would have gone through the bone. His friend was shouting and pulling him away. I called her back and got her to sit with a few neighbors and came out when they went towards their car. I haven't seen their car since but honestly I wouldn't sell something that meant someone had to come to my home online again. So a stranger who clearly wasn't interested in the car, let's never meet again. When I was 11, we, my single mom, 9 year old sister, and 6 year old brother moved into a beautiful, older, craftsman style house. I heard it was around 80 years old back then in 1994. Soon after we moved in, we found out it was infested with cockroaches. I never seen anything like it. We'd turn on the lights at night and they'd scatter from every surface. We had to store all of our food that wasn't canned in the fridge so they wouldn't get into it. We tried bug bombs and professional exterminators numerous times with no effect. Those things really can survive a nuclear war. Anyway, they weren't the reason we lived in the house less than a year before fleeing for our lives. I remember my mom discussing at our next door neighbor's creepy son with my grandma. He was in his 20s or 30s. She'd been doing dishes one day and looked up to see him standing directly on the other side of the kitchen window, staring in at her. Normally, she would have kept something scary like this from us kids, but about at that time, she told us to tell her if we ever saw him near the house and we weren't allowed to play outside. So one afternoon we were all doing some spring cleaning when my brother said he found a cigarette butt in the upstairs toilet. Weird, since nobody in our family smokes. Being a dumb little six year old, he flushed it before telling our mom. I still remember her trying to get the entire story out of him, being upset that the evidence was gone and thinking he might have been mistaken or maybe he'd picked up a butt somewhere outside of curiosity. She soon dropped it and we mostly forgot about it. I think it was a few weeks later. My brother was spending the night at our grandparents and my sister and I were the only ones upstairs. Our mom's bedroom was downstairs. My sister heard a sound like a screen door slamming, but she insisted it came from in the house and she was freaked out. I told her it was just from outside and to go to sleep. A minute later, we heard a strangled cough coming from just outside our bedroom door, a man's cough, and sounded like he was trying to keep from making noise. I whispered that we needed to get downstairs. We sneaked out of the room and I had the irrational urge to turn on the light in the bathroom, which was just across the hall from our bedroom, and check to see if anyone was there. Then just as strong of a feeling to get away from the bathroom and get downstairs now. The scariest moment of my life was when we were creeping down the stairs in the pitch black. It was a spiral enclosed stairway with walls, the perfect place for someone to hide. The stairway light was burned out and the wood steps were creaky, so it was terrifying making our way down. We got downstairs and woke up our mom, panicked that there was a guy upstairs in our bathroom. 
She started to tell us to go back to bed, but could see we were seriously scared. She went over to the bottom of the stairway to go up and shows that there was nothing to be scared about. Then she just has strong of a feeling to close the stairway door and lock it now. She did, called the cops, they found nothing and didn't really take us seriously. The next day, she called a PD detective friend of hers from high school to come over and inspect the house. Remembering the cigarette butt in the toilet, she had him look at the upstairs bathroom window. It was a high, narrow rectangular window. Not very big, but just wide enough for a person. Who knows how many times the intruder climbed our roof to get in and was upstairs while we were sleeping across the hall. The window swung up on hinges. When my mom's friend let the window drop, it sounded like a screen door slamming. He said the locks on all the windows were so old they were practically useless, and we needed to get out of the house immediately. We moved into my grandparents' house that day. When my mom went with her brothers a few days later to pack up some things, a back door had been smashed open, but nothing in the house was disturbed. A few years later, we heard the neighbor's son was arrested for attempted murder. I still wonder what might have happened if I turned on that bathroom light, if my mom didn't lock the stairway door, or if we didn't leave the house when we did. Backstory, my wife and I don't live together. She had become abusive over the last few months, mostly towards our daughter. Our daughter is almost 18 months old and is my whole world. I am unemployed at the moment, but my mother had been helping me out a lot. Today at around 4 p.m., I took my daughter to the store. I usually do this around the time she wakes up from her nap. My daughter is a very active child and can't seem to sit still for more than 10 minutes without getting cranky. I usually let her walk with me, holding her hand and patiently walking at her pace. I usually get just a juice for her, but had to get some extra groceries that I was short on. Flour, sugar, and some noodles. I also remembered we were low on milk and grabbed a gallon on our way back. With all that I was carrying, I wasn't able to hold her hand. I made sure to walk behind her, but that only makes her walk slowly. As we made our way to the registers, I was continuously urging her to keep walking, which she would do, but only for a second before her attention would be drawn to another rickety box with whatever was on sale, or she would see something colorful on a lower shelf. I was getting a bit frustrated, but I wasn't showing it in my voice. I kept urging her to keep walking, and she kept getting sidetracked. With everything I was carrying, I started to wish I had grabbed a basket. At the front, their customer service desk holds register 1, which was thankfully open. I want to take the time to mention that my daughter is very fond of saying hi and waving at everyone. I set everything up to get rung up, but the service attendant was busy with the return of the customer service area, so I had to wait. The entrance to the store is to my right, the only exit door is behind the service desk, which leads into the small foyer before leading to the other doors. As people enter, they have to pass the customer service desk. I was being fatherly to my daughter, trying to entertain her with patty cake and the itsy bitsy spider, while we waited for the cashier to check us out. My daughter would frequently wave at people passing and say hi in her squeaky toddler voice. Some people would smile and wave back, while others would stop to adore her. At this point, I'm used to people doing that. The lady was ready to check us out, and I told my daughter to hold my hand, since I wouldn't be looking her way. I had to pull my wallet out to retrieve my debit card to pay for the groceries and let her hand go for a moment. I kept looking her way to make sure she wasn't wandering off. The lady went to hand me my receipt when she all of a sudden yelled at someone behind me. What are you doing with this daughter? She bellowed as I turned to look at a man who had picked her up and started running towards the entrance doors. I was shocked. The doors didn't open since they were a one-way set of doors, and the cashier quickly picked up the phone yelling that she was calling the police. I was stunned to the point of immobilization, but quickly realized what was going on. I have a pocket knife that I usually carry on me so I can break the seal on my daughter's juice. I quickly ran after the man as someone started to make their way through the entrance doors. He didn't get a chance to run through though because I slammed my fist across his temple. I decided to not use the knife in case I might get in trouble. The man stumbled and I grabbed my daughter from his arms. He then proceeded to run out the door empty handed. The police arrived about 5 minutes later and asked me what I had seen. I explained that I hadn't seen the man's face since he had long hair and a beard. He was also wearing a hoodie, which wasn't that much of a surprise. They took the statement of several witnesses, including the cashiers, and had already had other officers searching the area. Someone had said the guy had ran behind the building, but the officers didn't find anyone. The police took us home and then asked more questions like, have you seen him before? Do you know anyone who looks like this man? And they proceeded to ask about the home life. CPS had been over earlier in the day to discuss my wife's mental health plan, and the police had been here earlier as well. The officers asked if we needed any groceries or anything. I told them no. The officers left, leaving me their cards in case I saw the guy around the area. About 20 minutes later, I got a knock at the door. To my surprise, the officers had returned with the largest box of Pampers diapers I had ever seen. A large box of wipes, about 6 large Winko bags of groceries, and a couple bag of toys. They had left us with a Christmas card saying I was a strong father to have had so much go on recently and that my daughter was lucky to have such a great father. There was a $100 bill in the car too, wrapped in a note that said to get a drink or two if I needed it. I don't drink so I'll probably get some extra Christmas presents for my mom and daughter. So, to the guy that tried to kidnap my daughter, I hope the police find you. 
Close to 10 years ago, my best friend and I scored the deal of the century. Living her parents recently purchased and refurbished home for cheap as Chip's rent so the property wasn't considered unoccupied and their insurance still covers it. They were planning on selling their house in the country and moving closer to town in a year. But when they spotted this place, it was perfect, so they snapped it up. They couldn't be bothered dealing with random tenants for a year, so we offered it. It was a lovely old mid-Victorian-style house with a hallway running the majority of the link on the left side, and three bedrooms and a bathroom coming off the hallway to the right. At the back of the house was an open-plan living room and kitchen in a backyard. It was an inner Melbourneian suburb, so it was totally fenced in with six-foot fence on three sides, and the front had a cutesy white picket fence. On the right side of the property, an outdoor gravel pathway was wedged beside the bedroom walls and the fence line. It began with a gate in the front yard and ran the length of the property to the backyard. This is important later. My friend obviously scored the master bedroom at the front, with lovely vertically opening bay windows facing the front garden and street. I had the next bedroom, with the window facing the gravel path slash fence, and the third bedroom was our study. We lived here for close to 10 months in bliss, great house, great company, and even though the area was considered a little dicey, the location was stellar. One hot summer night, we said our goodnights, and I went to bed and fell asleep immediately. My housemate stayed up in bed to read for a bit, with just her bedside light on. She was doing that just for an over an hour before she heard a weird scratch in the front window of her bedroom. Initially, she put it down to an overhanging tree branch, till she realized there was no overhanging tree branch. She sat frozen in fear, blankly staring at her book for what felt like an eternity, till she heard the noise again and again, scratch, scratch. Slowly looking up, she saw a dude wearing a hoodie trying to open her window, looking her dead in the eyes. She screamed, jumped out of bed, and ran straight into my room. I woke up super dazed as she was pulling my hand and whispered yelling that someone was trying to break in. She had a tendency to be a little overdramatic sometimes, but I swear I've never seen someone look so genuinely terrified. I went to grab my phone to call the cops, but we just went completely still when we heard the distinct crunch 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 of someone walking down the side path of the house. We both rolled off my bed onto the floor and went completely still. The crunch 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 continued, getting closer to my bedroom window. I don't know what it is about distinct sounds at night when it's otherwise quiet, but it sounded deafening. And then I realized why it was so loud. My window was wide open. I jumped up, slid the window down, and slammed the lock shut just as he reached the window. He looked at me, but he didn't react at all. He just calmly tried to open the window, but when he realized he couldn't, he continued down the pathway to the backyard. I was extremely terrified now, and my housemate was crying. I sprinted to the back door to thankfully find it locked, and ran back to my room and called the cops. I didn't know what the cops knew that we didn't, but they must have broken a land speed record to arrive all at 3 minutes later, lights and sirens off. We saw them go down the side path, guns drawn, straight to the backyard. There were some noises from the yard, then a knock at the back door a moment later and the police identified themselves. Turns out the dude had bolted the back fence, and another patrol car was headed to the next street over to look for him. The two cops at our place asked if we were okay, and then asked if they could come in and look around. They managed to calm us down whilst making sure the place was safe. They took her statements and they asked if there was anyone we could stay with tonight. My housemate and I stayed at our boyfriend's place for a few nights after that, and when we stayed in the house, it was never the same. We felt completely violated, and ended up moving out a few weeks later. We never found out if the dude was caught, but there was a random stabbing a few nights after the incident at the train station two streets over. If it was related or not, I don't know, but all I can think is that we were so lucky that it went the way it did. This happened way back in October of 2006. At the time, I was just a 19-year-old kid always on the lookout for adventure. One Friday night after wrapping up a shift at McDonald's, I met up with some of my friends who suggested we check out this haunted location called White's Bridge. My one buddy Brendan said he had recently learned about it and began telling us the legends associated with the 100 year old wood covered bridge. Never want to turn down a spooky experience, we all piled into my green Ford Taurus and headed out on our journey. Brandon gave directions, guiding me off the main road and within minutes we were on the dirt back roads, surrounded by woods and cornfields. Our only point of reference was a blinking cell tower off in the distance. We could tell we were getting further from the city as our cell phones began slowly losing service. As we rode deeper and deeper into what legitimately felt like the absolute middle of nowhere, Brandon repeated the legend associated with the bridge. Back in the early 1900s, a local farmer discovered that his beloved wife had been cheating on him, and in a fit of rage he killed her and her lover after discovering them in the act. After committing the cold-blooded murder, the farmer left his home and wandered the dirt roads in a daze. He eventually came upon White's Bridge where the realization of what he had done finally began to sink in, and deciding he would rather die than face the consequences of his actions, he hoisted a rope up and over one of the bridge's rafters and hung himself. As far as I could tell now, the story is complete fiction, but we totally believed it at the time. 
After a long and bumpy ride, Brandon instructed me to turn right on an off-road I wouldn't have even noticed was there had he not pointed it out. I took the turn and there before us was White's Bridge. It looked like something straight out of a horror film. An old wood-covered bridge, aged by time, sitting alone above a river deep in the middle of nowhere. We parked the car on the side of the road and got out to explore. Immediately catching our eyes was a scarecrow line abandoned at the entrance to the bridge. My friend Mike, who was known as somewhat of a risk taker, and a stupid one at that, picked up the scarecrow and lit it on fire. The hay body burst up into a ball of flames and Mike waved it around proudly next to the old dry wood bridge. Realizing the risk, I told him to throw the thing in the river and put it out, which thankfully he did. After making sure there weren't any rogue embers that could ignite the bridge, Brandon suggested we get back in the car and pull it onto the bridge. He explained that the legend was that if you parked your car in the middle of the bridge, put it in neutral and killed the engine, the spirit of the dead farmer would push the vehicle forward to get it off the bridge. Naturally, we had to try this. We piled back in and did exactly as he said. We parked halfway across the rickety old bridge and killed the engine. We sat in the pitch black, saying nothing, waiting for something, anything to happen. The only sounds were the creaking of the bridge, the river flowing beneath us, and footsteps? Suddenly, the back driver's side door opens and a woman abruptly enters the back seat, cramming in next to my two friends back there. She looked to be in her late 20s slash early 30s, long straight black hair, slim, and wearing a plaid shirt and blue jeans. It's been a while but this is essentially how I remember the conversation going. I saw your fire signal for me, she said. Uh, wait, what? I replied, totally freaked out and at a complete loss of words. I'm so glad you came. My boyfriend's car broke down down that way. I need a ride back. My brain was doing its best to compute the situation. I'm sorry, but who are you? I asked. What are you doing out here? I told you. She responded curtly. My boyfriend's car broke down over there. Can you please just give me a ride so I don't have to walk all the way back? She was pointing ahead, towards a narrow road that forked off to the right on the other side of the bridge. My friend Mike, the scarecrow burner, and never the gentleman added, I mean, if you need a place to stay, you're more than welcome to come crash at my place. I got plenty to drink and I interrupted him. No, lady, listen, I'm sorry. I don't know who you are. You just got in my car and this is all really weird. I'm sorry, but you have to get out. She glared at me in the rearview mirror. If looks could kill, I would have been done for, but you signal for me. She responded in an irritated tone. We weren't signaling for you. Get out. She let out an angry sigh and got out, walking back in the direction from which she came and disappearing into the night. I started the engine right up and looked at my friends. They all had looks of disbelief on their face. Without saying a word, I put the car in drive and slowly rolled forward and off the bridge. We needed to turn around and go back across the bridge to get to where we had come from, and the only way to do that was to pull onto the side road that the woman said her boyfriend's car had broken down on, and then reverse. As I pulled onto the side road, my headlights illuminated the three posted signs that I hadn't been able to see from the bridge. No trespassing, private property, and do not enter. Looking up the road, there was no sign of the woman. Wherever she went, it didn't appear she went that way. I didn't want to stick around though, so I backed up and crossed the bridge again, and from there began the journey home. We didn't have much to say on the ride home. I think we were all equally stunned, except for Mike, who asked if he knew anyone that would be awake at the salver that he could score some weed from. I visited White's Bridge a couple other times after that, but nothing of note happened in my subsequent visits. Sadly, some people burned down the old White's Bridge some years ago. It was rebuilt, but from what I hear, it's just not the same as the original. I don't have any plans to go and check it out. To the strange lady who entered my car out in the middle of nowhere at 2am, let's not meet. This happened in 2019. I was in my second year of college and living in a town home about a 10 minute walk from campus. I lived with two other girls at the time but they were all back at their parents house for the holiday. I work in healthcare and was working Christmas this year. A little bit of backstory, there used to be four of us living there but one girl had moved out due to issues with her boyfriend. He was a jerk who abused our kindness and allowing him to stay there, was only supposed to come every so often but basically ended up living there. We told her she needed to kick him out after an incident with him one night after he got physical with her and verbally abusive with the rest of us. She wouldn't listen and we told her we would have to talk to the landlord then. Long story short, she ended up moving out and left on bad terms with us. At this point, it was affecting everyone and we didn't feel safe with him there, etc., so she moved out. Okay, so back to the story. It was Christmas Eve and I worked the next day, so I was getting ready for bed. Locked the doors, turned the lights off, and went downstairs where my bedroom is. I was scrolling on my phone for about an hour. It was Christmas Day at this point, when I heard what sounded like the chairs in the kitchen move. The kitchen is right above my bedroom. I thought maybe I was hearing the neighbors next door as we share the same walls and sometimes they could be loud. But I remembered one of them texting me and asking me to bring in a package they were expecting while they were all gone at home. The noise was short lived so I brushed it off. Next thing I know, my bedroom door is being opened slowly. But my phone screen is lighting up my scared jaw drop face. So I can't act like I'm asleep. 
where I'm laying in bed faces directly to the door, so we're just looking right at each other. So there I was laying in my bed while this guy has one foot in my bedroom with the door cracked open. It felt like an eternity, but in reality it was probably more than like 10 seconds of us looking at one another. He slowly takes his foot out and closes my door. I sit there just in complete utter shock. I couldn't make out what he looked like as my eyes were adjusting to the dark again from the phone screen. All I could see was a backwards baseball cap. I knew I had to call the police, but my anxious self knew if I called, it would alert my parents' phones that I called. Me being dumb, I was like, well, I don't want to make them worry. Also, I was scared he might still be somewhere in the house, and I didn't know what he would do if he heard me call. So I text the guy I was seeing at the time and tell him, some random guy just broke into my house and came into my room. He snaps me out of it and told me to call the police, and so I did. The dispatcher asked me if I felt comfortable to go unlock the front door for them so they didn't have to break it down, and I told her no way I don't care if the door is broken, I'm not going up there alone. A couple minutes later I see flashlights shining through my window. I hear the police knocking at the door and announcing themselves. They got in and asked me where I was. They came out of my room and they came and got me. They told me to wait on the back porch while two of them searched the house and one stayed with me. They didn't find anyone and I said nothing looked like it had been taken. They even tried to get fingerprints but were unsuccessful. They then started asking me questions and informed me that the back door was unlocked and had no signs it had been broken. I told them I had locked it. Luckily the guy I was talking to stayed with me that night but I still couldn't sleep. I kept having to go check every inch of the house over and over. I placed chairs under the door handles on the front door, back door, and my bedroom. The next day I informed our landlord and she refused to come out and change the locks, and she never ended up changing them for the rest of the time we lived there. Every time I go to bed now, I triple check all the doors have been locked, doesn't matter where I am. I have a dog now and he helps my anxiety of intruders, as well as a recent purchase of a ring doorbell. I believe it was our old roommate's boyfriend. I think they may have made an extra key for him because he was basically living there, but I don't understand why he didn't do anything to me, the house, or our belongings. If it were someone random, I don't know why they wouldn't have done what they intended and that could be many different possibilities. I don't know what their intentions were that night, but to the man who broke into my house on Christmas Eve, let's not meet again. Over the summer, me, my fiance, and my stepdaughter, then two years old, went on a vacation to Presque Isle in Pennsylvania. We stayed there throughout the afternoon and decided to get dinner in a nearby town, Erie, Pennsylvania. We go there and see a water fountain that kids play in. We think our kid would like that, so we get food and take her there. Now, it was kind of a pretty sketchy area, but there were also kids and it was still a little light out, like 6.30, 7pm ish. Me and my fiance sit down and watch our kid play for a bit. At some points, our kid wants me to run in the water with her, so I do. I kind of keep going back and forth between playing with her and keep Keeping my fiance company. After playing with my kid for a while, I come back to my fiance. She looked kind of pale and said, Go get our kid. We need to leave right now. I didn't know what was going on, but I got my kid. As I was turning to go back and get her, I noticed a group of about three really weird guys staring intently at us. When I looked over, one of them stood up a little bit and was giving me a stare. I grab up her kid and start following my fiance who is booking it. As we were walking away, she tells me that somebody is following us now. I look over and see the creepy looking, a shirtless dude getting into his old, beige sedan behind us. My fiance explains to me that the same man kept approaching her whenever I would get up to run around with her kid. At first he introduced himself and tried talking to her. She thought he was being benign but just trying to hit on her. When I came back he apparently bolted. I sat with her for a couple of minutes and then went back to play with her kid. Apparently as soon as I went he returned. He asked her if she was married to me. She said that we were going to be hoping that it was the end of that. He goes away before I came back to sit with her again. The third and final time I go to play with her kid he apparently came back. He told her that she thought she was a beautiful lady and asked if that was her daughter pointing to our kid. My fiance said yes and the guy said that our kid was also a beautiful lady and that his night was going to be made, whatever that means. Q and I come in and we book it. We're walking back to our car which is kind of far away. Erie in general was pretty abandoned outside of the park and we notice the car pull out and start driving extremely slowly in a street parallel to us. At this point, I don't think he knew we saw him. My fiance is freaking out and I tell her to wait near the vestibule of a closed Starbucks where we weren't in this guy's vision. We stayed there for about 5 minutes and I was watching the roads, not seeing anything. We continue walking but are still on high alert. I find my car parked outside of a McDonald's and we're now power walking to it holding our kid. I look behind and lo and behold the same beige car going at 3 miles per hour just barely inches out from the side street so I can see it. As my fiance and the kid are getting in, I turn around and stand at the back of the car and shoot this guy the death stare. After looking at his car for about 10 seconds solid, he peels out and speeds off past us nearly hitting me. Not sure what this guy's problem was, I assume that he wasn't tailing us for any good reason. Afterwards, I bring up the three guys that were staring at me. My fiance said that the pervert following us was sitting with them when he wasn't coming over to her and saying creepy stuff. 
During college, I dated a fairly well-known and talented local musician named Tim. In the beginning, he was a loving, attentive, charismatic, seemingly normal partner. He made me mixtapes, cooked me my favorite meals, and dedicated songs to me at open mics around town. However, over the course of our year-long relationship, his mental health severely declined. He had the ability to appear lucid and normal around other people, but in private he began suffering delusions, compulsively lying, and creating art that focused on themes of murder. I was worried sick and his condition was exhausting, but I did my best to be kind, understanding, and supportive. I loved him and believed that he shouldn't have to struggle with this mental illness alone. One time he vanished without a trace for a full day. I found his apartment empty, lights on, front door wide open, phone on his nightstand. I took a few deep breaths and called all around the city for hours before finally discovering he had been involuntarily checked into a mental hospital. I did my best to be strong for him, seeing him every day during supervised visitation hour, bringing him his favorite books to pass the time, and holding him as he sobbed that it was all a mistake, that he did not belong there. It was surreal to see my boyfriend surrounded by visibly insane long-term psych ward patients. In retrospect, none of the staff ever told me the real reason why he was there, and I was too polite and naive to ask. Our relationship ended a few months later. I found undeniable evidence that he was cheating on me and, secretly relieved, confronted him. I told him to leave my apartment and never come back. He cracked. The gentle Tim I had known and loved melted away to reveal a new dark persona. He threatened to off himself with pills unless I took him back, but I was so extremely done that I called the police. They weren't much help, but Tim left. I blocked him everywhere and never contacted him again, but he left me insane voicemails from different numbers for weeks afterwards. I was relatively unshaken and things returned to normalcy. I graduated and got a sweet job in the same cool college city. Six months later, I woke up to concerned texts from mutual friends saying that they didn't want to freak me out, but Tim was off his meds, clearly manic, and was posting a newly written song all over his social media. His best friend, who hadn't been in touch since before the breakup, sent me an apology along with a screenshot of the lyrics. That got my attention. The song was pretty explicitly about my murder, but in a sort of clever, disguised way. I checked his profiles myself from a friend's account, and he was posting dozens and dozens of totally insane rambling statuses, most of them about me. A flip-flops between flowery love prose and murder imagery. His friends were reacting with concern but a few egged him on, probably thinking he was just venting about his ex. I decided it'd be best to continue ignoring him, but I saved screenshots just in case. A few days later, while at work, I looked up from my computer to see Tim enter into the far side of the studio. My blood turned to ice. He was talking to my creative director. It looked cordial enough, and I saw Tim begin to casually scan the studio. I ducked down and bolted into my favorite project manager's office, slammed the door, and unleashed upon her what it must have been a nearly unintelligible explanation of what was happening. I was shaking so hard I could barely speak, but Nancy was amazing, and she understood almost immediately. She snuck me out of the building and drove me in her car to the police station, where I showed officers the screenshots and filed a report. My co-workers later told me that Tim was there to inquire about the open designer position. He is not a designer. He had brought with him a portfolio and an elaborately fabricated work history that sounded legit. At the end of his interview, he casually asked if I still worked there. He said we used to collaborate. Oh, and he had written a song for me, and it had been picked up by the local radio this morning. He asked my coworkers to let me know with warmest regards. That phrase still makes my skin crawl. He then left, found my abandoned car in the parking lot, and paced behind it until the police arrived. Unfortunately, he wasn't enough of a public menace for police to bring him in that day, but the incident helped me to secure a restraining order against him. My company was amazing too. I was deeply embarrassed about my literally insane ex coming to the studio, but the CEO filed trespassing charges against him and created an action plan to keep me safe if it happened again. Not long afterwards, I moved to a different city, and that was that. Haven't heard from him since. But I discovered the most alarming part later. His roommate at the time, Liz, went through a similar experience with him during his breakdown, and when he compared notes much later, she said she had seen a large axe in Tim's car the same week it had all gone down. She said that she was worried about Tim's Facebook activity, so she removed the axe and hid it. Tim was so angry that he completely trashed their house and never came back. And if our timelines are correct, it must have been just before he came into my workplace for his interview. When I was about 12, I decided making a newspaper for my entire neighborhood was a really great idea. My friend and I were both at middle school and decided to get together once a month and write absolutely enthralling articles about the weather or when the pool would be open and then deliver our front slash back one page newsletter to every single house in our two street neighborhood whether they wanted it or not. We kept this up for about two years until the time of the story. So we were on our once a month paper route, if you could call, walking around our small neighborhood and putting a single sheet of paper in every mailbox of paper route. It was raining this particular time, so we had umbrellas and we were carefully walking to each mailbox. 
trying to keep our newsletter as dry as possible. This also meant all the cars that came by had their headlights and windshield wipers on, and also made sufficient noise with their tires splashing through the puddles. My point is that we knew when a car was approaching behind us. We were about halfway through on the street we weren't so familiar with, the one we didn't live on, when we noticed this souped up old white car coming really slowly up the street. Now, the way my neighborhood was set up, the only reason why you would be on the same street as us is if you lived there or you made a wrong turn. So there were even less cars on the street and the ones that passed usually were people that we knew. We continued walking from mailbox to mailbox while periodically checking to make sure the white car wasn't just parked. It was moving very slowly and the headlights and windshield wipers were either broken or just not turned on. This car drove slowly past us as we walked, going roughly the same pace as our steps if not slower. Something was so off about everything. There was no reason for this car to be on this road in the first place. We definitely didn't recognize it or the driver inside, and it was going so incredibly slow. Car trouble? I don't know. We pretended one of the houses was ours and walked up the driveway to avoid the car as it got close to us. It continued at the same pace and we watched it until it eventually disappeared around the corner. We laughed about it, thinking it was weird but nothing happened. It was all well and good until the car showed up at the end of the street behind us again, going just as slowly as it had before. What was this person doing? We were so confused and walked a little farther from the curb to avoid the car again as it came by. We didn't laugh about it this time. The car showed up a third time at the end of the street, and at this point we decided we should cut through some yards to get home. Better safe than sorry, right? We crossed the street, but the car passed again and we shrugged it off and kept going. The fourth time this car came around, it pulled up right next to us and the driver had his window down. Being 12 and living in a bubble, my friend and I hadn't really experienced shady people, but we knew something was up with this guy. He had a white towel draped over half his head, was wearing a white tank top, while we were in long sleeves and rain jackets, had his window down, and when he spoke his speech was slurred. We were polite and said hello and he asked us what we were doing through his open window. We continued walking as this interaction took place because we knew this dude seemed sketch, but at the same time we didn't want to assume anything and be rude. When we told him we ran a newspaper he immediately perked up and enthusiastically asked us about placing an ad. He also took his hands off the steering wheel and leaned over so he could get closer to the window. He smelled of cigarettes. My friend and I looked at each other, we knew something was wrong. We told him no, we don't place ads in our newspaper, even though we did. He told us we were pretty girls and probably cold. Our idea to cut through some yards was decided. We heard at least said something about needing to go home and he began shouting at us from inside the car as we crossed the street. We bolted to a neighbor's backyard when we heard the car begin to move quickly and hid in some bushes until we were sure the car was gone. We stopped writing our newsletter after that. Meeting a creepy person while you're alone in the rain in your own neighborhood was a good deciding factor for calling it quits. So, weird and probably high dude that tried to talk to a 12 year old me and my friend, let's never meet again. To start off, I am a 16 year old female. Okay, I was visiting my mom's apartment for the weekend with my sister. We go there every weekend or every other weekend to see her. We arrived at about 10 in the morning and brought in our pillows and movies or whatever from my grandma's car. We get inside and chill there for a couple hours watching TV before my sister says that she's hungry. My mom asked, okay, what do you want? I said I was okay with having a pizza and my mom said that she would have to run to Kroger's which is less than a mile away. She said she would also get some movies from Redbox. My sister then asked if she could go with my mom to Kroger's. My mom said she could and asked if I would be okay in the apartment by myself. I said I would because I knew I would. I'll be gone in 20 minutes tops, my mom said. She didn't like leaving me alone, but she thought it would be okay as she told me later. Now, my mom's apartment is kind of in a crappy place, where people have been spotted with drugs and thieves and stuff. But I was on the third floor in one of the many surrounding apartment buildings, with tons of neighbors. I would be fine. Okay, lock the door, and you know not to open unless it's me. They left soon after, and I was sitting in the couch, on my phone with Jerry Springer playing in the background. It was about 10 minutes after they left when I heard the doorknob jiggle. I looked up, not feeling scared right away, but also feeling a little wary. I should mention that I carry a pocket knife everywhere with me, and the blade is about 3-4 to four inches long. It was sitting on the coffee table in front of me when I got up to go to the door. I'm only 5'3", and I knew not to open the door, so I grabbed a chair and stood on it to look through the peephole. That's when I got scared. On the other side was some guy, just standing there trying to open the door. Of course, being how I am, I tried to laugh myself out of being afraid because I had no reason to think he was going to do something to me. Maybe he just had the wrong room. I'd never seen him before and I don't know everyone in the building personally, but I had seen them all at least once, and he wasn't one of them. Hey man, I think you got the wrong room. He froze, his eyes glued to the door handle, and then at the peephole. He probably could tell exactly where I was when I spoke. I swear we made eye contact and the whites of his eyes were so yellow I thought he had jaundice. Then he all of a sudden started ramming his shoulder into the door, like full on shoulder ramming like in football. I jump off the chair and grab my phone and knife and run into a room with a window and lock the door. 
I called my mom's friend who lives in the apartment building across the street and start crying hysterically and said, Jess, someone's trying to break in, call the cops, bring Chris, please just get over here. She didn't even hesitate, I'll be right there. Within seconds of hanging up, I call my mom. The guy is still hitting the door and he's yelling in frustration now. My mom picks up at after a few rings and I tell her what I told her friend and she was coming with Chris and she needed to get here quick. She was frightened and yelled that she was almost there. By the time I saw Jess make her way down two flights of stairs and across the road with her boyfriend, my mom was flying down the road and was there within mere seconds of me calling. They all race inside and I hear everyone yelling in the hallway. I unlock the door and peek outside of the apartment and see Chris holding the guy against the wall while my mom hugs me and Jess is screaming at him. Long story short, the police arrived and took my statement, and the man first denied it by saying, I thought it was my room, but then he ended up confessing that he wanted to see me and talk to me because he thought I was pretty. The police officers had him in handcuffs and ran a background check on him and what came up wasn't surprising. He had a warrant for an assault charge on a woman and had been arrested for kidnapping. Yeah, I hope I don't have to experience that again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I was 19 years old and the only female working at a shop specializing in automotive batteries and things of that nature. I had been working there long enough to realize that most of the clients were male and oftentimes made for some awkward situations. For instance, I would get talked down to and patronized quite a bit or flirted with to the point where I would be somewhat uncomfortable. However, this never really bothered me. One day during a particular busy rush, a very tall man who was maybe in his mid-30s came through my line. This guy had some very strange energy, he seemed a little off. However, it was my job to be professional and assist whoever came through my line. I brushed aside the uneasy feelings. I just wanted to ring this guy out and get him through the rest of the line that was now trailing out the front door. I greeted him and talked to him as I would any other customer while I was processing his transaction. Things were going fine until he realized I was almost done. He started stalling, making up weird excuses as to why he couldn't use certain credit cards, how he needed me to put his battery on hold and he would be back, etc. I told him that I would hold it for him and that he could come back whenever he found the time. I figured he would leave at that point but he just stood there and just stared at me. Now that I think about it, he was more staring through me than at me. I was a bit uneasy but kept my polite, professional demeanor. Sir, if you're not purchasing anything at the moment, may I ask that you step aside so I can assist the other customers, I said. He completely disregarded my question and, in a slow, raspy voice, asked, so, what's your name? I didn't wear a name tag specifically for reasons like this. Customers had found me on Facebook before and it was really unsettling. Thinking quickly, I threw up my nickname. It's Rhea. Rhea, he said, as he kept staring. I just smiled awkwardly and said, yep, that's me. By this point, my manager had realized what was going on and he proceeded to ask the man to step aside as well. After hearing it from my manager, the man walked to a corner of the store by some shelving and continued to stare while I was ringing the rest of the customers out. A bit of time went by and the line had cleared up but he was still standing there, staring and now smiling the most sickening smile I think I've ever seen. It made my skin crawl. Of course, my manager and coworker saw this too and my coworker grabbed my arm and said, come on, let's go out back. As we were walking to the stock room, my manager asked the man if there was anything else he needed. The man muttered that there wasn't and left. I wish that was the end of it, but of course he had to come back in to purchase the battery. When he came back the next day, we again had a line. He let people go ahead of him and waited until I was free before coming up to the counter to make his purchase. I greeted him again and tried to remain professional, but it was hard considering how creeped out I was. I was again met with the same stare and the same freaky smile. I can't remember the entire conversation, but at one point, the questions he was asking became personal slash weird slash inappropriate enough for my coworker to cut in. He looked at the guy and then at me and said, Rhea, go take your break, before he basically pushed me out the way of the computer and rang the guy out. I stayed in the back until my manager came and got me, telling me it was safe to come out. We were all pretty creeped out, but thought that was the end of it. A few days went by and we had all mostly forgotten about this creepy dude until he walked in again. This time though, he didn't look through the store, didn't approach the counter, didn't say a word to anyone. He just stood, jacked hood pulled over his head, in the corner of the store, staring and smiling. The smile had become even wider and more sinister looking and at this point I started to freak out. I started shaking and feeling sick to my stomach. Then my manager cut the horrible tension by pretty much screaming at the guy. Hey, I'm sick of you coming into my store and pulling this crap. The creep paid him no mind and kept right on staring. This pissed my manager off and he walked out from around the counter and told the dude, Look man, if you don't quit coming in here and staring at her, I will not hesitate to call the cops. What you're doing is harassment so you need to get out of my store. At the mention of police, this dude's smile dropped and he slowly sauntered out of the store. We never saw him again, but I was immediately taken off closing shifts due to fear that the man would come back and try to catch me when I was alone.
About three years ago, I was in a long distance relationship with a younger man, meaning he was only 17 at the time while I turned 19 in the relationship. His name is Peter. Peter was not a nice person to say the least. He thought that the first impressions he made on people were the only one he needed, and as such he stopped being nice, polite, or reasonable to people after the first meeting. I was young and saw past this thinking I could somehow change him. However, this abuse towards people around me and myself eventually became too much and I broke off the relationship with him. The breakup went smoothly all things considered, except he wanted me to say the words so he could play the victim. This had been a core element of our fighting because he hinted that he would wanted to break up, but instead of just saying it, he kept me on the hook and became even more abusive. I'm getting sidetracked, but the point was that I thought of the matter as resolved and entered a loving relationship with my current boyfriend shortly after this. Then came the day where Peter wanted to get his belongings back. I texted him a list of everything he had left in my apartment and he okayed that it was everything. We also made an appointment for him to stop by my apartment around 3pm the following Thursday. I have no intentions of letting him get back into my house nor being alone with him, since he suddenly seems to have many mood swings after seeing me in another relationship. He has been blocked from my Facebook account, but somehow knew I was in a new relationship, which was a major red flag to me and my boyfriend. Thursday came and I felt eager just to be done with it. My boyfriend and I are walking home from high school when my phone rings. It's Peter. He yells at me that he has now been waiting at the train station for over an hour. I try to reason with him, agree to meet him there with his belongings since he needs to catch a train. My boyfriend walks with me to the train station, but we arrive only to find it vacant. I live in a small town and the train station is mostly used during rush hours in the morning and evening. It is also located rather bizarrely among normal residences and there are a lot of off alleyways leading all over town from there. I get a text stating that Peter can see us, but won't come out of hiding when my boyfriend is there. We leave his stuff on a bench at the train station, calmly replying that I'm not actually interested in meeting him. When I say calmly, I mean that my reply is calm. I'm shaking and my boyfriend is furious over this child's play. On our way home, I receive another text. This time, he states that he has a gift for me and it is in my mailbox. This freaks us out even more, mostly because this indicates that he might be waiting at my home. It is entirely possible that he watched us on the train station and then ran all the way to my apartment. However, there is no trace of him and nothing except a bill in my mailbox. By now, we figure that he is acting out of spite and proceeds to ignore the bombardment of text, calls, and so forth that follows that day. After a while, life returns to normal. Then I get another call, this time from my ex-elder brother who is worried about his sibling. Apparently he has disappeared, taking one of his brother's gas pistols. I am speechless, but since I haven't seen anything, I shake it off as another childish act. The same day my boyfriend sees police officers walking around the basement staircase on the exterior of the house we lived in, while doing some grocery shopping. He did this every day around 4pm. The next day, we are contacted by my boyfriend's mother. In the newspaper, there is a description of an unnamed young man from the same town as Peter, who has been arrested for attempted robbery of the pizza place I lived above. He was armed with a knife, a gas pistol, and lighter fluid, while stating that he was not attempting a robbery, but was there to visit his ex, presumably me. Contacting the police, I discovered that he also had a mask fake papers, and a wig and a duffel bag, which he had thrown down in the staircase when, around 4pm, he had jumped a fence and tried to enter the pizza place. This means that my boyfriend went out at the front door, while my ex was hiding right beside the front door armed. I have never been that freaked out before. The sad truth is that my ex never got charged with anything because he is a minor, has a father with a military background and money. Luckily after this, me nor my boyfriend ever saw him again. So this happened when I was in 7th grade, a 12 year old kid. At the time it was just my mom, my brother, and I living in a rental in a rundown low income area. We moved in during the summer before the school year started, and we were welcomed by our next door neighbors which wasn't too uncommon but not super common at the same time for that area in Oregon. My mom worked 8am to 5pm every day, so my little brother and I would ride the bus home every day from school. My cousin would also sometime ride back to my house with us and her parents would pick her up later, important for later. One day when I came home I noticed our small laptop we owned was gone off the counter. I figured my mom had moved it. Later when my mom came home later we determined it was missing and that a lot of other things were missing like my iPod and wallet and my mom's safe with her handgun in it and lots of family valuables. We called the cops and reported a robbery and they came to investigate. They determined the person probably slid through the doggy door leading into the garage and then entered the house through our unlocked garage door. Cops stayed in their cars on the curb all night and said they would stay on watch for our house more than normal. I was terrified all night and my brother and I slept in my mom's room. The next day we locked all our doors. It was Wednesday and it was a random half day at my school so I rode the bus home around noon and my cousin came with while my brother went to a friend's house for the afternoon to hang out. I used the key under the mat my mom leaves for me, and my cousin and I hung out for about an hour or two until her mom came and picked her up. 
After she left, I hear the doorknob of the closet right next to the front door slowly open and out comes the skinny, what looked like a 35 year old man that I recognized as our next door neighbor. He seemed to be constantly shaking, intense eyes, had a really unhealthy look to him because of the extremely sunken face. Terrified, I'm in the living room just standing looking at him while he looks at me, with a surprised look on his face. I think he thought everyone left when my cousin did, until his face changed to an amused smirk when I believed he realized that I was alone in his house. He begins to walk towards me while I stand there shocked, not sure what to do. He grabs me really hard on the shoulders. He seemed crazy and excitable with his intense eyes. I instinctively jump and buckle my knees to allow my full weight to be the force that rips me from his grip and fall down. He then bends down for me when I heel kick him as hard as I can. He then yells and falls to his knees. I use that time to run past him to my front door. I open it and run to a kid I rode the bus with's house about six houses down. He and his mom were there and she called the cops and my mom while I waited. The cops got to the house and he wasn't there but had managed to steal a few more small valuables. I gave my testimony that it was our next door neighbor and he was later caught the same day selling some of our stuff at the pawn shop in town. He ended up being a crystal meth addict, stealing our stuff to sell and pay for his addiction. He was super weak from all the drug abuse which is probably why I was able to get away from him. He also was apparently somewhat high when he spontaneously decided to attack me being that I was alone. He had apparently watched us for a few months, learning our schedules from when we left and got home. He took the time to take the key from under the front door mat while we were gone, get a copy, and then put the original back under the mat for my brother and I to use when we got home. The cops were surprised he was smart enough to do that, as he seemed to be mostly dim-witted with everything else due to the drug abuse. Either way, I testified against his physical attack and he got a few decades of jail time being that he was already on parole for drugs. I was terrified and slept in my mom's room for the next year. About 25 years ago, when I was in middle school, 7th grade, I had a real bad problem with bullies. I couldn't handle the ridiculing I took while riding the school bus, so I started walking 3 miles to and from school every day. The path I walked was pretty safe, mostly on a sidewalk and always on a busy road, with the last 2.5 miles being a straight shot directly to the school. Back then, there wasn't a stigma attached to kids being outside on their own, so this wasn't deemed unsafe or noticed by anyone, or so I thought. I lived alone with my father, parents being divorced, and my mother saw me on weekends. He didn't see any harm in the walking, and my mother wasn't aware of the bullying or the walking. I did not want her to know, so I continued unimpeded for over half the school year. Now, I wasn't really an active kid, and I sure didn't like having to walk 6 miles every school day, so I assumed this was the motivation for the error I was about to make. One day on the way home, a car pulled up on the shoulder and stopped, about 100 feet ahead of me. That car looks familiar. Hey, it's my father. He's gonna drive me the rest of the way. I started to jog up to the car, seeing him in the driver's seat, waiting patiently. Huh, his hair looks darker than normal today. Wasn't the inside of his car tan and not red? The thoughts left as soon as they entered, and I caught up to the car and opened the passenger side door and started to get in. As I was tossing my backpack on the floor in front of me and swinging my legs into the car, I started saying, thanks dad, but the sentence never completed. Before I knew it, I had shut the car door and we began to move. This isn't my father. This man was much older, by at least 20 years, hair obviously dyed black, and hands propped at 10 and 2 on the steering wheel. The shirt he was wearing looked just like one my father would have worn. A short sleeved collared button down, brick red with black horizontal lines, not pressed, but not too wrinkled either. He was smiling at me, which probably would have felt warm if it was coming from my grandfather, but instead it felt menacing. I heard a click and looked over at the door, which had just been locked. I stared at the door for a moment longer, then turned to face front and completely froze, terrified. Hello, I saw you walking. I figured I'd come give you a lift. I did not move or answer. His voice matched his smile, deceivingly friendly. We were roughly a mile away from home, and half a mile from the next turn needed to head in that direction. All I could concentrate on is how I was going to get out of the situation. Are you on your way home? This snapped me a little out of my zone. Yes, I want to go home, I answered. Stay calm, talk normally, don't act scared. Where is your house? I can take you there. Feeling just slightly relieved, I told him to take the next right turn. I felt myself begin to breathe and I realized how tense I had been. My body relaxed slightly and I finally moved and wrapped my hands around my backpack straps. We started to come up on the intersection and I pointed ahead, reiterating that this was my turn. Okay, but if you want, we could take a ride instead. It sounded like a question, but it didn't feel like one. The dotted line for the turn lane had begun, but he did not get over. Instantly, I tensed back up and my grip and my gaze on the backpack straps tightened. Through strained muscles, I choked out that, no, no, I really need to get back home. He swung the car into the turn lane and began to make the turn. Wide-eyed, I glanced up and verified that yes, indeed, we were making the turn. Are you sure? I'll make sure you get home before anyone realizes you're gone. Grip tightening further, I abruptly stated that no, I need to get home now. My father's expecting me home now. He's waiting. I just hoped it sounded more convincing than it sounded to me. We completed the turn. Sigh. Okay, maybe next time. We can meet at the same place tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow's good. I just need to get home today. Now. 
My eyes were firmly trained on the road ahead of us, hoping that if I just focused on the direction to home, I would get there. The turn until my neighborhood was approaching, and I informed him, again pointing towards the direction, the direction home. The next few moments were silent. As we came upon the turn, I reminded him, and to my slight surprise and incredible relief, he made the turn. For the first time, I had more hope than doubt. My old neighborhood consisted of mainly apartments, but in the back were a block of townhouses, which is where I lived. If you were unaware of the layout of the complex, the townhouses might go unnoticed. Right before we got to the area where I lived, I told him here, stop here. He pulled over to the side of the road in front of an apartment building. He unlocked the door and I hurried out of the car, backpack still in hand. I began to close the car door behind me. See you here tomorrow, same time. I paused for just a second and risked another look at the man. Still smiling, still terrifying. Yes, tomorrow, see you later. I finished closing the door and hurried off. I swung my backpack on the right way and briskly walked into the opposite direction of my house. I could hear the car still idling behind me and it wasn't until I was able to turn off that road and leave his view that I heard him start to move. He had to drive up to where I was walking to turn around and I glanced back as he was making an awkward turn instead of going around the block to leave. He caught my gaze and gave a slight wave before driving off. My hand was in the reluctant process of waving back, but I was slow enough that he was gone before I completed the motion. I turned my head and kept walking, and the moment I could no longer hear his car, I ran. As fast as my legs and heavy backpack would let me, I ran around to where I could hide between two buildings and hid there for a while, until I felt enough time had passed for me to feel confident he was not driving around waiting looking for me. It was probably 30 minutes, but it felt like hours to me at the time. I ran the rest of the way home, keeping a lookout, making sure he couldn't see me going through the backyards. I reached my front door, unlocked it, and almost spilled inside. I was moving so fast. It wasn't until I locked the door behind me that I felt safe. I didn't feel scared anymore. I was home. In the end, I told both my parents, and my mother forced my father to drive and pick me up from school for the remainder of the school year. And luckily for me, the bullying stopped the next year. My father didn't believe me and thought I made up the story to get out of walking to school. In his defense, me trying to explain that, no, the car was exactly like yours, except the entire color of the inside, and no, he did look like you just with darker hair, and it all happened so fast. It was worth his disbelief and annoyance every day in the car, so I never had to meet that guy again. So this happened when I was 16, visiting my grandma, who lives in a small town in Poland. Just for context, it was summer and my family wasn't with me at the time. As you can imagine, living without my parents for a short time, my grandma's really chill was a dream. I could stay out late as much as I wanted to without my parents being able to prove it. Now at 16, you feel you're invincible. You don't really think about how many screwed up people there are in this world. Because of this mindset, I wasn't worried about walking alone at night. The day on which the story takes place was very hot. I remember shopping and hanging out with my friends until about 8pm when it started to rain. Instead of walking home quickly, I decided to visit my aunt's house, hang out with my cousin for a bit, and walk home when the rain stopped. Well, I lost track of time and ended up leaving her house at about 10.30pm. At this point, the rain had mostly stopped, and this being my favorite type of weather, I declined my aunt's offer to drive me back, telling her I was getting a cab. I'm still surprised she believed this, but maybe she just didn't care. So I went on my way, called my grandma to tell her I'd be home in 30 minutes, but not telling her that I was walking alone. If there was one thing that scared me, it were the huge train tracks which you had to cross in order to get to my grandma's house the fastest, so I decided to take the longer way around through some sort of a nature preserve. I'm not sure how to call it. I enjoyed my walk through the light rain until the long metal bridge came into my view. Just as it's beginning, I saw a man. It was a small quiet town, so it wasn't common for the people here to be out this late, but I wasn't scared immediately. I only saw his back, but he looked like every other guy you'd pass by on the street. He didn't seem to notice me, and I didn't really care. I got distracted by looking at the trees to my left, but when I came to the beginning of the bridge, the man was nowhere to be seen. I suddenly stopped dead in my tracks and got an ominous feeling. This man couldn't have already been out of view. It would have been impossible for him to move this fast. He would have had a run and I definitely would have heard him running on the metal bridge. At the end of the bridge, there was a small path that led under it, which was hidden by thick bushes. I got even more scared by the thought that he was hiding there, waiting for me. I slowly started to walk backwards, not taking my eyes off the bushes. I hid behind a tree and decided to wait a few minutes to see if he was hiding there. After about 10 minutes, my biggest fear came true. Suddenly, the man emerged from the bushes, looking in my direction. He was holding something big and shiny. I could make out in the dark that it was a knife. My mind started racing with a thousand questions. How did he see me? Why didn't I see the knife before? Where was he hiding it? He suddenly started to run in my direction, so fast. He ran straight past me hiding behind this tree and I was so relieved. When he was out of sight, I ran faster than I ever ran not stopping to look behind me. 
being frightened the whole way back, thinking that he'd somehow find me and do whatever sick thing he had in mind. Luckily, I arrived home safely, my grandma waiting for me already mad. Looking back, this was one of the most stupidest things I could have done because of what happened a month after this incident. Two teenage girls about my age were stabbed dozens of times by this bridge. One body was found about 30 meters from it, and the other one was thrown into the nearby river. To this day, nobody knows who did it, but I'm pretty sure that it was the same man whom I've encountered. For context, this took place when I was 16 years old. I'm 24 now, so it's been a while, but this was one of the many stupid things I've done in my life where I could have ended up dead or even worse. I grew up in Portland, Oregon, and me and my friends would often go to the Lloyd Center to go shopping or just to hang around the food court being degenerates. I was walking around the mall with my friend Crystal and my mom when a man at a pop-up kiosk stopped us. He said that he represented a modeling company and wanted to talk to us about modeling for their clothing line. I considered myself better looking than the average duck, spoiler alert, I am about as plain jean as they come, and so I promptly announced that I wanted to sign up for the modeling agency, which my mom quickly shut down. I replied with a why, which got me in trouble later down the line with both parents, but that was the only start of my woes. I convinced my mom to allow me and Crystal to go off on our own and with a reluctant sigh, she allowed us to go off. Me, being the dumb kid I was, marched right back to over to the modeling agent and signed myself up with a phone number and email address. He said that he would be back in contact with me shortly to set up an interview with the company. That night, I went home and saw that I had a friend request from someone that shared no mutual friends with me. Hesitantly, I added the person and a message popped up. Hi, I'm such and such from the modeling company. You signed up with our agent earlier today and I wanted to get in touch with you. I know you're in the Portland area, so we wanted to set up an interview with you next week at 9pm at this location. Are you able to come speak to us? I responded with a maybe and logged off my computer. That's when my phone started to ring. I picked it up and it was yet another guy from the agency. This new agent asked me whether or not I could come and do the interview. I said maybe and bid him farewell. It was about here that my gut instinct started to kick in. Why would they set up an interview so late at night? And I googled the address and it was in an industrial park by the airport. I chose not to answer the onslaught of emails, Facebook messages, and phone calls that I was getting. This went on for about a week before I got radio silence. The guy on my Facebook blocked me, there were no more emails or calls. It was at this point I began to worry. What if I had allowed my career to not even blossom, let alone flourish? What if I had made a mistake? I was already in hot water with my father for telling my mom off at the mall the first time. So the school in my mind, I allowed the idea to fade from my mind of what could have been. About two weeks later, our home phone started to ring. My father answered the phone and as soon as he started listening to the message, his face became ash and he instantly hung up the phone, turning me to demand what I had done. I tried to feign innocence, but I knew the jig was up. We had just gotten a phone call from the Portland Police Department to warn our family about a ring of traffickers who were targeting young girls with promises of modeling and acting. They had stumbled upon the name of one of the men who worked for the ring and through that started contacting families of young women whose information they had gotten a hold of. The worst part of it all, they had my family's address and home phone number as well. I was grounded for the rest of the year, which was to be expected, but it was better than being carted off to some trafficking ring, so I couldn't complain. When I was finally allowed back to the mall with my friends, we walked by the kiosk where the modeling agent once peddled his false hopes and dreams. All that was left was an empty booth. This happened about four years ago. I had just graduated from high school and was a month and a half into summer break. Needing money for college, I began working full time for the school district I had just graduated from. Due to a music festival I wanted to attend as well as monetary concerns, I did not go with my family to North Carolina, which was fine by me. What 18 year old doesn't want a house to themselves for a week? Furthermore, my parents' house was out in the country, so I had little to no fear about my neighbors complaining about parties or being bothered in any way whatsoever, but I was wrong. I often take the back roads home from my friend's house, but on that night I decided I wanted some McDonald's, so I took the main drag and came home on a different route. This way takes you past a mechanic shop not a mile away from our cul-de-sac. It was between midnight and 1am and as I passed the mechanic shop I noticed a car's lights turning on. Or should I say light, for this car had only one headlight working. I remember thinking that it was strange that this car all of a sudden turned its lights on as I was passing, and began to become even more concerned when it pulled out behind me. But I tend to be paranoid by nature, nothing serious but I always question the person behind me is following me and whether they mean me harm, so I brushed this off as an unfortunate coincidence. But as I neared my street and the car was still tailing me, I started to become freaked out. I looked at my gas tank and my heart sunk as I saw I was on E. Either I pull up my street and go home, or I risk driving around some and seeing if this dude follows. Yet that option held the risk of my car running out of gas and leaving me stranded on the road and I figured I'd rather take my chances on my own soil than on the side of some dark and lonely country back road. So I turned onto my street only to have my heart sink when the one headlamped car makes the turn right behind me. 
At this point I know I'm screwed. With nothing left to do I began pulling up my driveway. It's a hill about 100 yards long. To my utter horror they begin to follow me up. Looking back I should have called the cops, but there was no love lost between law enforcement and myself and at the time I was too caught up to even consider calling them. If my family would have been home this would have never happened. I could have called my dad and he could have grabbed his gun, but he along with the rest of my family were gone, 12 hours away at the beach. So when they began to drive up my driveway after me I stopped to put my car in reverse. They responded by reversing as well, yet they stopped at the bottom, effectively blocking my driveway. At this point, I pulled forward again only to have the same jig and dance happen. They followed, I reversed, they reversed, and set at the end, blocking my escape. I quickly pulled up and turned my car around to come at them head on. By this time, they were halfway up my driveway, the furthest they had come up. Looking back, I was terrified, alone, and angry. Who did this person think they were? With my brights on and shining right into their face, I opened my car door and got out. I pulled out my pocket knife and held it in my left hand while I grabbed my hammer in my right. I used to keep one in between my sear and door. In some weird desperate mindset, I made a split second decision to grab the hammer from the head with the handle sticking out. My hope was that it would be mistaken as a gun. I began yelling at points of my hammer slash gun at the car, screaming at them to get out and what do you want? All the while, I held my hammer as a gun and prayed they would fall for it. Whether they did or not, I cannot say. Part of me believes they thought it was a gun due to my brights being behind me making my whole front side a shadow yet they could have just not wanted a fight. Perhaps they thought I was a girl or was timid and wouldn't resist so aggressively and violently. Who knows but it worked. They slowly backed out of my driveway and crept around the cul-de-sac. As they were leaving my street I ran after them hiding behind my neighbor's houses and at every driveway the car would slow down to a near stop as if scoping out the houses. Thankfully, they didn't pull into any driveways and they turned off my street altogether. After I was safely in my house, I ate my McDonald's by the front window with all the lights turned off, waiting to see if they'd come creeping back. Thankfully, they didn't, but that night I locked every door in the house, which I always did anyways, and slept with a hammer, machete, and baseball bat next to me and my pocket knife under the pillow. Complete overkill I know, but I was terrified. Now I know where my dad keeps his gun, so if it ever happens again, I'll be better prepared. Last year, I was dog sitting for my aunt. The dog is small, sweet, and a little skittish. I had worked most of the week, so I was just living in the house for the time being. It's a nice house, not big enough to feel empty if you're alone, but not small enough to feel cramped. The only rooms I used were the kitchen, bathroom, living room, and the guest bedroom. My last day of work this particular week was a double shift. I was excited because after this I had two days off. I planned on using them to introduce the dog to RuPaul's Drag Race. I usually try to keep good spirits for a double shift because regardless of the time and annoying customers, extra money is always needed. My old job was a barista and cashier. Mornings are always busy and nights are slow. On weekends, people are more concerned with coffee and breakfast than anything else we may have to offer. I was having a nice time actually because this day was turning out to be not as hectic as the previous ones that week, one even involving a small fire. As the morning rush line was dwindling, the limited tables in the restaurant came into view and I started people watching. As I slowly scanned the customers eating bagels and reading the paper, my eyes met a man at a laptop. He had long, dirty hair and a bit of a stubble. He stared at me with a little too much intensity. I wondered if he found my people watching rude, so I decided to clean and restock instead. It didn't take long for a line to reform, so I returned to my register. Once again, after the line died down, I could see the few tables in the front. The man was still there and he was still staring at me. Every now and then he would look at his computer and then back to me. It almost felt like he was looking right through me or like he could see every part of me. It felt so uncomfortable that I went and cleaned in the back of the restaurant, out of his sight. After the next rush, I took my break and sat far away from the man. He was out of sight and I was out of his. When I came back from the break, the man was gone. My manager asked if I had interacted with him at all. I told her about him making eye contact with me, but that nothing else really happened. She told me that the man had been watching 18 plus content on his laptop and she had asked him to leave. So that was weird enough. The man had been watching that and stared at me. I really wish that this is where the story stopped. Hours passed and the rest of the day was entirely normal, despite me and a few female co-workers feeling a slight edge. We were in the process of closing, which is actually a process I really enjoy. We're well in and I'm almost done with my assigned jobs when my manager comes up to me again. She informs me that the man had found his way back in the restaurant at some point and she found him hiding in a back corner. She chased him out by threatening to call the police. She knew that earlier in the day, he seemed to be paying attention to me. She said I could finish up whatever I wanted or needed to, but afterwards 
where she strongly advised me to get home as soon as possible. She also offered to walk me to my car. I took both offers and quickly got my things together and clocked out. My aunt's house was not far from work. It was a 5 minute drive at most, which was helpful because then I didn't feel the crippling anxiety for much longer. I got in the house and after triple checking that I had locked every door, got into my pajamas. But unsurprisingly, I was not ready to sleep yet. Now was the time to introduce the dog to RuPaul's Drag Race. I went into the living room. The living room consists of a couch, two chairs, a TV, a window, and the front door. Unfortunately, the porch light was broken and the window had no curtains. That had me a little stressed, but I was willing to take that over the only other TV in the house, which was the one that exists in the scary basement. Facing the basement TV included having my back to a sliding glass door facing the very dark woods. No thanks. I was setting up the TV when the dog started growling. I really didn't think much of it. As I said, the dog is skittish so he growls and barks all the time. I wasn't looking at him. I was muttering shush shush and figuring out how to work the TV. The dog didn't stop and started to get louder so I finally put down the remote and I turned to face the dog. I froze. The dog was barking at the window and there was an outline of a man at the window. The exact same build as the one at the restaurant. I screamed and luckily that was enough for the man to run away from the window. I stood there frozen for a while. The dog had calmed down but I hardly felt safe. So I went into the kitchen, grabbed a big knife and called my mom. She did not advise calling the police, my mom never does, and instead came and spent the night with me. I told my aunt. I spent the rest of my time dog sitting clutching the knife anytime I slept or took a shower. My aunt also gave me permission to have one friend stay with me every night. Nothing else ever happened. I never even saw the guy come into work again. A part of me wishes I knew who he was or where he went, or what he even wanted with me. I'm glad he was a coward and that all it took to scare him off was my scream and an extra small dog. The year was 1995 and I was 16 years old. I lived in a three bedroom, tooth bath house in a middle class suburban community with my mother, two younger brothers, and our 140 pound Doberman, Turbo. From the front door of our house, relevant, you could see directly into our living room which had an open concept floor plan with the kitchen and dining room. Our couch was on the wall directly in front of the front door. It was the summer between my sophomore and junior years in high school. My brothers and I spent a decent amount of time outdoors. I suppose anyone paying attention knew who lived in our house, and I suppose they knew that the only adult was gone when the only car was gone. However, prior to the man showing up at the house, I never noticed anything off and I never noticed anything afterwards, so maybe we were just a random target. It was a Saturday and mom and the boys had run to the grocery store. In Nevada in the 90s, almost no one had air conditioning, so to cool off, you would open up all the windows and doors and use fans. On this particular day, I had the back sliding door and front door wide open to get a cross breeze. Neither screen door was locked. I was napping on the couch in full view of the front door in shorts and a tank top with unlocked doors. In my defense, there was 140 pounds of protective dog muscle on the floor next to me, and probably only for that reason am I alive. Around the approximate time I expected my family home from the store, Turbo began barking. Assuming he was barking their arrival, I told him to shush and try to go back to sleep. Turbo continued to bark, becoming more and more intense and even aggressive with his barking. Finally, after 5-10 to 10 minutes of Turbo refusing to quiet and my family never coming in from the car, I sat up, realizing something was wrong. A man who I didn't know stood, seemingly frozen, staring at my frenzied and barking Doberman. Assuming that the man had some appropriate business at my home, I hurried the 10 steps to the unlocked screen door, constantly shushing Turbo. I apologized for my dog and for not hearing his knock. He never knocked. The man explained that he was from the phone company and he was here to check our lines. He never took his eyes off Turbo. Turbo never stopped snarling. I leaned forward far enough to see the street. Only unmarked, privately owned cars lined the street. I looked at the man who was dressed in tennis shoes, jeans, and a t-shirt. I was 16 and dumb enough to nap in front of an unlocked door, but I was no fool. Phone company personnel A, always wear uniforms, B, always drive company vehicles, and C, don't come without being called, and D, don't work weekends. I looked at the man who had yet to look up from the 140 pound dog that was now foaming at the mouth. I grasped the screen door handle and held it. This got his attention. He met my eyes as I said, you have 30 seconds to show me identification or I'll open this door. I don't even think he made an incoherent excuse as he ran away. I fell to my knees and hugged Turbo. I then gave him all the meat in the fridge. I believe with absolute certainty that I would have been attacked if we hadn't had him. I like to think that if I hadn't had a huge, overly protective dog, I would have been in the habit of locking doors. But what would a screen door latch do against an intruder? And that creep stood there and watched me for 5-10 to 10 minutes. Perhaps he was paralyzed in fear, but maybe he was working his angles and only Turbo's insistent display of his willingness to kill anyone who threatened to be changed his mind. That's my theory. Turbo is long past, but his legacy lives on, and two loving, loyal, and lethal when necessary dogs sleep in my room every night.
For context, I'm a 5'3", 24-year-old female and working as a programmer for an IT company in the Philippines. Now the area where my office is in compromises of three buildings. Building A, where my office is in, Building B, and Building C. To get to the other building, it would take you like around 10 minutes to get there. Important for later. This happened to me a year ago around the end of February until March. I just got out of a bad breakup at the time and I really intended it just to focus on myself and not meet anyone yet. I just got out of work and it's around 7pm on a Friday night and went to my usual waiting spot, which has benches and is located at the back of our building near the entrance of the underground parking. For our company shuttle and Omar shuttle dispatcher is there. Now, I've known Omar for two years and is someone I consider now as a friend and we've been often chat about our lives, even the breakup with my ex then, and joke around. He's a 40 plus year old guy and he gives out this big fatherly vibe so he's really someone that I trust. That night, he was there and with someone new that I didn't recognize. Our conversation went like this. Omar, oh hi. Good thing you're here, I would like you to meet someone since he told me he already wants to meet you for a long time now. And then this guy stood up and shook my hand. I greeted him as just to be polite and this new guy, let's name him Ray. He's average looking and a little shorter to my height, 5 foot 1 I think. And he instantly gave off an all 5 as soon as I shook his hand. I thought that would be the end of it, but he proceeded to talk to me for a few minutes while I wait for my shuttle to arrive. Omar has purposely left me and this Ray guy so that we could talk and get to know each other. I'm actually puzzled at this point because, 1. I have no clue who this guy is and why he would be so eager to meet me. And two, I clearly told Omar before that I'm not into meeting anyone just yet. But for the sake of being polite and nice, I talked to Ray but we never reached any personal questions, exchanging numbers, social media accounts, or even telling him my full name. I just told him my nickname, and I left it just as that when I finally got on the shuttle. Fast forward to a week and Friday again, I got off at work in the same time and surprise surprise, Ray is there again with Omar and his security guard. They were chatting but as soon as I came, Ray instantly greeted me and at this point, I'm a little creeped out as I expected our encounter would only be a one time thing. I just said hi and brushed him off and sat on the benches to wait for my shuttle again and of course, as this guy doesn't seem to know the definition of personal space, sat beside me and talked to me again but this time he's asking for my cell phone number. I told him off and clearly said that I'm not giving out my number to strangers and just giving him one word answers just to give an impression that I wasn't interested at all. He would ask, why wouldn't you give your number, I just want to be friends. And I could see it in his face that he was getting frustrated every time I told him I wasn't giving it to him. This happened while Omar and the security guard was looking at us from afar, but this went on until I got on the shuttle again. As soon as I got home, I mindlessly scrolled through my timeline and saw a notification that I have a new friend request and guess what? It's Ray and he even messaged me with a, please accept my friend request. I just deleted his request, but now I'm pretty shocked since I didn't tell him my Facebook account, so how did he manage to find me? The following day was the last straw when I decided to get off at an earlier time so that I could avoid him, but to my surprise, he was there, again waiting for me, along with Omar and the security guard. Ray immediately ran up to me to say hi, but I brushed him off and dreaded the fact that I would have to wait with this creep again when I saw my shuttle isn't there yet. He immediately asked me if I accepted his Facebook request, and I decided to play dumb and said I haven't been active on Facebook and I haven't seen any requests. He got disappointed and he fiddled with his phone for a bit and then revealed his phone to show my Facebook profile and asked me if this was me. I said yes, and this time, I was completely ignoring him at this point and playing with my phone and told him that I wasn't going to accept his request because I don't know him. And then Ray grabbed my phone out of my hands angrily and said he was going to add himself using my Facebook account if I won't. I muttered a what the and grabbed my phone from him and with perfect timing, I got on the shuttle in a hurry and told the driver to go. At this point, I could confirm that this guy could be stalking me and now knows my daily schedule and social media media accounts. I reported this incident to my manager and told her how this was already happening for some time now. She was surprised that I didn't report it earlier but I blamed it on my lack of assertiveness and fear that I might be overreacting to his advances. We reported the incident to office security and told them what happened and they couldn't do anything at first as, one, I need actual evidence about my allegations to him, and two, I only knew Ray by his first name and they would need more information than that. I didn't bother to ask where he's from or if he's even working in our office slash building which is dumb of me and I should have asked in the first place. My manager then decided that I should be at least accompanied by some of my office mates to confirm the situation and the guys volunteered to accompany me every time I got off work. They accompanied me for a couple days and no matter what time I got out, Ray was there to harass me. I felt bad for my office mates as they had to deal with his BS as well. First instance when he saw I was with my office mates, I could see the visible anger in his eyes and he would try to butt in our conversation even if we were ignoring him. At one point when I'm talking with my office mates, he let out an exasperated sigh and said, Can I talk to you for a second please? What do you want? I just want to talk to you. If you don't, I'll leave. Okay, and then I went back to talking to my office mates. He butted in once more and asked that I should introduce him to my office mates when I didn't. He proceeded to introduce himself instead which irked the heck out of my office mates and I as his behavior doesn't seem normal at all. 
After that incident, my office mates and I told my manager what happened and how dangerous this guy might be. She decided that we should escalate it to HR and have them deal with it immediately. Gladly, HR responded and took the situation seriously and began to do an investigation on who Ray might be. Same day, they sent an email that after searching through records, turns out Ray wasn't an employee at our office and they might need to talk to building security to find out more about this guy. HR also requested our office security to escort me and observe the situation. I honestly felt relieved as now I'll feel safe for the time being while they search for who Ray might be. He still showed up even if I got out late or earlier than usual, but never went near me when he saw I was accompanied by security, but he would just keep his distance and stare at me, smile creepily, and linger outside my shuttle until it left. HR contacted me for a meeting with him and my manager about some news on Ray and I was shocked by the information that they found out. Ray was not an employee of our building slash office, but in fact, a temp in the security office in building C. I then thought, okay, this creep is really putting an effort for someone who is clearly not interested and if he's a temp meaning there's a chance I won't be able to see him after this. But then what HR said chilled me to the bone. He was a temp assigned to work on the security cameras meaning he had access to all the building cameras. It has been his way to spy on me and the reason why he was able to be there at the exact same time I got out. HR has already spoken to his supervisor and gave a warning to Ray and of course, Ray denied the allegations even if I had witnesses against him. The supervisor wanted to apologize to me in person, but I decided not to as I just wanted this to be over with. After that meeting, I never saw Ray again and I reckon he must have been kicked out after HR issued warning against him. As for Omar, I never seen him as well and I felt bad but he was also part of the people who enabled Ray and didn't do anything when I was clearly getting harassed. I received a bit of backlash from the security guards at the building for a while as well, hearing them say that I was overreacting and I should have accepted his advances, which was disgusting, as I heard the same thing being said by female building staff as well. Nothing strange happened for a few days, but then the security guard that was with Omar at the time, when Ray was harassing me, added me on Facebook, but I didn't make much of it and just deleted the request. I'm still working in the same office and building as of today and been totally shaken up by the incident that I decided just to keep my distance from people so I could avoid from this ever happening again, and to Ray, please don't meet me again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. This story is of my brief friendship with a guy that near stalked me, and I'm sharing it for some closure, I think. I started my freshman year of college at a university in my hometown that's pretty nice. I'm not going to share too much about it, but it has a smaller amount of students but enough that you don't really run into people often. I lived on campus and I was only 17 at the time. I had Tinder of course, as I was fresh out of a relationship and looking to experience new things in college. I matched with this one boy, Asher, who seemed nice enough. Pretty socially awkward, but I never really minded because I have anxiety issues myself and I'm really sympathetic to it. Because of that, I ignored a lot of warning signs I shouldn't have. We texted for a while and he seemed really nice and caring. He wanted to know a lot about me, which I wasn't too keen on sharing, but I told him the basics and we texted kind of regularly. He lived on campus as well and invited me to hang out. At that time, things didn't seem too sketchy so I was completely down. When I first met him, that's when things started to get uncomfortable. We hung out in his dorm, which is pretty standard overall. I got cozy with him on his couch. I'd say almost cuddling, but not quite. Still, really standard. When we started talking more, I realized how uncomfortable things really were. He kept making comments that just put me off, but I tried to ignore them. Things like, I've never really cuddled with anyone before. Sorry if I'm doing it wrong and so many comments about how he already liked me a lot and wanted me to stay forever. Weird word choice, but whatever, he's just trying to be nice, I let him down easy. I ended that hangout pretty quickly for some fake excuse, and went right back to my room. He kept texting me and professing how much he was into me, and I told him sorry, but I'm not looking for any kind of relationship, so I do not want to keep things romantic. A bad lie, but I'm very non-confrontational and I didn't want to be mean. That's when things started to get really weird. He sent me this long paragraph saying about how it was okay I didn't want a relationship now, and that he'd wait for me to save his virginity for me. We had never talked about anything sexual, I had never really even told him I liked him or flirted back. I just never turned him down. It was one of the creepiest messages I've ever received. Unfortunately, this was just the start of all the things we were to come. He wouldn't leave me alone even though I kept trying to de-escalate things, and I kept running into him all over campus. I wasn't sure how he suddenly was nearby when my classes ended, and I wasn't sure why suddenly we'd both be in the dining hall at the same times even though I hadn't changed my regular routine, but I just tried to brush it off. Definitely a mistake. I ended up turning him down completely because I was getting creeped out and couldn't figure out how he wasn't understanding that I didn't want anything romantic or sexual with him, telling me how he was going to off himself and no one was ever going to love him. I've been in a manipulative relationship in the past and I recognized that behavior right away and shut it down. I told him I couldn't be friends with him and in my head that was that. He didn't reply 
apply for a while, but when he did, everything broke loose. I was luckily out of town at the time for a concert, so that made me feel a lot better. He went off, sent me paragraphs after paragraph about how horrible of a person I was, and how I needed to get put in my place, etc. I could handle that, I just ignored it. Then, once the regret set in, he made it his mission to win my love however possible. He apologized profusely, told me how he couldn't be all alone and I was his only friend, and how much he loved me. Whatever, terrible, but I didn't care about that. Then, I guess to prove his dedication, he did the creepiest thing yet. First, he told me he was outside my room. We did not live in the same dorm building, and you can't get into the buildings unless you live there. I don't know who let him in. I wasn't there, and my roommate was out, so that was okay. I texted him back at that point and told him to leave and how wrong and creepy that was, and he pulled out his last resort. He just sent me screenshots of my contact in his phone. On Apple devices, you could fill in tons of information and have a note section. Everything was entirely full. He knew my home address, my room number on campus, my parents' and brothers' names, my pet's names, my schedule. It was terrifying because I'm a fairly private person. My Instagram is my only social media and I do not share that much on it. I don't think I'll ever find out how he discovered all that about me. I blocked him on everything right away and reported him to school. The school did nothing at all. I still see him on campus, but it seems like he doesn't care about me any more gladly. I was around 16 years old when this happened to me. It was just me and my dad at our house, and since he was a businessman that traveled frequently, I was left home alone quite often. First of all, I'm going to try to do my best to describe you the layout of my house so you can better understand my situation. My house is pretty small since it's just my father, my dog, and me living in it. There's a long hallway full of full-size windows separating my dad's room and mine. Our dog loved to look out the windows, so we always kept them open enough for her to look out. I'm the last room at the end of the hallway, and between the two rooms is my bathroom and a spare room. All the rest is irrelevant. Let's get to it. It was around 11pm when the worst night of my life began. My dad was passed out in bed after a long day, and I was mindlessly dancing around my house getting ready for bed. I just hopped to my shower, not knowing what was coming ahead, when my dog starts aggressively barking up a storm. I walk out the bathroom and go out and explore. I head to my room to throw some clothes on while my dog is still barking. Months before, I'm not sure how I managed to break my door handle, but you don't have to twist the knob to open it, all it needs is a small push. Scared, I barely managed to put a shirt on when my dog opened the door. I looked to see her enter my room, while in the midst of barking that's when I saw it. There's only one window that has vision to the opening of my room, and in the corner of it I saw a face. It was dark, so I took a second to comprehend what I just saw, but when I finally realized it, I screamed. My dad owns lots of guns, so when he heard me scream, he ran out with a pistol. He asked me what happened and could barely mutter what I saw. He ran outside to see if the man with the terrifying face was still near. We stood out there for maybe a minute scanning the area. A man was casually strolling towards us from the opposite direction from about 100 yards away. I knew it was him. I got that feeling in my stomach that you can't mistake. It was like he was trying to cover up that he was there by coming from a different direction. But he didn't fool me. You better stay away from my daughter. You see what I have here, you know what this does. Holding up his gun, I could have sworn my dad was going to shoot. The man brushed these threats off easily. My dad and I went back inside. He went back to bed like nothing had happened, but I could not sleep a week. I kept thinking he was going to come back and hurt me because of the threats to him. We called the cops the next morning and they came and scoped out our house. He looked around the house trying to calm me down, but I was still pretty shaken up. He went to the front yard and that's when he saw it. In front of the windows in the long hallway there were small bushes, nothing much. The cop from outside went to the window that had view of my room and there it was. If he tried to tell me the news without making me more upset, he failed. There were incidents in the dirt right in front of the window. That meant he knew where he needed to look for you and it seems as if he had come here more than once because of the broken pieces of bush and the divots in the ground. Turns out he was the nephew of my old neighbor and he had been staying there for months. Never rested, never got in trouble, probably barely got a slap on the wrist. But at least he's gone now. How long had he been watching me, I'll never know. All I know is I keep my door shut and I never keep the blinds open. To begin, I've always had this feeling that someone was watching me ever since I moved into my family house 8 years ago. At first I thought I was just being paranoid, but I could not help looking over my shoulder when I would walk to school or to my bus stop. When I would walk to school, I was always scared in the mornings when it would be dark during the winter or fall because where I live is just fast country lands. I live in Canada and although not much crime happens in my neighborhood, I never could rid myself of this eerie feeling. Even when I would come home from school, being home alone did not help. I would triple check my windows and locks to make sure everything was locked. However, in my basement, our garage door would never fully lock since the door hinge was broken and detached from the door. Therefore, it would never properly close. I always told my dad to fix this door, but because he would always go away for work, he never found the time to do so. Stupidly, I thought nothing bad would happen since my garage needed a 4-digit passcode to get in. Now, my theory is that he knew the passcode of my house. 
therefore he had free reign for seven years to go through my things. At first I thought I was being forgetful. Maybe I was the one who misplaced my underwear somewhere. Maybe I was the one who misplaced my favorite top or maybe my dad accidentally donated it. But I should have known better. During my four years in high school he never really contacted me. It was when I went to university that things started to change. Since I live in the countryside I decided to go to a university an hour away. My dad did not want me to live on residence because he didn't want to leave the house unattended for long periods of time. So we came to the conclusion that it would be the best if I drive to and from school. Now I would leave for university very early in the morning around 6am and come back around 6pm at night. I stopped being aware of my surroundings at this time because I would be tired from my 12 hour days and now that I wasn't walking alone everything would be fine. When I would come home from university I would find certain things moved in my house. I am a neat freak and I like things a particular way in my house. When little things like my makeup or candles would be moved, I thought it was odd and would frequently bring it up to my dad, but he would just say that it must have been me who was doing it, but it wasn't me. During my second and third year in university, I started getting weird notes in my mailbox. The writing on these notes looked almost childlike and it would always be written in blue ink. I have those country style mailboxes at the end of my driveway where the little red flag goes up whenever we get mail. From my way back from university, I would always check the mail and sometimes I would find these letters. The letters would never be long, in fact they would only be one of three sentences that would contain odd questions like, where are you? I wonder what you do while you're away from home. How do you find university? It must be tiring driving that long. Did you make new friends? Do you still hang out with your best friend? You dress differently now, why is that? I miss the scarves you used to wear. You don't close your curtains as much anymore, why don't you look for me? These letters would always come once a month at the beginning of the month. I would show my dad and at first he would say, oh maybe your cousins are just pranking you or it's probably your friends. But every time I would ask my friends or cousins, they would give me this confused response saying that they never sent me any letters. Now that I am in my fourth year at university, the letters do not come as frequently but two weeks ago something happened that makes me think that things are escalating. I came back home from university at 7.45pm and it was fairly dark outside. I saw that my mailbox flag was up so I checked the mail and it was just bills. At this point I haven't gotten a note for a little over three months now so I am thinking maybe the notes will not come anymore. As I settle in for bed I change into my pajamas and I check the locks usually. As I checked my front door lock I look out the glass panel on my door and I saw that the red flag on my mailbox is up. It's 10.30 at night so no way the mail could have gotten dropped off and plus I just checked the mail. I call my dad and tell him about it and he said not to freak out and that maybe one of our neighbors accidentally got our mail and just dropped it off since this happens frequently. I stay on the phone with my dad and quickly run down my driveway to check my mailbox. As I open the mailbox, I feel my heart drop because it's an unmarked vanilla envelope. I quickly run back inside and open the vanilla envelope and although there is no written note, I find something more disturbing. It is a pair of my old blue panties that I haven't seen in years. At this point I scream and my dad tells me to hang up and call my aunt who is a police officer. My aunt comes over and checks the inside and outside of my house but she can't find anything. She tries to jog my memory and ask if I know anyone who could be doing this but I honestly have no clue. My aunt told me to keep any more letters like it and she has been staying with me the days my dad is out for work. I just hope that we're able to find whoever this is. About two years ago when I was 17, I received a Facebook message from someone named Dan who I didn't recognize. I had mutual friends with him and he looked to be around the same age as me so I wasn't alarmed. What follows is the messages. Dan, hello, have you been? Haven't seen you in a few years. Me, hi, not trying to be rude but do we know each other? Dan, um, yeah, you really don't know me? I didn't respond. Dan, wow, real nice way to treat a family friend. Me, sorry I just don't recognize you. Dan then sent a picture of me and him together from when we were little. And I mean really little, like I looked maybe 2 or 3 and he looked 5 or 6. Me, oh wow, did our parents used to be friends or something? Dan, I was your neighbor, you really don't recognize me, come on I didn't move that long ago. He had in fact moved a long time ago, at least 12 years ago, so I honestly feel like it's not that uncommon for me to not recognize someone who I hadn't seen or talked about since I was 4. Anyways, the conversation continued like that. I apologized for not remembering him and just started catching up. He was being nice enough and I was bored so whatever, no harm, no foul. After we kept talking I started remembering more about him. Like I remembered him coming over and swinging in my backyard and me going over to his house with my big brother and all of us hanging out together. Dan was a few years older than me, at least two but I can't remember exactly. Anyways, we kept talking on Facebook just messaging back and forth about normal things until it started to get late and I was tired and at school the next day so I told him I was going to bed. I closed my computer and just laid down and went to sleep. The next morning I woke up to a bunch of messages from him. Things like good night beautiful and sweet dreams, message me when you wake up, are you asleep yet, can't wait to talk to you. Literally there was almost 50 messages. I was creeped out but I opened the messages and glanced through them and just didn't reply. 
On my phone, I have it set to where I don't get notifications from Facebook Messenger. At the time, I was in a lot of group chats with different team sports and group of friends, so it was just easier to, at the end of the day, check my messages versus getting a ton of notifications all day long. Some point during the day, I had gotten more messages from him that I just hadn't noticed while I was at school. He was saying stuff like, do you still live at insert address here? I did still live there. Does your mom still freak out about you hanging with boys? My mom has never freaked out over boys. Let's go out and catch up. Let me take you out and treat you right. It just kept going on and on with really random questions that weren't necessarily threatening but just somewhat creepy. He then talked about wanting to go on dates even though he didn't even live in the same state anymore that I live in so I have no idea how he would have planned on going on dates with me. The messages just kept continuing over the next week him telling me he wants to go on dates and asking me really weird questions about my mom, my brother, and my house and then he started asking about his house that he used to live in. I didn't reply to any of his messages but I was getting at least 50 a day. Eventually, I brought it up to my mom and just asked her if she remembered Dan from next door. Her face completely drained of color and she got super serious all of a sudden and she asked me why I was bringing him up. I told her that he had messaged me on Facebook and was trying to get me to go out on a date with him and was just trying to catch up. I didn't tell her he'd been messaging me 50 plus times a day and I wasn't responding at this point. She told me to block him and never message him again. I asked her why and this is a summary of what she told me. When I was 3 or 4 I used to play over at his house a lot. His mom would always offer to babysit me if my mom had to go out and run errands and he also had a little sister who was around my age so my mom figured it was a perfect opportunity for a play date between Dan, my brother, me, and Dan's little sister. One day when I came home after one of these play dates, my mom was asking me and my brother what we had done that day. My my brother started talking about how he had watched some movie. I apparently told my mom that Dan had brushed my hair for me. My mom thought that was a little weird that a 6 year old boy wanted to brush a 3 year old girl's hair so she asked a couple more questions and it came out that he wasn't brushing my hair. He had been taking a brush and was rubbing it all over my body while I was only in my undies. My brother didn't know anything about this because we had been in Dan's room and my brother had been in the living room with Dan's little sister. After that my mom didn't let me go back over to his house. Apparently when my mom confronted his mom about it, a huge fight broke out. Not physically, but a screaming match. It turns out that Dan had been doing similar stuff to his little sister, but it had escalated farther than that with me. My mom threatened to report them to the police or Child Protective Services. She did both, but before much could be done, they moved out and found somewhere else to live. They were renting the house. After hearing that from my mom, I immediately blocked Dan on Facebook. I wasn't quick enough, I guess, however, because he messaged a bunch of my friends on Facebook asking about me and had changed his relationship status to take and in a relationship with me. He then followed me on Instagram and found my Snapchat somehow. He liked to comment on almost all of my Instagram pictures and sent me a bunch of Snapchats. I quickly blocked him on both and luckily he never figured out my phone number. Luckily I haven't heard from him since. We were both 16 and 13 respectfully. My sister and I were home alone while my parents were out of state for a couple of days to attend the funeral of a longtime family friend. Our grandfather lived only a couple miles away and was originally supposed to babysit us, but he trusted my sister and I would be fine, and he would be on call if anything were to go bad. Well, of course, something did. Just our luck. It was around 10pm or somewhere close to that on the second night and I was upstairs in my bed trying to sleep after a long day of biking around with a couple of friends. My sister suddenly came running up the stairs which she almost never did unless she was in a hurry for some reason. She came into my room and was frantically talking to someone on the phone. I lied there in confusion while she talked. I don't remember exactly what was said, but when she hung up, she hugged me and told me that everything was alright and that grandpa was on his way. What had happened was that my sister was sitting outside on our stoop talking to a friend of hers on the phone when a pickup truck came rolling onto our driveway. My parents don't own a pickup so I immediately threw up a red flag. Once she saw a man get out carrying a duffel bag, that's when she came running inside and called our grandfather. My grandfather may have been 60 at the time, but he's no pushover. Being 6 foot 4 and having the strength of Godzilla with a Demeter to match when it comes to protecting his loved ones. He also owns firearms, which I wouldn't doubt for a second he would bring alone in case something really hit the fan. We also lived in an area where the police would take a bit of time to reach, which is another reason why my sister called him and not the authorities. Suddenly, we hear what sounds like a door being kicked open downstairs. Almost immediately afterwards, we began barricading my bedroom door. Since none of the bedroom doors had locks in them at the time. Once we're done, she looks at the window while I sit there, covering myself with my blanket. All the while we hear footsteps downstairs on our hardwood kitchen floor. 
My sister then looked around my room and asked if I had a bat or something, which I did in my closet. My Louisville slugger that I used when my parents made me play baseball when I was in elementary school. I also had a hockey stick, but who would use that as a weapon unless in a very circumstantial situation? She rummaged through my closet and found it, then stood next to the door while I ducked down behind her, thinking maybe I should grab the hockey stick, but it's much less intimidating than a bat. Unless this burglar has some sort of PTSD associated with hockey, then this is the ultimate weapon. We then hear the sound of a gunshot followed by a man yelling out in pain. The sound of both I can still hear even to this day when I think about it hard enough. My sister and I are standing by the door, almost sobbing when about a minute later, we then hear my grandfather yell out our names, asking if we were alright to which we both yelled out simultaneously that we were. My sister and I pulled the dresser and various other objects out the way of my door and we both went out into the hallway. We heard my grandfather on the phone with 911 as we stood at the top of the stairs. When the police and ambulance arrived, the man who had broken in was taken out on a stretcher, to which I later learned was shot in the abdomen. My grandfather had come in through the same back door and found the man in our kitchen looking through drawers. When he came at my grandfather with one of our kitchen knives, that's when he was shot. The man almost died from blood loss, but ended up surviving and I hope he's learned his lesson, both through being incarcerated and by being shot in the abdomen and almost losing his life. But, of course, you never know with certain people, especially the nefarious ones. This all started my sophomore year of high school. I was 15 and at a new school, so I didn't have many friends yet. I was in that phase where I thought I needed a boyfriend to have validation, so I was actively trying to find a date for the homecoming dance. A classmate suggested a junior in one of her classes, whom I will call David, to be my date and got him to ask me out. He seemed nice, so I said yes, a decision that would haunt me for the next two years. David and I had fun at homecoming, so when he asked me to be his girlfriend, I said yes. It's important to know that he was quite the loner. He was very much into science and often spent alone conducting experiments in his room and even at school at times. I just brushed it off as him being quirky and figured I shouldn't get in the way of his passions, but it wasn't long before I realized there was much more to his nice guy facade. Over the first several weeks of our relationship, we would talk over the phone and David would make increasingly inappropriate comments about things he wanted to do to me. I was 15 at the time and he was 17, so not only was I incredibly uncomfortable, but he was also nearly an adult making these comments to a younger girl. I kept telling him I wasn't comfortable with the things he was saying, but he always laughed it off as me being prude. I was fed up after a while and finally threatened to break up with him and that finally made him stop. I should have recognized the red flags and bailed at that moment, but again, I was dumb and felt I wasn't worth anything unless I had a boyfriend. Although the inappropriate comments stopped for the time being, he would still become increasingly possessive and downright obsessed over what I was doing at all hours of the day. He would intrude on conversations I had with my friends and want to know things that frankly weren't any of his business. One day when I was getting into the shower, he called and my dad told him I would call him when I was done. Instead of simply waiting like any rational person would do, he called a total of 4 times over the next 10-15 to 15 minutes to see if I was out of the shower yet. I began to feel suffocated, but every time I asked him to back off, he would cry about how depressed he was and that he only wanted to talk to someone to feel like he was wanted. I always fell for it like the dummy I was, but now I recognized the clear manipulation that it was. One day I finally had enough. I broke up with him in person at school and he bawled like a child. I didn't let it get to me this time, however, and firmly told him that I didn't want to be his girlfriend anymore. Although he couldn't get his way, he still somehow convinced me to stay friends. I know, I was an idiot, but things didn't end there. Over the next several months, David kept trying to get me to go out with him again, even going as far as to cry in front of other people to garner sympathy. Fortunately for me, David had earned a bad reputation throughout his school year, so no one really believed him. He would even try to trick me into a date by subtly suggesting we go see a movie as friends, which I always got around by inviting my friends to come along too. They knew what he was doing and never turned down the chance to help a girl out. In the last few weeks I spoke to him, he would sit on the phone for hours on and literally begging me to take him back, and thankfully I held on strong and kept refusing. One night his brother actually called me telling me he was crying hysterically. Eventually it came to a point where I told him I didn't want to hang out anymore because it was clear that he would not stop until he became his girlfriend again. He agreed to not approach me anymore, but I wouldn't be writing this story if it ended here. The very next day at school, David came up to me like nothing had happened. I once again reminded him of the conversation we had the night before about how we agreed to not hang out anymore, but he acted offended that I would even suggest such a thing. Eventually, my friends and I convinced him to leave, but of course it didn't stop there. For two weeks straight, he would follow me around school, call my house, and my cell phone. For two weeks straight, he would follow me around school and call my house. This was the days before smartphones, so blocking his number wasn't as easy. I tried to get help from the school staff, but the vice principal basically told me that there was nothing I could do because he wasn't trying to hurt me. I was frustrated, but thankfully David seemed to back off when it was clear that I wasn't going to give in. That is until I got another boyfriend. 
The following school year, my junior year, I started dating a senior named Justin. Not long after we went public with our relationship, I noticed David following me again. Now Justin was a football player and he was a pretty big guy with unresolved anger issues, so he didn't take kindly to this guy. He would hang out with me and my friends and David would hover over nearby, walking by every now and then and making it blatantly obvious that he was spying on me. One day, Justin walked straight up to David and confronted him. He didn't lay his hands on him or threaten him in any way, but he did ask, what are you doing, in a really angry tone. David simply muttered some kind of excuse and scurried away. We thought that was the end of it, but later in the day I was called to the principal's office. Turns out David claimed that Justin threatened him and blocked the doorway so he couldn't move. Justin denied it, of course, and told the principal I could back up his claim, which I did. Thankfully, nothing came of it, but this was only the first of a long line of incidents. Over the school year, David and his brother, who was a year younger than me, would try to get Justin in trouble every which way they could. He even started rumors and threatening his life. A classmate of mine overheard them talking about ambushing Justin and hurting him, but even though I brought this to the staff, nothing was done about it. All the while, David kept following me when Justin wasn't around. There was even an incident in the school gym one day when a bunch of classes had to stay there for the period. He and I both were there and he made sure to sit on the bleachers nearby, even following me when I moved. I was on the verge of tears, but then I saw two guys I knew sitting on a few rows down from me. They were cool with me, so I got their attention and, after explaining what was going on, asked them if I could sit with them to feel safer. They accepted and we ended up having a good time talking about music. In spite of this, things just kept getting worse with David. Finally, it came to a head when David's brother wrote a letter to Justin's sister. They had been good friends before this whole mess started, and in the letter David's brother threatened physical harm to me and to Justin. The sister gave the letter to Justin, who then came to me and we both brought it to the principal. That was when the principal called everyone involved into his office and had a nice little chat with us. The principal showed the letter to David's brother and said, I can expel you for this right now, but I am willing to let it go on one condition. David and Justin were both about to graduate, so the principal gave them the ultimatum. He stated that David and his brother were not to contact me or Justin in any way, shape, or form for the rest of the school year, or he would see to that neither of them would graduate. I was pissed because Justin did nothing wrong, but in the end, we just wanted this whole mess to be over with. From that point on, David didn't bother me again thankfully. Justin and I ended up breaking up that summer for unrelated reasons and the following year I didn't have to see either of them ever again. A few years later however, David tried to send me from requests on Facebook. I deleted the request and blocked them. I even unfriended and blocked the two mutual friends we had for good measure. Sure I was being paranoid but it made me feel better. There was one last incident involving David not with me but with my younger brother. When he was 14, he took his then girlfriend to see one of the Transformer movies and David walked in. Upon recognizing my brother, he sat behind him in his day and kept laughing uncontrollably at inappropriate times and even started kicking their seat. My brother tried confronting him, but it did no good. They didn't bother getting the manager because my brother's date was too afraid he would attack them if they tried to leave. Thankfully that was the last incident I or anyone close to me ever had with him. I'm doing much better now. I'm 30 years old and, ironically, I ended up marrying one of the guys who sat with me in the gym that day. My advice to any teenagers reading this is that you should always pay attention to red flags and get rid of toxic people in your life. It's always better to end up alone than stuck with someone who makes you feel bad and treats you like your feelings don't matter. This happened a few years ago when I was bartending in college. I was coming home down a stretch of divided highway at around 3am when I noticed a car heading towards me in the wrong lane. I doubted myself at first and thought that the car was on the other side of the highway. Sure enough, the white Ford sedan passed me at a really high speed at around 90 miles per hour. It's worth noting for later that I also drive a white Ford sedan. I was used to drunk slash idiot drivers in the middle of the night so I pulled to the side of the road and let him pass me. I had a moment of clarity and thought to call the police, thinking this person could hurt themselves or somebody else. The dispatcher answered and after telling them which road and exit slash mile marker I was at, told me they would send a car. The state police station was only a few exits away so I figured they would send somebody and I would just drive home. As I headed back onto the highway, I noticed some lights a few miles behind me. I live in a more rural part of southeastern Pennsylvania and traffic at 3am tends to be truckers and cops. The car gained on me as I was getting up to speed so I stayed in the right lane and waited to be passed. Instead, they flipped on their high beams making it uncomfortable to drive and rode my tailgate. At this point, I thought I was going to be pulled over by the police. I drove a white Ford sedan and had just called out a different white Ford sedan, so I grabbed my registration from my glove box. Suddenly, the car behind me audibly slammed on the brakes and stopped in the middle of the highway. They must have shut off their car because the lights went out and I saw what looked like the same Ford sedan from earlier. Still, I thought this may have been a police car. They had a roof rack, and it could have looked like I had reached for a gun in my glove box or something. I panicked and called 911 for the second time and asked the dispatcher if they had sent a cruiser to investigate. The dispatcher was a little curt 
with me and assured me that they sent somebody out. Dispatcher, we have sent a trooper out to find the car, sir. Me, I only ask because somebody is following me and acting weird. It could be a cop and I think I freaked them out by getting my registration. Dispatcher, are you pulled over? Me, no, they didn't turn on the lights. Dispatcher, let me try to get the trooper we sent out. As she was talking, the car again sped towards me and stopped inches from my bumper. Again, their high beams were on and again they slammed their brakes. I told the dispatcher, I'm pretty sure this is not the police behind me. The car sped to my bumper again and turned their high beams on, this time laying on the horn. Hearing this, the dispatcher asked me what was happening. Dispatcher, what's happening? Did you honk? Me. That's the car behind me. I don't think it's a cop. Dispatcher, I'll try to get the trooper again, but I don't think that's him behind you. For some reason, this is what shook me. Before that, I was thinking I would get pulled over and maybe get a ticket. Up until then, I was going to the speed limit and trying to avoid getting pulled over. I told the dispatcher, I don't care if I get pulled over, I'm speeding and if they put their lights on, then I'll pull over. I started to accelerate and the person behind me just kept up with me. The speed limit was 55 and they kept on my bumper the entire time, but this time they were swerving. I tried to signal for an exit then bail on it, but they followed. At the next exit, I took the off ramp and continued onto the on ramp and the car behind me followed the whole time. I thought about trying to go to a Wawa gas station, but the dispatcher and I thought that it would be unsafe. She was calm and talking to another person trying to send police to me. The other person, maybe a supervisor, asked if I could drive to the state police station. Realizing that I was one exit away, I told her I was coming there and she said that she would have troopers meet me outside. As I pulled off to the exit, the car followed me. I blew a few red lights trying to get to the police station and the car tried to pull into the other lane to pass me or pull up alongside me. Once the police station was in view, I put on my turn signal and the car slammed on its brakes again, turned off their lights, and turned into a parking lot. The story ends kind of anticlimactically as I pulled into the police station and met the troopers. Two of them went to find the car and I stayed with the third trooper. I think the dispatcher and her supervisor and the state trooper escorted me home after taking a statement from me. I was never called to follow up or testify so I can only assume the person didn't get caught. I don't drink as a general rule, but once a month or so I'll go out with friends and binge. My friends and I had a great night at a bar in the city and they left. I was chatting up a cute guy so I decided to stay. I went back to his place. After post coitus, I'm ready to head home so I call an Uber to pick me up. I don't know where I am, I know the city I'm in but not my exact location. I ordered the Uber but it's taking forever. So I cancel it and try again. Pretty soon a car pulls up. I drunkenly mumble something like, is this the Uber? And I hop in. Mistake. Ubers apparently are supposed to have some kind of marking on their vehicle. The guy pulls away and starts driving, we're chatting, I'm fumbling for a cigarette and the next thing I notice is that we're headed for the highway, but in the opposite direction of where I thought we needed to drive, and we're going at a solid 90 miles per hour. Then I get a call from an Uber driver, he's there and I'm not, because I'm in the car with someone else. I start texting my friend frantically counting off mile markers for her. Then I realize that's going to do Jack, because she's probably drunk too. So I call 911, but I realize this guy is crazy. He's refusing to let me out of the car, so I've got to do it on the sly. It's been about 40 minutes now, I'm terrified. I don't know where I am, I don't know who this is, we're driving at over 100 miles per hour, weaving in and out of traffic. This guy is trying to get me to hang up my phone call. And also smoking pot, so I don't want to do anything that might provoke a violent reaction from him. I start chatting to the 911 dispatcher as if it's my friend, praying that they'll catch on. Hey girl, it's me. Yeah, I'm with someone right now. We're driving past highway exit. No sweetie, it's not my Uber. I thought it was, but it's not. It's a shame you can't come and meet me and bring friends. Thankfully, the operator catches on. He gets me to stay on the phone while he sends cops, and we develop a code. If I see cops, I'm supposed to casually put my hand out the window, which looks semi-normal because I'm smoking a cigarette. We pull into some random little housing complex, and he busts out some powder and forms two lines. I now have confirmation that he does drugs, which means he's probably emotionally volatile. I relay this to the operator in code, oh girl, I wish you were here right now. This guy just busted out the coke. You'd love it. He's taken a really big bump, man after my own heart, etc. Pretty soon, I can see the lights from the the cop car so I start waving my hand out the window. At this point I don't care if he's onto me or not. I don't know if he has a weapon but I slump down on my seat just in case things get hot. The cops surround us, get him out of the car, and then once it's safe they extricate me as well. They whisk me to the hospital for a drug test and evaluation and that's where my story ends. On my way to the hospital as I'm explaining all of this to the officer, I find out that of the guy's 40-ish years on this earth, he's been in federal prison for 30 of them for violent offenses. I want people to learn from my mistakes and if nothing else call 911 and stay on the line. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. For background, I'm a 24-year-old woman living in Australia and work in an establishment that caters for an adult audience. 
One night, as my shift is coming to a close, one of the patrons asked me to buy a drink which I accept because, employer policy. I talk him up to a couple of expensive drinks for the two of us, have a quick conversation, and make my excuses about my shift being over, but he should come back to see me soon. He starts to gaze at me and it feels uncomfortable. He stands up and with his creepy grin asks to walk me to my car. I know never to put myself in that position and politely decline and I tell him I might see him next time. I walk out past our biggest bouncer and the guy doesn't follow me. Great, nothing extraordinary, just standard par for the course of my profession. But sadly, this isn't where our story ends. For this creep, it's only just the beginning. I'm off for a week after that night, but when I come back into work, I'm told a Patreon has been coming in every night for the last week asking for me. He says he wants to buy me another drink. Naively, I think, oh great, a bigger pay this week, and gets set for my shift. Then I rolls on and who should roll in but our man of the hour, and he asks for me. So I saunter over and he buys me a drink. The whole thing I'm sitting there with him, he just has this creepy grin on his face. Not like a normal creepy grin, that's just normal. No, this is the kind of grin where he knows something you don't and is very pleased with himself about that fact. So we're talking and I'm getting him ordering himself drinks and trying to upsell him where I can. About half an hour goes by and I make my excuses to leave so I can try to spread the tips around. But this guy isn't having it, he won't let me leave and the more I insist the angrier he gets. He's practically hissy at me by the time I give a look to one of the bouncers, who promptly comes over and diffuses the situation, giving me an opportunity to walk away. Great, crisis averted, wrong. Bouncer doesn't throw him out, just gives me a buffer so this guy starts following me around the place, even attempting to walk into an employee-only area which is where another bouncer finally notices and kicks him out. I finish my shift and walk over to my car. There he is, I kid you not, sitting on the bonnet of my car. How he knew it was my car I will never know. He wants me to give him a ride and tells me how pretty I look. He's spewing greasy slimeball creep lines at this point and I'm not interested. I try to give him a hint nicely and decline to give him a ride, but again he just turns to me and grabs me by my arm insisting I give him a ride. I tell him to screw off and jam my key in his shoulder as hard as I can. He lets go and I push him with all my might so he falls down. I jump in my car, lock the door, and shove that key in the ignition. He's back up and banging on the window angrily to let him in. And I mean hard, so hard I think his hands or my window might break. I gun the accelerator and I'm out of there. When I get 5 minutes down the road and I'm sure I'm not being followed, I pull over to the side of the road and call back to work. I tell them what's happened and alert them that the other girls need to be careful leaving tonight. As I hang up the phone I break into tears. I eventually compose myself, pull back into the road and head home. I cry myself to sleep. Next morning word has gotten around and owner calls me to make sure I'm okay. I assure him I am but he insists I take some time off in case this creep comes back. He wants to put some distance between us, makes sense. A week goes by, then two, he's coming in every night asking about me and being told I quit and don't work there anymore. I lie to get him to stop coming in, you know, but he just keeps coming in and asking, clearly not buying it and then suddenly two and a half weeks in, he stops. Great, I am really needing money at this point so I'm happy to be able to go back to work the following week. Time goes on and everything seems to go back to normal. Same old chances but the good kind that leads to higher paychecks. Abusive guy doesn't come back in, I'm happy. I start being forgetful though. I think I leave a door closed when I leave the house but it's open when I get back. Lights on or off, food left out, things ending up in different places than I remember putting them sometimes moments before. I'm losing it but it's probably just the stress of everything that's gone down. One of my close friends who works with me reassures me that it's normal after being grabbed like that and it will pass. This keeps up for a month until one day I head out to work, get 15 minutes down the road and realize I forgot some clothes I'll need that night at work. I head back home only to find the lights in my front room on and the TV visible as on from the outside. I really am losing it, good thing I came back I guess. I head inside, grab my stuff, make sure to turn the TV off and the light out and head to the door. Suddenly I freeze. There standing blocking the door is the creep that grabbed me. I'm stunned, jaw dropped on the floor. Then after what seems like a lifetime of standing in silence staring at each other, him smiling, I scream what the, I'm screaming for him to get out and ask him what he's doing here, how he knows where I lived, all in one jumbled mouthful of confusion. He just stands there with that smile on his face while I'm loudly freaking out but stupidly not moving. I start gasping for air in a mixture of panic attack and bewilderment, then he decides to speak in my wake. The word ooze out of him and leave me chilled. Welcome home honey, you're back early. A switch goes off in my head, I throw everything I have on me at him and sprint to the back door. I'm out ski. I leg it faster than I have in my life, screaming bloody murder as I go. I hide in some bushes around the corner, tears running down my face, gasping for air. I check my pocket and my keys are still there, no phone though, I threw that at the stalker creep along with everything else. I sneak back to my house, jump in my car and nope out of there. I head to work, tell them what's happened and call the cops. Cops head to my house and send others to my work. Stalker guy is gone but when they turn up, they search the house and turns out he's been living in my crawl space. I'm paranoid that's what all those doors and lights and misplaced things was about. I pack up whatever I can fit in my car while cops are still there, that they'll let me take and I drive. Haven't been back since. I moved states, knew everything.
This happened around 2006, when I was in my mid-twenties and my sister, the unfortunate main character in the story, had just turned 21. At the time, she and her boyfriend lived with my fiancé and I. On weekends, we went out to one of the two bars set at karaoke, air hockey, etc. This particular night, we were at the bar further out from where we lived in the city, a good half an hour by car. Everyone was having drinks, socializing with people we knew. It was one of those places, lots of regulars, singing karaoke, nothing out of the ordinary really. Except that night, my sister started hanging out with these two older ladies who had a liquor store in their purses, and were quite sharing, although I didn't know it at the time. As she tended to drink a lot more than me, that was a score for her. Less money spent on drinks, but she ended up far more hammered than usual. Towards the end of the night, around 1.45, she was really very drunk. The aforementioned fiancé, my sister's boyfriend, and I were in a heated air hockey game, planning to leave as soon as it was over. She walked up to us and said she was going to smoke a cigarette outside. Nothing unusual, everyone did until we were done. About 5 minutes later, we paid our tab and walked out, but she was not on the porch area where smokers congregated. Okay, weird, but not alarming. We went out back of the bar to check for her, inside, in the restroom, in the large parking lot. It is notable that this particular bar was in a business park, so there were multiple businesses that were closed, as well as the Mexican restaurant next door that had just closed as well. We searched, asked everyone that knew us and those who didn't if they had seen her. No one had. I asked the workers from the restaurant that were sitting outside as well. They seemed nervous when telling me they hadn't seen her, but I didn't think on that much until later. By then, I was in a full-on panic after trying to call her cell about 15 times only to have it go to voicemail. Being a bit inebriated myself, I started searching for her. Went as far as to take off my heels and start running down the highway searching for her as, honestly, there had been times she would start walking home in the past, though never from this place as it was so far away from where we lived. The fiancé and her boyfriend thought we should go to the house to see if she got someone to bring her home. Seemed unlikely, but not unheard of. We get home and she's nowhere to be found. Just as we were about to head back and I was going to phone the police, I received a call from the PD on my phone. They indicated that they had my sister, that there had been an incident, and I needed to get down there. We rushed to the PD where we were taken into a room with my sister. Her face was red from obvious crying, and bruises were starting to show on her arms and chest. She said that when she told us she was going outside, she thought we said we were leaving then, so she walked to the car. After a few minutes being drunk and tired, she sat down up against it to wait. A van pulled up and a young man was asking her directions to somewhere. She walked closer to try to explain when suddenly the back door flew open and two other men grabbed her and threw her in, taking off. They were rough with her, hitting her a few times while holding her down, saying they only wanted money. They snatched her purse from her, breaking the straps and searched it, quite haphazardly as they didn't find the $30 she had in it. After driving around a bit speaking in Spanish, she couldn't understand they pulled out a gun, making sure she saw it and put a bandana around her eyes, telling her that they'd let her go. She was driven to some woods by a neighborhood she did not know. The door was opened and they pushed her out, telling her to run, that if she took the blindfold off or turned around, they'd shoot. She ran and ran. Eventually, she did take the blindfold off and came to the first door she saw, beating on it and screaming for help. The police were called, she was picked up, and now we are back to my being there, hearing what I feared had happened. Report filed, police did a search and did locate the bandana she ripped off, but as she was so intoxicated and terrified, she was not able to give a clear description of the van other than white older model or the three occupants other than young Hispanic men. The investigation turned up nothing as no cameras caught any of this. We even had detectives in our home who said, look, we need the truth. If you got drunk and just went home with someone and didn't want your boyfriend to find out, we will file charges against you. Aside from the bruises, broken person or trauma, there was nothing concrete to go on. That was unpleasant. I am still fairly convinced someone at the restaurant knew something given their suspicious behaviors when I asked about her, but the police were never able to find that link. All said and done, the guys were never found. Eventually, we just moved on. In different states, it's now just a story in our lives. It still makes me sick thinking of what could have happened, but thankfully, it didn't. A little backstory, I was about 16 at the time, and I rode the public bus to and from school. This particular day, I had done some special effects makeup before the end of my classes, so I had fake blood running down my face and I couldn't be bothered to take it off before leaving school. Now I knew as I was boarding my bus, people would stare or ask questions, so I wasn't surprised when this man, who looked to be in his mid-30s, started asking about the makeup. The conversation was normal at first, just the usual, oh wow, did you do that yourself, kind of stuff. I answered the questions as normally as I would, and expected the conversation to be done and over with. But I was wrong. This man, he mentioned his name was Joe, started steering the conversation into strange territory, asking me if I had a boyfriend, to which I lied and said I did. He then proceeded to ask if my boyfriend liked the makeup and if I was on my way to see him now. I again lied and said he likes the makeup and yes, I was going to see him, trying to get Joe to believe someone was expecting me. The conversation died down for a bit until he said this, you know, you remind me a lot of my sister. 
He said with a grin. I just smiled a response, not really knowing what to say. After not hearing anything from me, Joe continued, My sister was kind of a jerk. She was always lying about me to her parents. I had fantasies about breaking her jaw. Now at this point I was terrified. My bus stop was still another 20 minutes away and I just wanted to be out of that situation. Seeing that what he said made me uncomfortable, he switched the subject, telling me about where he worked and what he does there. I just nodded along to what he was saying, remaining silent the entire time. Closer to my bus stop, he says to me, why don't you come to my house? I have a freezer full of pizza and ice cream. Maybe we could hang out for a while. To which I politely declined, saying my boyfriend was expecting me. Finally, I get to my bus stop and quickly get off the bus, speed walking all the way home, all the while calling a friend to inform them of what happened. Things were fine for a bit after that. I switched my bus route so I wouldn't run into him again. But one afternoon, I had to go to a store that was on my old route. I was nervous about getting on that bus again, but was happy when I didn't see Joe. I did my shopping, and as I was leaving the store, I saw Joe, standing out by the door, staring at me. The second I was out the doors, he walked over to me, a grin on his face, and wrapped his arms around me. I pulled away from him, telling him I was very busy and had to go. He then asked, well, what are you doing? I have time I can tag along. I was very persistent, saying I really couldn't, I had to go, and I walked away, heading into a neighboring store that I knew would be busy. Sure enough, Joe Joe followed. I ignored him as I made my way down a heavily populated makeup aisle, keeping my attention on some cheap lipsticks in the hopes he'd get the hint and leave me alone. I was wrong. Joe reached over my shoulder, grabbing a red lipstick as he leaned in close and whispered, This color would look gorgeous on you. I can't wait to see you wearing it. He then placed the lipstick in my basket and walked away, leaving the store. I remained in the store for about 20 minutes after he left, afraid to leave and make the walk home. After I mustered up the courage, I put the lipstick back, put away the basket, and called a friend to stay on the line with me until I made it home. Now I don't know if he followed me home or not, but I can say that after that day, the motion detector porch light started coming on at night, and I started hearing knocks at my bedroom window. Thankfully, I moved shortly after and haven't seen Joe since. This happened two summers ago, while I was house sitting out in California for an older couple I had met at a conference for work. It had seemed like a dream scenario, the couple wanted to vacation to Hawaii for two weeks, but didn't want to board their cats, and I had been chatting with them about wanting to visit California again, where they happened to live, because I had loved it for the first time I went, and we figured that we could mutually benefit if I came out and house sat for them. So I flew out there, and they showed me around for a few days, taught me how to take care for the cats, two of them, one that was extremely shy and I barely saw, which is important later, and their plants gave me access to their house and cars. These people were so generous, and before I knew it, I had dropped them off at the airport and I was on my own. At first, it was really the dream vacation. I was staying in Oakland and making forays into San Francisco, Sonoma, Monterey. In the mornings, I could walk out the front door and shortly be hiking the paths surrounding nearby Mount Diablo, and I was just ultra content with the world. I was so enamored by the area that I had actually started looking into taking some steps to relocate out there even. But then one day, about halfway through my final week there, when I got back to the house I felt really odd, almost like I shouldn't go inside. I shook it off and went inside anyway because it was getting late and I needed to put out dinner for the cats. Once I was inside, I forced myself to ignore how off I felt, and I made some food for myself, went to bed, and was shocked to find the shy cat hiding under my bed and crying. This was the first time I had ever seen her close up. The entire time I had been there, up to that point, she never left my host bedroom unless she didn't realize I was around. Again, I ignored feeling weird, and just assumed she had decided I was okay and went to bed. I did start locking my bedroom door that night though. I also remember that about halfway through that night, I thought I heard someone walking around in the gravel outside my window, but after listening for a bit, I didn't hear anything else and went back to sleep. The day after, in the morning, I still felt a little odd, but kept up with my plans for the day. I drove out to a little musical festival in Sonoma and went clothes shopping and had an overall great day. When I got back to the house though, I found the front door locked in a way that I hadn't left it. Basically, my host never locked the deadbolt, only the lower second lock, and that's the only lock my key worked on, so I never messed with the deadbolt, but it was definitely locked. So I had to call my host and find the hide key, which, to their credit safety wise, was buried like a whole foot underneath a bush outside and had definitely not been unearthed for a long time, so I used that, went inside, and kept the key with me just in case it happened again. And it did, but with a different door. This time I had stepped out into the garage to get a drink, and when I turned around to go back into the house, the door was shut and locked. I could use my normal key on that door, but I was still getting pretty bewildered. My own cats were whack, so I think in my mind I was trying to come up with a way that the cats could be locking me out the house, but I was coming up empty. I decided I must have been misunderstanding how the locks worked and just wrote it off and started checking and triple checking locks when I went out of the house or into the garage. That night when 
I went to bed, the really awful feeling of unease was still there, and so was the shy cat, who was clearly unhappy to see me, but also wouldn't leave my room. But again, I just locked my bedroom door and went to sleep. The next morning, I felt awful. Nausea, body ache, I had no desire to leave the house, so I decided to stay in and Netflix for a day. This vacation stay was like a full two weeks, so I didn't feel like I was in any hurry to get all the touristy things in anyways. But as the days went on, I started to feel that feeling of wrongness again, and it morphed into feeling incredibly washed. Around mid-afternoon, it got to the point that I was so uneasy that, even feeling awful, I decided to get out of the house for a bit to shake it off. I was getting a bit low on food, so I went to the grocery store and bought a couple food items that I didn't think would hurt my stomach and then I left. When I got to my car, I started crying and my entire body was telling me not to drive back to the house. I couldn't not though, because I didn't want to neglect the cats, so I drove back, parked in the driveway, and convinced myself, after about half an hour, to just go open the front door. Once I did that, I thought I would get over it and would be able to go in and at least feed the cats, and then maybe I'd go get a hotel room after, but my body physically would not let me inside. It was like I was stuck in the entryway. I then made a deal with myself. I would yell into the house saying I had already called the police and that they were on their way. In panic logic, I figured that would make anyone in the house leave, so I faced the inside of the house, looking down the hallway towards the bedrooms, and I did just that. The second I had finished saying, they're almost here, so if you want to avoid being arrested, you need to leave now. The light in my host room turned on and I heard some banging. I immediately hightailed it back to the car, called the police for real, and proceeded to have a mental breakdown while talking to the dispatcher. Once they got there, they checked the house and didn't find anyone. The double doors on my host bedroom were left wide open. I'm so glad the cats didn't get out, and there was a pile of food wrappers in the corner behind the blinds, so they said it looked like someone had been there. What makes it so scary to me is that nothing was taken, and that based on the shape of the house, that would have been the perfect vantage point to see me in the living room as I stayed home sick. To explain this, the house was in an L shape and from the windows into the garden that were in my host bedroom, you could see into the living room windows. Also, the minute the police were gone, they said they couldn't prove anyone was there, there were no signs of forced entry, and we couldn't get a hold of my host immediately to verify if anything had been taken, etc., which once they were back, they verified that nothing had been taken, so, so they said they'd patrol a bit but nothing else. The shy cat was right back into my host bedroom and I didn't see her again until I left to go back home. So basically, I think the intruder had been there at least two days, forcing her to choose between two strangers and leading her to choose the one that was at least a little less strange, me. It messed me up pretty bad, especially because they didn't catch the person and didn't seem to have any desire to look, and I still had to stay in the house for the next three days. Nothing else odd happened and I didn't feel off the rest of the time I was there, but the damage was done. I've never felt completely safe in a home without doing a complete search before bed since, but I am extremely glad my gut spoke up. I guess I'd rather have some residual anxiety than be dead. So about 5 years ago, I, male 26 years old, set out to travel the world. Being straight out of college had left me dead, ever more desperate for any job I was overqualified for and generally depressed. I felt isolated and alone in my small town in Washington and found the only way to get out, travel. My high school buddy suggested I look into Wu Fai Ji and volunteering as a way to travel cheap, and so I did. The way it works is quite simple. You work for around 25 hours a week on some farm for food and housing. The draw is that since the community of cheap travelers is quite big, it is a great way to meet new people, get outside of your comfort zone and just let yourself live and figure life out. Fast forward 8 months and I'm a seasoned cow patty shoveler. I started out in Washington, Oregon and went south to California. There, I was able to save some money I was paid under the table for some extra work and was now faced with a decision, where to go in the world. The excitement of being able to purchase a ticket to almost anywhere in the world got the best of me, and on the advice of my volunteering partner, I chose it at random. I went to a randomizer website and clicked the country button, Georgia. The country of Georgia. To say I didn't know anything about it was an understatement, but the fear of the unknown made it exciting and exotic somehow, and so I did it. I purchased a ticket and started browsing for a farm that could host me. There were a few options, and most were remote and hadn't even had an internet connection. I messaged every single one because few ever respond and got a response from one farm on top of a mountain. The picture showed a traditional Georgian stone house with a large garden out in the back, a family with several cheerful children, grandparents having dinner, animals. It seemed warm and inviting. The description was written in good English and the requirements for work seemed reasonable. I was excited. After I flew into Tbilisi, the capital, I followed the instructions that they have sent to locate the farm, which wasn't an easy task. Few in Georgia speak English, the roads are screwed since few have been maintained since the fall of the Soviet Union and the country is generally poor. It took me around 20 hours of Soviet buses and taxis, weird serpentine roads and paths to get to the desired blue pin on my map. It was a dirt path leading up a steep hill and to a national park up in the north of the country. There was nothing for miles on end but trees in their silence. As I got up that hill, I saw the house about half a mile away on even a steeper hill, surrounded by the trees. From that viewpoint, it seemed abandoned, overgrown, brown, and dreary. 
As I walked past the gate, Giri, fake name, the apparent owner approached me. He was a heavy, small, middle-aged guy with a big smile on his face. He shook my hand and in broken English started to show me around. He also smelled a booze. As he was showing me around, I noticed that there wasn't anyone there but us. I asked about his wife and kids and he brushed that aside and said something to the extent, they're away right now. By this point, I am creeped out. From browsing around, it was apparent that the farm was in deep decline. Apple trees and crops were dying, the roof of the small barn caved in, and the house itself full of trash and smelling of mold. It was obvious that Giri was going through a rough patch, but I wasn't going to turn around and just leave in the middle of nowhere, without a plan, having not slept for the past 36 hours. It was evening, and after feeding me well and trying as best as he could to hold a conversation in English, Giri showed me my room on the second floor and I went to sleep. I almost immediately blacked out from the exhaustion and stress, and would have slept for 10 hours if I wasn't awoken by a strange noise in the middle of the night. It sounded like something metallic and heavy was being dragged across the wooden floor. In that sleepy in-between state, I listened to it for a few minutes, thought nothing of it and went back to sleep once it stopped. In the morning, Giri, now sober and grumpy, asked me to repair some of the windows and doors in the house as he himself planned to go and fetch some components in a nearby village. Again, I got this weird feeling creeping down my spine. Something wasn't right. He didn't maintain eye contact and was evasive. There was no cell reception, no internet. Once he left, I checked around the house to get a general idea of the place, and it became apparent that the place was hardly ever lived in, like one of those abandoned houses. There was broken furniture, newspapers, and old photos on the floor, a shattered mirror, I took my phone and looked through the saved listing again. The photos didn't match neither the backyard, the garden, or the walls. Yuri wasn't in any of them. It was a completely different house. Now by this point, I am full-blown panicking. I pack my stuff and start to leave when I see a group of three men going up that first hill. There aren't any other paths I can take, so I go behind the house and rush down this hill into the forest. After some time, I stop and listen. I hear them in the house. They're clearly looking for me. Afraid of making any noise, I remain still, hidden behind a bush. I don't know how long I wait, but they were persistent. At some point, I hear them leave, so I count until some large number and proceed back into the house and path, and once I find it's all clear, I book the heck out of there. Never ran this fast. But I am still in the middle of nowhere. No traffic, no public transport. I reach a paved road and start walking in the general direction from where I remember coming. Hours go by and finally, a car drives by and stops. It was a really nice Russian family that gave me a ride to town. The listing disappeared from the website a few days later I left, and I haven't heard from Geary since. I've yet to make sense of that experience. I have traveled since and volunteered to and have yet to have an experience like that again, but I trust my gut feeling something was really not right. More than a few years ago, I was working as a burlesque entertainer in a gentleman's club. It was idly sitting at the end of the bar one night when a couple came in. Not unusual. I had no contact with them and thought nothing of their being there until later. A few days after that night, the doorman handed me a piece of paper that had two names and phone numbers written on it. Laura and Richard. I was supposed to call one of them, so I called Laura, who told me they had been the couple who'd been at the bar the other night. And they noticed me and thought I'd be perfect for a part in a movie Richard was producing. Would I be up for a meeting? Of course I would. Who wouldn't? I was told Richard would pick me up the next night at 7 and to wear something wild. 7 o'clock came the next evening and I was ready in a white lace dress with ostrich feather trim when Richard showed up outside my building so I went down, introduced myself and got in the car. We agreed to go to a local bar I knew well from the meeting but first we had to go back to his place so he could pick up some contracts he'd forgotten so off we went. He went in the house and came back out with a few manila envelopes and an open bottle of beer, a brand that I didn't drink. Plus, it's against the law to drink alcohol in a vehicle here. So I stuck the beer into the window well of his jeep and we went to the bar. At the bar, he showed me what were supposedly scripts from this movie he was producing. In some contracts, it looked pretty legit. Richard was very nice and I was interested. I had made some plans to go out later with my soon-to-be boyfriend, so I excused myself to go call him on the bar's payphone and took my corona that I'd ordered at the bar with me to the bank of phones. As a dancer, I'd been taught by the other older girls to never let your drink out of sight. My boyfriend wanted to get going to another club, so I went back to the table where Richard was and told him I had to go. He didn't like that and tried a few different things to get me to go to the movie set with him, saying I could meet Mickey Rourke and check out the set. But all I really wanted to do was meet my boyfriend, so I declined, took Richard's card, and left. I never heard from Richard again, but a couple of months later, the police came around to the bar I was working at. They had two big books some mug shots and a stack of Polaroids with them. And they wanted to talk to all of us about a predator couple who had been setting up meetings with dancers by saying they were in the film industry, then drugging them. They showed me the two mugshot books and asked if I saw anyone I recognized in the pictures. And I immediately identified Richard and Laura. They then showed me the Polaroids, which were trophy pictures of the couple in the act of attacking the poor drug girls, and asked if I knew any of the victims and where they might find them, in order to talk to the girls. I only knew a couple of women in the photographs, but there were a lot that this had happened to. Richard and Laura were prosecuted. He went to 
jail, but she didn't because she was from a wealthy family and she also turned witness on him. About 12 years after Richard was convicted, I saw in the newspaper that he was up for possibility of parole. So I wrote a letter to the parole board telling the story and urging them not to let him back out because he's a dangerous offender who should have to stay in prison for the entirety of his sentence. If I had drank that open beer he had handed me in his Jeep on the way to that meeting, I wouldn't have made it to the meeting and would probably have ended up in that stack of Polaroids. Girls and guys, always, always keep your eye on your drinks. Have fun, but be careful out there. So this happened about a year and a half ago. I moved to Los Angeles three years ago. First time living on my own and I love it. Even with everything that happened, I still love living here. So I'm a smoker, on average about three to four cigarettes a day. So thankfully I'm only at a pack, like every five or six days, whatever. Math isn't my strong suit. Anyway, I live in a non-smoking building so I have to step outside when I want to smoke. The first time I saw this guy, he was outside my building, sitting next to a dumpster. No big deal, probably just another neighbor I hadn't met. His name is Oz. The first time I I saw Oz, I was having a cigarette outside, and he just glanced over at me every once in a while, but that's it. Two days later, it's like 11.30pm and I'm heading downstairs to smoke. I look at the lobby of the building and see someone underneath a blanket behind some chairs. I see a cord going behind the blanket bulge, so I immediately assume someone's in the doghouse for the night and charging their phone. I have my smoke, head back upstairs, and go to sleep. A week later, it's the middle of the day. I've gotten some work done and decided to take a smoke break. I go and sit outside like I always do. Oz is sitting outside as well. This time he's got some paperwork with him. A lot of paperwork. At this point, I feel like I should provide a description of Oz. He's about 6 feet tall, early to mid 30s. He has medium length hair that has been styled into dreadlocks. A full but short beard, if that makes sense. He was wearing worn down pants and jackets. Based on his face, he seemed like he cleaned himself up regularly, but his clothes made him look homeless, and sadly he was. So Oz is going to over the paperwork in his hands when he looks over at me and says hi. So I responded kind. He then asked me how I'm doing today. I'm doing pretty okay, I respond. How are you? I'm good man, I'm good. Good. It's a nice day, right? Yeah, yeah it is. So when are you moving? Now that question came out of nowhere. Was he hoping to find a new place to live? Was he trying to move into this building? Was that what his paperwork was all about? I mean, if he's moving into a new apartment, great. I hope life works out well for him. But why was he asking me when I'm moving out? I know the building at the time had a vacancy or two, so if he was going to move in, why ask a question like that? Why make it sound like he's waiting for someone to move out so he can have a spot? My brain asked all those questions in less than a second of Voss asking me that. After a couple seconds of being stunned by Oz's question, I just said, I'm not moving anytime soon, man. My cigarette was over by then, so it was time for me to go to my apartment. Another week later, I go see a friend stand up set, and when I get back to my apartment at like 10 p.m., I see two police SUVs outside my building with lights on. I go inside because if there are two police vehicles already there, I can't do anything so might as well stay out of the way. The cops are talking to one of my downstairs neighbors, and I can't catch anything they're talking about. Two days later, notices have been put up next to the mailboxes that say, this man is not allowed in this building and it has a photo of Oz. Turns out the blanket bulge I saw was actually Oz, when he somehow managed to get inside the building and sleep in the lobby with an electric blanket. A couple of months go by and I don't see Oz. I honestly forgot about him by that point. When finally one day, Oz is there again, sitting outside the building with somehow even more paperwork. This time when he sees me, he's almost immediately hostile. So when are you getting out of here? What? I want my apartment back, man. I don't know what you're talking about. You stole my apartment and I want it back. I was so confused by this. I snuffed my cigarette out and went back into the building. This exchange pretty much repeated itself every few days for the next two weeks, each time making me more and more uncomfortable. On weekdays, I would get home very late, like anywhere between 11.30pm and 2am. Oz never had a predictable pattern to his appearances, so I started getting really nervous about going home. Like, I wanted to avoid going home so I could avoid being accosted by Oz. Finally, one Saturday after lunch, I step outside and have a smoke. Oz is there, and this time he's mad. He's saying that if I don't get out of his apartment by the end of the day, he'll get me. That shook me up a lot. I got back inside and stayed there. Around midnight, I decided to step outside and have a smoke, hoping against hope that Oz isn't there. But lo and behold, Oz is there. Wizard. He's sitting by the dumpster again, and I go to the opposite direction to inhale smoke. I see Oz go up to the stoop and stand in front of the door to the building. Great. When my cigarette is done, I head to the stairs to get into my building. Oz steps to block me from getting to the door. Excuse me, I say as I try to go past him, but he stops me. You ain't getting in here, he says. Why? Because you don't live here. Yes, I do. No, you don't, man. You don't live here. Yeah, I do live here. Now, please move out of my way. Maybe if I stay kind, he'll let me go home, but no, he doubled down. Nah, man, you can't get in here because you don't live here. 
For the last time I live here. Prove it man, you got paperwork? Yes, I have a lease. Where? I was getting really irritated at this point, so my answer started becoming really cold. Like I was getting pretty rude to this guy. I don't carry it with me everywhere I go. Now move aside and let me in. No, now you need to get out of here. Move. Nah, now you need to get out of here or I'm calling my security team. No, you need to move or I'm calling the cops. Do it man, my security guys are already on their way. They're gonna screw you up. At this point, I was already stepping away from the door and pulling out my phone. I called the non-emergency number because in the moment I didn't feel threatened by Oz, but I should have called regular dispatch instead of non-emergency. Cops got there about half an hour later and Oz was still there. The cops came and got out of their car. One cop was holstering their nightstick and dropped it on the ground, then holstered it properly. The two cops that showed up separated and talked to Oz and I separately. I tell my cop that I was just trying to get back into my building, he's blocking me. He's been harassing me lately saying I need to move out. Oz, however, had a very different story. He claimed that I stole his apartment from him, stole his credit cards, and stole his insurance payouts. The apartment he claimed I stole from him isn't the apartment I live in. The cherry on top of this lack of a Sunday is the part where he accused me of throwing dog water on him. An actual water bottle filled with a mixture of dog spit and water. That's the guess I have as to what dog water is. First he claimed I threw it up at him while I was standing on the sidewalk and he was on the stoop. Then he claimed I was on the fire escape above him and literally poured the water on him from above. Thankfully the cops knew immediately that this was a lie, but because I guess no actual crime had been committed, all they could do was tell Oz to go away. He was not happy about it, but he did. I hoped that Oz would not come back after that, but sadly I was wrong. Oz did come back just one last time. A few days later, it's the middle of the day and I'm walking downstairs to inhale fire. As I step outside, I see two cops, Oz and one of my downstairs neighbors. Oz and my neighbor are separated and giving statements to the cops. When my neighbor is done, his name is John. I go up to him and ask him what happened. John then shows me his elbows, both scraped up and lightly bleeding. One of his knees is also lightly cut up. Oz also had a couple of bruises and light cuts on him. John tells me that as he was trying to enter the building earlier, Oz was standing right outside and tried to force his way in. John stopped him and tried to tell him to leave. The two got into a small fight and the cops were called. I decide to sit outside with John while everything is being figured out and while John is waiting for his wife, a nurse, to get home and look him over. The manager of the building is called and helps the cops to look at the security camera footage for the front of the building. After looking at it for about 10 minutes, the cops and manager return. Sadly, the fight took place outside of view of the cameras. So it became a case of he said he said, so all the cops can do is tell Oz to leave once again. Since then, I have not seen Oz anywhere near my building and a sign has been put up outside the building stating, this building is not open to the public, no unauthorized entry, which is both comforting and disconcerting. This event took place quite a few years ago, so unfortunately I don't remember everything that happened, but I remember nearly all of it. Anyways, this happened when I was around 4 to 5 years old and on Easter Sunday. My family always gathers at my grandmother's house to celebrate holidays, birthdays, etc. So as we do every holiday, my mother and I started our hour-long trip to her house. My mother prefers to live away from all the city commotion, which explains the long drive. We were probably around 20 minutes away from our destination when my mom noticed that we were a little low on gas, so we pulled into this old, almost rustic looking gas station with just a handful of customers inside. It was red and white with a few festive decorations outside and lots of Easter stickers from the two large glass windows that were on either side of the door. My mom, having taught me not to talk to strangers nor open the doors for anyone but her, trusted me enough to leave me in the car alone as she went inside briefly to pay for gas. She told me she would be right back before going into the gas station. It felt nice that day, so the windows in the car were down so we could feel the breeze while driving instead of the AC. While I was waiting on my mom, I remember adjusting the colorful paper clippings in my Easter basket next to me, then looking out of the backseat window. When I looked over, I saw a tall, older man, maybe around 30 or 40 years old, approaching my window. He crouched down slightly and looked at me, hi there, what's your name? I remember him saying. At this moment, I remember that I wasn't supposed to talk to strangers, so I told the man that my mom says I shouldn't speak to strangers. He then replied with, well, we could be friends then, my name's Charlie, and now that you know, I guess I'm not a stranger now, huh? At the time, I thought he was right, in my mind, I thought, since a stranger is someone you don't know, this man wasn't a stranger anymore because I knew his name. The man and I had a short conversation that I don't quite remember. All I remember is him telling me that I had a nice Easter basket. At this point, I started to get a sick feeling in my stomach, but being a child, of course, I didn't know why. My mom then walked out of the gas station and noticed the man immediately and began approaching the car quickly asking the man what he thinks he's doing. The man seems to panic and he pulls my door handle violently. He quickly realized that it was locked, thankfully, and proceeded to reach into my window and grab me by one of my wrists and attempt to pull me out. This obviously scared me a lot causing me to panic and pull him against on instinct. This caused him to let go and take off running. My mom quickly ran to the car and I unlocked the doors. She grabbed me and pulled 
me into an almost painful bear hug, then inspecting me closely repeatedly asking if I was okay. I ended up with a slight bruise slash redness on my arm where he grabbed me, but other than that I was just shaken up. The reality of what had just happened set in at this moment and I remember just crying and holding until my mom right after I said I was okay. I don't remember anything after this point, but I recently asked my mom about it and she said that she called the police immediately after. To this day, my mom still says that this was the most frightening moment of her life and claims that if she had gotten there any later and came back to an empty car, she wouldn't have been able to live with herself. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. I am a female and now 23. This happened around the time that I was 15 years old. Around this time it was my sophomore year in high school, so little backstory to help understand the story I'm about to tell. I was involved in my high school color guard. We are a part of band except we don't play instruments. We would spin colorful flags. We also use rifles and sabers in our performances. Around this time it was the fall and we were practicing our show, doing a lot of reruns to try and perfect it before our usual competitions. Normally practice would start at 4 and end almost at 9. Side note, I didn't live close to my high school like most people that went there. The drive would take at least 15 minutes max. Walking from my house to school would take an hour and taking the bus would take 45 minutes. My brother at this time worked late hours and my parents didn't get off of work until midnight, so my next best choice was the bus. The neighborhood wasn't the worst, but it also wasn't safe to be walking home at night. So on this night, I was saying goodbye to my friends and not wanting to bug them for a ride, I walked to my bus stop. I had my cell phone and started scrolling through Facebook. I would occasionally glance up and look at my surroundings. I noticed a car slowing down in front of my bus stop, but it immediately signaled to make a turn to my left. I didn't think much about it since there are houses behind that bus stop. It wasn't weird until I noticed this car doing that again and then again and again. I found this odd. It wasn't until he had basically passed by me for the seventh time that he finally parked on the curb by my bus stop. That's when I got a good look at him and that I took in his appearance. This happened a couple of years ago so my memory isn't great, but I do remember he was Hispanic and reminded me a bit of an uncle of a friend of mine. He spoke his first words to me that sent me panicking. To translate what he said to me in Spanish, it was basically him saying, Hey, come over here. Do you need a ride? Hop in. I'll take you. He kept saying that for a good five minutes and then suddenly drove off. I then let out a breath I didn't know I was holding in. I was trying to calm myself down and tell myself it was over, but I knew it wasn't and I was right. His car showed back up and the thing about my bus stop is that there is a house behind it, except before the house there is a good amount of space with just dirt. Cars can actually go in this space and I've seen it before. He parked behind my bus stop. At this moment I was already thinking about how to get out of the situation. I was frozen in place, not fight or flight but freezing, the worst thing to ever do. At this time this big guy was close by and was walking his pit bull on a leash. In my frozen state I knew this was my only chance and fought to get the words out. It was my only chance to save myself and I'm so glad I spoke out. Excuse me, could you please stay with me? That man in the car right there won't leave me alone. I'm very scared. Please stand by my side. My words choked up and I was shaking at this point. The guy was kind hearted and agreed. He stared down the man who at this point had his window up and began reversing. He drove off and the guy stayed with me till my bus came. At this time it was 9.59. I know that some of you might ask, why didn't you go back to your high school? Well at this point no one was really there. Mostly everyone had been picked up. I had a cell phone but no one was going to be able to pick me up. This was my only transportation and that time I didn't know about Lyft or Uber. I'm not even sure if it was a thing back then. Overall I'm just happy to have been saved by that kind hearted guy. Because of him I am here and able to share the story of mine. I'm still shaken up at the memory of it because of the scare it gave me. After that incident I asked for a ride for the remaining of that season. Sometimes even when you don't want to bug people with rides it doesn't hurt to ask. It's better to be that annoying person than finding yourself in my situation. Stay safe when taking the bus at night. I work evenings as a dispatcher in a medium-sized midwestern city. I was driving home at 2am when I stopped for gas. In retrospect, it was stupid to have stopped at all. The gas station was poorly lit and completely empty of any other customers, but I knew the shady areas of town and this was not usually one of them. As I was pumping gas, I noticed a middle-aged woman sitting on the curb across the parking lot. It was a cold night and had just started raining. The woman was not wearing weather-appropriate clothing so she was drenched. When the woman saw that I was watching her, she called out to me from across the parking lot. My second of many stupid decisions that night was choosing to engage with her. I was worried for her, so I approached her to see what sort of help I could offer. Hi beautiful, I'm just trying to get home, but no one will help me, she said. I'm trying to get to City A, but the cab ride is $60 and I only have $40. Can you help me? I don't usually give money to panhandlers, but this woman seemed genuine. The weather was terrible and my job centers around helping people, so I agreed. I told her I didn't have any cash, but if she would come with me inside, I'd take some money out of the ATM and give her a few dollars. But the ATM was 
wasn't working. I apologized and told her there was nothing else I could do for her. She followed me back outside, idly chatting with me as I opened my driver's door to get in, and then she got in my car. I was too shocked to really say anything. I sat staring at her as she buckled herself into the passenger seat. As soon as she got into my car, her demeanor changed entirely. She no longer seemed forlorn, as much as she did extremely, extremely excited and restless. Just take me to my aunt's house, she said. She can give me money. Of course, alarm bells are going off in my head. Although my first instinct is to tell her to get out of my car, my gut tells me that that would be dangerous. She'd already proven to be unpredictable, she seemed to be high, and I didn't know if she had any weapons on her. Forcing her out of my vehicle, I thought, had the potential to elicit a violent reaction. Where are you asking me to take you? I finally said. Just start driving, I'll tell you where to turn. No, if you want me to consider driving you somewhere, I need you to tell me where we're going. I say, with no real intention of driving her anywhere. Don't worry, honey, I'm not gonna rob you or nothing, just drive. No, I repeated, where is your aunt's address? Okay, it's on street A. What's the house number? As I was asking her questions, she got really agitated. We still had not left the gas station parking lot. I considered getting out of the car and going into the gas station to help, but A, she had seemed to know and be friendly with one of the attendants that was inside when I tried to get money, and B, I wasn't about to leave her alone in my car. Finally, she snapped at me and said, why are you asking me so many questions? I thought we were friends. You don't trust me? I work at a police department, I said. It's my job to ask these sort of questions. She flipped out. She started yelling at me about being a snitch, about trying to get her into trouble, just in general losing her mind. At this point, I'm more scared than ever. I just wanted her gone, but my instinct still told me asking her to get out of my car wouldn't work, so I decided to take a risk. I'm not a police officer, I just work at a police department. Why don't I take you to Walmart and see if they have an ATM that works? My idea was to get her out of my car as peacefully as possible, then lose her in the store. She liked my idea and immediately calmed down. I knew that driving off with this woman in my car was incredibly, incredibly risky, but it seemed like the best option at the time. As we're driving, she keeps talking to me. Her thoughts were erratic, bouncing all over the place. It sometimes seemed difficult for her to follow through one a thought, but this is roughly how our conversation went. I'm glad we're friends now. I have about five or six people trying to get to me. I'm going to come to your work tomorrow so we can go arrest them together. Okay, we can talk about that tomorrow. Tonight you said you're trying to get home? Yes, honey, I'm trying to get to City B. City B? I thought you said you needed to go to City A. Yeah, yeah, City A, that's what I meant. That's why the cab ride is $40. It's far away. The cab ride is $40? Yeah, you said you have $40. I do. I have $40, but the cab ride to $60. Silence. Are you sure you can't take me to my aunt's house? She lives close by on Street B. I thought you said she lived on Street A. No, I meant Street B, but it doesn't matter because she won't give me my money anyway. You sure you just can't take me to City A? It was obvious that this woman was utterly full of it, because the details of her story were constantly changing. When we pulled into the Walmart parking lot, she finally got out of my car, only after I got out first, and followed me into the store. I told her before we went to find an ATM I needed to use the restroom. My plan was to call the police from inside a stall but she followed me into the bathroom and that's when things got really weird. She grabbed the crook of my arm and whispered into my ear, if you don't got any money to give me, that's okay, but let me ask you something, do you want to do it in the stall? I told her no as forcefully as I could manage, bolted it to a stall, and locked the door as fast as I could possibly manage. As soon as I had a barrier between us, I said, you know, I have some friends at the police department that can probably help you better than I can. I'm just going to call them and we can figure this out together. Again, at the mention of the cops, she started screaming at me. I just kept reiterating that the police would help her. She stopped snapped to me that she was just going to leave and stormed out of the bathroom. But it wasn't over. I waited to make sure she was really gone. Sure enough, not 60 seconds after she left, she came back into the bathroom and started banging on the stall door. And she said something that scared me more than anything else. Hey, come back to your car with me. I left my beer in your car. I blatantly tell her that no, I saw her get into my car and she had absolutely nothing with her other than the clothes on her back. After that, she left the bathroom again and didn't come back. I waited a good five minutes before exiting the bathroom. I immediately found a manager who called the police for me. Thankfully, I was in a different police jurisdiction from the one I work in because I was mortified at how entirely stupid I had been the whole night and would have died of embarrassment if any of my co-workers had responded. The officer that responded took my statement and advised me to be more careful in the future. He said that sometimes panhandlers turn violent and that just recently there had been a report of a woman who matched my description assaulting a good Samaritan that had stopped to try to help her. I definitely learned a lesson on stranger danger and I'm lucky to have come out not harmed. I'm glad my stupidity didn't kill me. This happened a few years ago, when I was around 20 or so. I was hanging out with my buddy Matt at my apartment, located in the downtown area of a medium-sized, midwestern city. We were drinking whiskey, watching comedies, playing tunes, etc. He mentions that he has a close friend, Emily, who used to live in my apartment building with her mother. 
She now lives across the street from me, and he thought it would be a swell idea if we met because apparently we are very similar and I was single at that point in my life. He rings her cell and tells her to come by my place. She arrived at my apartment and I instantly became fond of her. She was hilarious, very pretty, and a musician just like me. She was around 30 or 10 years older than me. My friend Matt was 35. I've always had friends that are much older for some reason. We played songs together and laughed hysterically for hours. Matt decided to go home, leaving us two alone. We chilled for a while longer, ended up making out, and I got all of her contact info before she told me she's going home and that we should meet up soon. Over the next few weeks, we develop a strong relationship, and we hang out almost daily. I would throw some pajamas on and walk across the street and we'd get wasted and watch movies. It was awesome. After arriving home from my 10-day trip to New York City, things got really weird. The day I returned, she asked if she could come over, so I unpacked my stuff and then told her to stop by. She rings the bus takes the elevator seven floors up to my apartment and lets herself in. I was talking non-stop about all the awesome things I did and people I met in New York City and I could immediately tell she didn't want to hear any of it. She would change the subject every time I brought it up and eventually she said, can you stop talking about New York? I really don't care. I was surprised to hear her speak like this. The Emily I had been getting to know was not like this. She was caring and passionate and an amazing person, so I thought. Fast forward to a few nights later. I had just gotten home from a working 12-hour shift and I collapsed in my bed, ready to pass off for the night. It's about 9 p.m. and I get a text from Emily that says, hey, what's up? I don't feel much like replying at that moment. I am too exhausted and our last hangout was too weird for me to comprehend, so I am still trying to decide how to deal with that. I plug my phone into my charger, turn the lights off, and fall asleep. Bang, bang, bang. I wake up to somebody pounding on my door and screaming at the top of their lungs. Open the door, let me in now. My entire apartment reeks like cigarette smoke. I grab my phone from beside my bed, my heart beating a million miles per hour. 27 missed phone calls, a bunch of text messages, messages, all from Emily. I scan through the text while she's still at the door screaming, trying to break my door down. The most recent text from her is a long one claiming I'm a bad person for not responding to her text earlier, and that she's coming over to beat me up for not doing so. She still had a key to the building still, from when she used to live there. I get out of bed and nearly having a panic attack and try to decide what my next move should be. Should I open the door and calm her? Should I call the police? Should I just ignore her? I decide to open the door. She begins wailing on me, swinging her arms trying to hit me. She was smoking a cigarette and there were three cigarette butts on the ground next to her. Smoking indoors was prohibited in my apartment building. She was very obviously on some sort of drug. She kept screaming at me, telling me how awful I am for not responding to her text message, slurring her speech losing her balance. I was somehow able to calm her down and I took her to the roof of the apartment building which had a pretty nice little enclosed picnic table area. We sat beside one another. She was quiet now finally. She kept asking me how I could be such a jerk and that I need to explain myself. The look in her eyes was pure evil as she spoke to me in a calm demeanor now. I said to her, Emily, I don't ever want to speak to you again after tonight. This whole scenario is absolutely insane. You need help. Let me walk you home. I take her home and return to my apartment to attempt sleeping, at which I do not succeed. A couple of days later, I return home from work and there is an envelope taped to my door. I open it and it's a handwritten letter from Emily apologizing and saying that I'm a beautiful human who doesn't deserve an evil person like her in their life. There was a literal candy bar attached to the envelope, one that I had never heard of that she always told me I needed to try. I never spoke to her again. From what Matt tells me, which, by the way, he always knew she was a problematic person, she's a heavy user of crack now and is working as a food runner in a restaurant nearby. This happened on Saturday. My girlfriend, Tess, my puppy, Jack, and I are all getting ready for a road trip. We're planning on meeting some friends at their house and then starting the trip from there. On our way to their house around 11 a.m., a white car with all tinted windows cuts us off and brake checks us close enough that I had to slam the brakes and swerve to avoid an accident. In the immediate fury, I honked and flipped the driver off. I wish I hadn't done this. Immediately, the driver rolls down his window and waves his hand over. He slows down to go back to the other lane so that our cars are parallel to one another. The driver is gesturing wildly and yelling at us while we continue driving down the avenue. I proceed to make gestures to calm down and then try to ignore him and continue driving. He continues driving next to us. Eventually, I try speeding up and he revs in front of me and tries brake checking me again. At this point, I swerve to the other lane and he again slows down to match my vehicle speed. He is still gesturing and screaming while I try to ignore him. Suddenly, he reaches in his lap and I notice he is holding a glass bottle. He throws it and it shatters at the side of my vehicle. Tess is hysterical at this point and the pup had hidden under the passenger seat. I go into adrenaline mode and try turning into different streets as the chase ensues. He is following close behind 
when he throws another glass bottle that shatters against my back window. I tell Tess to call the police as we speed down a two-lane street and up a hill. She calls 911 as I come to a stop at the light at the top of the hill. The guy chasing us slows down to a stop behind us. Suddenly, he hops out of his vehicle and in my rearview mirror, I see him reach back into his car and grab something and puts it into his shorts. He begins walking towards the side of my car as the car in front of me drives away. I noped out of there, slammed the gas, and turned into the next avenue. Within a minute, he has caught back up to us as I am now on speaker with 911 explaining the situation and giving them the details of his car and appearance. Tess is crying as we speed down a busy avenue, weaving in between cars at 20 above the speed limit. I'm updating the 911 lady with where we are and she tells me to drive to the station. At the next red light, he yells not audibly, do we have a problem? Don't flip me off. I'm trying to gesture that we do not have any problem. He's still trying to get me to get out of the car. The light is still red and he again hops out of his vehicle. I again floor it through the red and he continues chasing as I make way towards the police station. We're now accelerating and brake checking each other as he tries to drive off the road. I make gestures that he should continue following, hoping to get him to the station. About a block from the police, we get stuck in a busy intersection. There are many cars around as he again walks up to my car. This time I'm boxed in and Tess is panicking. I'm looking for any escape options to no avail. The drivers around us notice and many put their windows up and lock their doors. He comes right up to my window, slaps it with his palm, and asks for more time. Is there a problem? I again say no. The 911 lady tells me to not engage over the phone speaker. He says good. He gets back into his car and then speeds away. 20 minutes into this horrible car chase experience. We end up meeting with the cops and they say that there was nothing they could do, even though I updated them with more details of his direction and where he was last. We calmed down and then we continued our road trip. So I, a 20 year old female, lived in a shady apartment complex in an otherwise rich suburban area for 3 years. This story is about a neighbor that I'll call Bob. A little backstory, me, 18 years old at the time, and my then 16 year old sister used to babysit all the neighborhood kids. These kids considered us their friends and it got to where they seemed to have a radar of when me and my sister went outside. They'd come out and talk to us and we let them ride our skateboards and such in the parking lot. The kids were ages 8 to 13. So one day we were outside with them and we were joined by a stranger. He he stood between us in our car, towering over us. He introduced himself and asked us to sign a petition he made up. We did, just being friendly, then he asked us how old we were. I thought maybe he was a fellow teenager that looked older or that he was just awkward, so I told him I was 18 and the very next question was if I wanted to go out with him, in front of my mom and the other kid's mom. I awkwardly declined, but he continued talking about how he thought me and my sister were in middle school. Also, he was 28. Eventually, he wandered away to ask someone else to sign his petition. A few days later, he knocked at our door after asking neighbor for the address. He had a bag of what he said was chicken and wanted us to go eat it with him at the park. Park. We declined because we both had schoolwork to do. He walked away and he was mumbling about how antisocial everyone was. Later, we look out our window and see him playing baseball with two girls. He kept physically moving their arms to different positions even though they shrugged away from him. Next day, one of the kids runs up to me. I'll call her Maddie. She's eight. She's got a new pair of Heelys and wanted help with them. I was holding her hand and guiding her along when Bob appears and says he can help better. Maddie says no, but he insists. He pushed me aside and reaches for Maddie, holding her tightly around the upper chest area. Her grandma was there too and flips out. He wanders away. The next day, Maddie's freaking out, saying Bob was just sitting on her porch when she left for school that morning. Her parents found out, and as they walked outside, he let himself in, and they said he went to their kitchen to make orange chicken. We later found out another neighbor had a similar story. Another time, we were helping a family move. They have a two-year-old son. The garages are in a triangle shaped to the road, almost a roundabout. There's a flat patch of grass behind them. Well, here comes Bob to help us. He criticized the way we packed things and didn't help until our neighbor politely asked him to leave. Well, he left the garage, but instead of leaving, he asked the two-year-old if he wanted to play. The kid said no, and it made him mad. He picked up the kid to play, and the kid slapped him. He asked the kid if he wanted to go behind the garages to play ball, so I go with him and guide the kid to his mom. The climax of the story is when me and my sister went on a walk with our 17-year-old friend and her other friend. Maddie found us and wanted to come along, so we are starting our walk when Bob comes out. He sees our friend and asks how old she is and how much she weighs because she's so skinny. He asks where we're going. My friend tells him we're going for ice cream on a girl's trip. We didn't ask her to say that. He's like, oh man, and stomps away. We continue our walk, but halfway through we have a weird feeling. I look behind us and Bob is running towards us. He yells at us for hiding from him while also telling Maddie how pretty she is. An older neighbor sees this and asks him what's going on. He tells the man we're being mean and he needs to go write a song about us. He leaves, but we see him sitting at the park. Well, he saw us and again comes running. We stop and he asks which one of us is over 18. Maddie's dad is here at this point and tells him we aren't interested in him. He explodes, telling the dad to screw himself and that he's so rude. Maddie is crying and the neighbor who saw us before came to check on us since he saw Bob running. Bob goes 
goes inside, muttering to himself. For weeks we don't see him, a single dad and his five-year-old daughter move in, and we are introducing ourselves to them. My mom kind of tips him off that there's someone in their building who is a little off, especially around Maddie. The dad says he's seen someone like that giving kids candy at the pool when the kids looked uncomfortable. Well, here comes Bob, as if on cue. He immediately tells the girl in front of her dad that she looks like a movie star and that she's so pretty. He has to play with her, but the dad says no and they go inside. Turns out, they're next door neighbors. We still didn't see him much, but other neighbors were telling us stories about him. There's a woman who's alone most of the day with her two kids under five, who told us he watches her when she goes to and from her car. Also, Maddie's parent continued to see him watching her. Then one day, we're again babysitting and here he comes. Only this time, he's swinging nunchucks. Maddie screams and hides in our car. Bob strolls over with his nunchucks and starts talking to us all casual. Then his head cranks to look into the car and he says, where's Maddie? We told him she wasn't here and he walked away. By then, most of the kids were afraid to go outside when they saw him. He had a habit of wandering around the complex. We could tell by his height and lanky gait. A few times we'd see Bob with his dad. Those times, neither of them glanced at us. Then one day, he just stopped showing up. We'd see his dad and brother come in and out all the time, but never him. We only saw him again a year later, and it was only for one day near Christmas, and then he disappeared again. So I don't know what happened to him, but it was just one of our weird experiences with neighbors in the three years living there. On Friday afternoon, I got a call from my friend named Sarah asking if I wanted to meet her and another friend named Lisa at Dunkin Donuts as we hadn't seen one another in a while. Dunkin Donuts is a 15 minute walk from my house so I decided I would walk, besides the weather was fine. I got to Dunkin Donuts and found where Sarah and Lisa were sat so I went to join them. As we were chatting, I noticed that my sister, Alina, was sat at a table in the corner of the room with her friend, Jess. For some context, my sister and her friend are both 18 years old. My sister still lives with my parents whereas I live alone. I excused myself from the table and went over to Alina and Jess's table. They were sat at a table with three seats so I went to sit down and said hey. They both jumped a little bit but then looked more relieved than anything to see me. Immediately Alina whispered to me, don't look now, but the guy in the blue shirt, I think he's following Jess and I. I glanced over and saw the middle aged man sat at a table facing away from us. He's passed our table a good five times in the past 20 minutes to go to the bathroom, but he walks slower as he passes us, she continued. I told them that they were most likely being paranoid and that there was nothing to worry about. But for their peace of mind, I offered to leave with them so they wouldn't feel as worried. I walked back over to my table and explained the situation to Sarah and Lisa. Both of them laughed it off and assumed my sister to be paranoid. Literally about a minute later, I saw the man get up from his seat and walk towards the bathroom. My eyes followed him and sure enough, he walked extremely slow past Alina and Jess. In fact, it was almost comical how obviously slow he became. Both Alina and Jess looked in my direction and I nodded to show that I had seen him walk slower. About 5 minutes later, I went into the toilets. On my way, I passed Alina and Jess and told them I was ready to leave whenever they were. They both agreed that they were ready to leave now. I told them that I was just going to go to the bathroom and that we could leave after I had done my business. Alina had come in her car so she was going to give me a lift back. I went into the toilet stall, did said business, washed my hands. I was walking down the corridor back into the main eating area when Alina and Jess rushed into the corridor. I asked them what's up and they explained that another man had joined the strange creeper men and that the men were both pointing and staring at them, so they right felt unsafe. We walked back into the eating area, I put my money on our table and explained to Lisa and Sarah that I was taking off and I would explain what was going on when I got home. We all got into Alina's car and left the creeps in the car's rearview mirror. After a two minute drive we reached my house. Just then I remembered that I had been meaning to return something I had borrowed from my mother. So I asked if Alina could drive me to my parents house as she was going there anyway. I jumped out the car to get what I needed when my phone rang. It was Alina. She explained that a car had driven past and had pulled into a driveway. She said the driver of the vehicle was the creep from Duck and Donuts. I looked out of my window and sure enough there was a car which didn't belong to the owner of the house parked on their driveway. I got the girls into my house and locked the door. I instructed Alina to take a photo of the car and its license plate and I told Jess to call 911 as she gave the operator more information than what I could. Alina took the photos and we sort of gathered around Jess as she was speaking to the operator. She had finished telling the story and I heard the operator assure us that the police would be at my house soon. A few minutes passed and there was a loud knock at the front door followed by a loud voice shouting it's the police. We all did a sigh of relief as I went to open the door. Jess told the operator that the police were here and she hung up. I was in the process of unlocking the door when I thought to look through the spy hole at the top of the door. I peered through and it wasn't a police officer, it was the same guy. I froze in fear and I didn't know what to say. We didn't call the police. I managed to shout back to the man through the door. Elena and Jess were both confused as to why I said this. We had a call, sir. The man shouted back, you have the wrong address. I yelled back and informed the girls that it was the creep of the door and not a police officer. Both were rightfully shocked and extremely scared 
scared, as was I. I was about to tell Jess to call the police again until I heard the sirens. Sir, you have to let me in. The man shouted again. This time I didn't answer. He was pounding on the door. His commands for me to let him in turned into begging and pleading. I heard the police car pull up in some commotion outside. An actual police officer knocked on the door and I let him in. Yes, I checked the spy hole first. The police officer took the man into custody while another police officer took Alina and Jess into the dining room for some brief questioning. I called my parents and Jess called hers. Both were here extremely quickly once we told them what had happened. The man was found with a kitchen knife on his person and some other weapons in his car. Who knows what could have happened if I hadn't looked through the spy hole first. Both my sister and her friend were fine, just shaken up after the whole incident. Back when I was 17 or 19, I worked at a small local bakery. There were less than 15 employees spread across all the night and day shifts, so we only had a few people working during the day. One of these people was Dave, the delivery driver. Dave immediately gave me an off five. He was in his mid-50s and way too friendly to a teenage girl. But the boss told me straight up that yes, he could be annoying, but no one worked harder than he did, so just ignore his antics. When I signed the paperwork, they never asked me to submit to a background check. In hindsight, that should have been red flag number two. Over the course of the year or so that I worked with Dave, I tried very very hard to ignore him. He was rarely outright creepy, but he was always just a bit too friendly. He would stick around long after his shift was over to talk to me and the other pastry chef on shift. He always wanted to lick the bowl after I made Rice Krispie treats. He would always stand in front of the racks of equipment or ingredients, just enough that sometimes my hand would brush him while reaching for something. He always stood just a little too close. He was constantly asking me about my life, what I liked, what I did for fun, if I had a boyfriend, almost daily. He would tell me how a nice girl like me should have a boyfriend, how maybe a boyfriend would be good for me. I left this slide because sometimes older people can say things that were meant differently in their time. Then it was concert invites. Every other week he had tickets to one concert or another. Once he figured out my genre of music, it was almost exclusively tickets to bands I desperately wanted to see. But I also knew I should not go anywhere with him. I don't like to associate with co-workers outside of work anyway, and I had seen way too many red flags about Dave to trust him for even a second. My birthday came. He brought me a t-shirt. It was two sizes too small. He told me to try it on. I said no. He told me to try it on after work and text him a photo. He gave me his number. He asked for mine. I said no. He asked for the other pastry chef for my number. She had my back and refused as well. He also brought me two tickets to a band I'd been wanting to see. VIP section 21 plus year old only. He said he could get me in but I had to go with him and him alone. I refused. He told me he could get me booze. I declined. For months and months this continued. I brought it up to one of my bosses but they laughed it off as classic. Dave, when he wanted a hug on his birthday and hugged me without my consent. That's Dave for you. Offering to get me booze or pot? Ah, Dave, you scamp. When he pulled up his shirt and showed me his abdominal scar from a snowboarding accident, well, that's just Dave. No respect for boundaries, but a good worker. I seriously considered having one of my male friends come in under the guise of being my boyfriend just to placate Dave. I was repulsed by him, but he hadn't really done anything to classify himself as a predator. Besides asking for my number, he had never tried to harass me outside of work hours. And besides the odd hug or two that I was too afraid slash shy to refuse, he hadn't gotten super physical. Then one day, Dave was gone. His name disappeared from the employee roster. My boss asked to see me in the office. She informed me that Dave was no longer employed at their business. Dave had been fired. Dave was fired because Dave was a convicted offender. Davey here had two counts of assault and one count of kidnapping a minor from the mid-90s, about the time I was born actually. They had never background checked him, and when they contacted a friend of the police department, they found out that Dave had been lying on lots of paperwork, hiding the fact that he was a convicted felon and not notifying anyone when he moved. Once they brought this information to the police department's attention, they had a few more charges to add. They found out because a Apparently he had been stalking and harassing one of the clients he delivered to, showing up at her home when he should not have known where she lived. After his termination, Dave showed up to work one day. He had a weapon, but I never found out what he had. They told him to leave or the police would be called. He ended up leaving in handcuffs. I am so thankful I wasn't there that day. Another little tidbit, the police officer my bosses knew had been in the PD for a while and knew one of the officers who had arrested Dave in the 90s. That abdominal scar was from a run-in with the cops and he got injured trying to climb over a fence. That was a few years ago, but some Sometimes I still think about how badly things could have gotten had I gone to even one of those concerts with him. This happened when I was a bartender about 4 years ago, but I think about it often and has changed the way I operate throughout life. 
I now refuse to go to any store alone after midnight. For the story's sake, I will tell you that I was 25 and a blonde at the time. On a busy Friday night, I was bartending with the bar manager and he had noticed that they were very low on some bar necessities after the dinner rush. Lemons, limes, bitters, that kind of thing. So I was sent out to go to a 24-hour grocery store down the road to pick up the odds and ends that we would require to get us through the weekend. I picked up everything that was asked for me without trouble at the store until I got to the liquor aisle. There were two country-looking guys that were probably around my age in the aisle and they were staring at me and whispering to each other in a way that made me uncomfortable as I assumed they were making comments about me. All pretty innocent so far. Before they could approach me, I grabbed what I needed very quickly and power walked to the self-checkout. I really booked it out of there because when you're a bartender, it's kind of like you are on stage and are required to be charming and interact with people that you otherwise absolutely wouldn't be able to tolerate unless you're getting paid to, thus why I am not a bartender anymore. I get to the self-checkout and the two guys are on me. I'm skinning my stuff and they use the scanning station next to me. I get a better look at them now that they are right next to me. One is taller, muscular, and average looking. The other is shorter and more plump. They both looked dirty and their eyes were completely bloodshot, not sure if they were high on something or had already been drinking for a while. They continued to stare at me and our eyes awkwardly met, so I did just a polite smile to them. The taller one starts trying to talk to me. Hey, looks like you're ready to party, huh? I replied with something like, yeah, something like that. It's not for me, though. They walk closer to me and ignore their responsibility to scan their items. Oh, must be for your boyfriend, huh? I flash a polite smile again and roll my eyes slightly, like, this is your hint that I'm not interested. The taller one continues to try to talk to me. Me. You could come hang out with us tonight. We could show you a real good time if you know what I mean. I reply with, no thanks, I'm good. I have plans already. Well, the tall one starts to get upset that his moves aren't working like he hoped and starts using a more threatening tone and moves very close to me, like two inches away, but I ignore him, staying focused on the scanner. I don't think he had showered in a few days by the smell of him. He gets a little louder and says, I see how it is. You probably only screw doctors and rich men like that. You think you're too good for us. We can show you that you aren't. We can teach you a lesson. Now, I'm not sure in what context he meant, but it definitely wasn't good. Still not looking at him, I turn away so my body is blocking his view of my purse, which I set on the scanner to grab my 4-inch pocket knife out and slide it up my jacket sleeve in case I need to protect myself, acting like I am searching for my wallet. I do this, however, in view of the self-scan worker standing at her podium and look at her with wide eyes trying to communicate that I do not feel safe and I might need help. I turn back to the machine and slap my credit card to pay, while the creepy and hostile guys are practically standing on top of me. The machine malfunctions and starts beeping. The lady worker comes over immediately and the guys standing next to me change their expressions from, I am planning to torture you for a couple of days and toss your body in a creek, to, just your friendly good old country boys making polite conversation over here. They actually try to act like I knew them and we were friends so the worker wouldn't be alerted to their ill intentions. They tried joking with the worker saying I was stealing something, and that's why the machine went off. The worker was definitely not buying it. She was a six plus foot tall woman with some muscle on her, by the way. I wouldn't mess with her on my best day. Anyways, she presses a few buttons on the screen, shooting the guys a very unimpressed look when they were trying to act charming and cancels the order completely. She turns to me and says, I am sorry for the inconvenience, ma'am. This machine seems to not be working correctly. Why don't you gather your things and I will bring you up at an actual register? She puts her hand on my back and gives me a wide-eyed look, like I gave her a minute earlier, letting me know that she sees I am in danger. I pick up my things to follow her to a register that is near the security office. The guys linger around the self-scan, still glaring at me, and eventually complete their purchase, but stand at the exit assuming they are waiting for me. I felt like I would be walking to my death if I made my exit in that moment. The worker keeps a close eye on the guys and scans my items. As she's scanning, she tells me that there wasn't really anything wrong with the machine I was using. It just misread my credit card. She said, I had a bad feeling about those guys from the moment they walked in, and I then saw them getting aggressive towards you. I already rang security to be ready to walk out to the parking lot and make sure you left safely when you were ready to leave. Then I saw you take that knife out and put it up your sleeve, getting ready to protect yourself. As much as I'd like to see you show them they picked the wrong check to mess with, I'm glad I was able to pull you aside and make sure you are safe. I see them waiting by the door for you. I'll just keep pressing buttons on the screen and act like I'm having trouble with your order until they give up and go outside. Our security officer and I are both still going to escort you to your vehicle when you leave. I thought to myself, this woman seriously deserves a raise. I thanked her over and over again and told her what they said to me and I was getting afraid because I don't know what these guys are capable of. As I'm talking to her, my bar manager calls me to see what's taking so long. I explain what was happening and he was obviously very concerned and ready to come up there himself. By the time I hang up, the guys had given up and walked out to the parking lot. The worker said to give it another few minutes because she had a feeling they may still be in the parking lot waiting for me to walk out and see which vehicle was mine so they could follow me. My instant thought was, no way, they have to be gone by now. I was wrong. The worker and security guard escort me out and as it was after midnight, you can imagine how empty the parking lot was. 
Towards the back of the lot, there sat an old big pickup truck running with the lights on pointed towards the store. It was a huge parking lot, and it wouldn't have made sense for them to initially park like that. So I'm assuming they moved the truck to set that way so they had a full view of when I exited the store to go to my vehicle. It was like being stalked by very hungry lions. When I unlocked my car and they saw that me, the worker, and the guard were looking directly at them, and that I wasn't getting in my car until we watched them leave, they then peeled out of the parking lot. I mean, they seriously did a burnout to establish that they were pissed and trying to intimidate us or something. I thanked the worker and the guard over and over again, as I am certain they had just saved my life, or at least, saved me from having to live with whatever those guys were planning on doing to me. I did write a long letter to the store manager and to their corporate location describing how their employees protected me and how grateful I was. I really hope that earned her a promotion, bonus, or raise. She didn't know me at all and was ready to protect me, which really isn't her job, but she did it anyways. Needless to say, I do not go late night shopping by myself anymore. Never will again. This is my brother's girlfriend's story. She doesn't have a Reddit account, but I told her about this subreddit and she wanted to share her story because it's creepy but also a good lesson to learn from. I go to a school in a big city that is one of the least safe cities in the US. I chose this school for nursing and definitely not for the location. I live in a row house off the campus with four other girls. Cheaper and nicer than dorms, or so we thought. I guess you get what you pay for. We're all sophomores in college. As you would guess, we go out and drink, come back to do things we don't remember. We had just started our rent in August. Three floors, plus a basement, which was padlocked by the owners. Understandable, we would definitely have parties down there to avoid immediate cleanup. The house was great, amazing location to the school and work. I am a CNA who works odd hours, important for later. It was not expensive, and in good condition. I had never lived with that many people before, just one roommate, so before we definitely knew if one of us had misplaced or changed something. I started to notice my snacks were either half gone or completely gone. I was getting annoyed, but a house with many people, it's too much work to go and figure out who ate what, so I ignored it. Slowly, we started making comments about someone eating our food, but passive aggressively. We all just let it go because none of us want a whole house fight. I work until about 11 in the NICU. I get home at about 11.30 mostly on weeknights. I started to notice pants left out or snack wrappers around. I thought it was odd because none of my roommates had done that before but just thought, oh, they probably drank a bottle of wine then went to bed and forgot all about this. Again, my roommates started making comments. This time, we started to ask because it was getting annoying that all of our food would disappear and things being left out. I knew it was one of them, but no one wants to admit that they ate someone else's snacks in college. We chalked it up to the girl who always smokes and eats her weight in food. She swore it wasn't her. This went on for about two months. It got more obvious that someone was clearly taking everyone's food. It definitely had to be the girl that always smokes. I see her eat her whole snack pantry in a night. Come to find out it was not her. One night at work, I was about to get off, but a situation happened and I ended up leaving about 12.30. I took the bus home. I got home and was about to collapse. I wanted to go to bed ASAP. I walked in the front door and the stairs are directly in front of you. You can also see down the side into the kitchen. I walked in and saw someone in the kitchen but was way too tired to say hi. I I thought it could end in like a 30 minute conversation about nothing, so I went straight upstairs. When I got to the second floor, I noticed all of my roommates doors were closed, which always means they're either all in their room for the night or asleep. I got a weird feeling, just something that made it click. I texted our house group chat asking if anyone was in the kitchen. I felt stupid for even asking. Two responded no, and they said the other two had been asleep. I knew it wasn't any of my roommates down there at that moment. I dialed 911 but didn't press call. I crept into my roommate's room across the hall. Thankfully, she didn't have her door locked. I whispered telling her I think someone is in the house. She gave me the widest eyes ever and almost looked like she was going to cry. She didn't suspect anything like I had, but for reference, there was a shooting in the house two doors down only weeks earlier by an intruder. She mouthed to make the call. The whole time we were dead silent, we didn't hear anything at all. I was starting to think I was seeing things after such a long day at work and was regretting that I dialed thinking I'm going to look like an idiot when they show up and I was just exhausted and dreaming. We explain what's going on and they said that they will send someone ASAP. That actually does mean right away since it is a big and dangerous city. The police showed up and I didn't even want to go downstairs, but the operator confirmed it was them so I did. The police come in and look around. I'm thinking, I look so dumb right now. They ask if there are any other floors. We tell them technically the basement but it's padlocked so not really. They check the basement just in case. And well they were right. A man had been living in the padlocked basement. The lock was pulled off the hinge 
hinges and just kind of propped against the wall. We never looked at that though. We rarely went out back. The guy had taken a comforter out of the hall closet and had a mattress from somewhere in his clothes. He was the one moving and eating all of our stuff. He would come out in the middle of the night and do it. He started getting more comfortable. I'm not sure if he was drugged out and forgot to clean his tracks or if he didn't really care. Me and my roommates have pretty consistent schedules during the week, probably letting him think that any time after about 12 was good to come out. We never slept with our individual doors locked, and that's what freaks me out the most. He had access to any one of us at any moment, and we had no idea. A little backstory, when I was 19, I lived with my mom in a ranch style house on a road that backed up to a large field. On the other side was the main highway, about a half mile down from me was a loony farmer, and about a mile on the other side of me was pretty much a drug house. I guess someone used to live there, but it was run down. I will say that they were pretty quiet, other than those two houses we were isolated. At the time I was working full time and going to school full time. One of my classes ended at 10.30pm, I often wouldn't get home that day of the week until about 11.15ish. I was driving home one night and I noticed some guy walking down the road. He had a yellow shirt and track pants. I remember his outfit because it was weird. It wasn't weird to see people walking down my road because of the whole drug house thing, but I instinctively looked over at him when I drove past. He turned and smiled and waved, which freaked me out. So I speed the half mile home and pull into the driveway, weirded out. I made sure all the doors and windows were secure and then sat on the couch to be a paranoid freak and wait to make sure the dude walked past my house. Except he didn't. And there was another guy with him, dressed in darker clothes. They actually walked up my driveway and started playing around with my car, testing the handles and stuff. In my hurry, I forgot to grab my phone from my car, so I was kind of worried that's what they were after until the guy in yellow started approaching my door. I'm freaking out, so I go and wake my mom up. She's bleary and I'm trying to explain the situation when we both hear the doorknob turn very slowly. Good thing it was deadbolted. She got out of bed, walked to the door, and then yellow shirt knocked. I perched up on the couch so I could get a good look at him and his friend, still in the driveway. The porch light was on because of the sensor. Yeah, my mom said, you dropped your wallet. I told my mom that I had my wallet, it was in my purse. So she calmly told him that she had her wallet and it was too late to be knocking on people's doors. I remember perfectly what he said next, even though this was about 6 years ago. Okay, I'm not a bad guy, just so you know. We were all pretty still, no one moved, not even the guy at the door, not even when the porch light went off. Then he tried the handle again. My mom told me to call the cops so she could get the gun and I told her I didn't have my phone. So she walked to the kitchen to grab hers from the charger. She handed me the phone and walked to the bathroom. I stared out of the window into the backyard, then she went to her room to grab her Ruger. I was talking to the cops and explaining the situation all while watching the two guys, explaining that they were two suspicious guys at our door when my mom came back out and said, one in our backyard too, which explained why she had looked out the bathroom window. She glimpsed him from the kitchen and went to get a more discreet look. My mom walked back over to the door with her gun and loudly said, if he tries the handle again, I'm just going to open the door and shoot him. I don't know why she said that instead of waiting for the cops to arrive, but the guys took off down the road. I told her and she rushed to the bathroom, where the guy apparently in the backyard saw his friends running down the road and sprinted off too. They were going in the direction of the drug house. The cops searched our house and our yard and went to the drug house, where they found five dudes hanging around. One was the yellow shirt guy and I'm assuming his friends were with him. They did get arrested and nothing weird like that ever happened again, but I was on edge for a while. I still make sure the doors are locked at all times every day, even though I live in a much nicer area now. This was back in 2015 or 2016. I'm a career tow truck driver. At this point, I've been towing cars for most of my adult life, and will likely do so until I either retire or die, whichever comes first. At the time, I was working for a pretty small towing company with only two employees, and we rotated who was on call each weekend. It was my weekend on call, and it was summer, so with people being out and about late and whatnot, I was pretty busy. Cleaning up accidents, towing broken down cars both in the city and off the highway. I was fine with it, as I was paid commission at the time, so the more calls I did, the more money I made. So it's Saturday night, now Sunday morning, and it's around 2.33 in the morning, and like I said, I've been busy. I'm tired, a little grumpy, and kind of want to go home when my phone rings. It's an insurance company calling asking if we can do a tow for one of their customers who has broken down on the side of the highway. The breakdown location they give me is about 15 miles out of town, which I normally wouldn't do, but the tow destination happens to be a dealership that's just a couple of minutes from my apartment. I contemplate rejecting the call, but because I'm paid commission, I figure screw it. 
I could run up and grab this car, drop it off around the corner from my place, then hopefully I could head home and get a couple of hours to shut eye. So I take the call and hop on the highway. The insurance company provided me with the customer's first name, which we'll say was Kara, and gave me a phone number for her. Usually I try to make contact with people who are on the side of the highway to let them know I'm on my way and give them an ETA. I try calling her a couple of times, but she doesn't answer, not unusual. After a short while, I see hazard lights up the way on the shoulder, so I turn on my strobes and start slowing down. As I approach, I noticed that not only is there the late model car that I'm looking for, but there's another car on scene as well that doesn't have its hazards on, but it's parked in front of the car I'm meant to tow. This is annoying but not uncommon, as I need to be able to get in front of the disabled car in order to load it and sometimes people don't realize that, but because the other car is there, I instead pull up behind both cars. You do this so that as the tow driver, you're the one that has to make the weird maneuver of pulling off the shoulder and back onto the shoulder, and that the other car just has to drive straight forward on the shoulder. Otherwise, if I pulled up in front, then the other car would have to go around me and it's unprofessional and unsafe to make them do that. Standing in the trunk of the late model car, which is now directly in front of me, are a man and a woman. The woman is probably in her early 20s and dressed to the nines for a nine out. She's about 5 foot 1 or 5 foot 2. She's wearing tight leather-ish or something pants, a halter top, long black hair. The man is probably around 5 foot 10 and skinny, maybe 150 to 160 pounds, wearing a dark hoodie and dirty jeans. They're standing very close and facing each other. She has her arms crossed and he's leaning down talking to her. I step out of my truck and approach them both, introduce myself. They separate a few feet and I look to the woman and say, are you Kara? She nods. I say I'm here for her insurance company and I ask what's going on with the car. Immediately, the man pipes up and says, yeah, it's just having some fuel issues. It's an easy fix. Can you just drop it off at this commuter parking lot? I'm gonna fix it for her there. I'm rather annoyed at this because the commuter lot in question is further up the highway and I'm already 15 miles out of town. Like I said before, I only took this call because it was supposed to be coming back toward my apartment and I really wanted to go home. Not only that, but in order to change the original tow destination, I would have to call the insurance company back, wait on hold for who knows how long for a representative, and then let them know the change and try to get them to pay me extra for the deadhead miles back home after unloading. And I really didn't want to do any of this. And thirdly, this is a late model car. I'm no mechanic, but it's new enough that whatever's wrong with it is likely covered under warranty, so the dealership is really the best place for it to go anyways. I explain all of this to the guy, but he's really not having it. He gets stern with me, saying something like, look man, you just need to take the car where I tell you to take it. We go back and forth on this for maybe 60 seconds and he's just getting madder. Well, you know what man, you're not the name insured, Kara is. The easy way to settle this is to ask what she wants me to do with the car, and whatever she says is what I'll do. Fingers crossed she'll want to take it to the dealership so I can get home sooner. I turn to look at Kara to ask her that question and I don't see her right away. She's no longer standing where she just was a minute ago, which was slightly off to my right. I continue to not see her until I've turned to almost all the way around because she's standing directly behind me and by directly I mean within an inch of my back arms still crossed I look down at her and she locks eyes with me her eyes are as white as plates almost owl like and immediately it feels like she's staring into my soul she didn't say a word and she didn't have to I took a step back and did what felt like a double double take I looked at him then at her then at him again and then back at her and it slowly started to dawn on me that maybe something isn't right I asked her do you know this guy and she ever so slightly shook her head no without a word the guy starts to move for Kara and I move to stay in between them. He tries to push me out of his way by shoving me in the chest, but because I believe he underestimated my weight, only pushed me hard enough to make me take a single step back. Immediately, I took that step forward towards him and body check him hard, as hard as I could, hard enough to completely knock him over basically onto his back. Because we rotated during the back and forth push bit, Kara is now in front of me to my right, somewhat between me and the guy who's trying to scramble to his feet. I reached out and snatched the poor girl up by her waist, spun her towards my truck and yelled for her to get into the driver's side and she does so. I turn back to the guy who is standing up again at this point and he's breathing hard. He gets right up in my face but doesn't do anything, just breathes at me. I stare him right in his face and tell him you need to go. I'm shaken now and I'm absolutely terrified. I don't know if he has a weapon, I don't know if he's gonna try to fight me, and I don't know what I would do if he did. After probably around 15 seconds or so, which felt like eons, he kinda huffs a bit, smiles one of the creepiest smiles I've ever seen, and starts to back off. Sucking his teeth and rubbing his hands together, he slowly walks backwards a few steps, then makes his way to the front car, gets in and drives off. I stayed motionless, watching him until I could no longer see his taillights. I got Kara's car loaded
loaded up on the tow truck, and as we made our way to the dealership, she told me through tears that her car had shut off while she was driving, and she pulled onto the shoulder and called her parents, because she was on their insurance. Her parents made the call to the insurance company, who eventually dispatched me to her location. While she was waiting, a bit after she made the call, the guy pulled up in front of her and walked up to her passenger side window to try to talk to her, asking if she needed help, etc. And she told him she was fine, that a tow truck was coming, and that she didn't need help. He persisted, and she tried to tell him off, and eventually tried to roll up on the window. Apparently, he stuck his arm in the window and got the door unlocked and opened the door. In fear, she jumped out of the car, leaving her phone inside, and ran to the back of her car and stayed put there because it was in the line of sight of traffic. Apparently, he was pretty lewd with her, and whenever she tried to go back to the car, he would prevent her from getting in. Several minutes later, I showed up. Who knows what would have happened had the timing been any different. Her parents were waiting at the dealership when we arrived, and she told them what had just happened. Her parents gave me a $20 tip, which was all the cash they had on them at the time, and Kara gave me a very tight and clearly heartfelt hug before I left. I never saw her again. To set the tone, I always hated the town I lived in. I moved there alone when I was 18 for college and quickly regretted it. It was a decent sized town but full of not decent people. Nearly every gas station was robbed frequently, there were shootings in broad daylight, robberies, you name it. Well for the first 3 years I lived with roommates on a side of town that wasn't awful but it was sketchy. So when I was making decent enough money I moved out on my own. The house was tiny, maybe 500 square feet if that, super old and poorly built. It was just me living there so I didn't mind how small it was. Was. But what originally sold me was that it was in the middle of nowhere. It was surrounded by a bunch of fields and some wooded areas with only a few houses nearby. Considering I hated being in the town due to the continuous paranoia of getting mugged or shot, I loved the idea of living out there. So at the beginning of July I moved in. Everything seemed super swell minus not being able to get good internet. A month goes by and everything is still swell to me and I decided to get a dog to keep me company. He also loved the place and spent long amounts of time lounging about the yard and trying to convince the nearest neighbor to walk over and pet him. Important later. Roughly two months into living there, I started to notice things at a place. Something to note is that an old roommate of mine was using my spare room as a storage place until he got moved himself, so he had a key but was never there. He kind of just popped in every once every other week to grab something and usually let me know beforehand. But I'd come home to my kitchen chair being pulled away from my table, or a bowl in the sink, things like that. There were such small things I wrote off as my roommate swinging by or just stuff I was forgetting. But then my dog developed this crazy bad separation anxiety. Up until now he didn't even care when I left. He just lay on the couch and chewed his toys. He never barked, never did anything weird. However, all of a sudden he began acting really awful every time I tried to leave. He'd literally cram his body through the door as I was closing it, screaming and barking and wouldn't stop until I came back in the house. He didn't want me to leave him there alone, at all. I couldn't afford a kennel for him yet so I decided one day that I'd put a movie in while I was out, thinking maybe the sound of people talking might keep him calm down. I only had to finish one task up at work and knew I'd be home early, so I put in a copy of Hamlet. I know, boring, but I chose it because the copy I have is 5 hours long. I knew it would be playing when I came back. Flash forward 3 hours, long before Hamlet should have been over, but when I walked in the door, not only was the movie not playing, but the TV and the Xbox were completely off. I immediately called my roommate and asked if he had been over and he wasn't even in town. I explained the TV situation to him and he shrugged it off as the TV powering off when it idles for a while. Even though this is true, there are several reasons I know this isn't the case. One, it wasn't idling. A 5 hour movie was supposed to be playing. 2. Even if it had shut off, my Xbox wouldn't have. I have left it on by accident for weeks I was gone out of town or whatever and it was still on when I came home. Always. But it was completely powered down this time. The weird thing is none of my stuff was missing and the door was locked when I entered. I eventually convinced myself that it was something weird with the Xbox or whatever and shrugged it off. That is until my dog started acting even weirder. Remember earlier I mentioned he used to play with a neighbor? Well all of a sudden, if she even walked by the house while he was out, he'd start yelping and running at me away from her. This was incredibly weird to me and made me incredibly cautious of her. I put some cheap alarms on my doors, the kind that go off when the doors opened, and slept with my pistol handy. The second night the alarms were on my doors, I was woken up by the one on the back door going off. I flew out of my bed with my pistol, trying to convince myself that I was about to shoot some intruder, but once I got to the door it was shut and there was nobody there. The alarm had been knocked all the way across the room. The door would have had to open for it to be chucked like that. It couldn't have 
had fallen off and landed there. Something else weird. The door was locked, but not the way I had locked it. I always locked the knob and the deadbolt, but upon checking my lock after this, only the door knob was locked. The police wouldn't do much as I had no witnesses, no lead, and they didn't have much to go on. Needless to say, I changed the locks. I didn't have any noticeable problems inside after that, but later found out that the close neighbor that my dog hated had previously lived in the house I was renting, and the locks had never been changed. I have no way to prove my theory, but it's pretty obvious she had a key and was coming and going as she pleased. Why though, I can't figure out. Nothing of mine ever went missing. The most unsettling part for me though, is that she had tried to come in at night until the alarm scared her off. How many times has she been in my house at night while I was asleep, and why? Not sure. Luckily though, I don't live there anymore and never plan to move back there. A while ago, I was staying in an upscale hotel in the safe area of a large midwestern city. I am a 16 year old female and I was in a room all by myself with my parents a few doors down. In theory, this isn't unsafe by any means, but I had bad luck on this particular trip. Our first night there passed without incident. Me in my room, my parents in theirs. I watched a pay per view movie and ate way too much from the snack bar. I didn't have any reason to feel unsafe. The next morning, we did the usual tourist stuff that one does when visiting a new city. As we ate a breakfast, in the hotel restaurant, I noticed a man who looked to be in his 60s staring at me for an abnormally long amount of time. I ignored it and chalked it up to him thinking I looked like his granddaughter or something. The next night, my parents allowed me to meet up with a friend for dinner who lived in the area. He met me in the hotel lobby and we had a nice dinner and then went back to the hotel for drinks. Yes, I am underage, I had a drink, my bad. Coincidentally, the same man who had been eyeing me earlier was at the bar. This time, I knew I didn't remind him of his granddaughter. Even with my buff guy friend next to me, his eyes traced my body. I felt unsettled and mentioned it to my friend, Ethan, who glanced over and also seemed really weirded out by how obvious this guy was leering. We left the bar quickly and by now, it was around 12.30am. Ethan walked me to the elevators of the hotel and once I pushed the button, I left. I wish I would have asked him to stay, because no sooner had he walked away that my creeper came, rounding the corner, and stood there waiting with me for the elevator. I felt so uncomfortable knowing that he would be seeing what floor I was going to, but it hadn't occurred to me to get off on a different floor at the time, and even if it did, he planned on following me, so it would have been just as bad a move. When we were in the elevator together, I tried to keep my eyes averted from his, but they literally bore into my body. He kept trying to step closer and I kept backing up, too scared to even speak. What freaked me out more was that he hadn't pressed a separate elevator button, so he planned on getting off when I did. When I got to my floor, I almost ran to my room, and the guy just stood at the end of the hallway, waiting to see where I was going. I stayed in my room for 15 minutes until I was sure he was gone before I I told my parents what had happened. They were freaked out and told the hotel staff, but there was no sign of the guy and it was really late, so I just locked my door and tried to get to sleep. I had almost drifted off when I heard a knock at my door. I obviously wouldn't just go and open the door at nearly 2am. Instead, I turned on a light and froze. At this point, my intuition had kicked in and I knew it was the guy. I was near tears, but the knocking kept continuing, harder and harder, so I finally shouted and asked who it was. The voice that replied to me was the most chilling thing I had ever heard. High pitched but growled almost giggly, and so disturbing I could barely describe it. It's hotel staff, please let me in. I was terrified. A look through the people confirmed that it was the same creepy old guy. I locked myself in the bathroom and called my dad's phone. He has a habit of always keeping his ringer on, so he answered me almost immediately, and I tried to tell him what was wrong through my tears. The guy before, I managed, is at my door. And what happened next gives me nightmares. My dad naturally went into superhero mode and opened his door to find the old man in just a robe, whacking it. It's pretty obvious to piece together what he was planning. My dad slugged the dude in the face and made sure he didn't move an inch while my mom called hotel security. We pressed charges and the guy is in prison now. Some backstory before I begin. These events started when I was in second or third grade, 2002 to 2003 ish, and ended during the fall of 2015. I'm a 21 year old female living in Canada. The RCMP are involved in the story, which stands for Royal Canadian Mounted Police. When I was in elementary school, I was friends with a girl named Jessica. We had a group of five or six girls that we always played with. Jessica's parents were divorced, and I often went over to her dad's house after school because they had a trampoline and a slide. Her dad was a totally normal 
normal dude. His name was Richard and he held a job as a pilot which is definitely a job that requires mental stability. Jessica came over to my house as well and her dad would always come pick her up after the play date so he was familiar with where I lived. And I think second or third grade, Jessica moved away to live with her mom. I didn't fully understand what was going on as a child and I still don't know what happened, but something had gone wrong with her father. We didn't hear much from Jessica, but around her birthday the following year, Richard invited our group of girls over for a surprise birthday party. We arrived at the party and we were waiting for Jessica so we could surprise her, but Jessica never showed up. We were just hanging out with her dad for a while. As a child, this didn't seem as weird as it does to me now. When our parents picked us up, we obviously told them what happened, and we didn't hang out with Jessica or Richard again. After that, some of the girls started receiving presents from Richard at their homes. I never received them, but my mother told me about it years later. The presents usually consisted of cheap jewelry and notes. I have no idea what the notes said, but I'm not sure if I want to. After this, Richard goes away. My mom later told me he was in a mental institution. Years go by. I completely forget about the whole situation. Then, in the winter of 2013, I was out of town for a cheer competition. I was scrolling through Facebook one night when all of a sudden a new group chat popped up with five girls from my elementary school. I had not kept in touch with any of them, so this was weird. The chat was about how they had received messages from Richard on Facebook. I checked the other folder of my Facebook messages and sure enough, I had some too. I had a variety of messages that did not make a lot of sense, including some strange poems. Many of the messages were descriptions of dreams he had about me, though some of them were nonsense. Others were understandable enough to come across as violently threatening. I don't feel comfortable sharing some of the more explicit messages, but here are a couple of the shorter and less scary messages. Hi little girl from not long ago, pristine of pristineness, I want you, I want you, I want you. We're gonna have planets to go to someday provided you don't melt them first. I'm so proud of you. Stay happy and I haven't found a way to keep you all off my mind. I clicked on Richard's Facebook profile and his whole profile was dedicated to his five girls. He didn't have any friends added, so clearly nobody had seen it. Unfortunately, we didn't have very good security settings on Facebook. He had saved dozens of photos of us and then reposted them with nonsensical and inappropriate captions. The captions ranged from essays about his love for us to a one sentence caption that simply said she is so ugly. Here are some of the shorter photo captions. Emily, hopefully and not too soon I'm gonna find out your address and I'm gonna show up as a man that knocks on your front doorstep and bite your bottom lip off before you can say a word. Kiara, because of my initial euphoria turns into suck and depression when I realize that there is nothing I can do about anything beside you because you're inside me and I can't get you out of my mind. I love you so much. Melissa, can I paint your picture? I want to lift you around to see how heavy you are and well go for a drive on Hollywood Drive with the windows rolled down so we can get a crystal clear view. We were all freshly 18 at the time and didn't know what to do, so our moms contacted the RCMP. They told us not to block Richard on Facebook, but not to reply as the messages could be used as evidence. He continued to send us messages every single day, and we shared the screenshots with each other in the group chat and sent them off to the RCMP. He had several different Facebook accounts that were all variations of his name, along with one randomly named Esteban. One of the girls got in touch with Jessica to find out if she still had contact with her father. She only saw him in supervised visits every once in a while. She was very embarrassed and apologized a lot. She was a super sweet girl and obviously none of us were upset at her in any way. Eventually, Richard was charged with five counts of criminal harassment. He pled guilty and went to jail for around five months. When he got out, there was still a no contact order in place meaning that he could not contact any of us girls or come within a certain radius of our homes. He was not allowed to use the internet either. I'm not sure how all of this works, but this is what the constable handling the case told me. However, not surprisingly, he started contacting us on Facebook again. He went back to jail for breaching his probation. It was the summer of 2015 and he got out again. I started receiving more messages. I immediately wrote on the group chat to see if the other girls had gotten anything. They hadn't. It was just me. I immediately contacted the police. It seems they had forgotten to include my name on the no contact order. He knew not to contact the other girls, but thought it was still safe for him to contact me. This time things got worse. I had just started working at a new job, and being the idiot that I am, I had my workplace public on my Facebook profile. One day I came into work and there was a package waiting for me. I was obviously confused because I would never order something to be delivered to my work. I opened it up with my managers and there was weed inside along with the disc with encryption software on it. He had mailed me weed to my work. I knew immediately that this was him, and awkwardly explained the situation to my managers who thought it was hilarious. The security in my office tower was alerted and given a photo of him. 
They began walking me to my bus stop after my shifts. It was scary knowing that he knew where I worked. At this point, I hadn't seen Richard in years, but it was clear that he was mentally unwell. I had absolutely no idea what he was capable of or what his motives were. The RCMP did not seem to take this case very seriously, and they moved very slowly, passing the case around to various officers. Meanwhile, I was terrified. I could hardly walk down my street at night without freaking out. Every time somebody knocked on my door while I was home alone, I would drop whatever I was doing and hide under the kitchen counters. I had not moved since I was a child, so it was very possible that he remembered where I lived. The packages kept coming. I received more weed in several different forms, including cookies, what appeared to be cocaine, and a key to his apartment along with some miscellaneous items. I opened all the packages at the police station. One of the packages included a USB stick with a bunch of audio recordings on them, but I decided it was better for me not to listen to them. The return of the packages was to a random PO box in another city that did not belong to Richard, and no fingerprints were found on the packages. During all of this, the Facebook messages were made constant. Luckily, in one of the messages he informed me that he had sent me drugs and the key along with his home address. This confirmed that the packages were from him. He was charged again. I received a subpoena in the mail to appear as a witness in court. However, he once again pled guilty and I never got to go to court. I was actually a bit disappointed as I thought seeing him in person would provide me with some sort of closure. He is still locked up somewhere as I am writing this, but I still get scared walking at night or when somebody knocks on the door. The police provided me zero information on where he was being held or when he would be released. I feel like I am just waiting for the day that he will contact me again. I just hope that he never does. I had just moved out of a share house in the suburbs and it's in my own one bedroom apartment in the city. I'm a male and at the time was around 25 years old. My apartment, while old and small, was located about 500 meters from one of the most popular night spots in the inner city. As I was in my mid-twenties and out on my own, this was the perfect place for me. This was because my friends and I were quite social and would frequent bars and nightclubs in the city and the taxi fares were starting to add up. Also, this new apartment was close to my work so it made sense. I got settled in right away and invited my friends over for pre-drinks before hitting the clubs. Due to the limited space in the apartment, this meant that some friends were inside and some were drinking on the walkway just out front. We had the music up and I just started drinking but between songs, I could hear the couple next door arguing. Now, the apartment was old and bad which met thin walls too, so I pressed an ear to the wall in order to listen in. I hadn't met any of my new neighbors at this time as I didn't take long to move in and I didn't really see anyone during. I was curious. Judging from what I could determine while eavesdropping, they were a gay couple in their early 30s. One of the men was yelling at the other to go next door and tell us to keep it down. The other was arguing that it was just a housewarming and to let it go for the night. Since I didn't want to cause trouble, I marshaled everyone outside to start making our way to the nightclubs, leaving my new neighbors in peace. Later that night, I came home alone as I was tired from the move. I decided to let my friends carry on partying without me. I arrived at my door and proceeded to fumble around for my keys when I looked up to see a man standing in the walkway in front of the next apartment smoking a cigarette. He was tall and thin with brown oil hair. I noticed that he also had a cut lip and a faded but still visible black eye. I said, sorry about the noise earlier, correctly assuming he was my neighbor. He replied, nah, you're alright man, I'm Chris by the way. I shook his hand. I noticed his knuckles were red and a little bit scratched up so I knew something was off. I apologized for the noise and said, I hope I didn't cause any trouble for you. He withdrew his hand and with a soft but cracking voice said, nah, that's okay, Rick just gets a bit cranky sometimes, I'm used to it. With that, I finished off the conversation and told Chris that I'd see him later. It was about 2am at this point and I just wanted to sleep but couldn't help worrying about the potential domestic abuse going on next door. I decided to just keep an eye on it for now as I didn't have all the info, for all I knew, he could have gotten into a fight with someone else. As the weeks passed, I noticed that my new neighbors got drunk regularly and would argue almost every time. I could tell that Rick was the dominant one as his voice was a lot deeper and Chris seemed to be afraid of him during their shouting matches. This is why I kept my distance and never really socialized with them. I would even overhear them arguing about me and that Rick thought that Chris liked me, etc. I would just tune all of this out with headphones and video games, not to mention an active social life and full-time work to keep me occupied. I did find myself avoiding having guests over because of the neighbors. I would opt to meet people out as their arguments could be quite upsetting. This was working out fine enough for a while until Christmas Eve that same year. I was arriving home after coming from last minute Christmas shopping. I was getting ready for a night of present wrapping as I was to visit my family the following day for Christmas. As I arrived home, I noticed two police cars outside in Anna and Asia 
Asian woman who lived a few apartments up from Chris was screaming. I asked her what was happening and all she said was, it's just so sad, while sobbing. I could see three officers trying to restrain somebody and there was blood on their uniforms. I came just a little bit closer to see Chris's oily brown hair in the center of the affray. His face was bleeding from his jaw where he had apparently been slashed by something sharp. They got him to his feet and I could see that his cheek had been cut so deep that the skin was flapping open as he struggled and resisted with the police. I recoiled in shock and went to comfort Anna who was crying uncontrollably at this point. Suddenly, Rick's voice boomed out from nowhere. You see what you've done, you loser. This frightened me and my instinct was to get myself and Anna to safety. Even though the cops were here, they had their hands full with Chris and I certainly didn't want to get involved in such an ugly fight where knives were involved. Anna refused to come with me and said that she would be fine. I looked around to see where Rick was as he kept yelling at Chris the whole time. The three cops struggled to restrain him. I could hear Chris whimpering apologetically in between. I couldn't see where Rick was so I decided just to go to my apartment and lock the door. As I turned to go, I froze in horror as Rick's voice boomed, where are you going? A deep chill went down my spine as my brain struggled to reconcile the fact that these words were coming out of Chris's mouth. I felt panic grip me as I realized that all this time Rick and Chris were the same person. All the fighting, laughing, drinking, and carry on that I couldn't help overhearing over the last couple of months had come from one solitary person. A lonely guy in his small one bedroom apartment. For some reason that made me feel sick. I learned later from Anna that this wasn't the first time the police had to come take Chris away. Anna explained that he spends a couple of months at the local psychiatric hospital each time. His father owns the apartment so it's here waiting for him when he gets out. I moved out a few months later and while it is a sad situation for Chris, I really do feel him. Today was like any other, just another ordinary day, working by myself in the store, checking out customers, stocking shelves in my moments away from the register. A normal day. At some point while on register, I greeted a man with a large dark beard, bald, and wearing glasses as he came through the door. He immediately smiled and got that surprised look on his face after seeing me as if he had just found his next victim. Eventually, after about an hour or two of being on register, I'd pretty much cleaned the store out of my customers and moved on to stocking candy. The man before before with a beard approaches me with a smile and holds up a large white trash can. Uh, excuse me, yes, I reply, glancing up from the box I'm stalking. Are there any more of these in the back? This one doesn't have a lid, he says, gesturing to the large trash can in hand. Oh yeah, I can check for you. I smile and turn away and head toward the stockroom. I notice he's following me and think nothing of it, but glance down the aisles for any other customers as I walk, immediately taking note of the store's emptiness. Well, I guess it's just us in the store, I think to myself. Moving through the stockroom door, I'm quickly relieved this guy stops at the entrance. I'll be right back I say as I make a turn around some full rotainers, which due to just receiving a truck, our stockroom is full of them. They stand very tall and are like giant movable walls, but very heavy mind you. Being short myself, I don't have to move them much to make a path through and see what's on them. So after only a minute, I've made myself a little path, having three heavy ones on my right and left and in front of me. I decide to give up my search for trash cans. Sign, I go to turn around and inform him of my defeat only to find he's in my tiny path of walls. A very tight squeeze for a man of his stature, standing directly behind me. Find them? Uh, no, I don't think I have any. I try to laugh and avoid acknowledging the creepy situation. I'm in a very small area with walls at my back and sights towering over myself and this very robust man standing in the way of my only exit, in a room very far from any customers with no cameras and no other employees in the store. I'm helpless and increasingly growing scared at how this man isn't moving to let me out. I go to voice that I need to return to work after a solid minute goes by, but I am not able to get out a single word before he says in this creepy, almost shy voice, you're just the cutest little thing, did you know that? Within an instant, I'm scared and feel ill attention from the sky. Surprising myself though, I choke out without thinking. I just heard my bell, what? He looks confused but doesn't budge. I just heard my bell, there are people up front who need to be checked out and are looking for me. I stand nervously knowing full well neither of us heard the familiar ching from the service bell I keep on register. But what about my trash can, he asks, stepping forward but taking a glance back toward the trash can. And again, with lightning thinking, I blurt out, I'll mark it down half price, no big deal, laughing and trying to act like nothing is out of the ordinary. I slip by him, seeing my opening at his turning around. I try my hardest to walk away, pretending to be calm as I exit the stockroom, then sprint to the front of the store the moment I was out of sight. He wound up leaving without purchasing the trash can. So, creepy guy who I expect to pull something like that again, I hope you and I don't meet again. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you.
My fiance and I threw a dinner party one time to celebrate his mom completing chemo. I hired a caterer. We were expecting 25 friends and family, so it was more than the kitchenette of our single story ranch house could handle. We'd also only just moved in, so didn't have a lot of cooking staples. The caterer said he'd bring everything 75% done, but he needed to finish off some dishes in our kitchen. I told him that was fine as long as he was finished by 5, because the kitchen is centrally located and we'd prefer everyone be finished before the guests arrive due to the intimate nature of the occasion. He said that would be fine. He arrives as scheduled at 12 p.m. We gave him until 5 and the guests aren't even arriving until 6, so it's plenty of time. He smelled bad. It was more than a sweat smell though. It smelled like sunbaked diaper, and that made me uneasy because he was going to be preparing food for sick prior and young kids. I just made sure he washed his hands and then left him to his own devices worrying I was being presumptuous. Throughout the entire process, he keeps pulling me aside to ask me questions and have me taste things. I was super busy because my husband had to work during the day and pick up the surprise guest right after. So setting up the deck, decorating, putting together the slideshow equipment, coordinating the surprise guest, we flew in her sister and I had to make sure she got an Uber at the airport and her hotel had worked out etc and just a million other little details. So every 10 minutes being asked things like, do you prefer this with paprika or without? With this fine, whatever you think, tasted to be sure was getting old. When he was still there at 545, after two gentle reminders, I flat out told him I needed him completely out by 6 no matter what. He apologized and said there had been a delay because our oven wouldn't stay up to temperature. I never had a problem with our oven, but I figured he's the professional, maybe it was a subtle problem. A little before 6 rolls around, a few of our friends start trickling in. I decide to tell him whatever's done is done, and whatever isn't he should just put in the fridge. But he's nowhere to be found. I go out on the deck to ask my friends if they'd seen him, and he's out there. Alcoholic beverage in hand, out of his chef whites, and now in a t-shirt and jeans, mingling with my friends. I walked out just in time for him to introduce himself to my cousin-in-law as a good friend of mine. Nope, too weird for me. I met him in person for the first time barely six hours ago. I told him he needed to leave, now. So he goes inside and gets his bag and makes a beeline for my bedroom. I'm taken aback. I say, excuse me, where are you going? And he says, to change. So, first of all, we have a guest bathroom clearly visible. Second, why can't he wear a t-shirt and jeans home? I tell him I'm not comfortable with him going to my room, but he insisted it'll only be a second and goes in and shuts and locks the door. I couldn't even get a word out before he went in and I felt helpless. I was going outside to ask one of my friends to help me usher him out, but at that point my fiance got there with my aunt-in-law. I had to explain the situation to him nearly in tears at this point, and he was like, what? He went in the bedroom? Why? So he pounded on the door, and the caterer came out, still in a t-shirt and jeans, and my fiance said, you shouldn't be in there, you need to leave. And the caterer said, excuse me, but this is not your house, it is not up to you to decide. And my 6 foot 4, 260 pound fiance tells him, yes, actually, it is his house. It puts a hand on his back and guides him to the door. The caterer says, I thought she lived here, referencing me, and he says, yes, my fiance lives here with me and the caterer goes nuts. He turns to me and screams, you lied to me. I have no clue what he's talking about. He starts yelling about how I let him on and calling me more names. I don't know who he thought the man in the pictures with me around the house was. So my fiance says, oh no, you won't talk that way in my house. Find the door. And the caterer goes in the kitchen and starts throwing the trays of food out of the refrigerator and onto the floor. At that point, my fiance realized two of his brothers, both currently offensive linemen at the college level, had come in and were on the deck. He signaled to them and they came inside and he basically said, this guy's harassing my fiance. They helped my fiance out. The party then went on as planned, but I insisted we just order pizza and throw out all the food he made. My fiance and friends kept saying, isn't that a bit much, but I was insistent. We went out late drinking with his brothers and got home around 3.30 a.m. and passed out in our room. At around 5 a.m., I was woken up to the sound of the door opening. I figure either we forgot to lock the door in our drunken stupor, and it blew open or one of his family forgot their keys or something in the house and didn't want to wake us. His parents and his local brother have a key, but his parents never ever let themselves in when they know we're home. And his brother had even more than we did and was definitely not awake and driving around at 5am. It wasn't nearly windy enough for the door to have blown open, it had been tranquil all night. So I wake up my fiance and whisper, someone just came in the house, and he said the same thing. Probably my brother left his wallet or something. I figure I'm being paranoid and try to put it to rest when I hear a loud crash sound. With that, my fiance was up and on his feet in one movement. He told me to lock myself in the closet and call 911 while he went and looked around. As I was pulling out my phone, we hear in the distinct accent, hello, and I realize it's just this insane caterer. I'm not worried about this caterer physically overpowering my fiance, or me for that matter, so I charge right out there. The caterer is shirtless and clearly on something. He's taking the pictures that are of just me off the 
wall and holding several in his arms already. He lunges toward me when he sees me. My fiance gets between me and him and I call 911. My fiance tells him cops have been called and it is in his best interest to get off the property. The caterer says no, I have to make sure your fiance is okay. And I say what, why wouldn't I be okay? And my fiance rightfully says not to engage with him and feed into it. My fiance stays between me and him while I climb out a window. He watches as the caterer throws photos of us on the floor. My fiance didn't want to subdue or touch him in any way so the caterer couldn't make any assault claims. He's begun to destroy our kitchen at this point and when the cops come in he has a butcher knife. My fiance considered going for the gun safe when he first got the knife since we live in a standard ground state but he decided the situation was hectic enough without introducing a firearm. The caterer doesn't obey the police's orders to drop his weapon and he says he isn't leaving without me so they tase him. It's lucky for him he only got tased and he didn't antagonize my husband into squashing him. As he's let out in cuffs he's shouting how he and I are in love. He continues on this tirade the entire time police are reading him his rights. The police ask us to do an inventory of the house and see if anything's missing or damaged besides what we witnessed him do. We go around and there's nothing. But then I remember he was in our room yesterday and he went through the room. All of my underwear from the dirty laundry hamper were gone. We were so freaked out in the aftermath that we replaced all of our kitchenware, toothbrushes, sent our sheets to be professionally cleaned, and had a cleaning crew do a deep clean on the whole house. So glad we decided not to serve the food to our guest and my fiance's medically fragile mother. He sent me a letter from prison that thankfully my husband intercepted because I was still recovering from the whole thing. We gave it to the police who helped us get issued a no contact order. He was sentenced to three years in prison. This happened in May of 2015, in California which will help those of you who are familiar. I had graduated college in June of 2014, moved back into my old hometown, and started a consulting company with my boyfriend which is going very well. We had just finished a contract in the Bay Area, and were beginning a new one about 8 hours south in Torrance. He moved down there first to start setting up, while I took care of loose ends at our closing contract before moving down to meet him. The day comes and I pack my car and head down south to I-5, for the uninitiated it's a straight highway with little in the way of scenery aside from the occasional strip mall and its monotony has a reputation for putting drivers to sleep at the wheel. I pass a strip mall with gas and a fast food joint and decide to fill my car in my stomach. I go to park in the food venue's parking lot but it's completely full so I park across the street at a hotel which at the time I didn't think anything of. I go inside and eat my meal then cross the street to get back to my car. I'm well into the hotel parking lot when a pickup truck pulls down the aisle and cuts off my path and stops with a passenger side facing me. The driver is alone and a clean-cut white male in his mid-30s. I don't remember anything about him except that he looked very generic and buttoned up. The way he pulled in front of me to block my path didn't initially set off alarm bells, as he has done it pretty organically. He rolls down the window and the dialogue follows. Excuse me, miss, but could you please tell me where the grocery store in town is? I'm sorry, I'm not from here so I couldn't say. Oh, where are you from? Uh, good question, I don't know, not here though. I didn't say that to be rude, I had just moved through so many cities at that point and was on my way to a new one. I wasn't sure how to answer. He laughs and makes a joke, then asks me where I'm headed. I mentioned that I'm moving. I will say he was very charismatic and at this point I just think he's trying to flirt with me. And if I hadn't been so exhausted or in a relationship on another date it might have worked. He makes another comment about how unpleasant moving can be and then gives a warm chuckle and extends his hand to shake mine and goes, well I'm glad I got to meet you, I'm Scott. If you recall the truck is in front of me with a passenger side facing me. I actually take a step forward to grab his hand and then got the delayed response of every alarm bell that should have gone off earlier. I'm in a hotel parking lot, he asks me a question that establishes I don't know where I am, another question that establishes I'm alone, and another question that establishes I'm not expected at my destination for many more hours. The thing that connected all these synapses when he extended his hand, he didn't make even the faintest effort to make it accessible to me. He didn't lean over the seat or move toward me in any way. His hand was hovering comfortably over the center console waiting for me to grasp it, which in order to do I would have to lean well into the car. Again, I had already taken a step toward him and begun to raise my hand to take his when the sirens went off. I rocked backwards back to where I was standing and I just remember looking in his eyes what felt like forever feeling everything click into place while also half convinced my imagination was just running wild. His hand still waiting, I lowered mine and felt my eyes slightly narrow with suspicion and slowly said, I'm going to walk away from your car now Scott. Boom. Truck burns rubber with thick gray smoke as the guy guns it out of the hotel lot at 100 miles per hour. He must have floored it. Regrettably smart on his end because I didn't have the license number or anything to offer the police. In the immediate minutes following the event, I felt relieved by 
but hadn't really processed the full weight of what happened. Unfortunately for me, I had many more hours to think back and analyze the whole interaction to shreds. The car was somewhat lifted, there could have easily been another person, or even two to three other people, hiding inside. I still get creeped out about thinking how close I came to taking his hand, and how fortunate I was that I didn't allow my reaction to be driven by manners as criminals often take advantage of. This happened when I was in high school long ago. My mom just recently found the paperwork about it when she cleaned out her office upon retiring from the police department. I remember being upset and scared when it happened, but reading the details as an adult, it sounded even worse than I remembered. I was a 17 year old female, working at a flower and gift shop. It's night time, a man comes in, short, overweight, balding, and 40 years old. He tells me about how he needs an apology gift for his girlfriend. So I offer a bouquet, obviously it's a flower shop. He says she doesn't like flowers because they die. This was the first weird thing as he came into a flower shop. Then he goes into detail about how he hit her and asked me if I think it was the right thing to do so. This was long ago so I don't remember exactly what I said but it was something along the lines of not if you want her to continue being your girlfriend. He then tells me what a great job I'm doing and asks me when I get off work. I dodge answering and he leaves. Nothing for six months. Then right before Valentine's Day he walks in the door one minute before close. It was dark and from the outset it looked like I was working alone as my co-worker about a 40 year old female was in the bathroom. Instinctively, it felt like a predator had just entered the room. You know when something isn't right and everything felt not right. I then noticed he has a tarnished revolver tucked into the front of his windbreaker, which is halfway unzipped. It was obvious he wanted it seen. I quickly scribbled a note to my co-worker that said he has a gun and handed it to her when she came out of the bathroom. She calmly walked to the phone and looked at me, wordlessly asking if she could call the cops. I shook my head no as I felt like it would escalate the situation. God forbid he heard the police coming and took us hostage or something. I was just going to try and act as calm and normal as I could and hopefully not tip the situation to something more dangerous. He spends 15 minutes wandering around what was a fairly small shop. In retrospect, he was probably waiting to see if my coworker would leave as it was now well past closing. Finally, he places an order for pickup on Valentine's Day, which gives me his name and info, which I'm going to for sure file with the police report. He buys a card and pulls out a wad of $100 bills, which he slowly thumbs through as though looking for the right one with which to pay for his $40 order. I ask him if he wants a bag as it wouldn't be very inconspicuous if he just showed up at home with the Valentine's card. He replies, no, I didn't feel like being inconspicuous tonight, which seemed like an obvious reference to the gun hanging out of his coat. He leaves. We quickly lock the door and watch him sit in his truck outside. We were not about to exit the shop until he was gone. Finally, he pulls out of his parking spot and moves to another spot further away and continues to just sit there. I don't know how long we waited, but he finally left. I called my mom crying. She called the police, who came to the shop the next day to take a report. I told my best friend at the time what happened. She told her mother. Her mother happened to work with the man and informed security at her job. She said he was very weird, creepy, and liked to talk about weapons a lot. Security at his job, it's a large company with government contracts and things having to do with tech and security, pulled him into the office and questioned him about it. He claimed it was a glove in his pocket, not a revolver. The police were pissed that this company made contact with him about it before they did, and he successfully dodged the cops' multiple calls and visits to his apartment. My mom, much to my teen fury at the time, Time made me quit my job, which was devastating as I loved it there. In retrospect, totally the right call. I never saw him again. In my late teens and early 20s, I was friends with a girl named Lucy. She was a very lonely kind of girl whose parents were, well honestly, not really great parents. Her mother was verbally abusive and her father really couldn't care less about anything. Because of the lack of love in her life, Lucy searched through dating sites for love and comfort from strange men and she was not afraid of meeting them face to face even if they'd been chatting for only a few days. My friendship with Lucy was a strange one. I found her quite annoying sometimes but I also felt awful for her because of her loneliness and lack of friends and love in her life. Sometimes I really didn't want to hang out with her and some days I would accept her offer to hang out. When it was just her and I together, she was normal and okay to be around but also very appreciative of having someone giving her attention. We had a small group of friends and she would try to get all of us together as often as possible and honestly, the whole group together was really quite fun. When we were all together, Lucy was very hyper and you could just tell that she was happy to be around people who didn't insult her as her mother does. Suddenly, Lucy tells us she has a boyfriend. We were all surprised 
surprised because we knew she met a lot of guys online, but we had never heard her say she was dating someone. A few days later, she sets up a day for our friend group to meet Trevor. None of us were looking forward to it because we thought he was going to be like all the others, a temporary boy toy. When we met him, we all felt awkward. He barely spoke a word. He wouldn't look directly at any of us at all. Lucy would try to be funny, but he would just give her dirty looks. Needless to say, we thought he was a weird one and could tell he didn't care much for her. As the days went on, Lucy kept telling me how much Trevor did not like me. She kept saying he thinks I am using Lucy for her money. Not sure how he thought that since I paid for everything for Lucy. To keep this piece of the story short, I think he was trying to find reasons to convince her to get rid of me. I got a terrible vibe from Trevor. He dressed like he didn't care about life. He never smiled. He didn't shake our hands when first meeting us. He stank of weed and really had an overall uncomfortable feeling about him. After months of Trevor trying to convince Lucy that I'm a terrible friend and she should not hang out with me anymore, she started to do as he said. She would start to hide me from him. If she and I were together and he would call her on her phone, she would lie and say I wasn't there. If she was with the group of friends, he would have her swear I wasn't there. When he was going to be joining the group on an outing or just hanging out at her place, she would tell me I couldn't come. Lucy will do whatever a boyfriend says just to keep pleasing him so she doesn't lose them. Now here's where it gets scary. Lucy calls me one day and says she wants me to come hang out at her place. I agreed. She came to pick me up and we went to her house and watched TV for a bit. We then decided since the day is nice outside, we would take her two dogs for a walk to a nearby pocket park and would later return to the house to have lunch together. While at this park, she receives a phone call. Now let me say that Lucy is not a private person whatsoever and has never ever walked away to answer a phone call until this day. She walked far enough away that she knew I would not be able to hear anything she said. This was suspicious to me but not enough to question it. The call ends as she begins walking towards me with a look on her face as if she is trying not to smile. She tells me, so I need to bring you home now. I was slightly confused as we had only been together for about an hour when we usually spend the entire day together and she would never want me to go home. She would even frequently beg me to sleep over to avoid being alone. So anyway, I said okay and we walked to drop off her dogs at home and we got into her car and off we went. About 10 minutes into the car ride, I realized she isn't going in the direction of my house so I question it. Where are we going? She smirked but didn't respond. I asked again laughing uncomfortably. Seriously, where are we going? She continued to smirk but didn't want to answer me. I started to realize she was heading in the direction of where her boyfriend lived. I asked one last time with anger in my voice, where are you taking me? Her only response was bone chilling to me. Trevor wants to talk to you. I wasn't having any of this. I insisted and demanded she let me out of the car but with her evil smirk and same response she said it again. It's okay, he just wants to talk to you. I was furious at this point because this creepy guy who looks like he wants to kill someone who also despised me wanted to talk to me. Why can't he talk to me on the phone? Why do I need to go to his sketchy apartment? She absolutely refused to let me out of the car. She had the doors locked as if I wasn't able to unlock my passenger door. I waited until she reached a red light. I grabbed her wallet from the back seat and took out her bus pass and bolted out of the car. I had no idea where I was or where the nearest bus stop was but I was not about to let her crazy boyfriend do whatever he wanted to me. She yelled for me to get back into the car but of course I ignored her. She sped off furiously. I immediately blocked her number on my phone. I removed her as my friend on social media and immediately warned the group of friends not to talk to her because she has gone nuts. I have not spoken to her since that very day and she also lost the other five friends of the group as well. I've recently moved into a new apartment three weeks and I'm starting to share it with my sister. The only reason we know properly is a single mom who lives in the apartment next to us. Ever since we moved in, she's been giving us advice and helping us out with things, etc. We don't know any of the other neighbors properly yet. Today I was out with my friends and after that I went to get my sister so we could go out for some food. We got home around 10pm. My sister and I got into our PJs and were sitting around watching TV when our buzzer rang. I jumped up to answer it and it turned out to be our neighbor single mom. I asked her what was up and she said that our dad is asking for us downstairs. Straight away my stomach dropped. I immediately asked her if she's sure he said that he was our dad. The reason I asked this was just to make sure that is what she actually said. But she replied that yeah, he said he was our dad and he was asking for us. The neighbor then asked me if she could let him up to our flat, but I told her no. I wanted to shout out to my sister, but I didn't want to worry her right away. So I asked the neighbor to not let him come up yet, and I heard her repeat this to him. 
I couldn't hear anything for a few minutes and I started to get really worried. At this point, my sister comes up to me and asks who it is. I called out to my neighbor a few times, but she didn't answer. It must have only been about a minute, but it honestly felt like ages when she didn't reply. I was about to tell my sister to call 911 because I was starting to panic and I didn't know what was happening out there. But then she came back on and told me that he was gone. She then came up to our flat and explained what went down. She said that she was walking back to her flat after finishing work and she saw a man by the buzzers. At first, she assumed that he was just someone who lived there, but when he noticed her walking up, he asked us by name and asked us if she could let him up to our flat. She asked him who he was and he told her that he was our dad. Obviously, she buzzed us and told us first, since our neighbor doesn't know us that well, so she doesn't know what our dad looks like. She said that because we were young and on our own and she didn't want to buzz an estranged man up to our flat. She said that her mom and instincts kicked in when she heard me being hesitant to let him up to the flat. She said that apparently after he heard me say that he got really pushy with her and started trying to move her out the way. He kept on saying to her, it's okay, I'm their dad, let me in, I'm not going to do anything. She started arguing with him and told him that if I don't feel comfortable letting him in, there's no way he's getting in. He then got into the car and rode away. Now this is the reason why I hesitated. We haven't spoke to our dad since I was 16. We even considered getting a restraining order from him at one point. He's not even our biological father but we were legally adopted by him when I was nine. He was very abusive. It got to the point where we, me, sister, and my mom had to leave him in the middle of the night. He was always really controlling and after we left, he would secretly follow us around and leave threatening voicemails on the phone. I found out that he has a criminal record as well as I believe he was convicted of manslaughter in the 80s. I have no idea of the backstory behind that and I honestly don't really want to know. Like I said, we haven't from him since I was 16, which was three years ago. And as soon as she said the word dad, I almost had a panic attack. I asked her to describe him, and she said that because it was dark out, she couldn't really see him. We ended up staying with her because me and my sister are really shaken up. This happened a long time ago, when I was around 15 or so. I'm 25 now. Back then, I was really into singing and dancing with my friends, and I was introduced to K-pop as a result. This was way before K-pop became noticeably mainstream, so whenever events relating to it came up, we got very excited. There was a global audition for one of the big companies in my town, and my three friends and I decided to go. I was the only non-Asian girl in our friend group. I'm only mentioning it because this pertains to the story later. The K-pop fandom back then was pretty much the same as now. People of various ethnicities were into the idol music genre. We all knew the likelihood of getting into the industry was super low, and for me even more so, as I wasn't of Asian descent. But I knew that going in. That wasn't the point of us going though, we just loved being in proximity of something important to the genre we enjoyed. Just kids having fun. By the way, I looked pretty young for my age then, and wearing pigtails this day didn't help with that either. So we get dropped off and meet up at the audition place, a community center of some sort. We kind of dilly dally around a bit until we have to line up for our respective auditions, i.e. singing, dancing, etc. I was going to go sing, so I was mentally preparing myself in the crowded space outside of the audition rooms. That's when out of the corner of my eye I see a tall, older, maybe 40 years old, white man beginning to approach me. I remember thinking, huh, is he going to audition too? It was strange because everyone else in there was younger, maybe he was a parent. He walks up pretty close and goes, can you help me please? I'm confused and I ask him what he needs help with. Oh, the staff here, my son. My son's trying to audition but but they won't let him audition. Okay, this was weird. I then asked him why. He said, because he's not Korean. That was when I started to get creeped out. I looked around to see a pretty diverse crowd and then back at him. Uh, I don't know. That's terrible. You should talk to, and then I point towards the staff. They should be able to help. I knew he was lying, but I was too scared to say anything else. I went on, anyone could audition here. He didn't listen and insisted on me helping him. Then he said something that sent a chill down my spine. When I was trying for the fifth time to convince him to approach the staff instead of me, he beckoned me to come outside with him. My son's just outside in my car. Can you come talk to him, please? That was when I repeated what I said earlier and began to firmly walk in the opposite direction. He kept trying to coax me out to see his son. I managed to lose him in the crowd of people. Only seconds later, I see him talking to my friend about me and helping his son and all that. I was shocked. The man had clearly been watching me for a while to know who I came with. We were split up at that point. I went up and told her we should get going without looking at the man. He ignored me and kept on talking to her. Without speaking, I went up to her, grabbed her hand, and pulled her 
Cigarette wants to get her away from him. She was super gullible and didn't understand why I was so worried. That man clearly was unnerved by what I did and left my friend and then disappeared into the crowd. So about 20 minutes later, I'm in the lineup for the audition when I get a cold feeling in my body, and I turn to look towards the entrance. My audition room was close to it and there he was, standing. But he wasn't just standing, he had his arms crossed and he was glaring at me. I've never seen someone look at me with such vitriol. He looked like he wanted to kill me, it was terrifying. The crowd of people was sparse because we all had lined up outside our assigned rooms. This man waited there, staring at me nonstop for an hour, an hour. He glared at me all the way until I got into the audition room. I was so scared that he'd be there once I got out, but I guess the auditions went on longer than he expected and he went home, with his son in tow I'm guessing. I was so scared that he'd be there once I got out, but I guess the auditions went on longer than he expected and he went home, with his son in tow I'm guessing. I've worked a few odd jobs in my life. My first job was a summer job at 16 during summer break at a dairy farm. I absolutely hated it there and made it harder for me to find the motivation to even try finding work again when the time came. I don't really remember how I was first referred to the job, but the following summer, I ended up working as an office assistant for a self-employed photographer. My parents knew her because she used to be a member of their church, and my sister attended her 4-H program when she had it. By that time, her health had begun to take a hit as she claimed it was a mixture of things from chronic Lyme to fibromyalgia. I had I had also been warned by my parents that she was a little off. She was very religious and claimed to have had real encounters with demons, even participated in a few exorcisms. I'm an atheist and a skeptic, so I never took her story seriously. Aside from the weird things she would tell me, she was mostly harmless and working for her was not hard. The job basically required me to do a lot of data entry, as well as help prep her photos with some minor touching up and the addition of her company watermark before uploading them to a site where her customers could browse them and then pick which ones they wanted to order. She primarily photographed horse events, dressage, stadium, and cross-country jumping, etc. And for the first several months, my job stayed in her living room, which is basically my office space at the time. Eventually, I was talking to tagging along at shows where she trained me as a photographer, and soon I was shooting at the events along with her. It was boring work, I won't lie. I'm not a horse person. But things didn't get weird until a year later when I learned the hard way it was not her that I needed to worry about. She had two sons, one who was out of state, the other one was in the Navy. The latter of the two, a guy called Nate, I had only heard small things about. When he finally he returned home and I met him for the first time while working in her living room. He seemed like a nice guy, a little odd but not concerning. He was obsessed with movies and being a bit of a movie buff myself, whenever he would venture to the living room to strike up a conversation, it would always be about whatever movies we were into or were excited to see. I should point out here that I was 18 by this point and he was in his mid-30s. At some point he got it in his head that I was interested in him, though he never said anything directly to me. I had to find out about it from my parents. My mom worked as the secretary at her church in Nate knew it. I can only guess my boss had told him. One afternoon, Nate showed up at my mom's desk and started gushing about me. He talked about how much fun I was, how he loved talking to me, how he was planning to take me to the movies and take me to this church and all these other plans he had for me. My mom was beyond uncomfortable, as was the pastor who happened to overhear it. And when I got home that night, she told me what had happened and suggested I make sure not to lead him on. I was completely baffled because I hadn't done anything. We never even discussed the possibility of doing anything together. I made an effort to acknowledge him less when he was around and keep the conversation short while stressing I had work to do. Eventually, he got his own place and moved out of his parents' house, so I figured the problem had solved itself. A couple years later, I had moved out, my boss's company had closed, and I was working someplace new. I was friends with both my boss and Nate on Facebook, and around that time I was finally coming out as an atheist, something I couldn't do when I was still living at home. One night, my old boss messaged me, asking about a ring I had on my finger. It was a black ring with a white solid star in the middle of a black circle. Already knowing where she was going with this, I told her it was just a ring. She started accusing me of wearing a pentagram, because she didn't know what a pinnacle was, and that I was promoting Satan. I tried several times to explain to her that not only was it not that symbol, but that also paganism has nothing to do with Satan anyways, but she refused to listen so I just ignored her. It was typical behavior of her and not worth the argument. The next morning, I had a message from Nate, telling me I needed to come to his church with him. I told him no and the messages I received back gradually grew angrier and angrier. He went from asking to demanding I go with him. He told me I was lost and that I would not find the answers I needed by living the life I was. Eventually, he outright said he thought the fact that I was wearing a pentagram was disgusting and that I was opening myself up for possession. Knowing there would be even less of a point in arguing with him than there was with his mother, I went ahead and blocked both him and her, deciding I was done with the both of them. Then, he started showing up at my workplace. He would always search through the store until he found me, and then once he did, he would corner me and not stop talking to me no matter how many times I tried to dodge him or tell him I needed to get back to work. Eventually, the managers caught on and started intercepting him whenever he showed up. 
I wasn't making enough to pay the rent with that job, so I had to take up a second one. Within a week of working my second job, which was in a different town, he showed up there too. This time, I told the managers outright who he was, and after that, every time he showed up, I was allowed to hide in the back room behind a locked door while they sped his order along and got him out. One of those mini encounters, while I was hiding in the back, one of the managers was back there with me, inputting employee time punches into the computer when the both of us heard Nate shout in our directing, I know you remember me. That was the last straw for them, and they told him his business was no longer welcome there. He started showing up at my other job as well for a while, which was a relief. Fast forward to a few years later, I was getting used to not having to look over my shoulder every shift or checking the parking lot for his truck. Then one day he reappeared. He was browsing a section I was walking past when he spotted me and got this deer in the headlights look. I made a beeline to the break room because just seeing him made me scared. After that, he started showing up regularly. I would always find ways to dodge and avoid him, but he would still eventually spot me and know I was still there. I was debating whether or not to tell the managers because at this point it had been a while since he had done anything and saying something just because I was nervous didn't feel right. Call me a coward or an idiot but that was my thought process. What happened next made me regret not speaking up. It was bound to happen eventually, but one night he managed to catch me while I was at the customer service desk. He approached me and said hi, and I immediately started to look for someone to signal over so I could make a break for it. But before I could say a word, he said something that made me feel sick. How's your little girl doing? She's three now, right? I look at him horrified. I had him completely blocked from all of my social media, I had his number blocked, I was living at a new address, and I had not seen or spoken to his mother since she confronted me about my ring. I had not told either of them I was a parent now or that I was married, and I was not friends with any who knew them, but he knew. How's your husband doing too? He asked when I didn't answer. He's good, he's a good man, I said, trying to reinforce the idea that I was not available to him and that I had no desire to have anything to do with him. Where does he work? At this point, I felt like I was going to pass out. Thankfully, another employee approached just to gather some reshelves, and I got out of there. As I was leaving, he called out behind me, I'll see you again, we'll talk, we'll go out and do something together, we will. I reported him to the managers, telling them everything about the encounter, including all the information he had on me and my family that he should not have had. They were able to pull up his face on CCTV. I haven't seen him since the incident with my managers. I think he may have gotten scared off. Turned out one of my co-workers used to work with them too at a different job and she also made a complaint about him to the managers. I don't know what they did with that information afterwards, but I know he hasn't shown up since. It sounds like they plan to call the cops if he sets foot in the store again. With two employee complaints of stalker-like behavior, they refuse to ignore that. When I was about 7 years old, my father bought a few hundred acres in southern Mississippi about 1.5 hours west of Mobile, Alabama. He built a small cabin on top of a hill that was in the middle of a large field surrounded by woods. This house was about 5 miles from a paved road. To get to our land, it took nearly 10 minutes of driving down dirt roads from the main highway, which was south of the house. About a quarter mile north from the house, he built a small lake, more like a pond. It was about as long as a football field but wider. To get to the lake from the house, you could take Route A which was a hard packed dirt road that was lined with dogwood trees. It was beautiful in the spring. Route B was about 100 yards east of Dogwood Lane and we named it Vampire Trail because it was always so gloomy. The trees blocked out the sun on the brightest days and it had a slight decline as you walked toward the lake. I say walked because this trail was not for vehicles. Thick woods filled the area outside and in between both trails. One morning during the fall, my parents and my little sister had gone to get ice cream and do some shopping. This trip would take them at least an hour or two. I was 10 years old so I decided to go fishing while listening to Bama play Ole Miss. The game was the usual Bama win so I thought I could ease the boredom of a blowout by fishing in the well-stocked lake. So I carried my pole, small radio, and my small ice chest. I had an Airedale Terrier named Bull that never left my side and it was on this day I realized how awesome he really was. Onto the lake we went. Picture a large oval roughly the size of a football field but larger with an L-shaped pier in the southeast corner. Vampire Lane opened up to a more severe decline to the shore and then the small pier. Across the lake on the west side there was a narrow tree line that separated the shore from Dogwood Lane. The north side of the lake was the dam and the south end in thick and swampy woods. Fortunately for me, I realized later. About five minutes after I threw out my line and two Bama touchdowns later, I got that feeling. It's a feeling I have come to recognize well and it may have saved my life this day. The feeling of being watched by something dangerous. Bull must have felt it too because a few seconds later I could hear him growling low and staring across the lake to the west. To the tree line that separated Dogwood Lane from the lake. I turned my head in that direction and almost immediately my eyes lit on what I thought to be half of a silhouette of a large man behind a tree. It was too far to make out details but close enough to be sure of what I was seeing. 
Almost five minutes went by and right before I scolded myself for an overactive imagination, the half silhouette moved behind a tree slowly. Bull stood and growled louder and I told him quietly to stop and I turned my head north towards the dam while keeping my eyes and attention rooted to that tree. Over the next ten minutes, which felt like hours, I watched while this figure moved slowly from tree to tree, always north and always facing me. The saying, scared stiff, was something I found to be true. For some reason I thought it was important that whoever or whatever it was did not know I was aware. I finally realized that the figure's path was bringing it closer to the dam, which would make its path to be shorter and easier. My paralysis broke and I casually put down the fishing pole and started walking towards Vampire Lane. As an adult, I was in the army for 11 years as an MP, but not turning to look over my shoulder during that walk was the hardest thing I have ever done. In my mind's eye, whatever it was, was screaming across the dam towards me. When I hit the tree line, I broke into a run. As I was running, Bull dashed ahead of me and my anger turned into admiration as he stopped some 20 yards ahead and faced north until I passed him. He continued this action the entire I run home. My dog was watching my back, just epic. Although I can grasp the awesomeness of this now, at the time I was so scared that I was literally sick. Even at such a young age, I knew that a large man watching and trying to creep up on a 10 year old boy was up to no good. When I reached the cabin, I immediately locked the door and got one of my dad's shotguns as well as his 38 revolver. I sat at the large front window, my eyes glued to both trail openings in the woods between them. My family returned shortly after and for some reason I did not mention what happened. I never felt safe there again. When me and my friends were my little sister wanted to go anywhere other than the area around the cabin, I made sure my parents were with us. What scares me the most though is the fact that our closest neighbors were about two miles northwest of us, with thick woods in between as the crow flies. Who or what was watching me from the woods that day, guess I may never know. I sometimes wish I could go back then. As a grown man with military training, as I am now, Bull lived a full life and was put to sleep peacefully as a very old but great dog. The best dog I have ever known. This happened a few years ago, and since then it has made me look at people very differently. I used to work in a strip mall out in a fairly rural area. Most people are recognizable even if you don't know them personally. People from out of the area frequently stop on their way through to other towns, so it's not like there are never out of towners, just that they might be easy to spot. Like in many places, we have a few homeless folks that hang around the shopping center, and they occasionally ask people for change or food. It could be a nuisance, but the folks that worked at the shops kind of kept an eye on them to help them out or to keep track of how they are doing. There's this one guy, let's call him Shane, that over the course of years has slowly gotten in worse and worse shape. He would be filthy and was clearly not doing well mentally, and was usually intoxicated. He always had several layers of clothing and the pants that he wore on the outside of his other pants always sacked making it hard for him to walk. He'd go missing for days and then show up again. We'd wonder what happened to Shane and ask around a bit, and a few days later he'd appear again. He was always so dirty. I always wished there was a way we could get him some help, but I didn't really know what to do. One day, I was out in a major city that is about 80 or so miles away from where I work. I happened to see a well-dressed, very well-groomed gentleman that looked exactly like Shane, but at that moment I figured my eyes were deceiving me. This guy has an expensive looking shoulder bag, a new iPhone, and an Apple Watch. We were both in line at a popular food truck and it was usually a long wait to order and get your food. Most people just mind their business and scroll on their phones while waiting. This guy on the other hand is staring daggers at me. I keep avoiding looking that way, but I keep glancing to see if he's still there. And at the time, I want to look at him because I'm so curious about how much he looks like Shane. I glance his way and I have to stumble back because he's practically right up against me. He has such intense eyes, he sort of whispers to me, but really intensely, and tells me he knows where I'm from and what shop I work at. He gets closer and I can tell he smells good, and I can even smell his minty breath. I ask how he knows, and he just smiles. I ask again and he smiles brighter, exposing a perfectly clean set of teeth, minus one tooth. I'm almost positive Shane is missing that tooth. I edge away, feeling more than a little uncomfortable. His order gets called up, but they say his name is James. The next few days, I don't see Shane anywhere around the shopping center, and I ask around and no one had seen him for a few days. Someone says they hope he's okay, another person shrugs and says they wish they could do something to help him. The next day he is here, filthy as ever, grimy teeth, dirty fingernails, and wearing all his layers. He sits on the curb outside my shop and asks people for change. I decide to venture out and confront him. I'm 100% sure it's him, but I don't understand how he could get so filthy and smelly in such a short time. I ask him if he was in the city and he looks at me through bloodshot eyes and mumbles that he'll kill me if I tell anyone. This takes me aback and I look at him puzzled. He slurs again that he will kill me if I tell anyone that he's not actually homeless. He starts to get worked up and I ended up calling the police because I didn't know at that point what he was capable of. He wandered off and I haven't seen him since. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you.
The story takes place late around 1.30 a.m. when I get the call. A very drunk friend of mine, Claire, is begging me to come pick her up and give her a ride home soon. The bar is closing soon and she's too drunk to drive home. The bar she is at isn't too far from my house, about a 10 to 15 minute drive, but the issue is that she lives like 35 to 45 minutes on the other side of town. Claire has been extremely nice to me in the past and I did owe her a solid so at about 10 to 2, I grab my keys and my concealed carry and leave the house. I get to the bar at around 5 past 2 and she's sitting outside on a bench by the doorman. I pull into the parking lot, which is pretty empty since the bar is closed and I assume the cars remaining were the workers who had yet to leave. I get out of the car and start walking to Claire who is kind of slumped over. I was hoping she wasn't passed out drunk and when I got to her, the doorman asked me if I was her ride. I told her yes, showed my ID for proof, and what he said next was of some concern. He kind of pulls me in and says, Hey, I was supposed to leave when we closed, but I have a strong feeling your friend was roofied. She's been on the porch drinking all night and some guy kept hovering around her. I assumed it was a boyfriend or whatever, but she never turned to talk to the guy. She was either drinking or chatting with other girls around her. Well anyways, she chugged her last drink, came up to me and told me you would be coming to pick her up, and she asked me if she could sit by me, and she told me she felt very dizzy and sick. I told her sure, hoping she just drank too much and she passed out right after she sat down. After that, I couldn't see the guy anymore, but I didn't want to take any chances. So visibly concerned, I thanked the guy profusely, and he even helps me carry Claire to my car. Midway to carrying her, she's kind of coming to, like someone just waking up after a surgery. That really groggy, not knowing where they are, talking of nonsense kind of talking. I don't remember exactly what she was talking about, but I'm sure if I wasn't on high alert about her possibly being drugged, it was some funny stuff. So we get her buckled in, I think the guy again, and he just says he hopes she gets home safe. So now, hoping my friend is only stupid drunk and not drugged, I start driving to her house. The whole time I'm trying to keep an eye on her, and an eye on the road. She's now snoring asleep which puts me at ease a bit, but about halfway to her house, my fuel light comes on. Cursing the fuel economy of a sports car, I pull into the next gas station. It's one of those small gas stations that doesn't have 24 hour store, so I'm on extra high alert while I start to pump gas. The gas station is about a block from the freeway, and right at the corner of the intersection. The street itself is pretty dark, with lonely lampposts shining very pitiful lights at large intervals. I get that really dead feeling like this place is just abandoned. To give an idea of positioning, because this is important, the gas station is at the corner of the intersection. The storefront would be facing south, and we were right in front of it where the pumps were. The east would be where there are air pumps for tires and parking spaces, and the north would be a diesel fuel pump right behind the store accessible from the street behind the gas station. I drive a Corvette so the filler is on the rear end of the car, and I'm leaning against the rear looking around. To my left, I hear this weird metallic scraping sound, so I turn and see this guy, about 15 to 20 feet from me, come around the corner dragging a long metal pipe on the ground. I immediately sense that I'm in a possibly dangerous situation now. The guy looks almost possessed but he's not looking at me, rather like he's trying to look into my car. I'm on the defensive but hope I can get him to leave so I call out, hey everything alright? Without looking at me he answers back, you took my girlfriend from me, I'm here to take her back. Now he turns to look at me and he's got blood in his eyes. Before he begins to take a step though, I start yelling hoping it'll get him to back off. Back off, please turn around. He takes a step towards me, clearly unimpressed. So almost automatically, I pull my handgun from my inside inside the waistband holster and draw a bead on him. Back off, you don't have to die, I start yelling louder. Anyway, in a panic, the guy throws the pipe at me. It whizzes by and I dive behind my car for cover. I have no idea if he has a gun himself or what, but I was going to put some kind of cover between me and him. And by the time I kneel up and aim over the rear of my car, he spooked it. I hear a car door slam and tire screech, and he launches off the curb on the east side of the lot and is tearing down the road, swaying all over the place. In my own panicked hurry, I pull the pump out of the car, screw the cap on, and tear out of there myself. Claire, however, is still passed out in the car, and now I'm afraid because I'm convinced she'd been drugged and we were followed by that guy. Me being more concerned about her earlier and keeping on the road, I must have not noticed being followed. The whole way back to her house, I'm wary of any car that's behind me. I'm also driving very aggressively, and when I get to Claire's neighborhood, I circle a separate block that's not hers four times to make sure no one followed me. When I was satisfied thinking I wasn't being followed anymore, I pulled up to her house and try to shake her awake. She's doing that groggy waking up stuff from before, but now she's able to get up. 
I'm able to walk her. Thankfully, I was worried I was going to have to call an ambulance if she didn't wake up, and I get her keys from her bag. I manage to walk her inside, and at this point she's kind of coming around, asking me what's going on, where she is, etc. I tell her she's home and get her to lie down. She's completely lost looking, and her eyes start welling up. She clings to me and starts sobbing. She's still very out of it, but I'm guessing she realizes something bad was going on or attempted on her. I was able to get her to lie down and get her to sleep. I write a note for her which pretty much said, hey, I'll be in the next room, we're going to the hospital in the morning to get you checked out. Fast forward to the morning, she's sick as a dog, and after she expelled some demons from her stomach, I drove her to the hospital where she got tested and treated. I still shudder to think what might have happened had I not had my CCW with me. Claire still doesn't remember much from the night except calling me and wanting to sit next to the doorman. They did a urine test at the hospital and found traces of Rahipnol, roofies. In the days after we went to the bar and let them know what happened, I gave as good description I could of the guy. Claire decided to against filing a police report and I respectfully went with her wishes. My advice is, either be with friends you trust when you go out or at least be vigilant if you're by yourself. That night could have ended badly in a thousand different ways but thankfully everyone made it out safe. I don't really know where to begin, but I suppose it started before I was born. My birth set in motion a series of actions that led to the threat on my life beyond my control. So pre my existence, my mother, Jane, dated an older guy named James when she was in her mid-teens. He adored her, but wasn't of the same religion as her, so she ended up marrying a gentleman from her congregation instead leaving James' brother put out. A year after being married, Jane gave birth to me and decided that she was unhappy with my father, Dave, and contacted James with the intent to go back to him. So Jane packed a bag one night, took me and left. As soon as she arrived at James, she was bombarded with messages from Dave telling her that he would take full custody of me if she didn't return. So with a heavy heart, she chose me over James, and therein lies my problem. She went back to my father and after another year of failed attempts, they divorced and my mother moved south to be with family, completely forgetting about James. My childhood was fairly normal for the next 13 years. A few house moves, a new stepdad, and a few siblings. Mother's second marriage falls through and she's single again. The year is 22 and she has just discovered Facebook. Being newly single and having sudden contact with all of her old school friends, she quickly strikes up a few romances out of nostalgia. Nothing sticks though until she finds him. James has a Facebook account. Not very active, no profile picture, but my mom is sure it is him and immediately falls in love again. He comes down south and meets his kids and stays for my 16th birthday party. Looks wise, he is easily in his 50s with shaved gray hair and glasses. My mom leaves him a third time and he finally flips and the crazy comes out to play. He starts turning up at the house uninvited. He is told to leave every time. The visits become less frequent and we think maybe he's got the message. But then hand delivered letters start arriving for my mom. And it's the contents of these letters that cause me alarm. In them he details how if she had never met my father they could have been happy together. And he had a plan to get her back that was ruined by the untimely arrival of me. So he did what any crazy man would do and started plotting to get me out of the picture. Back in 1995 she had a near miss of a car accident with baby me in the car when a car clipped her at a junction. She didn't get the car's details but put it down to chance. In the letters, James tells her that the incident 15 years ago was him and that he won't miss this time. He informs her that he still believes that there is a chance for them but only with me out the picture. I'm not a baby anymore, my father is well and truly out of the picture but the crazy in James' brain won't let it go. The next letter tells her that he will burn the house down. If he can't have her, no one else will. The next letter informs my mother that he has told social services that she is a drunk and that they will come and take me away. Not hard to prove that false so we don't panic. The next letter tells her that he will burn the house down. If he can't have her, no one else will. This one she takes to the police. Upon investigation, it is revealed that an ex of James, with the same first name as my mother, has a restraining order against him for stalking and attempted arson. We are put on high alert and the process for a restraining order is begun. A few nights later, my mom hears someone outside the house. Thinking it's him, she calls the police. They arrive within five minutes and search the street. No James, but his car is found behind the resident garages. He doesn't return to it that night. The next day, the police contact a woman's hostel in a neighboring county. They have a room spare, so we pack our bags and head there. And so the summer of my life was spent in hiding, no friends, no social media. Well, I wasn't supposed to have social media, but using proxy servers on the computer in the teen's rec room, I was the only teen in the hostel at this point was easy, and possibly very stupid. James began messaging me through Facebook, playing nice, telling me how much he loved my mom, and needed to know that she was okay. I ignored him 
even blocked his account. I had a number of fake accounts try to befriend me and they were all blocked also. After three months they find us a new house. We have a week to go back and pack up our old lives. So that's what we do and now it's eight years later and I've moved several times since, including for university. And honestly, haven't given much thought to the man who wanted to kill me so he could be with my mother. Two years ago I moved back up north not far from my birthplace. Two weeks ago I received an email on an old email account for a rental agreement. At first I thought it was spam, but upon opening it, the name of the top read to James Smith and the rental address was not too far from me, only a town away. That sick guy gave my email to the renters as his so that I would know he was nearby. I've heard nothing else but I seriously hope that we don't ever meet again. This just happened to me a few nights ago and I am still shaken up, so bear with me. I am a female bartender at a small cafe that doubles as a venue. During the day we serve coffee and lunch, and at night we have a full bar with bands, comedy shows, etc. On this night, there was an open mic comedy show. Not a lot of comedians showed up, so we ended up closing up shop early and I was ready to go home. I had a patron come in and order a single beer during the comedy show. He was acting nervous. I get customers that are shy or don't want to talk to people so I didn't think much about it. He sat down, sipped his beer, and watched the show. Since we closed early, everyone was pretty much gone and I wanted to lock up and clean so I could get home. After I escorted the last couple out of the bar and got ready to lock the door, I see the man from earlier walk down the back hallway and into the men's restroom. Not even a minute later, he burst through the door yelling, Hurry, come back here, I need help. I stood at the opposite end of the hallway and asked him what was wrong. The toilet is overflowing. There's water all over the floor. Help me. Help me clean this up. I could tell that something was wrong and I replied, It's okay man. It happens. I'll mop it up. I'm just trying to close it up right now. He continued to argue with me, trying to get me to come into the bathroom with him as I stood about 20 feet away down the hallway. Finally, he walks towards me very aggressively and tries to grab my arm. You need to come back here now, he says. I immediately put my hands out in front of me so he cannot come any closer and I tell him he has to leave. He walks outside and I lock the door behind him. I check the bathroom and it is completely spotless, no water on the floor at all. I flush the toilet and the urinal and they are both working fine. I start to get nervous and I take my large pocket knife and clip it to my waistband of my pants just in case. As I'm cleaning our espresso machine and putting toppers in the liquor bottles, I hear a tapping noise. I look up at the front of the store, which is one big window that has a few curtains covering it. The same man is tapping on the window, waving at me and laughing like a maniac. I watch him walk over to the door and pull on it. It doesn't open since I had locked it after he left. He starts screaming and pounding on the glass, saying, Open the door, I'm gonna kill you. Fight overcame flight at this point and I walked around the counter and about six feet from the door. I pulled out my knife and locked eyes with him and yelled, I'm calling the cops, get out of here. He smiled and walked out of the view of the window. At this point, all of my adrenaline had crashed. I locked myself in the office and called 911 crying, explaining that I'm alone and a man tried to lure me into the bathroom and was outside trying to get into my bar. I waited an hour and a half, no police showed up. I called my boyfriend and he drove up to the shop. My manager watched the security cameras from home, making sure that the man didn't come back. I did the deposit and immediately drove home, my boyfriend following close behind me. My male busboy has been coming into work with me so I'm not alone, and the managers have been keeping an eye on the security cameras while I'm working. This story happened more than 10 years ago when I was still a student. A bit of backstory. As with most students, I was always broke and had a few ventures apart from my part-time job to bring me extra money. One of them was house and pet sitting. I have always had a love for animals, so when this couple contacted me to ask to house sit for them for the last few days before they returned for their overseas trip, as the last sitter had bailed on them and their six-month-old golden retriever puppy would be alone, I jumped at the opportunity. The fact that they promised to pay me the full two-week fee for staying there less than a week and made it just more appealing. Little did I know how bad it would turn out. I got the details, got the keys from the agent and headed over to the house as it was already after 5pm and almost dark, as it was early spring. I got to the house, which was a really nice place, but it bordered a not so good area that was and still is prone to crime, house break-ins, robberies, etc. The first four nights went without a hitch, watching movies, jacuzzi, and just generally enjoying myself. The owners would have returned on the fifth day, fairly late at night. I went over to check on the Dog. I got a call from them at about 10 p.m. saying their flight got delayed so they're going to stay in a hotel and do the three and a half hour drive back the following morning and asked if I could sleep there again that night which was fine I was already there and had my overnight bag still in my car. I called my dad to let him know of the plans as I was still staying with my parents and he specifically asked what the address was. I normally did not give them details like that because I was old enough to look after myself. I still believe to this day that probably saved my life. I eventually got to bed about 1 a.m. and if 
felt like I had only slept 5 minutes when I was awoken to a window breaking, and I could hear movement and what sounded like footsteps running down the hallway. The first thing I did was grab my phone and just hit redial. Thanks to my old Motorola phone, redialing was as simple as pressing one button, as my dad was the last number that I had called, hoping that he wakes up from the call. I then dropped the phone in between the headboard and mattress in case my dad picks up and he can hear what is going on. I had barely done that when the first guy stormed through the bedroom door. I could see a silhouette and he had a knife in his hand. When he saw it, he raised it and came at me. Now one thing to those that are unfamiliar with South Africa and the crime. Robberies and house invasions usually are very brutal and violent. People get murdered or tortured if they are in the slightest retaliate or don't cooperate with the robbers. Out of instinct, I raised my legs back when he came at me, and when he came within reach, I kicked both legs out as hard as I can. When I kicked and made contact with the guy, he completely lifted off the ground and shot into the wall. Luckily, the knife shot out of his hand as well. Before he got the chance to get up, I was on top of him, driving my right knee into his face and in return, his head into the wall. I knew that my life depended on it, so I put in some extra force. The guy dropped like a sack of potatoes, but before I could get up, I heard the sound of a pistol cock and I froze. It felt like all the blood drained from my body and I just became numb. He stood like that with the pistol against my head for probably less than 10 seconds. I did not move and he eventually said in very broken English to get on the bed face down. I panicked but thought if he wanted to shoot me that he'd already would have done so. So I did as he said. He threw a blanket over me and I turned into a fetal position with my back against the wall. Just so if they wanted to stab me that I had my legs and arms in front to protect my body. Now by that time I had forgotten that I had called my dad and the guy that I had, Need, is still down. I heard a third guy come into the room and I could hear what sounded like Portuguese to me. I could not understand what they said but I recognized it as we used to go to Mozambique on holiday a lot and that is the main language spoken there. The one guy tried to get the guy that I put down off the ground while the other started to ransack the house, shoving valuables into a big bag. It was about at this time that I heard tires screeching and a car approaching at what sounded like Mach 2. The car skittled to a halt right in front of the gate and I heard someone scream. It was my dad. The three inside the house panicked and ran out the back door and tried to jump the fence. My dad opened fire, shooting in their general direction. I grabbed the house keys and pressed the gate remote and my dad called the police while he came in. I met him at the front door and we walked out to the car to wait there for the police. It took them over an hour to get there, some excuse of no vehicle available. By that time I had calmed down and started to look for the dog. I could not find her anywhere. I grabbed a flashlight from my dad and started scanning the surrounding yard and as I got to the corner I could see her laying on the ground. I got to her and saw she was dead. Later autopsies revealed she was poisoned and the police found pieces of meat laced with poison near the fence. Poisoning is pretty standard practice in my country for dealing with dogs at a house or area that is targeted for a break in a robbery. I was fuming and so sad. The police was also pretty useless and had a I don't give a crap attitude and barely took our statements. By that time it was starting to get light and I retrieved my bag, phone, and locked the house as good as I can without touching anything and drove home behind my dad. Only when I got home I got the story from my dad's side. He said he answered my call only to hear the shouting and what sounded like fighting going on. And when I did not respond he flew out of the house and raced over. Luckily he asked me for the address the previous night and he knows the area well to know exactly which house it is. Now my dad got there pretty quickly and he said he stayed on the line the whole time. Only hanging up when he stopped at the gate. My parents house is about 6 miles from there through a residential area. It's normally about a 20 minute drive. The call duration was 7 minutes and 13 seconds. I met the detective there later that day, gave my statement, they took fingerprints etc and the owners got back about the same thing. The rest of the day was a blur as I came down from the shock and adrenaline. Now that is not where the story ends. About 7 or 8 months later I got a call from the detective telling me they caught the guys. The one that I had need apparently was the leader of the group. He had 4 counts of murder, I think 8 to 9 for attempted murder, multiple assaults, aggravated assault, over 100 house break-ins and robbery. I was shocked. The detective told me that if I had not taken him out first and fast that night I would have definitely not gotten away so lightly. Now this is also not where the story ends. Three days later I get another call from the detective saying that I should be careful as he had escaped from custody and they have not caught him yet. I was not worried too much as the robbery wasn't at my house and I had changed cars so he would probably not find me. Also I got my firearm license and carried my pistol on me 24-7. I did not hear anything after that until about two years later when I saw the detective in the grocery shop. We started talking about the case and she told me that he was killed during a home invasion. He broke into the wrong house and the owner was waiting for him pistol in hand. Shot him once in the stomach and one in the neck. This whole ordeal has made me more vigilant, heightened my situational awareness and made me a little paranoid to double and triple check all doors, locks, etc. But I'm just glad that they were brought to justice.
Back in the winter, I had returned home to New York City and was getting used to the usual schlep on the subway to get to and from work and around the city in general. I had just left a cancer fundraiser event around 7pm and was only going a few stops over to where my house was on the end train. My little sister and I sat chatting quietly as the train began to move. A medium build man with a grey pea coat and a beanie made contact with me and hurried over. He bent down close to my face, extending his arm out for a handshake and said, Hello there, you are very beautiful, how you doing, what's your name? I sort of just recoiled back, giving him a confused, what are you doing in my personal space kind of look, shaking my head in a clear disinterest to make his acquaintance. All of a sudden, it was like a switch flip and his previously sweet tone turned to an ugly rage. You think you're better than everybody? Get out of your clown. He screamed at the top of his lungs and I noticed everyone turning and staring in our direction. Screw you anyway. He made a waving off gesture while I kind of just sat there staring at him wide eyed wondering what he was going to do next. His entire stance was very aggressive. He then stopped screaming and to my surprise made a direct pass to try the exact same thing on my sister who was right next to me. Wow, you are beautiful too, can I shake your hand? And he reached directly next to me to touch her. I extended my arm and said firmly, hey, leave my sister alone and back up out of our space. This guy smacks my hand out of the way. Now he's fully pushed my buttons. I stand up and realize I'm about eye level with him, so he must have been around 5 foot 9, maybe 5 foot 11 at most. Don't touch my sister, I said, and I was officially heated. This part is a blur as I don't remember what he said when he pushed me and we began to scuffle, but I landed a very sweet uppercut on his jaw. This enraged him and he had me on my back within seconds, kicking me and screaming I will kill you. After what felt like an eternity, two good people of the subway had run up behind me and grabbed him off of me. I heard one guy say leave her alone dude and when I looked up I saw several horrified passengers staring at us as we engaged in a full on brawl. Adrenaline was pumping through my veins so everything was bright and my vision was pinpoint and I felt numb. The conductor said something over the speakers about holding the train at the platform, and I stood there shaking as the guys threw him onto the platform and made a barrier between the platform and door as he attempted to get back into the car, clawing at the air and sputtering curses at me, staring me dead in the eye. The subway doors finally closed, locking him out. He pounded on the doors as though possessed by a demon, screaming so loud you could see every vein in his neck as he pounded on the glass. His eyes were so bloodshot they almost glowed red, and his voice was so loud it pierced through the entire car. I will kill you. Then the subway car pulled away from the station. Someone pointed to the ground. He had dropped his cell phone in the altercation. It was unlocked. I found out everything I could about this crazed stranger. His name, his social media handle, saw all of his selfies, the fact that he had been trying very hard and was unsuccessful at getting laid. His text messages revealed he was a drug dealer of some sort. I suspected crack because of the prices, increments, and wording of the text, which would also kind of explain his violent outburst. I had seen my fair share of crazy in New York City, but it hadn't gotten this up close and personal in years. I was shook and emotional following the attack. I went to the police station with my aunt and uncle soon after to file a report. I gave them his full name and they said they had a lot of people in the system with the same name. I said, well, I have all the specific info I got off the phone. They said they couldn't use anything off the phone without a warrant. They ended up taking his cell phone from me and nothing ever really came of it, except for the huge bruise I had from getting a blunt kick to the thigh. An officer came by my house a few months later with some photos of extremely similar looking men, none of which I could confidently identify as my assailant. Haven't heard a single thing since I filed the report and I couldn't find the guy on social media again. I just hope the man is found and arrested. So, a little backstory. I was a dancer for six years. I have worked in many cities and clubs. At the time of the story, I wasn't a rookie. I was well versed in the industry. At the time this took place, I was like 20 or 21. It was also in Texas at one of the upscale clubs. I never imagined something like this would happen in this place, but apparently I was wrong. I started my shift at about 6pm. I like to get there early, meet with some of my regulars before the crowds come in. It was like 8.39 and this really good looking guy came in with some friends. They were all older, like 40 to 45. I grabbed some of my hustle friends and we went and sat with them. It wasn't hard to convince these guys into a VIP room with a bottle service, but this is where it kind of gets weird. The guy I was talking to wanted a separate room for just us. I thought maybe because his friends seemed rowdy and wanting to party hard, he wanted to have a more relaxed area. I wasn't complaining because this meant I wouldn't have to share my cut of the room, so stupid me saw dollar signs and went with it. We get some mixed drinks and shots. Now a lot of the guys that come into strip clubs really want to let loose and brought drugs as well. These guys had just about everything besides crack, meth, and heroin. I was definitely a party girl at the time too, so yes, I partook in some of these. So at this time, we were all hanging out in one room together. 
I took a little hit of coke off the back of my hand and continued drinking. After we were all hyped up and ready to party, my guy pulled me into the other room. This guy was like 6 foot 4, obviously worked out a lot and was attractive. I on the other hand without my heels was 5 foot 6 and was like 120. I sat down in his lap and I started talking to him and laying down my moves to get him to empty his wallet basically. We were having a really good conversation and my bouncers were really good about checking up on the girls in the rooms because they were pretty secluded on the second floor. After about 20 minutes of talking, something snapped and all of a sudden he literally put his hands around my neck lifted me up and slammed me against the back of the couch the couch backs were tall and padded so it wouldn't have been heard on the other side plus with all the music i was literally frozen in fear after almost three years of dancing i had never been in this situation he started calling me names spit in my face and his grip on my neck would get tighter when he would feel me take a deep breath like i was going to scream luckily there were also vip rooms across the large overlook and a bouncer noticed me kicking and flailing i faintly remember like all the bouncers running into the room. They had to pry me out of his hands. When I was finally back sitting on the couch, they had him on the floor outside the room and his buddies acted like they didn't even know him. My manager grabbed me and carried me like a baby to the dressing room, asked me if I needed any medical. I said no, I was just really shaken up. His buddies talked to my manager and basically gave me guilt money for that happening. Apparently he was going through a bad divorce and just snapped on me instead of his ex. When I was 18, I was living in a small town. I was friends with rowdy skaters around and they helped connect me with this dude who sold weed. He was 29 years old, I think, at the time. He gave me pretty good deals and lived nearby. I wasn't driving at the time, so this was convenient for me. His name was Max. Max had always struck me as a weird dude. We had normal weed buying interactions that never lasted more than 10 minutes. Buy some weed, maybe smoke a bowl, that's it. He'd often tell me he could drop it off at my house, but I never let him because, as I said before, he was weird. I wasn't afraid of him, but was definitely aware that his offers to deliver to me were weird. One day in May of 2018, I was invited to a bonfire by the same rowdy skaters that introduced me to this guy. I had no idea he'd be there, nor was it important to me at all. I brought the guy I was dating at the time, I said hey to everyone including Max. We stayed for a couple hours and some of them played some music on their guitars. Nearing the time I was leaving the bonfire around 11pm, Max was getting upset about something and threw his guitar into the bonfire. I didn't know what he was angry or upset about and paid no mind to it. This happened as I was leaving with the guy I was dating. I went to bed and woke up to paragraphs on paragraphs of crazy texts from Max ranging from 1am to 5am. Like a constant stream of texts stating things such as, you know how much I loved you, you are cruel. He would go back and forth between saying, I would give you the world if you'd let me, and you really do deserve him though. He said really scary things like, you are a predator and should be snubbed out, just wait. And you are stuck, I will either love you or hate you to the fullest extent my powers behold. Right now I pray the worst death on you and that guy you're with. To top it all off he said, losing you is like losing a mother to me. He told me to tell him I never loved him and that I wouldn't hear from him again if I did. So that's what I did. I said, I never loved you. Do not message me again. I left it at that. I didn't get a response nor did I care to get one. Max had never expressed any romantic interest to me, asking me out or anything. This was all out of nowhere and he was 11 years older than me. I was barely 18. That night he cut his long hair off and posted photos naked on Facebook, curled up in fetal position talking about being a statue of shame. It's as if he had a breakdown, but I had no intention of causing that and didn't think I would even offend anyone by bringing this guy I was seeing. Everyone else seemed to like the guy that I brought. About a week later, Max texted me pretty late at night and asked if I had seen the flowers he spread along my sidewalk, saying that he stole every flower in the vicinity of my neighborhood that night. I asked how he knew where I lived and said, I hadn't seen the flowers so he must have had the wrong house. I also told him he shouldn't do that as I never felt anything for him and so on. He told me that he had heard I lived on the same block as another one of the skater guys I had and he wasn't wrong. The skater guy I lived by was on the other side of the block and I never walked that way so I never saw the flowers. I blocked his number and didn't hear from him again for weeks. Weeks later I woke up after a rough night and there were loads of flowers on the sidewalk right outside my house along with a little bouquet at the top of my walkway. I was pissed. I wasn't scared yet and stupidly I unblocked his number and texted him asking why there were flowers outside of my house. This confirmed that this indeed was where I lived. I still to this day feel so stupid for texting him and making it known that after weeks he had found my house. He responded saying, hmm, sounds nice, that was me. I blocked his number again. About a week later, I was out of town and my roommate texted me a photo of a heart with a peace sign inside of it and my name written under it drawn in chalk outside our house. When I got back into town, I went to the courthouse and began the process of getting a stalking order against him. When I left the courthouse, I went to Max's work and told him he needed to stop this behavior 
behavior and that he was stalking me. He looked me in the eyes with no facial expression and said, if you don't leave, I am calling the cops. I got angry and said loudly, call the cops. I was just talking to them about you and left his work in a rage. Soon after this, I began driving again. I once drive by him and he noticed it was me. The next day, I woke up with my car covered in flowers. I presented my case to the judge and she put the stalking order in place. He was served with it by police officers and I thought that was that and he wouldn't be bothering me again. I was wrong. After the stalking order was served, he made several other chalk messages on my sidewalk, left random gifts for me like chalk and beheaded my little pony heads on beer bottles. I always brought these things to the police station, but they said I needed to catch him doing it, take a photo or get a security camera. So I got a security camera and really hoped I would catch him. It turned out my security camera was stupid and I couldn't just watch the videos it took but had to skip through second by second by hand. It was an impossible task. I was terrified of leaving my house at night at this point. I never had my curtains open anymore and I was so frustrated that my livelihood was being taken away from me. Ultimately, I unblocked his number in hopes that he would text me directly violating the stalking order and after a few days, it worked. He sent me a weird text saying, forgive me, we are charming, this is harming, let us try again. By now it's September of 2018 and he finally goes to jail. He is facing up to a year in jail and has to stay there until our court date. I finally start calming down. I am able to go outside at night, even if just to get into my car, I let myself have my curtains open sometimes. I am starting to feel alive again. Right when I start feeling secure in my small town life again, someone posted bail and he was released after only three months in jail and I went back to living in fear. We still had court dates coming up and I was optimistic that he would serve more time for ruining my life for so long. His lawyer kept pushing the court date back to gather evidence and after about six months of pushing it back, the state decided he wouldn't do anything more and closed the case basically. I had moved out of town three plus hours away at this point so he didn't actually have an option to continue this behavior. Living in this new place I feel safe. I can walk at night and I don't have to have my curtains closed all the time. It's been over a year since they decided to close the case. About a month ago, he began responding to my friend's Instagram stories. Friends that live here in this new town, telling them how fond he is of me, etc. I have always had him blocked but my Instagram isn't private so he must have found them that way. I have since changed my account to private and he hasn't messaged any more friends of mine. I refuse to be fearful now, the way I was then. He will never find where I live or where I work now. However, my life is forever changed after this experience. I will always be more aware of people and their weird energy. He ruined my life for a year and I truly wish he had gotten that time in jail. He deserves it. So I, a 19 year old female, was at a house party a couple days ago. I only really knew a couple of people there and it was packed. I hung around with my two friends there for a while having some drinks. After a while my friends went into this room that everyone was hotboxing. I didn't go because I really didn't feel like drinking and being stoned at a party where I barely knew anyone. So I just mingled for a bit then went on my phone talking to my other friends. I noticed this guy that keeps staring at me up and down and instantly felt my stomach sink. I instantly had a bad feeling about the guy. I looked back down at my phone and sent my location to my friends, just letting them know where I was because things were changing from feeling chill to sketchy. There were a bunch of cans of soda in the kitchen, so I got up to grab a Sprite instead of having any more drinks. As I'm there, the same guy that kept looking at me comes in and started trying to get me to take this drink in a red solo cup. I was like, nah, I have a Sprite, thanks though. He kept trying though and I was getting annoyed because he kept being super pushy about it and I'm pretty blunt so I just said, look, I don't want your drink or your company and walked away. I thought that'd be the end of it and pushed it to the back of my mind as one of my friends came out from the hot box room stoned and happy. We hung out some more and my friend wanted a cigarette so I went out on the balcony with her. As we're there, she put her cigarettes on the ledge and as she's talking gibberishly, her arm pushed her cigarettes off and they fell down into the yard. I was gonna go downstairs and outside with her to get them, but she told me she had to grab something from her car anyways and that she'd be right back. I decided just to wait there for her. I'm on my phone and hear the door open and I expected it to be her. As I'm about to say, that was quick, I spin around and now I'm face to face with that guy from earlier. He just grabbed my face and kissed me and I pushed at his chest and said, dude, did you not hear what I said? He proceeded to say something in Spanish. I can't speak Spanish, but I could tell it was Spanish. I told him to screw off and went to push past him to go back and Side, and he proceeded to push me up against the wall outside and try to kiss on my neck. That's when I pushed him away as hard as I could, but he then let go of my wrist and grabbed my throat hard while maintaining eye contact and smirking at me the whole time. Just when he used his other hand and grabbed my butt, my friend came back from getting her cigarette.
cigarettes, poked her head out, saw what was happening, and she tried to intervene, but he pushed her with his other hand. I heard her say, oh nah. She grabbed the closest guy to the door from inside and brought him out. Random heroic guy from inside, then grabbed the crazy throat grabber, putting him in some type of hold, and started screaming at him. He got kicked out, pretty sure someone punched him in the face too. Everyone was super apologetic and said they didn't even know that guy and weren't sure who he even was. I wasn't about to call the cops or anything because I didn't want to get the party busted. But I went to the bathroom and immediately broke down crying. Called my friends. My friends here weren't sober enough to drive and they came to get me. I have a couple finger mark bruises on my neck still and I'd hate to think of what would have happened had my friend been distracted by something and not came outside when she did. All I know is I'm not going to a party where I barely know anyone anymore. That was scary. This happened when I was 4 or 5 years old. I was at a rather large toy store with my dad and sister, who was 2 years older than me, so that I could pick out a birthday present for a friend of mine. My dad and I were looking at the Lego aisle they had available, while my sister was shuffling around, bored out of her mind. At some point she wandered away. I was looking at the box of a castle set, wishing that it was my birthday coming up, when my sister returned and tugged on my dad's arm. What is it, sweetheart? He asked, without looking away from the box he was holding. I think he also wished it was his birthday coming up. There's a man, oh never mind, he's gone now. My dad looked at her, putting the box back on the shelf. What man, he asked. There was a man who asked if I wanted to come see his puppy, and I said that I'd have to ask you first, but I don't know where he went. My dad took the box out of his hands and put it back on the shelf, then took my hand in his and put his other hand around my sister's shoulders. Well, let's go find him, my dad exclaimed, and began leading us toward the checkouts. Now, like I said, this toy store was rather large, and we were walking pretty fast. When we got near the checkouts, my sister pointed at a man who was just about to leave the store and said, That's him. I could see how she recognized him from behind, as he had very long hair. It went halfway down his back. I remember him having a black winter coat on, which was strange because it was a pretty warm day. We walked even faster until we were at the nearest checkout, and my dad said to us, Stay here with this nice lady for a second, referring to the cashier. He then ran up behind the man who was now almost out the door, and threw his hand on his shoulder so hard I could hear it. My dad spun him around to face him, then began yelling, where's this puppy you wanted to show my daughter? People around started looking over at the commotion, and my dad continued, you wanted to take my daughter to see your puppy, where is it? I want to see the puppy too. The man was stammering and stuttering and trying to get away, but my dad had a firm grasp on the guy's shoulder. Turning his head to where we were standing, my dad yelled to my sister, is this the guy who asked you to come see his puppy? My sister silently nodded her head and then looked at her shoes. I think she thought that she was in trouble. I didn't blame her, our dad was yelling really loudly. Is the puppy in your car? Where's your car? Is that it over there? He pointed out the glass door into the parking lot. Or is that your car? Is that where the puppy you wanted to show my six-year-old daughter is? I remember thinking that if he just let go of the guy, he could lead us to the puppy. Before I knew it, three men in yellow jackets had come. There was a word on their jackets, which read security. My dad let go of the man, and the security guards held him instead. My sister was crying by this point. My dad walked back to us, once again taking my hand in one of his own, and putting the other around my sister's shoulders. He asked the cashier if she had a phone he could use, and she took us to the office. He called our mom to come pick us up, then assured my sister that she was not in trouble. In fact, she was in the least amount of trouble anyone has ever been in the history of the world, simply by coming and asking for his permission to see the puppy. I asked him if we were still going to see it, and he just looked at me and said, sorry son, the puppy ran away. Our mom came in just a few minutes, and as we were leaving, there were police cars pulling up. Are they gonna help find the puppy? My sister asked my mom, but she said no, they're here for something else. After a while, I remembered this incident and recently asked my dad about it. Apparently when the cops searched his car, they found rope, duct tape, a knife, pliers, and a hacksaw. My dad and sister testified at his trial and the guy got 20 years. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. This story dates back to about a year and a half ago when my daughter was around 4 months old. I'm 26 years old. I had just moved with my then SO to a dangerous part of town, but the street we moved to wasn't too bad. Everyone knows their neighbors and everyone seems to get along. Well, since everyone in the neighborhood chats with each other, one of my neighbors warned my SO and I about a homeless woman that parks her van on the street and harasses everyone who walks by her car, and to try and avoid her as best as possible. Side note, parking in this town is street parking only. No 
reserved parking spots. This'll have significance later. I thought, eh, that's one small downside of living here, along with the street parking. Not that big of a deal as long as I avoid her, right? Wrong. So the next day after our neighbor's warning, after returning home from a long day at work and picking up my infant daughter, homeless lady, really slender, wearing what appeared to be newish clothes, breath reeking of something foul, is walking up to the left side of the sidewalk, screaming up a storm at these teenage kids who look terrified. The teenagers aren't engaging her, just keep walking and looking at each other with uncertainty. I stay on the right side of the sidewalk, even though I knew I'd have to cross the small street to the left where my apartment was located. My daughter wakes up from her nap in my arms it begins to coo. Homeless lady spots me crossing the street with my purse, work bag, my baby, her baby bag, and decided it's a good idea to come up and chat me up about her conspiracy theories as I'm walking up to my apartment. Fine, no big deal. At least she's not bothering the kids anymore. Then as I'm fumbling to get my keys to open the gate that leads to my complex, she asks for money. I told her the truth, I'm sorry but I don't carry cash on me. All the while trying to hold onto my baby, find my keys, hold my bags, her response, stuck up lady. And then she continues muttering under her breath, which I must repeat was bad, and starts harassing more kids down the block. A couple months go by and she continuously comes up to harass me, as if she doesn't recall who I am every single day. Every day I politely apologize and say I need to get home, or I don't have any money, still, or I simply don't have time to chat right now. Every answer I gave her was met with an insult both directly and under her breath. At this point, I am still not concerned. I've always had a soft spot for the homeless, and I am aware that this lady has severe mental illness. I always apologize for not having money to give, even through the insults. One night, around midnight, my daughter wakes up crying horribly. My SO and I take her temperature, 103 fever. I tell him it's time to take her to the emergency room immediately before it gets worse. We gather everything up, and I gently take her from bed and lay her against my chest. She's so helpless, weak, burning hot, and whimpering terribly. I still want to tear up thinking about it to this day. So as we walk out of the apartment, my SO says he will run down three blocks to grab the car. Remember, it's all street parking, so we often had to park blocks away. I say okay, I'll stand in front of the apartment so he could just pick us up and we can book it to the ER. Wrong choice. I watched as he ran all the way down the street and turned the corner out of sight. Then I look back at my baby and start rocking and shushing her, so that maybe she could get a little bit of sleep slash rest before being up at the hospital all night. Moments later, when I look up, homeless lady walks around the same corner that Esso just ran around and makes a beeline straight towards me. I get a little uneasy as I have a sick baby in my hands, but maybe she'll leave me alone this time, right? Nope, that was wishful thinking to the max. I'll label homeless lady as HL and me as me. Homeless lady, and a voice loud enough to wake up the entire block. Oh hey there sis, daddy just told me that baby's done sick and she needs a healer. Me, still trying to gently rock my baby as she startled back awake and wondering why he told this lady about my baby being sick. Uh, uh, what? Sorry? Homeless lady. I'm a healer. My mom and I have been healers since birth. Give me that baby. Me. Still trying to give her the benefit of the doubt, knowing she's mentally ill. Sorry, I'm waiting on her dad to bring the car around so we can take her to the hospital. Can you keep your voice down? She's trying to sleep. Homeless lady, nah girl, I'm a healer, didn't you hear me? I done said I was a healer, you know what a healer is, don't you? Give me that baby. Now at this point, she reached out and put her incredibly dirty hands on my daughter's leg slash foot and wouldn't let go. Me, excuse me, let her go now. Homeless lady, give me that baby. Me, she's very sick, you're waking her up, stop. Her, let me heal her. Me, if you don't let go right now, I will kill you. It was at this point that she and I locked eye contact, and her facial expression was what I can only describe as the most terrifying, evil look a person can give, with her eyes and smile widening with every passing second. She then broke out in a laugh so loud and terrifying that I can't believe I didn't piss myself. By this time, my daughter was crying hysterically. My internal dialogue went something like this, Where is SO? I'm gonna have to set my sick infant daughter on the ground and beat this lady up just to get her to not kidnap my kid. It also crossed my mind that if I did that, I'd probably be the one arrested. Like a Hail Mary, my SO comes around the corner in the car and I reiterate to the lady that my SO is now here and if she doesn't stop harassing me, I will kill her. This finally struck some chord inside her brain and she took off running down the street, cursing profanities very loudly. My daughter's cry has me in tears too after being yanked so hard by this lady. I still wonder what could have happened if she yanked hard enough to take my sick daughter. My SO ended up admitting that he felt bad for her, so he told her that our baby was sick and even struck up a conversation with 
with her about it. All the while his daughter and I were waiting outside past midnight alone in a bad area for him. Needless to say he's now my ex. He even later laughed about the entire thing and told me I was exaggerating and she was harmless. He also still struck up regular conversations with the woman after that anytime he'd see her and it infuriated me. I don't think anyone who would have seen the look in this woman's face would label her as harmless. She looked very much like she was ready to harm. From 2006 to 2011, I worked in the electronics department at the local Walmart in the small city I lived in. Through those five years I had worked there, I had plenty of creepy encounters with strange customers, especially considering the state hospital was directly across the road. This story isn't just a regular old creepy encounter, but something that would lead me to being stalked for nearly a year. It all started in 2010 on a night I was working second shift. I was doing my end of shift ritual when a woman in her late 40s interrupted me. She was with a little girl no more than three or four years old. Excuse me, I need help with my cell phone. She spoke softly and proceeded to tell me her problem. I need to turn my phone into a straight talk phone. The girl earlier said you could do it. I said, sure, let me see what I can do. She handed me a six-year-old phone from Verizon and I knew as soon as I saw it, I wouldn't be able to do what she wanted. I explained that she would have to buy a new phone from straight talk and transfer her old number. Basic stuff, really. Now, I always took my job seriously and held myself to the highest standard of customer service. I did nothing to actually piss off this lady, but sure as it is, she was pissed. Why would I buy a new phone? I already have one. She starts screaming at the top of her lungs. Her claims of me upselling her and being a corporate goon. I finally managed to defuse the situation, and as she left the apartment, she gives me the classic, you'll never get a job in this town again. As I'm getting ready to leave my shift, my manager stops me and tells me I got a complaint at customer service from a lady claiming I swore at her granddaughter. Apparently, I told her to screw off. I explained what happened and he just laughed it off. My managers knew it was very unlike me to say anything like that to a customer. I wish the story ended there. For the next several weeks, I would get complaints about things I'd never done, sometimes even on my days off. I would come into questions from management nearly every day. It was complaints ranging from me being rude to a customer all the way to me doing drugs in the parking lot on break. All these complaints were coming from two women. As it turned out, it was the cell phone lady and her adult daughter. It turns out they have even been scoping out my work schedule schedule and started coming in nearly every day. They would walk through electronics to make sure they saw me and later that night I would have a complaint. This happened for months. It happened so much management deemed her, my name, favorite customer. To be honest, I didn't care much. I even thought it was pretty funny. I never got in trouble and everyone knew these ladies and just blew it off. I started caring when she took it to a new level. She started to follow me around. I would see her when I was around town. She made it clear she knew where I lived and would regularly walk by my house. I would see her standing out front just looking at my place. I began getting complaints to the city about my property, grass too tall, the old shed in my yard, my fire pit, basically everything. She even found out my girlfriend's name and began complaining at her job. I knew it was her. She would make it so clear that she was following me. Sometimes she would stop in and ask me questions at work and act like the nicest customer. A few times she asked me things like, how's your girlfriend or my favorite? How can you afford that big house on your little Walmart wage? For about seven months she stalked and slandered me. I started telling her I knew what she was doing and to stop. But she played it off. I couldn't report her. She never once threatened me. She was just making my life hard. By this time, everyone in my life knew about this woman. One night, I'm grabbing dinner with my friends from work and we're joking about it when someone says, what if you just counter stalk her? At first, I thought it was a terrible idea, but this convinced me it would work and they would all help me. So we hatched a plan. It went as follows. Find her job. Find her name and address. Make complaints in the same manner as her. Find out all the rumors she told about me. Make it clear that we know. Show her that we have numbers. I found out her information easily enough. Turns out she didn't live anywhere near me. I was even friends with a few of her co-workers. They would keep me informed on crazy stuff she said about me and even told her to stop. We began doing exactly what she was doing to me. We did this for about four months. The more we dug into her life, the more I found out about how obsessed she was over getting me in trouble. She had claimed that I assaulted her. She urged others to report me and follow me. She told police I was a potential drug dealer. Eventually, we won though. She started putting together that there were six of us digging into her life and asking questions about her. My last month at work, I didn't get a single complaint. In fact, I never even saw her anymore. The day after I quit though, I heard she was in the the store complaining about a new person after asking one of the managers why I quit. I'll honestly never understand why she was so bent on destroying me. I just told her to buy a $20 prepaid phone.
I work about a mile from my house in a pretty small town, 100,000 people-ish, spread out. I grew up in one of the largest cities in the states, so living here has been a bit of a culture shock. It's very easily accessible by walking, so I never drive. About half a year ago, I finished work around 1am. Nobody is really out past 8pm here. A huge shock coming from a big city, so the park I walked through was utterly deserted. I live in one of the safest countries in the world, not America anymore, so it's easy to forget just how vulnerable I still am. I honestly didn't feel uncomfortable at any point in my walk until I rounded the corner past some basketball courts nearby my house. I was still about two minutes away from home and this stretch of my walk was completely dark. The moon was massive that night. While I had welcomed its light at the beginning of my journey and the absence of streetlights, it actually made things look pretty eerie. I had walked this path hundreds of times but tonight something fell off. I'm not a fearful person in any sense of the word but I was really on edge suddenly. Then I saw saw it, a van in the parking lot next to the courts, with its side door open. I picked up my pace and kept an eye on it. There are usually cars in that parking lot, I live in a tourist town, and backpackers often stay in their vehicles to save money. I'd never seen one with its door hanging open like that in the middle of the night though. I was so focused on the van that I missed the man walking out from the trees near the courts. Until he was a mere 30 feet behind me, he was walking fast, and there was little doubt that he was heading straight towards me. I was at a loss for what my next action should be, screaming what do much. I was still too far away from any residences. I usually carry a glass water bottle with me for protection. We have very strict laws on weapons, but had left it at work that night. My phone was dead. Everything I knew better than to do, I'd done. I hesitated running on the off chance that he didn't mean to act sketchy. I also knew I couldn't outrun him. I saw a little dark blur darting across the library parking lot at the back of the courts. It didn't even register to me what it was. The whole situation was so surreal. The guy was behind me now and judging by his footsteps, he hadn't veered course. I quickened my pace, felt out my keys in my purse, and slipped them in between my fingers. I heard a slight jingling noise and everything suddenly made sense. The blur was Apollo, the large black cat that often walks me home on the stretch after the park. Tonight, he was doing that weird cat run, where they get really low to the ground with their ears back. I had an impression that he was angry, but he was moving too fast for me to see his face properly as he rushed past me. I kept walking, but the heavy footsteps were retreating now. I didn't dare look back and kept moving forward quickly. Apollo was suddenly by my side, still staying low to the ground and stopping every few feet to look behind him and hiss. Then he would do that weird cat run to catch up with me. He walked the whole way home with me, as he had done so many times, but I'd never seen him act like that. As we neared my gate, he visibly relaxed and flopped on his back. I coaxed him inside the gate before giving him some massive hugs and head bumps. I stopped walking home by myself at night and still saw my sweet little cat friend often. I never saw him behave that way again though. Apollo moved away three months ago. I still miss my little buddy and often think about how strange that night was. I wish I'd turn around to see him chase the guy off. I've heard so many stories about dogs protecting people, but rarely about cats. I am 20 years old. I live in the suburbs in a small residence of six houses. My gate is very often broken, including today. That means 80% of the time it is wide open, so everyone can fit into the small courtyard. My house has one floor. There are four bedrooms, including mine, and downstairs there is a guest bedroom, which is used as a treatment room because I have big health concerns. This is where all the equipment, medicines are stored, like morphine and doses that could kill an average person, and this is where the care takes place. Also, I have a dog. I am very close to him. He is a little bit all of my life. He feels everything to the point of feeling my epileptic seizures before they happen. To recognize the nurses who are arriving, he recognizes by the sound of their tires when they arrive in the yard. He never barks except when there is a problem. And finally, a nurse spends four to five times a day to give me care at home, including infusions. This is important for the story. That morning, like every morning, my liberal nurse arrived at 8 a.m. For the rest of the story, I'll call her Sandra. She takes care of me as usual. That is to say, an infusion of of a painkiller. She replaces the antibiotic diffusers, she makes me do blood tests, and remakes the cassette of my morphine pump. We usually chat about everything and nothing. She tells me stories with patients during the treatment. My nurses are an integral part of my life. They have looked after me for six years now. She leaves after 40 minutes and says, see you later. I'm sure I'll be a little late. Don't worry. That day, I have a medical appointment in the morning, and I'm alone all day because my parents are working, except the nurse's passage every four hours. Once back from my meeting, I sit on the 
sofa with my dog while waiting for my nurse. After a while, I hear the tire noises. I get up because I think it's the nurse, but my dog started to growl behind the door. I look at the time, 11.50 a.m. I tell myself that it is a bit early, but sometimes instead of going after, my nurse exchanges me with the patient from before. I hear a knock, surprised. I go to open it, usually the nurses come in like that, and I see a young woman standing, whom I have never seen. She said to me, hello, are you my name? I'm Camille, a third year nursing student. Your nurse will be a little late, so she told me to come and start preparing and she will arrive. I'm not wary at all, I'm used to students coming, but I'm just a little surprised that Sandra didn't warn me, because usually she warns me in the morning or sends me a message, and then she never leaves a student alone when it's the first time we see each other. I tell myself she must have forgotten to tell me. I bring her in and show her the way to the treatment room. I take out the things for treatment while she washes her hands. My dog is weird. He growls at her as soon as she approaches me and he turns around me. I was embarrassed so I left him in the living room and closed the door to be quiet. I don't really care what she does so I let her do it. I am on my phone at the moment. She begins to put the IV on the infusion stand and takes a syringe. Normally, we rinse my central catheter with a syringe of serum already made. You just have to open the packaging, and there I see it's not a pre-made syringe, but a syringe that she has prepared. I look up and see that the ampules for my treatments are intact and have not been opened, yet I did hear the sound of the ampules breaking. I am starting to think it's weird, and there she starts to approach me to inject the syringe when I get a message from my nurse. I'll be there in five minutes. Can you start pulling out the material? My blood has only run for one spin. I got up and said, I'm just going to the toilet, I'll be right back. I ran and locked myself in the downstairs toilet, the whole time my dog was barking and growling. When I opened the door, he followed me straight up so we were both in the toilet. So I sent a message to my nurse, Camille, your student is here, don't worry. And then she replied, who? I started crying in the toilet and was really scared. Camille came by and asked, is everything okay? I think she could see I was staying a long time. I said, yes, it's going to happen. Then I heard my front door slam. Two minutes later, I hear it re open but I hear my nurse. I came out of the toilet crying. She asked me what happened. I told her about it and showed the treatment room. So we called the police, they came and they examined, took samples, and the syringe and the rest of what Camille had prepared. The test results were received a few days after receiving the products in the syringe and the infusion. In the syringe was a paralyzer. She had put a dose that could have paralyzed a man of 120 kilograms. I'm 40 kilograms. And in the IV, it was medicine to lower the heart rate. But it was so concentrated it could have stopped anyone's heart. Today, we still don't know who Camille is. And luckily, I have never heard from her again. In retrospect, I realized that my dog had sensed that this person didn't want me well. And I tell myself that I should have watched her because she was just a student. And that my treatments are not paracetamol, and I keep wondering what could have happened if I hadn't looked at my phone. This happened about a year ago. There were so many terrible factors working against me that night. I am astounded I got away, at least physically. This all begins when I'm at my friend's apartment, who lives in a really rough part of town. In a series of poor decisions, that night I decided to get belligerently drunk and take a few pills of whatever knows what. I know, I know. Safe to say, after a solid night of partying, around 4am I was not in the right state of mind. My drugged brain decides that instead of staying the night at my friend's apartment like I normally would, I wanted to uber back to my own apartment. My friend's apartment had two separate entrances slash access to the building, one in the back unlit parking lot of the building and one facing the street. They had two sets of keys for each door and I only had keys to the one in the back of the apartment. Since my Uber would obviously arrive at the street and the door in the front of the building locks itself behind you, I exited this way when the driver was soon to arrive. I'm not paying attention to my surroundings at all in this state, despite the fact that there was literally a bullet hole in the front door I just came out of. Not good. I remember checking to see what car I was getting picked up in, and was only able to pick out the fact that it was a black sedan. Soon after stepping outside, a black sedan pulls up to the curb and starts rolling down the window. So I stepped forward. Before this man even spoke, I could feel something was wrong. He had an expression like he was tearing me apart with just his eyes. After seeing that look, it gave me a new meaning to the word predator. To describe a criminal because I then knew what it felt like to be prey. He basically barks at me, I'm your Uber driver. This was the second red flag that somehow made its way through my brain. Normally Uber drivers just roll down the window and say your name. I think I just stared at him for a second, my brain slowly piecing together the situation I was potentially in, and I ask him, what's my name? He immediately is enraged and starts screaming about how he doesn't have time for this and just get in the car, etc. I don't think I've ever sobered up so fast in my life. I'm completely panicking. Obviously, this wasn't my Uber. 
quickly checking the license plate, I immediately see it's not a match. Meanwhile, this guy is still screaming at me, and I have absolutely no idea what to do. If I bolt in either direction, this guy could easily outrun me or have a weapon. I'm also pretty sure at this point that if he's trying to nab a random girl off the street, he must have a weapon of some sort. I can't run back into the apartment door right behind me since it locks behind you, and I don't have the keys, nor the time to unlock it. Running towards the back door would do nothing as well, as he's idling right by the mouth of the driveway towards the back parking lot, and again, I would have to take the time to find the right keys and get in. If I screamed, I'm not exactly in the type of neighborhood where someone would try to be vigilant, and I can still hear the music radiating from my friend's third floor apartment. I knew they wouldn't hear me. Also, it's 4am and absolutely no one is around. It was the absolute worst feeling I've ever felt in my life. Everything in me wanted to run, but I felt that if I did, it would be the end of me. But if I kept standing there, staring in shock at this screaming man, the result would be the same. From when he started screaming at me to this point, I'm guessing only 20 seconds has passed by. Just as he's looking like he's getting ready to get out of the car, another black sedan pulls up right behind him. Checking the license plate as quickly as I can, I realize it's my actual Uber and make a full sprint to the car. Really only like 6 steps, and throw myself in, screaming at my real Uber driver, what's my name? The poor dude looks terrified, but responds with my name quickly, to which I reply, get me out of here, that man is trying to kidnap me. If I was in this Uber driver's position, I think I would be too shocked to react as quickly as he did. But my dude flew out of there, offered to call the cops for me, which I declined and now regret, and then walked me to the front door of my apartment, ensuring I got inside safely. Truly an incredible human being. You can rest easy knowing he got the fattest tip my college student bank would allow for, although he deserved much, much more. I was one of those kids you see walking around zoos or amusement parks wearing a leash. Those were already a thing 20 plus years ago but less common, and were initially only tied around the wrist. In my case it was a necessity. I would always start wandering off from the rest of the family no matter what situation. This is one of the stories that led to me earning my leash. It happened when I was about 6 years old, and I went to the zoo with my mom and sisters. Before every family outing, my mom made sure to give me the talk about not walking off again or face the consequences. My mom was a strict parent that made good on her promises, she had to, being a single mother of three. I didn't try to disobey her per se, but I often just didn't pay attention to the world and people around me. No different this day, I behaved and followed the group for a while, but then a butterfly garden caught my attention and off I was. When I finally realized I separated myself from my mom and sisters again, I panicked and started walking around the zoo looking for them, being afraid for my mom's reaction more than anything else. After a while, I somehow got it in my head that if I could just walk out, find out her car and wait there, my family would eventually find me. So I did. I got lost within a couple of minutes, walking around a strange neighborhood looking for either our car or the way back to the zoo. Nothing looked familiar. I started crying. Then this man came up to me, just normal looking, about 40 years old, asking if I'm lost. I explained I lost my family when we were visiting the zoo and I'm looking for the way back. I couldn't believe my luck when the man told me he had just come from the zoo and saw a family there standing near the entrance who were waiting for a little girl with blonde hair and a baby baseball cap. But it was still a few blocks away so he proposed I walked with him to his car and we could drive the rest of the way back. Just the mention of his car finally made me hesitant. I told him I wasn't allowed to get in a car with strangers. My mom would be mad. He then said something like, that was true but I looked smart enough to know that if I could trust someone. Don't remember the exact words but something like it. Also, he added, he spoke to my parents earlier when they were looking for me. So he's not a complete stranger. That didn't seem right. I asked him if he really talked to my dad, who had died a year before and when he said he did, I broke down crying uncontrollably. I still didn't understand the situation I was in. I was just really confused about everything and scared of how angry my mom was going to be after all this. Finally, my crying caught the attention of the security guard of a parking building we were standing next to, asking if there was something he could help with. The guy stepped aside with the security guard and started explaining the situation, but made it vaguely sound like he was my father and we were looking for his wife. The security guard seemed to believe him, pointing us in the right direction towards the zoo. The man thinks the security guard and proceeds to take my hand to walk away. The security guard takes a last look at me and asks me, in a comforting, friendly, adult-to-child kind of way, why I'm still crying. I tell him that my dad is dead. He looks really confused for a few seconds, then asks if the man is not my dad. I tell him again, no, my dad is dead. 
In a split second, his whole face and posture changes and he turns to look at the guy, who is trying to explain he never actually said he was my dad, that the security guard must have misunderstood and he was just helping me find my mom. The security guard said he appreciated the man's help, but he would take me out of his hands now and the guy immediately took off. I don't think there was much else the security guard could have done. I explained the whole situation and after making a phone call, he walked me to the entrance of the zoo, which was just around the corner from the parking building, and from there we were brought to the security's office where my mom and sisters were already waiting. I feel extremely lucky for the security guard being at the right place at the right time that day, and very grateful for the extra second of time he took that could have made all the difference. I, a 24 year old female at the time, was 21 years old. I lived in a larger small city in the Midwest. At the time, I had no car, a bicycle, and hardly enough money for the public buses. I worked at a retail battery, lighting, and repair store. I worked full time and only lived a little over a mile from my job. Because of my willingness to learn and my close proximity to work, I often worked all sorts of hours, mostly by myself. This time I wasn't the person closing and had a co-worker Joey, 22 year old male, who came in for a part time shift after he wrapped up classes at the local college. We had a close friendship and we often stood up for each other and stood in when we were flustered or needed to go to the bathroom in the back. Joey received a phone call for a possible repair on a smartphone, possibly LG low tier phone though, and he wasn't 100% sure if it was a phone that we could repair. He asked the young female caller to stop by for a consult. She had quickly agreed and said that she would stop by at around 5.30 p.m. This was a night that I was supposed to get done at 6 p.m. and catch the bus at 6.12. It was a windy, drizzly, early fall night. I remember this because I had my bike with and it became my anchor that night. A little before 6 p.m. this frantic, terrified, bawling 19 to 20 something year old woman came into our tiny shop. I was at the counter switching out aging price tags and general store maintenance. I looked up at her confused and willing to help. She looked me deep in the eyes, asking if Joey was here. At the time, he was using the tiny bathroom in the back, so I had to step in and help out any customers. I told her that he was currently busy and that I was willing to help her. She handed me her smashed cheap phone very timidly. My customer service skills couldn't prepare me for what she was going to say next. She quietly told me that her boyfriend, who was out in his red mini truck in the small front parking lot, had gotten gotten angry and smashed her phone when she tried to call her sister that afternoon. I took the backing off of the phone and tried to research the model for any possible screen repair. No results found. I tried to hand her back the destroyed phone and she pushed it back into my hands with a pleading look. Then the honking commenced. There was this light drizzle outside so our front glass door was covered in beaded drops and was slightly fogged over. I couldn't see who was honking out there. I told her again that I couldn't help and for her to try our cell phone repair competitor down the road. The tears started to really flow down her cheeks and I was freaked out at this point. She kept throwing glances behind her and the honking would not stop. I shook with fear and rage at this point. I myself was in a domestic abuse situation at the time and knew what this girl was experiencing. I broke my lock stare at her and tried to look at our system a second time for a replacement screen. Nothing again. I looked up from my computer and saw a shadowy figure of a young man pacing in front of the store. I was just happy that the honking stopped but I was increasingly shook up. My whole body vibrated with fear and I whispered across the counter if she needed me to call 911. She slammed her hands down on the counter and said that I couldn't do that, she begged me not to. At this point, Joey came out from the back and asked me what all the honking was from. We had a lot of elderly, farmers, lazy, and disabled customers that would honk their horns for us to pick up heavy battery cores from their cars. He thought that it was one of those situations, but with the looks on our faces, he knew something horrifying was happening. The young guy stopped pacing outside and began banging on our front door. Joey took the girl's phone from my hands and said for me to go in the back and lock the back employee only doors. I did what I was told and grabbed my bag, my bike, and my jacket. I looked at the clock in the back and it read 614. I spent 15 minutes with this girl, both of us feeling like trapped animals. Joey did bodybuilding during his free time and was a gentle, non confronting, short but stocky guy. I was a short, obese, kind lady that would respond either of two ways like a doormat or ready to stand my ground. I knew that I couldn't fight a customer and neither could Joey. Not not because of physical reasons, we'd lose our jobs and we had no idea what to do. The young guy threw the door open and the wind kept the door open. He had this manic, hateful look about him. A total predator he was. He was slim but muscular. Early to mid 20s and was soaked by the rain. He took the broken phone off the counter and took the girl in tow. He hurled insults at us and I gave the girl a pity look. He slammed the door back shut and both Joey and I stood in absolute silence. He snapped out of it and ran to the front door and locked it. I told Joey to call our manager from our store landline and stood around while he did. 
I noticed that the guy had moved his truck to directly in front of our door. He was watching us from his truck, watching us behind the counter as we were on the phone with our manager. I had to leave to get home, the last possible bus came at 6.42, and I couldn't pedal my way home in the weather and all the circumstances that had just occurred. The time was around 6.18 and I just needed to cross the busy highway and down the sidewalk by an eighth of a mile to the nearest bus stop. Joey, the guy, and I played the waiting game. It was 6.23 when the guy finally left our parking lot. I told Joey that I would leave at 6.25 so I could arrive at the stop safely. Joey opened the front door and I threw myself on top of my bike and pedaled harder than I could ever imagine. Now mind you, our store was in an industrial shopping area at the very edge of town. We worked next to a sub shop and worked across from a strip mall with a bullseye store and a local chain grocery store with other retail stores and a bank all in that in that large lot. It's started to downpour and as I tried to pull out of our parking lot straddling my bicycle, I caught a glimpse of the red truck looping around the sub shop. The highway had dual lanes each way and I had to play real life frogger. If I wanted to make it my destination in one piece, there was a few cars that slowed for me as I hauled myself to the other side of the road. I jumped off on my bike and threw it on top of the curb. I promptly hopped back on and tried to pedal off. My front wheel was stuck in the grassy strip and my right foot had slipped off of the pedal. My shin struck the pedal and I had to act quickly. I grabbed the frame of my bike and jogged awkwardly to the bus stop. The red truck pulled into the bank parking lot of which I had just passed. The truck pulled around and went out through the entrance across from the sub shop and took the closest lane to me. He went at a crawl and turned at the red light so he could circle the main parking lot of the shopping center. There was three ways to get into that parking lot, one to the left, one in the center, slightly off to the right across of the sub shop, and the other far to the right next to the grocery store. I stuck to the sidewalk since it felt safer and was in front of people. The truck patrolled the parking lot, the hunter stalking its prey. I felt cold, sore, and cornered just like an injured animal. There was a couple of cars that pulled into the left entrance of the parking lot, causing the truck to stop from re-entering the lot again. I almost collapsed in the bad small bus stop, and I felt my phone buzz. I saw that it read Joey, so I rested my bike on my person to answer the call. Joey told me that he was watching, and even though he had an elderly couple in the store that he was helping that he wouldn't allow the guy to hurt me. I started to cry all this had just gotten to me. The red truck looped around once again and again. I saw the bus pull up early at 6.39 and I couldn't be happier. I knew the driver since I used the buses to get around town, errand shopping, and to get to and from work. I had my stupid bike to worry about. I hung up the phone with Joey, putting my phone in my jacket pocket, and strapped down my bike in the rack that was in front of the bus. I struggled since I shook and my bike was slick from the rain. I got on the bus and turned to the open bus doors and saw that the truck took a left at the center entrance of the lot. I could finally let my guard down. I sat at the front of the bus and my hand shook at trying to get the $1.25 for the fare. The driver said that it was okay and that I could take my time with the change. I kept my backpack on and pulled my damp phone from my pocket, dialing Joey's number letting him know that I was fine. In under 15 minutes I made it to my apartment safe but deeply disturbed. I took my bike in so it wouldn't draw any attention to where I lived. All this gave me an idea to leave my own domestic abuse situation. To this day I wonder about that girl and hope that somebody more daring and stronger than me called the cops on her abuser. That she had the strength to leave that violent man for her to write her own story and to recover from all of it. I'm currently doing significantly better in life and finally have my own car. And I live a couple states away safely from my past life. Even though I'm states away and it's been three years now. For a little background, I'm a 27 year old female and I recently just moved into a nice apartment in a safe neighborhood with my two dogs Charles and Wigwam. Charles is a corgi slash German shepherd mix and is the most loving but overly obnoxious dog while Wigwam is a Lhasa Apso who is quiet, sweet, and most definitely scared of his own shadow. I've only been in my new place for about a month and after this experience, I highly doubt I'm gonna make it here for the duration of my year long lease. The way these apartments are set up is that each floor has its own set of doors that lead to four apartments and a fire escape door that only opens from the inside. I'm on the back side of the building which places my patio about 10-ish feet from the fire escape stairs. I take my dogs out three times a day, midnight being the latest I will go out by myself and every time I leave my apartment I put the bar lock on my patio door and lock my front door without fail. About a week ago we had a snowstorm and I had cracked my patio door because well I love cold weather and I'm a adult and if I want to watch the 
snowfall, then I can do that. It was around 11 p.m. and I decided that since it was getting late, I should take the dogs out for the night and since they both hate snow, this would be a quick trip. I go to lock the patio door and decide against it because I'm on the fifth floor and I'm only going to be outside for a few minutes. I get the dogs ready, grab my keys, and lock my door as I leave the apartment. I get down to the designated pet area with my beloved snow-hating dogs and let them do their thing and then back to the apartment we go and we get back in safely or so I thought. This is where I thought I was losing my mind, but in actuality, stuff was about to get real. As soon as we walk into the apartment, my dogs run over to the patio door and I notice the door is shut and the bar is locked. Mistake number two, I immediately think that's strange, but didn't connect the dots. I go into the kitchen to get dog treats and both dogs start going crazy and growling at a large cedar chest in my living room and as I'm walking to see what all the commotion is about, I see a pair of eyes creeping from under the chest lid. I stood there for about five seconds before I realized what I was seeing and calmly walked backwards to my front door, opened it and told my dogs let's go outside and they ran out without leashes and I immediately get them and myself in my car, lock the doors and call the police. The police show up in less than 5 minutes and they go up to my apartment and after about 20 minutes, two officers are dragging a 40-ish year old guy out of my building in cuffs and the plot thickens. This dude had been watching me since I moved in and had been stalking out my place, waiting for an opportunity to get inside because he knew I lived alone. If that's not creepy enough already, he had a fanny pack since it's still 1990 and he had a pocket knife, needles, ketamine, and a picture of me from the day I moved in and his plan was to sneak in through my patio door, wait for me to fall asleep and whatever knows what else. Needless to say, I didn't sleep for days because I thought he would come back. Luckily, the guy is still in jail, but I'll never forget those eyes. When I was 11, almost 12, the woman living above me was a coke dealer. The night of my 12th birthday, she went missing. Not long after, her boyfriend came down to ask if he could use our phone. This was 2004, so having a cell phone was more of an exception than a rule, at least in my area. For a little context, I was home alone at the time while my mom was at work about a 5 minute walk away. My mom had let our neighbor and her boyfriend come in to use our phone several other times before, so I assumed nothing was wrong with it and let him in, bringing him into to the living room which is towards the front of our apartment to use the phone in there. He picks up the receiver, dials a number, waits a few seconds, then hangs up on the phone. He does this a couple more times before the front door of the building opens. You can easily hear the front door open from where we were. It's a heavy door, the walls are thin, and the way our building is set up, it's a small, old single family house converted into apartments. Me and my mom's apartment were the only ones on the first floor and our upstairs neighbor's apartment was the only one above us. Irrelevant, but there was also a much smaller apartment below us. My neighbor's boyfriend looked at me, put his pointer finger to his lips like he was just trying to shush me, and told me not to tell anyone he was there before speed walking to my room at the other end of the apartment. I watched my bedroom door close right before there was a loud, hard, cop-like knock on the door. My jaw dropped as I opened the door to see a cop. He asked if my neighbor's boyfriend was there and, being scared, I stammered out, yeah, he just went into my room. The officer asked if he could come in, which I agreed to, and as he was coming in, he asked if I could let his partner in the back door and lead them into my room. We walked together to the back of the apartment and I let his partner in. The back door to the apartment was right next to my bedroom door, but we had to walk around the kitchen table to get there. There was just barely enough space between the two doors to fit a narrow, rectangular table against it without blocking the path to either door. After I let them into my room, I watched as they pulled my neighbor's boyfriend out of my bedroom closet. As they brought him out of my room and towards the back door, which just led to an enclosed fire escape, they told me to go wait in the living room while they brought him out the back door. I walked back to the living room and, after they closed the door, I couldn't hear what they were saying, but I could hear the distinct sound of metal clicking and quickly realized that he had just been handcuffed. Still scared, I waited for the police car to drive away before grabbing my keys, making sure the back door was locked, and locking the front door on my way out before running to my mom's work crying. Pretty sure I cut the 5 minute trip into about 2 minutes. And I've never been a fast runner. I was fueled entirely on adrenaline and fear at that point and I just wanted my mom. When I told her what had happened, my mom was pissed that he had used me the way he had, hiding out in a child's bedroom closet, of all places, to try to keep the cops from finding him. She gave me a short but gentle lecture that night about not letting people in to use the phone, telling me that I was not to let people use up her phone, even if I knew them unless she was home. I don't want to know what exactly he was wanted for nor do I want to know what could have happened if the cops had not shown up. I don't know if he had known that the cops were on their way and had to come to my apartment specifically to hide from them, or if he was up to something else and knew that the cops were at the front door of the building. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you.
This happened back while I was in college a couple years ago. Me and my roommate moved into a beautiful apartment our junior year of college. Our parents made it extremely clear that us living alone together was not ideal for some of the cheaper, shady neighborhoods close to our college. We attended a college in our state capital, so we were in a city environment, and had certain criteria we had to meet in order for us to live there, and for them to co-sign our leases. Lit sidewalks, keyed entry into the apartment building, lit parking lot, X amount of blocks from from campus, etc, etc. So we finally found one that fit our parents' criteria. Our apartment building had a keyed entry for both the front of the building and the back gate that led to the fire escape. Our apartment was an end unit that led to the fire escape, so there was two deadbolt locks on it. We loved our apartment, we felt safe, we had fun, truly living the college experience. And then my roommate's boyfriend starts slowly moving his things into the apartment and staying there way more often than he should. I finally tell my roommate if he wants to stay here and use the water, electric, and food I help pay for, then he needs to pay for it too, including our rent. I tell her a three-way split or I'm paying only my rent and he can pay the entire electric water and trash bill. I think I'm being pretty fair and even though her boyfriend doesn't have a job, that's not my problem. I work and go to college, your I don't want to work at McDonald's, yes he actually said that, excuse is completely garbage. If you want a place to stay then to the golden arches you shall go. So instead, my roommate starts sneaking him in really late at night after I go to sleep and he leaves on days I'm home. While I'm in class he's there, then leaves before I come back. My schedule is extremely routine. Well, he can't have a key, so if my roommate is in class or at work, how is he getting in? He can't take my roommate's key because if he decides to leave halfway through the day, how will she get her key back? All good questions. The solution they came up with was to leave the back door unlocked that leads to the fire escape, and then he can just jump the fence at the bottom of the fire escape to get back on the fire escape when he's ready to come back, or stick a rock in between the door, whatever works for him. So I'm off of work in school one Thursday morning and I decide I'm going to sleep in as long as I possibly can. My roommate and her boyfriend had already left for the day, so naturally they leave the door unlocked. I'm asleep and it's about 10 in the morning when I hear the back door open to the apartment. I come to just enough to recognize the noise, realize it's my neighbor or her boyfriend, and I brush it off and go try to drift back off. All of a sudden I start hearing someone creep through the apartment, wooden floors. It definitely doesn't sound like casual walking. It is clearly someone stepping slowly and quietly through the apartment. My door to my room is ajar just a sliver, but I don't see anything out the door and I'm honestly too tired to get up and look. A couple minutes pass and I figure that my room and or her boyfriend are just being weirdos and I fall back asleep. I can't be sure how much time passes before I open my eyes, but it can't be too long. I wake up to my door opening. My back is to the door and I am facing the opposing wall. I slowly start to turn over to see why my roommate or her boyfriend would dare wake me from my slumber, and there he is, a burglar. In my room, next to the bed I'm currently laying in, a 6 foot tall burglar, unplugging my TV about 5 feet from where I currently am. I immediately pretend I'm just shifting position in my sleep and continue to roll over with my eyes as shut as I can make them seem, still open enough to watch what was going on. He hears me shuffling as I turn over, stops, looks dead at me, and luckily doesn't realize that my eyes are open just a tiny bit. He goes back to unplugging my TV, my DVD player, shoves it in his bag he's brought, like those bags from Ikea, and steals my change jar and casually starts walking out of the front door to my apartment, like he came in for a cup of tea or something. After I hear the door shut, I immediately spring out of bed, grab my phone, Phone, start dialing 911, all while locking the back and front doors. The dispatcher is trying to calm me down. At this point, I am hysterical. I can't even catch my breath to tell her okay. Luckily, I told her my address before I started hyperventilating. I will take a second to commend the police department, both city and college, because they were there in less than three minutes. She tells me the cops are there, but they need me to go downstairs to let them in the building because they don't have the key to the front door of the building. I am so afraid to open the door to my apartment and even look down the hallway. I'm about to walk to the front door and extend my arm out to the handle when I hear, Ma'am, it's the police. As if I didn't get scared enough already, they yell through the door. I am paranoid because the dispatcher just told me they couldn't get in and didn't realize someone probably let them in downstairs. I ask the dispatcher to confirm that the people at my door are actually police officers. She tells me that they are at my door. Okay, cool. I open the front door and I collapse right there. My legs completely turn into jello and I just hit the floor. I blacked out for a brief period of time, but they helped me up and sit me down on the couch. There's at least 10 officers in my apartment from both the city and college departments. When I look outside the living room window to the street below, there are 5 or 6 cop cars blocking the street. I later found out that they were doing a perimeter search around the immediate area. I'm being bombarded questions now. 
I have to try to find out what's missing besides the stuff from my room. I'm crying, I'm shaking, this is not at all how I saw my day off going. I tell them my roommate left the back door open for her boyfriend, they inspect the back door and blah blah. The next thing I know my roommate and her boyfriend walk in and they both have the most dumbfounded looks on both of their faces. At this point now there is a detective talking to me and I'm giving my statement. Giving a description of the burglar, the stuff missing, looking at mugshots, etc. I immediately stop talking to the detective, look up at the both of them and blurt out, someone robbed us while I was asleep, he came into my room. Two officers take her and her boyfriend aside and talk to them while I'm finishing up with the detective. I call my then boyfriend and he comes over to help me pack my stuff to stay over his house for a couple of days, which turned into staying until my lease at my place ended around four months. After failing to recognize any suspects in a lineup, the cops slowly start leaving. After they all leave, I call my parents to tell them what had happened, gather my things, and head over to my boyfriend's house. My roommate and her boyfriend never once apologized, not for leaving the door unlocked, but just a general, I'm sorry this happened to you type of apology. They never asked me if I was okay, if I wanted to talk, nothing. The day my lease ended was the best day of that entire year. I couldn't wait to get away from my roommate, her boyfriend, and that apartment. They never found the guy who robbed me that day. They never found the guy who robbed me that day. I didn't even care about the materialistic things. He robbed me of my safety and security and it took a good amount of counseling to get that back. I am also thankful he didn't try to attack me that morning. My friendship with my roommate was tarnished. I haven't spoken to her since. To this day, I don't sleep with my back to the door and I always have a knife under my mattress. This happened to me two to three years ago. I was around 23 at the time. I am a female and I live in Romania. One night I was coming home from class, masters, classes start after 6 p.m. and end at 10 p.m. at around 11 p.m. I had to take the subway for about 12 stops. The destination I have to get off at was the end of the line for the subway. At the time, there wouldn't be many people in the subway. All I need is my headset and my music and I am good to go. Said and done, I plug in my music, I pick the furthest chair in the subway, I wish from the only two people that were taking the subway with me at the time. So far so good, until I see, with the corner of my eye, a silhouette approaching me and sitting right next to me. It was a man, fairly built, dark hair, wearing glasses, a black shirt with a black hoodie, and a sickening smile. He doesn't engage in talking with me, but would just stare at my phone as I would browse through my music. I can hear him breathe heavily, not like painfully, but still like he was feeling something very strong. I feel uneasy, so I decide to change my seat and go even further behind, trying to avoid him. I pick a new chair, sit down, plug my headset again, and proceed with the remaining 6 to 12 stops on my way home. I see the silhouette growing bigger and bigger and a breeze running on my skin as I realize the guy is again sitting right next to me. Glancing in midair, dead eyes, a big smile staring right into my phone. I panic, there are still 4 stops to go. I have nowhere to hide. I look after the other person in the subway trying to sit next to her, thinking that strength comes on numbers. She is no longer there. I start shaking a bit, but not allowing the creeper to notice me being vulnerable. I stand up, go to the door, and just decide to stand until my stop comes. This way he won't sit next to me, right? Wrong. He comes straight after me and sits on the chair right near the door because he couldn't see my phone, on which he was so focused so far from that angle. He fixates me right in my soul with his eyes and says, Hi gorgeous, why are you avoiding me? I am freaking out as I look at my phone trying to call my boyfriend or message him and he stops me by saying, I know no one will help you. You would have sent an SOS message by now. I know you didn't. That moment I realize I am cornered. He has been focusing on my phone to see who I was talking to, trying to figure out if I panicked, trying to see if I would ask someone for help. He cornered me bad. I had the luck to reach my stop as I would delay any reaction or ignore him so that he would repeat whatever he wanted to say. I drop off and run for the exit, not looking back. I get out at the surface and I don't see him anymore. At this moment, I put my phone in my purse and realize I had pepper spray with me all along. My heartbeat comes back to normal as I know at least I have something to defend myself with, but still a long way to get home, and who knows if he is alone or not. I walk rather fast for maybe 5 minutes from the metro and feel a hand grabbing my wrist hard and pulling me back, another hand covering my mouth disabling me from screaming my lungs out. It was him, the same black hoodie, dark hair, and dead eye stalker. He was furious and said, how dare you run away from me, you should be honored I give you attention. Now, my phone is in my bag, I can't call the police, and I can't reach for the pepper spray. I panic, I can't punch him in the crotch, his hand is still on my mouth. What do I do? I did the most desperate and disgusting thing I could think of just to save my life. I played along. 
I used my other hand to touch the inside of his thigh and mumble a I'm sorry while his hand was on my mouth. He took his hand off my mouth and repeated that I'm sorry, I didn't realize he was just flirting. He let his guard down and took his hand off my wrist. He asked me for my phone number and address to drop me off, but I refused saying I'd rather add him on Facebook and he agreed. I told him I'd reach for my phone but instead picked the pepper spray and got him sprayed all over his face. Made sure I'd cover both his eyes, nose, mouth, even his ears and hands. He instantly got all red, suffocating from the pepper and swelling. I called the police, told them what had happened and what I did. They asked me if he is immobilized and I said yes as the effect wears off in 45 minutes. The police arrived there 5 minutes later to see me shaking like a leaf and a man on the ground, swollen like a pumpkin, throwing up and swearing me between gasps of breath. He was arrested and the police told me they had been looking for him for the past week as they discovered the body of a 24 year old woman in his apartment. A lady with red hair. I have red hair too. The woman was his girlfriend and ever since he's never gotten back to the apartment. I do not know what he wanted to do with me. I can understand why he targeted me due to the similarities but I just hope I don't ever have to meet him again. I used to live in a townhouse, duplex, by myself with my dog and two cats near a train station. There were often commuters who parked outside my place and passed by through the day and night. Occasionally, I had cigarettes or stuff stolen from my front veranda, but none of this scared me like the night I was watched. My dog lives indoors and I would take him out for a last pee before bed. My backyard light was broken and was up too high to change the bulb so I always took him out the front. That night, it was around 11pm and I took him out the front. It was a hot summer night and I was mindlessly standing on the footpath when I saw movement across the road from me. Out of nowhere, a man had appeared and was walking diagonally across the street away from me. I thought it was odd because I hadn't seen him come from the other direction. I continued to think about it. Where he came from was from outside of a house that was being renovated. I knew the owners weren't living there and thought maybe he was trying to steal some stuff. So I kept looking down the road to where he had gone. He had turned the corner down the next street. I kept watching and then I suddenly see his head pop around the corner to see if I'm still outside. This gave me the absolute creep so I grab my dog and go inside. I turn off all my lights and go upstairs to my bedroom which is at the front of the townhouse and faces the street. I thought I would keep watch at my neighbor's house and call the police if he came back. I peer through my blinds which cover sliding doors coming off a small balcony. And like clockwork, I see a dark figure walk down from the corner and down my street. He's moving towards the house across the road and then I suddenly lose sight of him. A tree in front of my townhouse obscures my view for a moment. And then he is there. He's not just there, he has stopped at the top of my driveway. Just standing there. I kid you not, his arms were out by his sides and legs apart in an unnatural stance. Like he was preparing for something. Like he wanted to come kill me. My heart is racing so hard I can barely hear. And I'm standing there slack jawed looking at this would be assailant when one of my cats comes to see what's happening. My cat slides his body between the blinds and window further opening it and I see this person. This man looking up towards me. I'm thinking surely he sees me. If he does, this doesn't stop him. He starts walking down my driveway undeterred and fixated. I lose sight of him under the balcony and awning. By this time, my eyes are watering in fear and tears are streaming down my face. I don't know what to do. I go sit in my bed. I pick up my mobile and dial my dad who lives in a suburb away. He answers. I whispered to him what was happening and he said he will be there as soon as he can. I lie down on my bed and lie as still as I can, tears rolling down my cheeks, pure fear, not knowing what this man was doing downstairs and if he could get in, what if I hadn't locked the doors? And then it dawned on me, why am I lying here in the dark crying, turn a light on, so I did. What seemed like a lifetime but was probably just a couple minutes later my dad arrived. He had an umbrella with him. I live in Australia so no guns but he could have at least brought a knife. I stayed on the phone with my dad while he searched outside for the man. The man was gone. Maybe me turning on the light scared him off. I called the police who said I should have called sooner. Of course I should have, I don't know why I didn't. They came out with a sniffer dog and didn't find him either. I don't know what he wanted but for a good year after that I was scared living there. Luckily that feeling faded away after a while. This happened to me a few years back when I was in my early 20s. At the time, I worked in a department store and a makeup counter. The job relies heavily on good customer service and building relationships because you want people to keep coming back to spend money on your products. We are given personalized business cards so that we can build up our own client base. Very important for a commission department. It's not uncommon to be familiar with the people who frequently shop in the store. As workers, our training is focused on being friendly and accommodating. 
One day while I was working, I had to move to a makeup counter that wasn't my own to cover someone's lunch break. It was a really slow day so I was just leaning on the counter, people watching. I could tell most shoppers were just browsing so I kept to myself. One of the people that I noticed was a very tall and broad man. He walked very slowly, almost hunched over. His face was fixed very aggressively, like he was angry but focused. He circled around the counter a few times but I could feel his gaze on me instead of the products. After a few rotations around the department, I decided to to greet him in case he needed help. It wasn't until he came directly over me that I realized just how big he actually was. I'm a 4 foot 10 female, so I feel pretty small regardless. But even with his slouched posture, he was over 6 feet tall and well over twice my weight. I'll never forget his teeth, they were completely black in the front. Your eyes couldn't help but go right to them. Despite his menacing appearance, he was soft spoken. Truthfully, I could tell he wasn't all there by the way he talked. He told me no when I asked if he needed help, but requested my number, so direct. We had never spoken before. I declined and said that I was in a relationship and that it would be inappropriate. He then asked if he could have a business car for the counter in case he wanted to get products. Since I wasn't on my normal counter and I really wanted him to go away, I handed him my coworker's business card and told him to call if he had any questions. It worked and he walked away after that, filling me with relief. Only a couple minutes later the phone on the counter rings. I answer with my peppy customer service voice and say, Thank you for calling makeup brand name, how can I help you? And immediately I know it is the same guy when he starts talking. He asks me again for my personal number and I explain once again that I cannot do that. But he just wants to talk, he explains. Since he wasn't getting the hint, I say, I should have told you that I'm married, you can't have my number. Politely he apologizes and hangs up. I thought that would be the end of him, but for the next few weeks or so I spent much of my time at work anxious at he would show up. I would see him every week and he would lurk around the counter looking for me. Anytime I would see him, I'd immediately drop what I was going to to run and hide or run to the closest customer and offer any bit of assistance to make it look like I was busy so he wouldn't talk to me. I successfully dodged him every time and it came to the point where I stopped seeing him. I was thrilled. I had almost completely forgotten about him until one day I decided to go to Walmart by myself to pick up a few things on my day off. I generally like to shop alone. I can take all the time I need and I like leisurely looking around. I grabbed a basket and made my way over to the cosmetic slash hair wellness section since that's where most of the things I needed were. I only managed to grab a few things before I locked eyes with them as I walked by the supplement aisle. I had recently changed my hair color and wasn't wearing my work uniform so I didn't think he'd realize who I was. I was ready to just go about my shopping and ignore him until I noticed that he dropped the items he had in his hand and started heading my way. I panicked and swiftened my pace immediately. I thought to myself, he's not going to really follow you through the store, right? But as I turned around to look, I could see his humongous body just plowing through people, with that same terrifying look on his face, only meaner, his black teeth growing closer with a snarl. Since the direction I was walking was the opposite of the exit and there was no way I was going to turn around, I decided that my best course of action would be to follow the perimeter of the the store and cut down the center section, which would bring me close to the registers. I speed walked the entire time in the hopes of losing him amongst all the people, but never once turning around again. By the time I made it to the register area, I could actually feel him behind me. Still not wanting to turn around to look, I glanced in the reflection of the soda machines that are in between the register aisles to see how close he was. To my horror, there was only about two feet between us. I was afraid to just drop my stuff and run out the door in case he followed me to my car. I had parked in the far back at the parking lot and didn't want to risk it. I also didn't want to get in line at the registers since the lines were long and I would just be standing out in the open alone. Instead, I walked into the cluster of people crowded around the self-checkout line. I noticed another large but older gentleman with his carriage in the middle and ran straight for him. The people were so closely clustered together that the man following me couldn't make it through. I ran over to the man in line and grabbed onto his carriage. I said, I'm so sorry, I'm not cutting you, but there's a man that's been following me through half the store and I need to stand with you. He was so sweet and let me be with him while we waited in line and even let me go ahead of him so I could leave quicker. As I was cashing out, I could see in my peripheral vision my stalker staring at me and pacing about, but he couldn't come near me since the self-checkout is somewhat sectioned off. By the time I had finished and grabbed my receipt, I couldn't see him anymore. I looked around but he was nowhere. I thought about asking the older man to walk me to my car, but he still wasn't finished at his register, so I decided to call my boyfriend and make a run for it. Staying on the phone, I explained to him what was going on as I sprinted to my car, frantically looking around in case he tried to follow me outside. I made it to my car safely and rushed right home, breaking down to my parents about what just happened. 
I could feel it in my bones that the man wanted to do something to me, and thankfully I didn't find out what that was. His aggressive aura was bad. To this day, I could still remember the adrenaline that I felt when he followed me. I had never felt so vulnerable. I quit that job roughly two years later. This incident happened in the summer of 2015. I lived by myself in a nice house inside a small town. Low crime, but still the occasional shady person. Anyway, at work that day on a smoke break, I watched a dog get thrown from a moving vehicle, four lane city traffic during the start of rush hour. I ran right out there, scooped his little self up, and booked it back to my workplace. He was not injured amazingly. As a bleeding heart animal lover, I decided to take him home with me until I could figure out what to do with him. I have a large amount of cats, and always have. This was my first experience with a dog that I was solely responsible for. This guy was very shy, head hung, tail tucked, jumpy, just looking at me like I was about to beat him. I was clueless on the subject of dog personalities and tendencies. I just knew that they needed to be taken out frequently. His first night with me, we had been out about 15 times, as I did not want him using the bathroom in my house, obviously. I was having my final cigarette of the day on my porch. The dog was on a lead, chilling under my chair as I smoked and chilled. I see a man walking on the sidewalk that runs by by my house. He kept glancing up at me before passing. Shortly after he passed my house, he stopped, turned on his heel and approached. Hey, can you tell me where 302 Church Street is? He asked. I told him I would search the address on my phone, which, of course, was taking a minute to pull up. He explained he didn't have a phone of his own and was attempting to get to a friend's house, taking small steps toward me the whole time. Finally, the address I summoned came up. It's exactly two blocks north of here, right on the southwest corner of the cross street, I told him, pointing in the direction. He kept his eyes locked on me, continuing to slowly move closer. The dog starts growling very softly at this point. I forgot he was even there until now. Mind if I take a look at the map? He grinned sheepishly. I'm bad with directions. I rose from my seat, pointing again. It's truly just two blocks up the road. Just follow the road. Two blocks. The house will be on your left, making it very clear that I wasn't going to just hand him my phone. Well, can I call them? I need to let them know I'm coming, he said, still creeping closer, extending his hand. No, I curtly replied. How about text them, pushing forward still? Dude, no. I started toward my door. Just let me see your phone. He was visibly becoming pissed off, clearly trying to contain it and getting way too close to my porch. As a last ditch effort of getting this dude to screw off, I say, you need to get out of my yard. My dog's protective. He will screw you up. I didn't know the first thing about this dog, let him know whether he had the capacity to screw someone up. I just hoped Sane would intimidate pushy phone guy. Like I had said the magic words, Pupper springs into action. The dog emerges like a bullet from under the chair, growling, snarling, and barking his head off. He jerks me near off the porch trying to get at this guy. He sounded and acted like an 80 pound attack dog, not a 40 pound timid beagle mix. I was afraid. I didn't know if the pup would turn on me. As stated previously, at the time I knew absolutely jack nothing about dogs. He backed his hindquarters into my legs, almost nudging me to the door, still carrying on, eyes locked on phone dude and baring his teeth. Phone dude holds up his hands and backs off, stammers something like, uh, two blocks north, yeah, and begins walking that way. I go inside, cut off my light and peek out the window at him. He glances at my house, a shirt up inside, turns and begins walking the completely opposite direction I pointed him in. Icing on the cake, he pulls a phone from his pocket and raises it to his ear to make a call. The dog secured his place as a member of the family that night. He is incredibly protective of me and has frightened away another creeper since this incident. He is attached at my hip and has made it know that he is grateful to be in a safe, loving home, wherein he will never again become a projectile from a moving vehicle. His name is Hank, and I truly believe that that night would have ended very poorly for me had he not been there. So about three years ago, I was going to school in a US city and was living with two other roommates. My one roommate was known to usually bring CD characters back to the apartment. At one point during our fall semester, she befriended a guy in her advertising class who went by the name of Dallas. He became her weed dealer and she would frequently bring him over to the apartment. I suspected they were sleeping together, but she denied it. It was a strange relationship, but who am I to judge? My other roommate and I thought he was charismatic enough, but also didn't see the appeal that Christy, my roommate who befriended him saw. I remember one night we had Dallas over for dinner. He told us how he played for our college's football team, that he just started his own business at the age of 25, and how he was a very well-known weed dealer who made a lot of money, and his name was Dallas because he used to live in Dallas, Texas, and his parents named him after that. Me and my other roommate nodded our heads and listened, but we didn't think much of it except for this dude thought he was hot stuff and wanted to glow about himself. I believe he came over for dinner or something maybe one or two other times. My roommate claimed that one 
one time she decided to buy weed from him and went to his apartment off campus. When she arrived, she saw our roommate, Christy, just passed out on a chair in the middle of the day in Dallas's apartment in some random room. When my roommate arrived, he mentioned nothing of her being there. My roommate shook her awake and Christy just woke up in a haze and basically told my roommate to screw off. My roommate recounted the story to me and we both agreed it was weird and Dallas was probably not the safest person to hang with. After a couple of months, Christy stopped hanging with him. I remember her saying he got pissed she didn't want to sleep with him. I also found out that a friend of hers, who knew him for a long time, was engaged to him. Oh also, his real name wasn't Dallas. Yeah, real shocker there. Fast forward two years, me nor my roommate talk to Christy anymore. We are living elsewhere in said city doing our own thing. We get an alert on our phones that a girl who had just transferred to our college went missing after leaving from one of the campus bars the previous night. It doesn't take long, maybe a few days when this huge story breaks. This girl was killed by someone she left the bar with that night. My roommate calls me and goes, do you remember what Dallas's real name was? I go, yeah, I believe it was said name. She goes, go online and read this article. He killed that girl who just went missing. Sure enough, I go online and there is the most horrifying mugshot of Dallas with a photo of the girl he had just slain. It gets crazier. Apparently he had taken her home that night and attempted a one night stand and he killed her by blunt force and strangulation. If that isn't terrible enough, he cleaned up the evidence-ish in his apartment, threw her body in a storage container, took a lift to his grandma's house hours away, and buried the storage container with her remains in it on the property somewhere. After obtaining a video of the two of them leaving together from the bar, it didn't take cops long to bust him. Weeks after after the story broke, so many girls came forward and shared similar creepy stories about Dallas. The guy who played for said college's football and ran a successful business. You can guess that none of this was ever true. Also, he was like 28 years old, claiming he was still a student at Ever College when this happened, prying on younger women. I just hope he rots in prison for the rest of his life. For a bit of backstory, my mom was dating an abusive guy at the time. We'll call him Ian. Because of Ian and the crazy fights they had gotten into, we couldn't lock up my house at all. He had kicked in both the front and the back door to the house and they never fixed. My mother and Ian were at the bar all day, every day. I told you this so you would know why the house wasn't locked up and where my parents were when this happened. This incident occurred when I was around 12 years old and my little brother around 10. I was a really small girl at this age and my brother was sick all the time so he was very tiny and frail. My mother and Ian were at the bar as usual. When you opened my front door, it put you in the living room and you could see the back door. There was a hallway to the right that led back into the bedrooms, and that is where my brother and I were. We were in his bedroom with the door closed playing something on a PlayStation. It was around midnight or 1am and we were playing and having a good time when I heard a weird noise. My brother didn't hear it and I didn't want to creep him out. I told him that I wanted to go get a drink and told him to stay in the room and I would bring him something. To get to my kitchen, you would have to walk down the hallway in front of both the front and back door because it was behind the living room. I kept hearing strange noises so before I left out of my brother's room, I told him to get into the closet and work on our fort so that it would be ready when I was done getting our drinks and a snack. I raised my little brother for the most part and took care of him. I had a terrible feeling, a sense of dread. I could tell something wasn't right and this was a way to get my brother to hide without scaring him. He frightened easily and had really bad asthma attacks and at this time we had no inhaler or his breathing treatment machine for him. I knew if he started having an asthma attack on top of being scared, it wouldn't be pretty. Anyway, I left the back room and decided to see what was going on. I started sneaking up the hallway as slowly and quietly as I could. I was terrified. I could feel that something was wrong. Before I made it to the end of the hallway, I hear a man. It sounded like he was grunting. I can't explain it, but the feeling that washed over me made me near puke. So I of course freeze. I have no one in this town. I don't know anyone and my dad is living in a different state. My mom is at the bar drunk. I was sitting Sitting there trying to gather the courage to see what was around the corner and going over my options when I hear my brother's door open. He sees me and the look on my face and freezes. I remember his eyes going so wide with fear because he must have heard the grunting too. I motion him with my hands to go back in the room and he does. I gathered the courage to peek around the corner and what I saw still freaks me out to this day. It was horrifying. I saw a man, probably around 6 foot 2, sitting on my couch with a grin on his face. By some stupid luck that man didn't see me. I slowly snuck back to my brother's room. I slowly shut the door and started going over my options. My little brother was 
already horrified because of the grunting noise this man was making. I am so thankful he wasn't the one who saw what was out there. I gathered myself and calmly told him that there was a man that I didn't know on the couch and he needed to be very quiet and I needed him to be brave and keep his breathing in check. My little brother adored me and looked up to me so when I told him that I needed him to be brave, he tried his best. I told him not to move and he didn't. The first thing I tried was the window but it wouldn't budge. It was completely stuck. I'm making myself stay calm for my brother's sake but I know what's sitting out there. So since the window was stuck, I decided to start looking for a weapon. My oldest brother lived here and I knew he had swords somewhere. I don't remember where he was. As I'm looking for a weapon, I hear the man saying, I know you're here. My stomach nodded up. The hair on the back of my neck raised and I instantly got a cold sweat. And then I hear it. My little brother had started wheezing. Asthma attack. I hugged him, reminded him about being brave and told him to sit still and focus on his breathing. I started frantically trying to get my window open, but it was stuck. I looked around and started moving blankets when I find my older brother's cell phone that he always forgot. I remember thinking that I was lucky and felt a bit of relief. I immediately called the police and told them what was going on, hysterical at this point but still remaining quiet. The dispatcher told me to remain on the phone so she could hear what was happening when the man started banging on our bedroom door. It had been about 5 minutes into the phone call when this happened and I could no longer remain calm. I had lost it. I started screaming. I forgot to mention that our bedroom had the only working lock. So the door was locked, he was trying to get in and banging on the door. His banging got louder and louder. He was screaming to let him in when it went completely silent. Then he did the creepiest, most terrifying thing ever. He started laughing. He then says, You know I could just bust down this door in about two seconds, right little girl? He then starts lightly knocking on the door and asking me to open it. Then I hear the police start screaming at him to get on the ground, put his hands up, etc. I heard him putting up a fight, followed by more yelling and eventually silence. After a few minutes, there was a knock on my door, but at this point, I was too terrified to open it. I thought that this nightmare guy was still there. So being in my hysterical state, I started screaming, no, 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 please, over and over again, sobbing and shaking. I couldn't stay brave for my little brother anymore. I was on the floor holding him this whole time, convinced we were going to die. Eventually, I calmed myself a bit, and this time a female officer was at the door, so I opened it. There were about five cops standing in the hallway listening to me being hysterical. I refused to let go of my brother at this point, but we both ran to this female officer and just collapsed, sobbing hysterically. We had been so scared. It turns out this guy was completely wasted and high on drugs. I remember the cops walking me up to him and having me stand in front of him to ask me if I knew this man. I didn't. The man's eyes were completely bloodshot and filled with hatred. My parents were called and investigated for leaving us alone like that and for the doors being like that. My mom is a different person now, doesn't drink and is now married to a cop. She completely changed. I remember asking her about it later on and she told me something that I didn't know. The man had a huge knife, so that's what he was scraping the door with. He also had some rope, tape, and a tarp. I still don't know how he didn't get to us, or why he didn't just bust the door down to get us. It would have taken one half kick from him to kick the door down. It was super thin. So hopefully I will never have to endure that horrible experience again. This story starts around the fall of 2017. I was walking back to work from lunch when I passed this girl and noticed she got up and started walking behind me. She took a different route and didn't follow me. A few days later, it happened again, but this time she was following me. I assumed she wasn't following me at the time because where my office building is situated, you have to go up a set of stairs and pass a few other buildings and she did not follow me up to my building. After a while, I noticed we took the same train home. A lot of the time, she would be watching me. When we made eye contact, she'd look away. Then, she'd continue looking when she thought I wasn't looking. There's a Whole Foods across from my office. I went there for lunch a couple times during the week. I started seeing the girl sitting in the window for lunch and she would almost always get up as soon as I left and walk the same way I did. Around this time, I began seeing her more frequently. During lunchtime or when I got to the metro, she was almost always there. After a couple of months of this, I started noticing that she would get off at the same station as me sometimes. Sometimes, she would walk the same way as me. Once I got to my place, I live in a condo with my brother. She would always pass by but never follow me up to the entrance. During this time, I started receiving phone calls at work from random phone numbers that, at the time, I assumed was spam. There would either be silence on the other end or the person would hang up immediately. I also started receiving fake Facebook requests from people I already knew or were already on my friends list. December of 2017 comes. By this time, I'm not going to Whole Foods as often. If she gets off at the same station as me, I go into a restaurant or go shopping for 
groceries before I go home. Around this time, an old friend I went to high school with contacts me kind of out of the blue, said she wanted to follow me on Instagram. We text a couple of times and I accept her follow request. She contacts me again about a month later from a different number, but this time she's texting me frequently. I'm talking about every day slash every other day. I'm not one to be mean or show when I'm annoyed too often, but after months of this when she asks me if she's texting me too frequently, I don't hesitate to tell her that she could lay off a bit. She stops for a week or so, then starts texting frequently again. This whole ordeal should have sent red flags up for several reasons. During this time, she would ask me so many random questions, like what would you do when you're trying to get to know someone? She would ask for selfies, which I declined because I don't like taking pictures of myself, and I would tell her that there are plenty of pictures of me on Facebook. She would ask what I'm doing on the weekends and the names of my friends on occasion, which I wouldn't tell her because I thought it was weird that she'd want to know my friends' names. I only sent her a couple of videos of fun things I do, but that's it. August 2018 rolls around. I am still seeing creepy girl everywhere during the week. I get pulled into my boss's office. He says that a few co-workers received fake screenshots from Facebook of me talking badly about them. Now, I never post on Facebook and would never talk bad about my co-workers on social media. I don't have a grudge with anyone, nor do I know of anyone who has a problem with me. I managed to clear things up with everyone involved and still had my job. Of course, my friend is still texting me fairly frequently and I tell her what happened a couple days later when I got home from work. I tell her I don't want to get much into it, but she keeps pushing for details. I finally told her I was going to go to bed and she got the message. The more I thought about all the time she texted me, the more uneasy I got. Some things that she said just didn't make sense, especially from the way I remembered her. We had kept in touch over the years, just not as frequently and we hadn't touched base for a while before I heard from her in December. A couple of weeks later, I decided to reach out to my friend on Instagram but the Instagram she last messaged me through wasn't there. However, there was still an Instagram for her I followed and that follows me back. I reach out to her and ask what her phone number was. Phone number is completely different and it turns out that she was never the one texting me nor did she request following me on Instagram. I track the number and it turns out to be one of those fake phone number apps. I request to be blocked from the service and I never hear from my friend again. After talking about it with my brother and a couple of friends, I'm almost 100% certain it was the girl that's been following me. The these things only started after she appeared. The phone calls to my office, the fake Facebook request, etc. A few days before I was pulled aside by my boss, my friend texted me and told me that she had a weird feeling about me and wanted to make sure I was okay. I just thought that she was being weird at the time and didn't think much to it. This whole ordeal is really scary when I look back on it because I sent videos of myself and my address at one point. My friend even confirmed a post my brother made with pictures he tagged of me on Facebook. I was texting a stranger for 8 months about my life and they they also apparently have access to my Facebook page. She doesn't follow me anymore but when she did see me on the metro, she would always sit somewhere that she was able to make eye contact with me. I'm always careful now if anyone texts me from an unrecognizable phone number. I just hope that she decided to forget me and move on. About 5 or so years ago, I was 23 at the time and had just gotten out of my first and only serious relationship a year prior. That guy was my first love so needless to say when things ended and he had zero interest in trying to work things out, I was heartbroken. After about a year of moping around, I decided to try actual dating. I met this guy Rick on a dating website. He was a couple of years older than me, was an ex-marine, and good at making conversation. After a few days of talking online, he asked for my number and we decided to meet up. I drove to his house and to find out he lived with a few other guys who looked really shady. Now he actually lived in a good neighborhood, but the way they kept their home and the way his roommates looked was my first red flag that a inexperienced and naive girl would not fit in his crowd but I decided to stay and give it a chance. Once he saw me, he came up, gave me a hug, and handed me a helmet to his motorcycle. Now I have never in my life rode a motorcycle before but I had always wanted to, so I thought why not and hopped on. Now the street he decides to take me up is known to be a very long and windy road that is pretty secluded. It's also important to note that this is the springtime and it's about 5 p.m. when we go on our ride. I didn't realize at the time he had decided to take me on that specific road, but once we got on it, my red flag started to kick in. I began to realize that, one, it is dead silent and there are no other cars on this road right now, two, it's starting to get dark, and three, yeah, I don't know this guy so what am I doing, and my alarm bells start ringing. Once my anxiety kicked in, I told him that I think we should turn around and go home. He started laughing and asked if I was scared and I said no, I just need to head home because my parents are expecting me for dinner soon. He kept riding forward. More alarm bells ringing. Pictures of me lying dead in a ditch came up. 
I kept asking can we please turn back and he finally gave in and turned around. The next day comes and I told myself that maybe I was just overreacting and he was harmless and decided to agree on a second date a few days later. We met up at a sports bar for dinner and a couple of beers so we can watch the hockey game. The entire time we were sitting there, Rick has his arm around me and has me literally attached to his hip, constantly trying to make out with me and is acting extremely possessive. At this point, I'm completely freaked out because I barely know this guy and all he is talking to me about is our future future and how he would be such a protective boyfriend because he was an ex-marine. At this point I knew I was done with him but unfortunately my car is at his house. When we are done and head home, he insists that I come inside and hang out for a bit. I decide to walk in and stay for 5 minutes. We walk into his room and he immediately pounces on me, making out with me and trying to feel me up. I kept pushing his hands away and kept telling him that I needed to get going, but I could tell he wasn't going to give up until he got what he wanted, especially after I realized his little friend was aroused. He told me that he would not let me leave until we did something. I said screw this and was able to bolt out of his door and sped home. After that night, he tried to ask me to hang out again and I told him that I think it would be best if we stayed friends. This guy began to relentlessly call me and text me and beg me to see him, then proceeded to call me names because I was ignoring him, then would apologize for calling me said names and it was because he liked me so much so i blocked him then he tried to message me on instagram so i blocked him on there and then on facebook and finally on snapchat i never gave rick any more attention and moved on if you're liking this video all i ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video thank you This story happened to me about 6 months ago. I have lived where I lived for 3 years. It's a nice apartment in an amazing location, but they were built in the late 90s. In the last few years, the city I live in has had a massive population boom and people have been non-stop pouring in. Good weather, amazing economy, cool place to do stuff always. Because of this, I have seen the landlord staff start to do heavy maintenance on the apartments to bring them up to date to attract more people to them. My neighbor lived in his apartment for something like 6 years before he he ended up buying a house and moved. When he moved, the landlord immediately started redoing his apartment as one to bring up to date. The way that the apartment layout is, is that there are two stories. Where my bedroom is, on the direct other side of the bedroom wall is the staircase in my neighbor's apartment. The way my bedroom layout is, has my bed right up against the wall. They were completely stripping this place clean. It was one of the first ones that they did such heavy remodeling to. For weeks, I would always see the workers over there painting and redoing the floors, etc. A few days before this happened was no different. I left and saw them doing maintenance in the kitchen and when I came home from work, they were gone for the day. Nothing unusual for a single bit. The part that is unusual though is what happened one particular night. I was awake around 1am watching TV in my room when I heard someone on the other side of the wall slowly walking up the stairs and very obviously stopping halfway up. Where the person was stopping was directly where my head laid on the other side of the wall. I could feel him listening to me breathing. I immediately I immediately turned the TV sound off and sat there extremely quiet and still. I heard nothing for a few minutes and then after what felt like an absolute eternity, I heard the person start walking the rest of the stairs to the second floor. It was very obvious that someone was on the other side of that wall listening to me. I also knew that it was only a few days before this happened that I saw the maintenance redoing that apartment's kitchen. I knew that there was no way someone already moved in that fast. I quietly got out of bed and went to a room where I had a better view of the outside of the apartment. I obviously I obviously couldn't see if there was movement in there from the window, but I had a good angle to see if anyone walked out. I sat there for around 15 minutes just staring outside to see if I saw anything at all, nothing. I went back into my room and laid down in bed again. I didn't play the TV, I just sat there waiting to hear something again. I was messing around on my phone for around 20 minutes in silence until I heard movement in the stairs again. This time though, the movement didn't start from the top or the bottom. The movement started in the middle of the staircase, meaning that the entire time I was sitting there in silence, this person was just on the other side of the wall listening to my every move. This terrified me, so I called the cops. I gave them all the information of what was going on and they informed me someone would be out very soon. I went back to the one room and watched out the window again. Only a few moments later, a police car pulled up and a cop got out to examine the building in the apartment. Only a few moments later, a police car pulled up and a cop got out to examine the building and the apartment. He was looking around and shining his light in the windows. I heard him knock on the door and shortly after could hear him talking to someone, but couldn't make out what they were saying. I was totally 
clearly puzzled by this. The officer walked over to my door and knocked. I went downstairs and he informed me very nicely that someone just moved in there. I laughed and was completely embarrassed. I even said to the cop that it was a heck of a way to meet your new neighbor. I felt embarrassed, but more importantly felt very relieved about the entire situation. I brushed off the whole thing as it just being late and my mind playing massive tricks on me. The next day I went to leave my apartment when I saw something that made me stop dead in my tracks. I went outside and only took a few steps towards my car when I saw maintenance over there carrying out the old refrigerator. I was puzzled. I walked over to the apartment and I looked in the door that was wide open. The kitchen was still being worked on and not a single piece of furniture could be seen. I was legitimately speechless. I walked over to a maintenance man and said, didn't someone move in here? And he informed me no and that the apartment wouldn't be ready for showings until at least three weeks. I ran back upstairs into my apartment and called my landlord. I asked her if someone is staying there and she said absolutely not. I told her about what I experienced the night before. She was floored. She told me that they would change that apartment's locks immediately. She also suggested that I call the non-emergency line to the police department and inform them that no one lives there. I did just that and they asked me to come down to the station. I told them all of the information and detail of what happened. They were able to quickly figure out what officer came out to check out the situation so he could help identify the person who answered the door. The officer described the man in detail and I confirmed that I had never seen him around the apartments before. There was a search around town for a few weeks until the whole thing just sort of fizzled out and I stopped hearing about it and started seeing less and less patrol cars randomly in the parking lot. After that night, I never heard another thing in that apartment. Around a month later, an older couple moved in and they are very nice. When I saw the moving van pull up, I went out to introduce myself to them. But to be completely honest, the only reason I went out there was to see if any of them matched the description of who the cops saw. Not even close. I'm certain that the person who was in that apartment got away with it. I had an extremely hard time sleeping the following weeks of that happening to me. I actually ended up moving my bed into the smaller second bedroom because it bothered me so much. I have zero idea of what the intentions were of the person or what they were doing on that staircase. I am a proud Floridian. At the time of the story, early 2000s, I was going to college in South Florida and lived with my family in my hometown in the Florida Panhandle. It's about a 7 hour drive up through Central Florida to get between the two places, so I mostly only went home for the holidays. It was the Thanksgiving in my junior year, and I was excited that I had managed to rearrange my midterms to be able to leave campus three days ahead of everyone else. I was expecting to beat the masses of traffic and was hoping for a quick trip back home. My roommates wanted to have a last meal together before we all left for break. So I ate in the campus dining hall around 4 p.m. and I set off on my journey around 5.30 p.m. Around 10 p.m. I had just passed my two-third mark, where I always stopped at this little mom and pops type of diner by the side of the highway to grab a snack, use the restroom, and call my dad to let him know I was okay, I didn't have a cell phone yet. Well, I hadn't been there since summer and the place was out of business, so a little bummed out that I wasn't getting my chocolate pancakes. I just kept going. There really wasn't much built up around there at the time, so when I saw signs for a rest stop in, of all the places on this green earth, some town called Alachua, so I went for it. So I went and parked directly under the street light for safety and used the facilities, call my dad, etc. I didn't see anyone else there, except for a very exhausted looking woman who approached me asking for directions, saying she was with her husband and two small children from Virginia and they had made a wrong turn trying to get to Disney. So I left the rest area and was walking back to my car when I noticed a beat up, unmarked, gray or bluish work van parked very close to the driver's side of my 95 Honda Civic. Yeah okay, I thought that's pretty weird. It had Florida tags on it so it couldn't have been the ladies I talked to in the bathroom. I distinctly remember she said she was from Virginia. I turned around and hightailed it back to the rest stop, promptly running into some random middle aged guy with two little boys. Getting to talk to him, it turned out it was his wife I had spoken to as she emerged from the bathroom a second later, and I felt comfortable speaking to him. I told him what was going on with the van and how I didn't know what to do. He said he'd go check it out, so he left the kids with his wife and strutted up to the driver's side of the van. He stood there for a moment before speaking, his voice awkwardly quivered, but we could hear him yell it from where we were standing some 100 feet away. Excuse me gentlemen, we already called 
the police, so I'm going to have to politely suggest that you get out of here. And then he ran back to us, grabbed his wife and kids, pointed to me with a swift you, and said, come on, let's all get in the car now. And we ran together. So here I was, confusedly sitting in the back of the stranger's SUV, while he went and used the payphone to presumably call the police. Meanwhile, the van peeled out of there. Like, I have never seen someone get out of there quite like they got out of there. They ran up on the curb on their way out. They burned rubber. It was almost comical. The cops got there and I found out what happened. The man went to go check out the van and he could see in it pretty well because I had parked under the street light. The first thing he noticed was that all the seats except for the driver's seat had been removed. There was a guy sitting in the driver's seat and a guy sitting in the back. A tarp laid out in the back and a bunch of other random items back there he couldn't immediately identify. Neither of the guys were reading a newspaper or a map or anything. They were apparently both just sitting there. I'd say I was around 8 at the time this took place. At the time, we had to get mail from the post office in town, and so seeing my mom get the mail, my brain decided, wow, I want to be cool and get the mail like mom. That childish need to prove that I was mature. Eventually, after time and time of begging, my mom let me get the mail. I'd guess it was a weekend as the post office was closed, but you could still grab mail, just no people that worked there were there. I asked my mom if I could grab the mail as we slowly pulled up outside the post office. She nodded and gave me the keys that had the mail key and a few others. I jumped out of the old van and ran up the ramp to the building, avoiding the stairs completely. I opened the door and saw a lady and a man getting their mail, but turning to my side, I saw an older man sitting in the corner staring at me. He gave me weird vibes even as a kid, but still I gave him a quick smile and wave. Bad move. The man smiled back, revealing his stained teeth. I walked past him and went to the mailbox. Me being me though, I forgot what key was what and began fumbling awkwardly as the others grabbing mail left the building. After maybe 3-5 to five minutes of trying and failing, I finally unlocked it. I was so happy that I disregarded the man staring as I grabbed the mail. With a quick click of the lock, I closed the box and began to walk away. I found the gaze of the man as he looked at me, a crooked smile across his face. I put my open hand against the door and began to push when a pair of arms reached around me, one hand forcefully pulling the door shut and the other around the upper part of my chest, like my collarbone, pulling me into a tight, unwelcome and horrible hug. I froze. What was I supposed to do? I was always taught to respect adults and I did. He had a strong scent of alcohol on him, so much I think I coughed a few times. He began to speak after a moment of just holding me there. The words he spoke scared me really bad. He then said, man, hey, where are you going? He spoke almost passive aggressively. Me, oh, I have to go. My mom was waiting for me. Man, oh, okay. He sounded defeated and began to let me go. Before I could break away, he held me tighter again, tighter than before. Wait, wait, wait. I have a dog, you know. He had a grin on his face. Me, oh, that's cool. Man, yeah, and you should come with me and you could play with him. I almost went with him at that moment, but luckily something told me not to. The next maybe eight minutes he had let me go and pulled me back hard into him, his dirty coat brushing against me. He kept telling me to go with him. Finally, he seemed to snap. Man, alright, you're coming with me. Me, what? But I need my mom. I have her keys and she's waiting for me, please. That was still my priority, her keys and mail. Man, nope, you're coming with me now. He opened the door and began to pull me out. In a moment of his weakness, I broke away, running to my mom in her car. I slammed the door shut, scaring my brother and my mother. I began shaking and crying, dropping the mail on the car floor. I picked it up and handed everything to my mom as she demanded to know what happened. I told her everything and she looked pissed. I was so glad that she was on my side. I looked outside, tears still streaming down my face, and noticed the man look at me through the car window from the top ramp of the building. I began to cry harder and panic as he started coming over. My mom stopped me as she noticed him coming. He fell at the bottom of the ramp and tripped. My mom laughed at the creep and started driving away, while she tried to comfort me saying things things like, he was a harmless old drunk man and he didn't hurt you. I'm pretty sure I knew what his intentions were towards my younger self, and I'm just glad that I was able to get away from the man. This happened in 2015 when I was 16 and still living in my hometown, a forgotten little beach town in the middle of nowhere that's so remote it's probably not even known by surrounding areas. Basically, there's three things you can do there as a teenager. Go to the movies, swim, or go to this pathetic little place called Miller's Fun Park. It's relatively similar to a lot of fun park type things, only a whole lot worse. There's a crappy arcade with broken skee ball machines, batting cages that probably haven't been used since the early 80s, a pathetic mini golf course, and the most dangerous go-karts you've probably ever seen in your life. 
Miller's Fun Park is on the edge of a field. On the opposite side of the field, about three miles down is the beach, and across the single street are woods. If our town is in the middle of nowhere, Miller's is practically on the moon. My cousin Emma and I decided one summer night that we wanted to go go-karting. It was around 10pm, so we knew it'd be almost deserted, but that was the way we liked it. I picked her up from her house and we made the long drive down. Once we had arrived and parked in the nearly empty parking lot, we hopped out of the car and paid for some go-karting tickets. The same people had worked there forever. There was no one there except for a few boys in the arcade and a guy who looked to be in his 60s sitting on a bench near the batting cages. Emma and I paid him no mind and went to the go-kart track. Like I said, these carts were incredibly dangerous, so I was focused on nothing but making sure I wasn't going to skid and flip as we raced way too fast around the windy track. This is why I didn't notice the guy walking over to the fence and why I didn't notice him watching us until we pulled into the lanes after our last lap. He was standing on the other side of the fence, right where I parked. He stared at me with the most unsettling expression, a weird smile with dark eyes. I managed an uneasy smile back, handed another ticket to the guy running the go-karts, who was obviously higher than a kite, and Emma and I went off again. This time I couldn't focus. The dude gave me the worst type of feeling. My eyes were constantly finding their way to the metal fence where he stood, unmoving and watching us every time we were in his view. And the thing that was bothering me the most was we only had bought three tickets. We were on our our second to last run and he was standing directly next to the exit gate. I was just praying that he'd move before we were done. But of course, no such luck. Our last go came and went and I had no choice but to pull in next to him, unbuckle my seatbelt and get out of my go-kart. I glanced over at Emma a few feet away as I opened the exit gate to see if she was as scared as I was. But she didn't seem to notice as she bounced over and bragged about how she had beat me the last two times. I was barely listening. I opened the gate and the guy stepped in front of me just as I was leaving. Hey there, he said. His voice was dry and he smelled of cigarettes. What are you girls doing all alone here? My eyes darted over to Emma, who was looking at the dude with both confusion and annoyance. Uh, what? She said, pushing past the gate so she stood beside me. It's so late. His tone was as hungry as his eyes, and he reminded me of a snake. Do your parents know that you're out? Yes, I answered quickly. They're waiting for us, actually. We need to get going. This was a lie and probably sounded like it from my tone, but I tried to push past him anyway. It didn't work. He grabbed my shoulder to keep me in front of him. Nonsense. I saw you girls pull up alone. My heart dropped to my stomach. He had? Are you heading out? Why don't I walk you to your car? He starts inching towards me and I look to Emma for help. With one swift movement, she pulled me halfway behind her and started sizing the guy up. This was pretty dumb as we're both small, and though she's a few inches taller than me, neither of us are anywhere near his size. This guy clears six foot too easy, but she doesn't seem to care. Actually, we were just headed to the arcade, she says harshly. Her boyfriend is going to meet us here. I did have a boyfriend at the time, but he wasn't coming. He wasn't even in town, and I knew that she knew this. The guy's face immediately changes. His smile disappeared, and he now was glaring down at me with a look of annoyance in his eyes. I felt myself start to cower. Boyfriend, he says roughly. Emma didn't give me time to say anything. She grabbed my arm and tugged me behind her into the arcade. The boys from before had already left and the usual girl who worked in there was nowhere to be found. Still, it felt safer than outside. We ran to the back and hid behind the claw machine. What do we do? I left my phone in my car, I whisper shouted. There was no way I was going out there alone and the go-kart guy had already disappeared into the small ticket shack. I don't have mine either, I left it charging, she said, face palming. We're just gonna have to make a run for it. Are you crazy? He's probably waiting for us in the parking lot. What about the guy who runs the go-karts. We could get him to walk us out, she said. I just shook my head. He's as high as Mount Everest right now. I don't want to risk running all the way to the ticket stand for nothing. Then we have no choice. She stood up pulling me with her. Let's go. I swallowed hard, wanting to cry. I'd never been that scared before. There was something so wrong about that guy. We made our way out of the arcade, looking around to see if he's nearby. The park was now absolutely deserted. Emma practically had to drive me to the exit. I was looking every direction every second, waiting for the guy to come out, out of the woods or something thing and pounce on us at any second. But he didn't. Everything was still. Get your keys out, Emma instructed. And I pulled them from my pocket. We were about 20 feet from my car when I stopped dead in my tracks. What, she whispered. I stared at the car, keys in hand. I had never locked it. I never locked the car, Emma. What? I didn't lock it. What if? I trailed off, but she knew what I was saying. She started inching towards the car and I grabbed her arm to stop her, but she pulled me away. I'm just going to peek. If I say run, you run. Her voice is quiet. I nodded shakily. She eventually made it close enough to see inside, but by the way she was squinting, I knew it was too dark to make anything out. My heart was beating out of my chest. What if he's in there? All these thoughts, almost drown out, the almost 
unmistakable sound of shoes slamming against the pavement. My head whipped around instantly and there he was, sprinting at us at full speed out of the woods. I screamed bloody murder and broke for the car, jiggling the handle as I realized I had locked it. Emma was already on the other side screaming at me to unlock it. I fumbled with the keys but managed not to drop them as I unlocked the door, flung it open and practically threw myself inside. I just managed to close the door when he was there, slamming his fist against the window and shouting incoherently. I was sobbing at this point and barely managed to lock the doors as he goes for the handle and yanks on it as hard as he can. Emma was screaming at me to go and through my tears I shoved the key into the ignition and flew into reverse. He was still chasing us and yelling as I veered backwards out of the lot and turned as fast as I could while slamming on the gas. I was driving like I was still in a go-kart but I didn't care. I could barely see the road through the flood of tears and Emma had to grab the wheel several times to keep us from crashing before I regained some composure. Though obviously shaken up, she managed to keep her tears and be the same one out of the two of us as we drove at least 30 miles over the speed limit the whole way back to my house. We kept this encounter a secret between us for a long time but me and Emma decided to tell this encounter we had experienced on here. We didn't talk about it until months after the horrifying encounter. Safe to say we never went back to Miller's Fun Park after that. I urge all of you to be extremely careful when going out at night. I just hope that me and Emma never have to see that lunatic again. This story is about an event that happened to my mother around 1972 when she was 8 years old. To set the scene, both of my grandparents ran a restaurant slash gas station in our hometown. They have always run a business of some type since the 50s. This means that a lot of days my mom would take the school bus home and stay by herself if my grandma had to stay and help run things, usually no more than an hour or two. My uncle, her older brother, would usually come home on the bus with her but he was a little older and sometimes had football practice. So was the case in the day of the event I'm getting to. So my mother arrived home on this day, let herself in the house, and put away her things. She had just recently received a new puppy and knew the first thing she needed to do was take the pup out to the yard to use the restroom. She wrapped the dog in a white towel, this is important, and walked him outside. As she put down the dog, she shook its hair out of the blanket, flailing it about the wind. It's then she noticed the neighbor's son was staring at her from across the street. This guy was in his late 20s and was known to be very strange. My mom said he always creeped her and everyone else out. She said he would stare at her when she would play outside and made her feel generally uncomfortable. She said he appeared out of nowhere in his yard that day and as she took out the blanket he began grinning and waving. Feeling more than a little shook, she picked up her pup, went inside and locked the door. She began to do some homework and after about 5 minutes of work, she heard a loud knock at the door. She slowly walked to the window to see who it was. She knew it wasn't my grandparents because of course they had keys. As she opened the blinds, her eyes locked with those of the creep from across the street, like he was already looking in the window. She jumped and said she screamed a little as she shut the blinds. She walked to the door and made sure it was locked. She said he just continued with the slow continuous thud on the door, almost in rhythm. Knock, knock, knock. Then she really got terrified as he began speaking to her through the door. Hi sweetie, I saw you with your doggy. Let me in to see him. She was in shock. Come on and let me in sweetie, please. I want to see your puppy. In full freak out mode, my mom screamed. You need to leave now. You need to go back to your house. I don't know you. He kept knocking. Knock, knock, knock knock. I can see the fear in my mom's eyes when she describes that part. He said, let me in, I saw you waving your flag of surrender. I kid you not, the guy thought my mom shaking hair from the blanket was a flag of surrender and a sign for him to come over. My mom screamed, I'm calling my dad and the police if you don't leave now. With this, the knocking stopped. She tried to catch her breath and shake off her fear. She then got up from the door and ran to the basement level of the home. It was an old house so the kitchen and the rec room were down there along with the only phone in the house. She made it to the phone and began to dial 911. One. All of a sudden, she heard a shatter from the next room. She looked over to see the crazed neighbor attempting to crawl through the kitchen window. He was ripping down the curtain as his upper body got through and my mother screamed what was happening to the police on the phone. All of a sudden, he was bleeding from the abdomen where the window glass had cut him as his lower half couldn't squeeze through. Then my mom began hearing my grandmother scream, so what are you doing? Then the guy yelling in pain and squirming out the window as she hit him from behind with some tool that was laying in her garden on the side of the house where the entrance to the window was. He managed to get out the window and bolted to his house. The police came, grandma called my grandfather and he arrived as well after shutting down the business as soon as she told him. They arrested him for breaking and entering. On the day of his court date he told them the white flag of surrender story but this was the final nut on his crazy cake as they put him in a mental institution that day. He may have gotten out but went back because my mother said he later died in an institution. Outside the courthouse the crazy family of the creep tried to blame my 8 year old mother and the man's 
father call my mother a harlot. We always can't help but wonder though, what would he have done to her if my grandma didn't come home at that moment? This took place when I was about 16. My aunt was in town visiting and we were coming back from the grocery store. We were driving back to my mom's house, my parents are divorced, and she lived way out in the country. Like, it's a 10 minute drive from anywhere. We pull up at our driveway and a red car pulls in behind us. My aunt and I stay in the car and the man approaches the driver's side door. I can't rightly tell you why he looked like a creep, but he looked like a creep. Very pasty skin, eyes that were staring down too hard, just overall weird. He claims he is lost and looking for his way to a fitness center in the town next over. The exact fitness center that is about a minute away from where the grocery store is, i.e. the opposite direction of where we just came from. Super odd, but I give him directions. He thanks me, but continues to stare at me. He asks if we know each other and I reply no. He gives me his name and I again repeat no, I do not. A couple of seconds of awkward staring and he asks me what my name is. Well, being an idiot and feeling anxious, I tell him that was a mistake. He confirms we don't know each other, oh really, and heads back to his car and we watch him leave. My aunt and I agree he was very strange, but shake it off and take the groceries in. From where we were parked, you have to take a little windy path up behind the house to the back door. My aunt goes outside to grab the rest of the groceries, and I settle on the couch in the living room and look outside. Red car in the driveway. My aunt comes upstairs and said the guy was almost to our door and claimed he forgot the directions. My aunt curtly told him right, left, right, and told him to leave. The directions were truly that simple when following the main roads. I'm freaked, she's freaked, but we never see him again. A month passes and I'm chilling at my dad's and posted something like, I'm bored at my dad's house, who wants to chill on Facebook? Guys, always set your page to private. Several minutes later, I get a message from the same guy asking if I wanted him to come over. I'm home alone and understandably terrified. I immediately block him and tell my dad, who goes to one of his cop friends to see if they know anything about this guy. Well, this man was kicked out of a local university for stalking, and had two other counts of stalking on top of that and a restraining order. Another month goes by and I'm in study hall with a friend friend and he is telling me about this guy who was stalking his older sister. I don't remember the specific details, but it was definitely the story of someone being stalked. The craziest part was the stalker almost drove this girl's brother off the road in an attempt to get him to pull over. Once pulled over, stalker jumped out and was making his way to my friend's vehicle when my friend noped right out of there. I'm sure you guessed it, but the stalker and the creep I ran into were the same person. I was always the weird kid growing up, so making friends was never easy for me. I was a bit of a punk in high school, so living in a preppy, religious town was not my ideal place. Eventually, I met this boy, Sean. I was so happy to finally have someone I connected with. We quickly became best friends and hung out almost every day. He was odd, but so was I, so I just looked past it. Most of the time we were hanging out, we were also on drugs, so I figured some of the stuff he said was just the drugs talking. But one day he said, I'm gonna stab someone this week. For Four days later, he threatened to shoot up a place on Instagram. He played it off as a joke when I confronted him about it. His parents took away his phone and forced him to move away for a few weeks to let the air clear, but we kept in contact. At this point, my dumb self realized I was in love with him. I did everything I could to clear his name. I even got into arguments with parents on Facebook. My parents begged me to stop talking to him, but for some reason, I truly believed he was good. I didn't want to believe he was capable of hurting anyone. The whole shooting thing never really blew over. When he came back to school, Students would run from him in the hallways, people were sending him threats, his reputation was ruined. After all of this, something in him changed, he was angrier. We would be talking and joking around about something, and he would start attacking me with words. If I made a new friend, he'd go out of his way to ruin my new friendship and for some reason, I saw this as him being protective. About a year went by after this, the verbal abuse continued, and I continued to do nothing about it. I was still in love with him, but I didn't act on it since he was my closest friend. To keep my mind off of Sean, I started dating a boy named Alex. Sean hated Alex, not for any particular reason, he just didn't like that I spent time with someone that wasn't him. Alex was also a weed dealer, and Sean knew this. Sean asked if Alex would front him some weed since he knew we were best friends, and Alex did. I don't remember the exact exact amount of weed, but it was a decent amount, enough to be mad about if you don't get paid for it. Sean never paid Alex. Alex tried to talk to him about it, but Sean always put him off and avoided him. After about a month of this, Alex saw Sean's car in a Taco Bell parking lot and pulled up. He saw Sean in his car and began to get out. Since Alex had anger issues, he also pulled out his baseball bat. Sean saw him and freaked out. He pulled out of his parking spot quickly, drove off, and called 911, calling it a drug deal gone wrong. Alex was then arrested for assault with a deadly weapon. Three days later, 
later, when Alex got out of jail, he was driving to his friend's house, who lives in Sean's neighborhood, when he saw Sean standing in his front yard. Alex rolled out his window and called him a coward, then drove away. Sean called the police again and Alex was arrested for stalking. Around this time, my parents caught me smoking. I didn't want to lie anymore, so I was honest and told my parents everything. Obviously, they were very mad at me for getting myself into that situation, and I had just told them I was smoking weed and dating a drug dealer, so I was in a decent amount of trouble. My parents took my phone as soon as I got home from school, and I wasn't allowed to see Alex when he got out of jail. They took my paycheck so I didn't have money to buy weed, and they made me download a tracker on my phone so they could make sure that I was home when they weren't. They contemplated calling Sean's parents and telling them we had been smoking together. I knew that if Sean got caught smoking again, he would get kicked out of his house, so I snuck on my phone and texted him that my parents might call his parents and he was pissed. He called me horrible names and said he wished he had never met me. I finally had enough and told him not to talk to me anymore. My parents never called his parents. We didn't talk at all. I asked not to be scheduled with him at work and avoided him at school. We didn't have any classes together, so it wasn't too hard, but hearing the stuff he'd say about me made it a little difficult. He had started rumors that I was addicted to coke and I was selling my nudes. This is when the text started. He began texting me constantly, so I blocked his number. Then he'd use someone else's phone to text me, so I'd block that person's number. Then he'd use WhatsApp or group me to text me since we use those for work, so I just block him on there. He eventually got fired from our job because he had been writing tips on receipts if people didn't ask for a copy of their receipt and left the tip line empty. The continuous messages went off for a few weeks, and I just continued to block anyone he was associated with. I didn't want to be in contact with him whatsoever. He kept making new Instagram accounts to message me on, and all of his attempts to contact me failed. One day, I had a late lesson at School of Rock, where I took guitar lessons. My teacher had stayed late for me, so I was expecting his car to be the only car in the parking lot, but it wasn't. There were two cars in the parking lot, my teacher's and Sean's. To this day, I don't know how he knew I was going to be there. I quickly parked, locked my doors, and thought about what to do. I then realized he wasn't in his car, so I calmed down a bit and called inside to ask if he was there, but he wasn't. I cautiously got out of my car and got my guitar, then walked inside with no problems. After my lesson, I came out to see that he was now parked right next to me, waiting for me to get into my car. When he saw me, he began screaming profanities at me. I was paralyzed. He just sat there, screaming at me. I quickly climbed into my car from the passenger door so I didn't have to walk next to him and then drove home as fast as I could. He began asking people to ask me to talk to him at school. Of course, I didn't. Each time someone mentioned his name to me, it caused me to have a panic attack so bad I'd have to leave school. I ended up missing the entire month of November and then switching to online school. A month after I switched to online school, I was driving with a friend to pick up food for my mom. As soon as we pulled into the drive-thru, the car behind me begins to flash their brights at me. I look at my rearview mirror and see Sean's car. He has a sticker across the top of his windshield, so I knew it was him right away. I look over at my friend in fear and she said, I didn't want to scare you so I didn't say anything, but he's been following us since we left Target. I panic and just pretend to not notice him. He then pulled out of the drive-thru and parked right next to it by the exit. As soon as he pulled out, so did I. I sped to my friend's house, dropped her off, and went straight home. At this point, my parents thought going to the police would be the smartest thing to do. An officer came to my house and took a statement. I showed him screenshots of every message he had sent me over the months, and my friend that was in the car with me in the drive-thru talked to him as well. We decided not to press charges, but to just file an incident report. Days go by and I don't hear anything from him. I thought that maybe it was over and I could move on with my life, but my dad told me Sean had messaged him on Facebook. He had said I was addicted to pills and that I stole money from him to buy more. I've never done pills in my life. I stick to natural drugs. My parents know this, so they screenshot the messages and send them to the police. The police go by his house and tell him to stop contacting me. I continue to get messages from random Instagram accounts, and I sometimes saw his car behind me, but each time I just wrote down the location, date, and time I saw him. At this point, I started to work with Alex's lawyers to prove that Sean was not an innocent victim. Eventually, Alex's charges were dropped. Sean was proven to be unreliable since I came forward with my story. I wish I could say I had an ending to this story, but I don't. I still get random messages, but I don't bother to screenshot them anymore. Since I switched to online school, I was able to graduate a year early, and because of that, I moved away for college so I don't have to worry about him following me anymore. The last I heard about him was that he got arrested a few months ago.
I went on a Tinder date some time ago while I was adjusting to a new city I had moved to. I didn't really know anybody there, so I used some online dating apps to see the dating scene around town. I landed one from a girl that seemed just like a chill person. We had a few exchanges through the Tinder app and then decided to meet up for a drink. I picked her up at her house and she greeted me at the door and gave me a hug. She said the name of a local bar she wanted to go to for us to chat and get to know each other. I told her I would drive and proceeded to my car. The first red flag I noticed was when I walked to my car and opened the door. She had just followed me to the driver's side and was standing behind me staring. I looked at her blankly for 15 seconds and asked her if she was going to get in. She said, sure, I would love to, and went the long way to the passenger's side around the back of the car. Since I had just met the girl, I figured she had just maybe smoked some weed or something, as I had kind of got the vibe she was a bit of a stoner. As I was driving to the bar, she talked in a very low voice, almost as if she was trying to whisper. I am not hard of hearing or anything, but I had to ask her to repeat herself several times just so I could make out the full sentences she was saying. When we got to the bar, I made sure we got a seat closer to the back away from most people, just so I could have a little quiet in order to hear her. The conversations honestly carried on as normal from this point and it was actually a fun time for the time being. We talked about different things we were interested in, and she did bring up she did, recreationally use weed, and a few other tripping substances, like shrooms and such. I am not much of a fan of these, but it at least made me relax in the back of my mind to think maybe she was just high off marijuana, and that rationally explains some of the out of their behavior. Granted, I had a few drinks at this point, so I was honestly not thinking straight. I asked her if she wanted to go to my place after drinks, and she agreed. When we got to my place, we had a few more drinks, then she started talking about her jewelry. This is where it gets weird. She told me her jewelry was her big secret and it defined her. When I asked her why it was so important, she said, I'm actually Anastasia, and I was never killed in Russia. My jewelry is my link to my past. It was hard for me to take that serious at this point with how much I drank, so I kind of challenged that statement using the little bit I knew about history. At this point, she freaked out and started yelling at the top of her lungs about how I don't respect ancestors in history. And then she got quiet and tiptoed right up to me, grabbed me by my neck. She then brought my face eye to eye with hers while still holding my neck. She says at this point, I am a shaman and I will curse you. My ancestors have destroyed many people and you do not respect that. You are from oppressive ancestors and they will be punished. And then she put her hand in a whiskey glass and made a cross on my face and kissed my forehead. At this point, I started to sober up a little. I talked to her to calm me down, telling her I was only joking. Then she slowly started getting back to normal. Then she started talking about her cats. She tells me she has a list of people who she tames to act as cats. I am not about judging people on their interests, so I listen in. She then tells me all the things she does to them and starts acting like a cat in my living room. My red flags in my head were tingling like crazy at this point, so I just listened to try not to set her off. She noticed sage on my kitchen counter and asked me to let her light it and bless the house. Side note, I use sage to make my house smell better occasionally. It's kind of a ritual I like to do, but it's mine and mine alone. Something I take very personally and I like to do myself. I tell her no, she can't light it and that it's my thing to do on my own. Then she freaks out telling me I am a horrible human being and screaming all over the place. I tell her I can take her home now and she runs to the door and goes outside. As I get outside, she is screaming at the top of her lungs that I am a horrible person and I should go die. I tell her she can walk herself home then and I go back to my place and lock the door. She then starts banging on the door hard in about 10 minutes saying she left her phone in there. I grab her phone off the kitchen counter and open the door to hand it to her. She tries to barge inside and I block her with my forearm. She then acts like she's about to punch me. I just hold my ground and tell her she is not coming in. She screams she wanted the whiskey bottle we were drinking from. I told her no because I paid for the thing. I slam the door at that point and lock it. I hear her bang on the door for a minute. I then hear her footsteps going down the stairs. I I waited about an hour and then went walking outside to see if she was still hanging around. I didn't see her, nor did I ever see her again after that. So a few months ago, I was out hiking with my friend. We live in the mountains of western Maryland and we were about 6 miles into an 8 mile loop we have done frequently when we decided to take some pictures and eat a snack at a summit. This area of the trail had a park, benches and tables, and a parking lot. We were sitting and talking and I noticed a man just walking around the parking lot alone. He was walking aimlessly and staring at his feet. What confused me was that he was in jeans and a button down shirt, not exactly hiking attire. We decided to set off on the last 2 mile leg of the loop. 
This park goes downhill to the headquarters of the park and is cut out of the mountain slash bank. The end of that leg is the parking lot where our car is. You don't have a lot of visibility from the trail and you have to walk single file. I was walking in front and talking to my friend. I turn to look at her and I see the same man right behind her, following at a rudely close distance. I immediately got a gut-wrenching feeling. I noticed that he didn't have any pack or hiking gear and was not even wearing boots. Something about his eyes really spooked me. So a bit more walking and he continues to fall very close. I say to my friend that I have to tie my shoe, as a reason to step off the trail and let him pass us, in case he is only following closely because he wants to go faster than we are. She immediately catches on to what I'm doing and we pull over. He looks startled and she says hello politely. He just stares. This is when I notice that he is carrying a stick. As I'm fiddling with my shoe, she stands between us and he passes us. We wait to give him some distance ahead of us, but he immediately slows down. We wait for a bit longer and he gets to the furthest part of the trail that has sight lines to us, and he turns around looking up at us. We decided that something feels too wrong about this guy and we don't want to have to pass him again. So we turn around and walk back up the trail towards the park with the tables and parking. A few minutes of walking up the trail, I look back and see him walking up the trail too. He's following us. I tell my friend to walk faster. We book it up the trail and get to the parking lot area we were at before. We start to strategize and wait, deciding that we will wait to see if he comes back up the trail to the lot. There are more people around so we felt safer waiting and out. About 20 minutes go by and nothing. We are talking about how that could mean that he kept going on the trail and is long gone, or is waiting on the trail where it is more deserted. We see a couple come up from the trail where we were, presumably taking the loop in the opposite direction that we are. We approach them and ask if they saw anyone on the trail between the slot and the next. They tell us they saw a young man sitting on a rock about halfway down. They describe the man who was following us. We explain our interaction with him to the wife and get into a conversation back and forth about whether or not he was a threat. The husband finally interjects and says we need to call a ranger. He wasn't just sitting there, he had a knife and was carving that stick. Needless to say, we called a ranger. The nice couple walked that last leg with us to make sure we got to our car safely and then even gave us their numbers in case we needed anything. The rangers then walked the trail but there was no sight of him. I wish I knew where he went and what happened to him but I'm glad to know that my instincts are legitimate. If you're liking this video all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. The events of this story happened 13 years ago and it still messes with me to this day even though I'm not in any sort of danger. When I was in college, I got super depressed and stressed out near my junior year. I was always super into school and just started slipping near the end of my college term so it threw me off bad. Never experienced failing at subjects before and it threw me into a ridiculous stress. I graduated and I figured everything would go away with that, but I found myself still very, very mentally foggy. My sister knew how bad off I was from the last few years of school so she hatched a plan to surprise me. I always wanted to go to Miami growing up. I know how lame that sounds, but being a girl who grew up in the Midwest and even went to college there, it was always super exciting looking to me. Up to this point I traveled but never went anywhere as lively or big as Miami always seemed. My sister planned a 5 night vacation with me as a way to get me out of this mental fog and also celebrate in our own way me graduating college. I was super excited. The few months passed and it was time for the trip. We get there and the first few nights were incredible. We hit up the restaurants I had on my little list of places to try and spend many hours by the ocean. I was never a big party girl. Up to this point in my life, I was drunk maybe twice. My sister was the opposite who was at every party that happened in our hometown. She got bored of going back to the room so early every night and convinced me to go to a nightclub with her for the first time. I fought it a bit but let my guard down because I was feeling great for the first time in a long time and was ready to try new things. It was a Saturday night downtown in the middle of summer. We get to this nightclub and the line is legit wrapped around the building. It was massive. We waited in line for what felt like forever and were let in finally. I walked to the door and felt like I got shot because of the loudness. My sister dragged me to the bar and ordered some shots of some drink with a funny name. Again, I decided to just let my guard down and try new things. As more shots went down, I decided that would be the theme of the night, trying new stuff out. I was aware how boring I was and was, in my opinion, in the most exciting place in the world. Around 45 minutes into dancing and drinking, I became very drunk. 
borderline blackout. I was very sloppy drunk and was aware of it. I found myself laying on a couch thing in the upstairs area, overlooking the dance floor as my sister was dancing with some guys. As I stayed there trying to consciously sober myself up, I realized how badly I had to pee. So I brought myself up to a sitting position on the couch to stand up and walk to the nearby bathroom. As I sat up, a massive man quickly sat so close to me I could feel his leather pants pressed on my leg. Absolutely over 6 feet tall and looked like some sort of bodybuilder. Admittedly, he was very good looking, but I was so drunk that I wasn't even trying to flirt and just get up to find the bathroom. He smiled at me and yelled over the music something like this, leaving so soon. I remember nervously laughing and attempted to get up but he grabbed onto my dress and pulled me back to a sitting position next to him. His smile went away and he said in a very deep tone, I don't remember telling you that you were allowed to leave. Even though I was very drunk leading up to this, I felt like I sobered up within seconds. I never had anything like this happen before, but I wasn't going to just allow this guy, no matter how much bigger than me he is, to do that to me. I attempted to stand up again and he did the exact same thing, but much more aggressive. I thought it was insanely rude, but I wasn't afraid because of how many people were around me. He tapped my heels with his big yellow leather boots and said, I couldn't help but notice how much I want to screw your feet. My fight or flight kicked in. I slapped him in the face and stood up to walk away. I was very uncomfortable, but I still wasn't afraid just because of the amount of people around. As I was walking away, I heard him laughing and he yelled to me, I'm trying to decide if I want to keep your feet after I cut the rest of your body up into little pieces. I walked away very quickly as I attempted to search for my sister on the dance floor from above. I couldn't find her, so I decided to take my phone out to text her just to see I had missed a call from her. I was out of eye shot from this dude and cut away into the bathroom so I could call her back. It was still pretty loud in there, but it wasn't loud enough to where she she couldn't hear me on the phone. I went into a stall and called her back. As I was in the stall, I heard the bathroom door open and someone went into the one directly next to me. I was waiting for her to pick up when I looked down underneath the stall and saw the same guy's very distinct yellow leather boots. He was just standing there. I felt like I was about to die. I knew he knew I was in there. I held my breath and hung up on the phone just staring at his shoes, not moving a single bit from when he shut the door. I heard the main bathroom door open again and I immediately ran out the stall, out the door and straight to outside the club without slowing down once. I was terrified. Just so happens my sister was close to where I came out trying to call me to ask if I was ready to leave. I told her we needed to get back as soon as possible. We got back to the room safely and I told her everything that happened. She suggested calling the police but I was just ready to drop it. We changed up her flight and the next night flew back home. Home. I searched for a few years pretty actively online for arrest in the area to see if he would ever come up. He never did. After a few years, I moved on mentally and got over it for the most part. I don't know who this guy was, if he was trying to say things to scare me, or if he was serious. This story begins when I was in 4th grade, so I was about 9, as I was a bit young for my grade. Because of me being younger than the other kids, I didn't get along with them very well. So whenever we would go out to recess, I would make sure to bring whatever book I was reading at the time. I had my own special place I liked to sit and read. It was a little corner of the playground where barely anybody went. It was a large patch of clovers and other overgrown plants and had a large bush with a gap between it and the fence. I used to love to sit there. One day, I went over to my normal spot and sat with my back facing the bush. I had been reading for a while when I thought I heard a rustling sound behind me. Sometimes squirrels and chipmunks would hang out in the gap between the bush and the fence so I didn't think much of it. That was until I heard heavy breathing and something tugging on my hair. Surprised, I whipped my head around thinking my hair had gotten caught on a branch or something. But instead, there was a boy. He was sitting hunched in the gap between the fence and the bush, leaning forward between the branches with his face mostly obscured by leaves and his arm outstretched, trying to grab at my hair. I screamed and bolted for the picnic table area where the supervising teachers were. I was very shy back then, so I didn't say anything. Instead, for a long time after that, I sat and read by the teachers during recess. About three quarters of the way through the school year, I made a friend who we'll call Matt. Matt was also a bit of an outcast, and when we got assigned to be in a reading group together, we became fast friends. He was nice enough, but even my nine-year-old self could tell that there was something off about him. He was way too clingy, barely ever leaving my side and constantly coming up with excuses to touch me. I of course didn't have any other friends then, so I ignored it. However, one day he told me that he liked me. I had no idea how to react to this and just said nothing. He apparently took my silence as a yes because he called my home phone later that night. My mom handed me the phone, saying that a friend was asking to talk to me. Since my parents were watching TV downstairs, I decided to go up to my room so I wouldn't bother them. It was Matt. I could barely even say hello before he started saying some seriously weird stuff. He started saying things like, 
like, what do you want to name our kids? When we get to high school, let's run away and start a family. I bet you look really cute when you're asleep. Now, this would be creepy for anyone, but I was nine. I had no idea how to handle the situation, so I just stayed away from him. He was not happy about this, constantly glaring at me and just being all around super creepy. A year later, I was halfway through fifth grade and had a serious bully problem, but that's a story for another day. It got so bad that my dad decided one day to not wait until the next school year and instead switch schools the following Monday. Fifth grade at my new school was great, and starting in sixth grade, my parents got me my first phone. Of course, I called up Clara, who became my friend after the Matt incident, and let her know about my new phone. A couple more months passed, and one night, I got a call from an unknown number. Picking up the phone, I froze when I heard Matt's voice. I still vividly remember what he said. Hey, I missed you so much. Why'd you leave me? Not even a second after he said that, I hung up, blocked his number, and called up Clara as she was the only person at my old school who had my number. Apparently, after school, he had asked to see her phone to call his mom, as he had forgotten his at home. She handed it over to him as she was a very kind but quite gullible girl. Soon, she noticed that he was taking a while and that he had a pen out and was writing something on his arm. She yanked her phone away and he panicked, sprinting off. Looking down at her phone, she saw that he had opened up my contact info. I was freaked out but felt safe as I had blocked his number. That didn't stop him though. He would call me every single week from a different phone, leaving at least 10 messages every time. Every time I would block one number, he'd send a call from another one. When I got a new phone, the call stopped and I forgot about it until freshman year. At my high school, there were a couple of kids from my old school, and I suddenly remembered Matt. I asked one of the boys, Harry, if he knew what happened to Matt. According to Harry, he got expelled. Teachers had caught him smelling and touching girls' hairs, touching female students, and trying to sneak into the girls' locker room. The realization hit me like a semi-truck. Smelling and touching girls' hair. It was Matt from all of those years ago when I was reading at that tree. I'm a 24 year old woman and I once worked at a pharmacy store for about a year as a cashier. I had many weird encounters because people were sometimes behind in their medication doses when they came in to pick them up, mostly harmless. The shifts were usually just one cashier and a supervisor, with the supervisor in the back of the store and the cashier alone up front. This happened close to Halloween at about 9am on a sunny, innocent day. I was just chilling at the cash register waiting for customers when a man came in and stood in the aisle across from the register and just stared at me for a good five minutes. I didn't realize that's actually what he was doing until he made eye contact and he didn't look away. He was tall and reminded me of Tyler Labini's character in Tucker and Dale vs. Evil, just not the least bit charming. I immediately called my supervisor up front over the loudspeaker and the guy walked down the aisle towards the pharmacy. When my supervisor appeared, I told her what happened. She downplayed it, didn't look for him, and said just to call her if he did anything. Comforting. When she was gone, the man made a loop around the store and came right to my register with a bag of Halloween candy and nothing else. I tried ringing him up quickly, but he started asking me ridiculous questions about our savings card program and insisting he sign up. I slid him a pamphlet to fill out his information because I did not want to speak to him more than I had to. He just stood there holding the pen and staring at me, then suddenly asked if I knew how trick-or-treating originated. I didn't have time to answer him before he started describing how, back in the day, the men that ruled the country would go house to house every year on Halloween and demand the daughters of every age to be handed over so they could, you know. That was trick-or-treating in his mind. As soon as I heard that, I said, get away from me, and walked to the other register and called my supervisor loudly over the speaker because he was blocking my way to the back. He didn't flinch as he followed me to the next register and started talking about how all women are bad and are meant to serve men. He noted my wedding ring and said my husband could also rent me out because it was his right end on and on. I was considering jumping the side of the register to put some distance between us so I could run. Luckily, the male pharmacist heard the panic in my voice and rushed over to the front of the store. He saw the man and shouted, Jake, get out of here. The man, Jake, just stared at him as he calmly walked out and it was so scary and stupid at the same time. Turns out that Jake had been a regular customer until he stopped picking up his medication. Instead, he would just come in and harass female workers and he'd been on a police enforced ban for over a year. My savior Mr. Pharmacist called the police and the store manager to cuss her out for still scheduling girls alone after everything Jake did in the past, such as ripping a toilet seat off of one of our toilets and threatened to beat a girl with it who used to work there. I quickly transferred to a different location because I just could not get over it and the manager kept scheduling us alone. The police only watched the store for a week. 
I'm going to tell you the story of a terrifying old creep that had stalked me since I was 16 years old. I'm currently 20 years old. I worked in a restaurant which was inside a bigger shopping center. My stalker, an old man named Eric, worked for the actual shopping center itself and not a store inside it like me. I had one other friend at my job who was my age and her name was Jessica. Jessica had worked there for longer than I had and one day she asked if I heard of this guy who worked in the shopping center called Eric. Jessica described Eric as very strange she didn't describe him as frightening or unsettling, or even someone to be afraid of, just as a very eccentric man. Jessica has also told me that Eric had brought her a present on Valentine's Day, chocolate. Anyone would think this was friendly behavior or harmless flirting. If he wasn't a 50-something year old man bringing chocolates to a 16 year old girl he barely knew, I began to see for myself that Eric wasn't just an innocent old man with a slight crush. He had other intentions. The first time I remember Eric approaching me was when I was filling up a machine near the entrance of my work. This machine was out of the view of all the other employees and the restaurant was empty. Eric wasn't supposed to enter my place of work when he was working at the shopping center, so he had deliberately gone out of his way to come and speak to me. To describe his appearance, he had gray hair with bald patches and had beady little eyes which he never adverted from yours. Eric must have sneaked up on me as I looked up and he was standing right next to me, a little too close. My name is Lucy. Eric asked me, Lucy, are you married? He almost laughed after he asked me this. He had a smirk on his face. Eric liked to ask me questions that he already knew the answer to, just to see my reaction. I began to clock on to the fact that Eric had been going a little further than just approaching me at work, and instead stalking my social media accounts in the weeks following this first encounter, such as Twitter and Instagram, when he began asking me very specific questions about things I had posted about in the days before. For example, I had posted on Instagram about a tattoo I got, which was in homage to my favorite band. I was serving a customer one day, only to be in interrupted by a shrill but quiet voice. It was Eric. His eyes were huge and he had a look of pure excitement and menace on his face. He had yet again entered my workplace when he wasn't supposed to, just to talk to me. He asked me, Lucy, what's your favorite insert band here song? I felt creeped out. The tattoo I had gotten was covered by my work uniform, so the only way he could have seen it was going through my Instagram page. I forced myself to forget all about it and carried on working. Over the course of a few months, Eric would come into my workplace more and more frequently, asking me bizarre questions questions and still reciting back to me things that I had tweeted about or posted on Instagram. Every time I would see him, I would get visibly uncomfortable and he liked it when I got uncomfortable. All while this was happening, Jessica approached me and let me know that Eric had followed her in his car on her walk home from work, slowing down to ask her where she lived. I had also been told other disturbing news about Eric from multiple different people. It seemed as if he was becoming more invested in whatever his intentions were towards me and Jessica. News had traveled to one of my managers about Eric's unsettling actions towards me and this manager informed me that a few years ago, Eric was rumored to have followed a young girl who used to work for our restaurant into a toilet. Things didn't quite make sense to me. He was known for being a creep yet still employed at the shopping center. On one hand, I was glad to know I wasn't just creeped out for no reason, but on the other hand, I was frightened as he'd been doing this for years yet no one had stopped him. There was a woman who worked at the same place as me called Rebecca, and she had some sort of disability which caused her to befriend and be trusting to people without knowing anything about them. It seems that Eric took advantage of her, as he had asked for her phone number and she gave it to him. Rebecca had shown me her text with Eric. He had texted her things like, Rebecca, are you alone? And Rebecca, are you sat on the bus alone? But the most unsettling part of it all was the text from Eric that read, Rebecca, could you please let me know any information on the girls that work at, insert restaurant name here. I was stunned. I was constantly questioning why this old man was so bent on finding out everything I do in my life. He had gone out of his way to source information about me me through a vulnerable person I worked with, and I was scared he was going to go further. One night, I was watching the movie Grease with my family, and I tweeted something stupid like, Grease is my favorite film, because it's a great film, right? Anyways, the morning after my tweet, Eric approaches me in his usual way and utters, Do you like the film Grease, Lucy? The same usual smirk lit up on his face. I tried to carry on with my day, but spent the entirety of my shift feeling a little shaken up. The very second I clocked out of work and got into my car, my phone went off. This was a notification for PayPal. I clicked on this notification to see that I had received three pounds from an Eric, and the note attached to it read, To Lucy, Grease is the word from Eric. He literally found my PayPal and sent three pounds to it and quoted the movie Grease. If this wasn't crazy enough, in the days following, I received a string of anonymous and incessant calls, one after the other. My phone rang all night, I had to turn it off to get away. Even when I turned my phone back on, the calls continued. The phone calls that I did answer were just someone breathing down the phone, 
making a point to breathe heavy. I had no proof that this was Eric, but it wasn't hard to put two and two together after all the links he had gone to in order to track down my personal information. If he had found out my PayPal address, my phone number, and all of my social media accounts, what was stopping him from finding out where I live, breaking in, hurting me or my family? I reported Eric to my managers and they passed my complaint on to the managers of the shopping center. At this point, I was genuinely scared for my safety. Multiple girls added to my statement and added details of times they witnessed Eric's unsettling behavior of times he had been inappropriate with them too. Eric had been cautioned by the shopping center's management yet nothing was done, except the fact that he was warned not to talk to me. Eric found ways around the no talking to Lucy rule. He would make animal noises at me when he would see me, like a monkey or a dog or any bizarre noise that would get my attention. I think he just wanted me to think that he outsmarted me and found a way around the rules. After this, I stopped working at the restaurant as a full-time job and saw Eric less and less, which was obviously great for me. I moved cities as I went away for university and made new friends which distracted me from my old life in my hometown. After moving away and starting my new life, I forgot about Eric. I was soon going to remember though. On Christmas Day, I was back home in my hometown with my parents. My phone buzzed with a notification. I received a notification from PayPal and it was the exact amount of three pounds, only not from Eric this time, but from a girl whose name I didn't recognize at all. I opened up the PayPal app only to see a note attached to this payment I had received. The note read, sending on behalf of Eric. I had forgotten all about Eric and now he was antagonizing me through other people. I threw my phone down on the couch and spent the night drinking with my family, until I forgot about the notification. I since haven't seen or heard anything from him and I wanted to stay that way. I'm not sure if he still works at the shopping center, but I don't go there anymore so I don't have to find out. So this was back in 2011. There were four girls living in the house, including myself. Parents' place and I would sublet rooms. First girl was a child friend who moved in to get away from an abusive ex. Second girl applied via online ad and was normal enough except for telling everyone her daughter was actually her niece. Party girl. Third girl was a run-of-the-mill insurance claim processor and quiet type who kept to herself and usually declined any invitation from the rest of us when going out or socializing. Quiet girl. So party girl and I buy tickets to go to a concert at a town. Childhood friend can't get the time off of work and opts to stay behind as does Quiet Girl. No surprise there. So Party Girl and I leave on our trip and spend the night dancing away. Meanwhile, childhood friend comes home from work to find Quiet Girl sitting in the shower screaming slash crying with the bathroom door wide open. She asks if she's okay and calms her down. Quiet Girl says she wanted to make dinner for all of us and Party Girl and I have ruined her cosmic plans. Childhood friend sees spoiled chicken breasts in the sink and thinks, oh she just wanted to do something nice and offers to go out to dinner together as party girl and I will be back tomorrow night and we can all do dinner then. While at the all-you-can-eat Chinese food restaurant, childhood friend notices quiet girl is stuffing her purse with food. This is odd. She's not wrapping it in napkins, just shoving it in there. When they get home, quiet girl started talking all this crazy stuff that made no sense and childhood friend gets a little nervous and goes to bed early, locks herself in her room and nopes out for the night. When party girl and I get home the next afternoon, we notice a few things. Childhood friend is already at work, but quiet girl is sitting on the living room couch completely naked and has covered her body in the stuffed animals that belong to the rest of us. Rotten chicken is still in the sink and smells strongly of bleach and other chemicals. Knives are laying around it. Pictures have been removed from the walls. I go to my room and see all the pictures of my dad have been piled up in the middle of my bed. I ask Quiet Girl about this and she explains I need to be reunited with my father. He died in 2003. Party Girl emerges from her room wondering why her underwear is piled up in the middle of her bed and several other possessions have gone missing. Quiet Girl says she needed them for the ritual and explains we can find what we are looking for in the backyard. We find the charred remains of our things in the smoldering fire pit. We are both angry at this point and demand she explain this behavior. This is where she goes full crazy and explains that her souls are all linked and only through death can our bonds be truly realized. She explains that her and my cat are one soul and that he has been telling her about all of our sins and bad behavior. Also that it's actually her cat. She then full on threatens to end our lives as soon as the last member, childhood friend, has arrived. I grab the largest knife I own while party girl and I barricade ourselves in my room in the basement. She calls childhood friend telling her not to come home as it isn't safe and I call 911 as my life has been officially threatened by someone who has clearly lost her grip on all reality. Cops arrive within minutes and ask quiet girl her name. At this point she just starts screaming her first, middle, and last name repeatedly. Over and over again. Will not stop. My cat is trying to sneak out the front door and I ask one of the officers to grab him. She begins to scream that it is her cat and not to touch him. I 
am in tears and offer to retrieve his adoption papers. I am terrified. I don't know what to do. Party Girl is hiding behind me. Then Quiet Girl loses her mind, jumps up and attacks the officers. It took three of them to pin her down and arrest her. Once she was removed, I wrote up a letter of eviction and we began bagging up her room. That's when we discovered that she was a schizophrenic who was offered schizophrenia medication. Her boyfriend came later that day to collect her things as I had called him to notify him of the situation and he was totally clueless. He accused the rest of us of running a drug ring party house and driving her insane. Not true at all. We changed the front and the back door locks that night and put new locks on each bedroom door as well. She later tried to serve me papers and sue me for wrongful imprisonment. Pretty sure the cops made that call and not me. Nothing ever came of it obviously. I have not had a roommate I wasn't related to since. This happened about two years ago when I was 22. After work, I stopped at a local convenience store to buy beer. The cashier looked familiar, but it's a very small town, population of 6,000. He acted odd. I asked how he was doing to make small talk and he just stared at me. I instantly felt uncomfortable, so I only glanced at him a few times before I left. I arrived home 10 minutes later and decided to browse Facebook. I had a friend request. The guy looked familiar. He was a local, so I accepted him. A few hours later, I realized it was the cashier. He'd got my name off of my ID and added me not even five minutes after I left. I told my boyfriend we agreed it was weird. A few days later he came into my work. I asked my boss. She'd never seen him in there before. He grabbed milk and initiated small talk with me. I felt uncomfortable. He asked if I remembered him, told me his name and that we'd been good friends in high school. We never said two words to each other. I was trying to be polite, told him yes I remembered. After a few minutes my boss pulled me in the office. She was watching through the window and could tell I was uncomfortable. It was a small farm and we were all close. He started coming in every few days. If I wasn't there, he'd ask for me. After a few weeks, my boss would pull me in the office whenever he'd walk in. All the managers were briefed and did the same. That was all they could do until something happened. Then he stopped coming in. We didn't see him for a few weeks. I was relieved and went about my business. I was allowed to carry my cell phone on the floor. My mom was very sick, so if she needed anything, the managers were fine with her calling me. I got a text from a random number shortly after. I asked who it was and they replied, you don't remember? You gave me this number. It's my stalker. I'll call him George. My heart started pounding. I sent a polite, short message back. After I work, I checked to see if my phone number was anywhere on my Facebook. It wasn't. George started messaging me daily, calling me babe. I was freaked out to say the least. My boyfriend was working out of town with limited cell reception, so I couldn't let him know what was going on. A few days later, I got a message from an old classmate I still talk to once in a while. Hey, did George ever get a hold of you? He said there was an emergency and needed to contact you. Is everything alright? I broke down crying, finally acknowledging that yes, I was being stalked. I didn't know if he was violent and he knew where I worked, so I sent him something like, hey, I just wanted to let you know that I have a boyfriend. I didn't want there to be a misunderstanding between us. That's when it got bad. He called me a liar, telling me he doesn't know why my ugly self would even think he was interested in me. No man would be interested in your nasty self. I asked him to leave me alone. The insults got worse. I shut my phone off and tried to ignore him. A few hours later, after calming down, I turned it back on. The last message he sent read, I know where you work. I know where your house is. I could kill you in your house. Try to call the cops on me. I'm in New York right now. Do it. They can't protect you. Obviously not as legible. I could tell he was mad and wrote it in haste. I called a friend and explained. Show showed her the text. She took me down to the police station where I showed them the text. I filed a report and later got a restraining order against him. Turns out he already had two other restraining orders from girls he'd done this to as well. My boyfriend came back a week later and I told him what happened and had to stop him from hunting him down. Last year, he tried getting my number from a friend over Facebook. She blocked him. I haven't seen or heard from him since, thankfully. There have been very few times in my life I've been that scared. For some context, I'm a 32 year old female. This happened to me when I was about 25 or 26. I work full time as a researcher at a university, which is where these encounters took place. I'm not a professor or anything, and because of my age at the time, I could have easily been mistaken for just another student wandering around campus. On some days, when the weather was nice, I would prefer to spend my lunch hour strolling around the university grounds outside, or sitting underneath a shady tree on a bench, enjoying the time I was not sitting in a cramped corner of a lab 
lab. On one of these days, I was sitting on a bench enjoying the fresh air and a male student walking by asked if he could sit next to me. I'm a pretty shy and awkward kind of person, so even though I really would have preferred sitting alone, I said sure. He initiated simple conversation to which I obliged, but being careful not to be too forthcoming. He mentioned he had seen which department building I came and went from, which slightly alarmed me, given I had never seen this person in my life. But I pushed the thought from my mind. After all, the weather had been decent lately, and I had nearly spent all of my lunch hours for the past week outside. He asked if I was studying within the mentioned department, to which I told him I was not a student, but rather I worked there. He told me he was an engineering student and then followed up with asking me out to coffee sometime. I apologized and told him that I had a boyfriend and would have to decline. We parted ways after that, and I assumed I probably wouldn't see him around again. About a week or two went by, and I was spending another lunch hour outside on campus, sitting on a different bench somewhere, seemingly out of nowhere. The same man from before asked if he could sit next to me again. Admittedly, I don't remember what he started talking to me about at first. My mind was reeling and I was rather uncomfortable having to potentially turn this guy down a second time. Sure enough, he asked me again if we could go out for coffee sometime. I apologized and reminded him that I had a boyfriend and I would not be meeting him for coffee. And again, he left after that. I was feeling rather anxious now, but it still hadn't reached a level where I felt I had to be too concerned. A few days later, I had finished work and was leaving the building to walk to where I had parked my car. The university charges a fortune for parking passes, even if you're employed by them, so I had always opted for free street parking in about a 10 minute walk away from campus. My walking route would take me down several quiet residential streets, with minimal car traffic. Even pedestrian traffic was pretty sparse on the busiest of days. It wasn't until I was about halfway to my car, down one of these quiet back streets, that I noticed someone walking directly across the street from me. But keep a few faces behind. I noticed him from my peripheral vision and didn't want to flat out turn around to stare at him. It wasn't uncommon to see someone else by any means, I was just always trying to be aware of my surroundings when walking the streets alone. I had to make a few turns coming up anyways, and the chance that they would be going the same way as me was slim. But he did. He made all the turns I did, still walking on the sidewalk across from me, a few steps behind. I still did not want to look at whoever this was. I didn't want him to know that I was aware of what I thought he was doing. I quickened my pace to a speed walk. I was approaching the first of two busier streets before I would reach my car. His pace quickened to keep up with me. That was the moment I panicked, the moment I was sure that he was indeed following me. After that, I started a full out jog to cross the first of the busier streets. He ran to keep up behind me and was now on the same side of the street I was. I was now nearly at my car. I had to cross the last busy street and get about 100 meters and I would be there. But it was crossing the street that worried me. I often had to stop and wait a good minute or so before it was clear enough to do so. If this were the case he would catch up with me. As if the stars aligned, as soon as I made it running to the busy street I had a gap to cross. I booked it as fast as I could, finally turning around once I had made it. To look and yell at the man who had been pursuing me, it was him. I could have suspected, but now it was confirmed. It was the engineering student whom I had turned down for coffee. Stop following me. I yelled at him from across the busy street. Can I just talk to you? He yelled back. I didn't even answer him. I mean, the answer should have been obvious from the start, and I was certainly never going to give my time to anyone who had just followed and then chased me for about one kilometer. I keep moving quickly to my car, so determined to get out of there that I didn't even care if he saw which car was mine. He had given up following me and never tried to cross the road too, to my relief. I got home and broke down. I was shook. I had some anxieties walking to and from work after that. It wasn't long before a co-worker and I would walk most of the distance back to our cars together after work. I even changed where I started parking for a time. A few weeks had passed since the incident, and I had not seen him around campus at all. I had started spending my lunches in the lab instead of outside, but occasionally I would go to the student center to buy lunch instead. This one particular day, the food court in the student center was packed, almost shoulder to shoulder. I was standing in line at a burger stall and I heard a guy try and get someone's attention through the crowd. I look up and it's him again, waving to me and trying to make his way through the people. I panicked and even though I'm terribly shy, I started a scene and yelled to him to leave me alone. His face dropped instantly as people stared at us and he slinked back into the sea of students. My heart was pounding and I was shaking. I don't even remember if I ended up getting food after that. I went back to work and from then on was even more focused on my surroundings than I ever was before. It's been five or six years since then now and I still work at the university. I am so to say that I never saw him again after the food court, and haven't had any other harrowing accounts on campus. I never asked the guy's name, so I couldn't even report an incident to campus police or anything. All in all, I'm just glad I never saw him again, and I can only hope he never did this to any other girl before or after me.
When I was in my early 20s, I moved to Southern California with my aunt. Once I had a job established and steady income, I found an apartment that was super affordable at $350 a month, plus utilities, the first red flag because California is not cheap. The other residents in the apartment was a 45 year old male named Zach and a 45 year old female named Tina. They weren't a couple. Tina was a little difficult to deal with, very OCD on a lot of things and we mostly avoided each other. But this story is about Zach and his friend Mike, also 45 years old. Mike and Zach were childhood friends and Mike lived in the same apartment complex as us. So he was over a lot. Every time I would come home from work, they would be polishing off a handle of vodka and then would go out. I wasn't super comfortable in the living situation but it was cheap. and. I was in school and I tried to make the best of it. I got along with Zach for the most part if it was just him around, but Mike was just a time bomb. Here are just a few instances that just gradually got worse over time. The first incident. Zach invited me out with Mike and another friend of theirs out to a local bar a couple miles away. I was comfortable around Zach and I got into the passenger side of the truck. I didn't have any negative interactions with anyone until this point. Mike went ballistic in our complex parking lot about how I was selfish and had no business in the front seat because I wasn't Zach's girlfriend etc. It was weird because a man the same age as my dad was throwing a tantrum over the passenger seat, so I just got out and went back to my apartment. My first rent check bounced. I apologized to Zach and discovered that my checks had misprinted the account number. I paid in cash and paid off the bounce check fee and thought all was okay, until I got home one evening and Mike was over as normal, but starts interrogating me on why I couldn't pay my rent. I was only 22 at the time and didn't really want issues, so I was just like, hey, I apologized and took care of it. Even though Mike didn't live in the apartment. He would not let this go. He would just scream at me saying I was lazy, that I should be evicted and on and on. It's also important to note that Mike and Zach both had two DUIs. Zach was a school teacher and ended up being let go because of the DUIs. However, both men continued to drink excessively all the time. I also had to have a key made for the lock on my bedroom door because it would get violent a lot and that was my safety net. A lot of other instances happened, but this one takes the cake and is the point to the story. Zach and Mike had gone out and took an Uber to whatever local bar. I had gotten home and went straight to my room as always. I hear the front door swing open and Mike was pissed drunk screaming his head off about how he lost his new iPhone. This guy starts beating on my bedroom door demanding to be let in because he knew I had his phone. I cracked my door open and he had stepped away from the door with his fist balled up like he was going to hit me. I told him I didn't have the phone. Mike circles back to the one time months prior at this point that my rent check bounced and I obviously need money. He demands that he come into my room and tear my room apart looking for said phone. I told him absolutely not and shut slash locked the door. Mike started banging on my door and trying to unlock it, threatening my life, saying he was going to kill me and lots of other gross and scary things. I was told if I called the police that he would beat me to a bloody pulp. This was especially scary because my aunt was my only family nearby and she wasn't really helpful. She just told me to be an adult and deal with it. Other than that, I didn't really have a support system. I told Zach a couple of days later that I would be moving out immediately and would not be paying rent for that month. Then, out of Zach's dark bedroom, Mike just pops up with a smile saying bye, almost taunting. I hurried into my room and locked the door. I could hear Zach blaming Mike for me moving out and Mike continued to just call me names and asking how I had the money to move out. The iPhone was found for anyone who's curious. It had fallen out of his pocket in the Uber he was in, but obviously the first step to finding the iPhone was to flip out on me versus calling the Uber driver. This was almost a decade ago and I don't know what happened to that pair. About two years ago, I worked at a movie store inside a mall. I was 20 at the time. This guy was over 6 foot, late 40s, very hefty, and always had this weird zombified expression on his face. He came in about once a week. One of my coworkers had even warned me about him, how he was a little off, but I still treated him with as much respect as I did everyone else. One day, he came in and we talked for a bit, but it got a little awkward and I kept trying to end the conversation and looked busy by tagging items behind the counter. He stood there in silence watching me for about 20 minutes and finally left. A few days later, he comes back in and walks up to me, holding a large container. He says, I made four pounds of enchiladas at home today, just for you. I remembered you like Mexican food. I don't remember at all telling him that I liked it, but I do know that I went to the Mexican restaurant across the way every lunch break. I just politely accepted it and put it in the back office. Another few days later, he came back in and had a drawing for me of a dragon. Now, I love dragons, but I never told him that. This drawing looked like it took 
took hours to make, and at this point I was a little freaked out. I had him leave it on the counter so I could just throw it away later. Later on, I was given about a week vacation. During that week I had cut my hair about 12 inches. The day I came back, I got a shift with my manager. I told her all about the guy and immediately she was weirded out for me. A few minutes later, I see the dude walking around in the mall. He was going towards the exit and didn't look at me once. My manager tells me to go back to the office. I go and wait until she comes to get to me and when she does, she tells me I need to make a report to mall security immediately. Apparently when I ran back there, he turned around to come in and walked all throughout the store. When she asked him if he needed help with something, he said, I can't believe she cut her hair and briskly walked out. I go to the mall security office to make a report and we went through all the videos from the cameras of when the guy came to visit me, but there was one video that really stood out. The video shows him pull into the parking lot of the mall and about three minutes later I arrive. This was really early in the morning and no customers were here yet, but there were cars in the lot. I didn't notice him at all. It shows me walking through the entrance and him following me. Right as I open the entrance door, the man starts sprinting towards me. I walked inside just in time. It shows him stop and just stand in front of the door, watching me through the glass walk a little further away. He begins walking normally inside the mall. I never noticed him behind me. That part really screwed me up. The video gave the security every reason to ban him from the mall and they did. They later told me they gave him a background check and he had four counts of stalking with restraining orders from different girls on his person and was on probation. If you're liking this video, all I ask is that you make sure to subscribe to my channel and like this video. Thank you. When I was like 13 years old, probably close to 12 years ago, I went trick or treating with some friends from school. We were the type to bring pillowcases and get as much as we could, then weigh at the end of the night. We've been all over the neighborhood. We lived in a suburban area, but we were quick. We were able to get most of the houses before lights started turning off, and we all had a hefty turnout of candy. Trick or treating was starting to calm down by this point. The time must have been around 9:30 or 10, maybe. There was this one house with the lights off, but we still walked up anyway because they were a couple cars parked outside. We rang the doorbell and nothing, so we rang a few times, still nothing. I'm not defending what we did at all, we were seriously stupid kids back then. One of us starts banging on the door and talking bad like, we're gonna egg your house and so on. Right after that, this man jumps out of the door and basically slams it open. We all jump back startled, it was pitch black inside his house. Where were the other people? There were two cars right in front of his house. He had to be late 20s or early 30s with a scruffy beard, wearing a white beater and black zip up hoodie and had this look of total rage in his eyes. He comes out with this huge dog on a leash that starts barking, growling, and showing his teeth in our face. I couldn't really make it out at the time, but it appeared as though he had a knife in his other hand as well. We're terrified because we didn't expect this. He just busts out the front door and starts chasing us down and we start sprinting away in total fear. He's screaming things like, I'm gonna kill you, and you shouldn't have screwed with me, or better hope my dog doesn't catch you, or get back over here. He ran after us for probably 10-ish minutes. The whole time he was just frantically waving his arm with a knife, shouting mostly incoherently with his dog by his side on that leash. It was horrifying. We got away thankfully, somehow managed to lose him after running for a while, but I can't imagine what would have happened if we stayed there for any longer. I'd probably be chow for his dog, but thankfully we were all pretty healthy kids so we could outrun him. I'm honestly surprised that nobody else was really around to see this maniac chasing us in the middle of the streets. I knew it was later at night, but still. We had to beeline back to my place looking over over our shoulders the whole time because we didn't notice when we lost him and we didn't see him walk back towards his house. He was just gone after we turned a few corners. Now I understand it would be frustrating for some kids to be at your door being annoying like that, but what gets me is that the reaction from this guy didn't really seem appropriate. I would have just opened the door and told the kids to screw off or threatened to call the cops or something like that. We went back to my parents house and played Smash Bros on the Wii all night and ate a bunch of candy. We managed to hold onto our pillowcases of candy the whole way home. My friends started crying after we got back. We locked all the doors and windows obviously. We were pretty sure he wasn't around when we went into my house so it seemed safe. That guy's house was right in front of the middle school I went to and I had to walk right by his house to get to school every day. So fearing for my safety, I told my dad. We went back to that house the next day to knock on the door. In hindsight, we probably should have called the cops and let them handle it, but my dad is a confrontational no BS type of guy. So we went over and knocked on the door. This time there were three cars in front of the house. This mother opens the door and we could see inside their kids watching TV. When we told her what happened, her face went pale and she immediately rounded up her family and got 
got them outside, fearing this crazy person might still be in her house. She told us that her family went out to another friend's house in the city next to ours for Halloween that night to do all their trick-or-treating. They didn't get home until the next morning because they stayed the night there. It was at that point that cops were called to search the house while we all stood outside. They didn't find anything though, no trace of him turned up. He must have been long gone by then. It turned out that the guy was able to get into their house because there was a window unlocked in the daughter's room on the bottom floor near the front door. Luckily, nobody was in the house that night. The only notable thing the woman could tell the police was that she noticed a car with dark windows parked down the street for a while but didn't think anything of it. He must have been posted up in there with his dog scoping out houses and noticed this whole family get in a car and leave and figured that would be a good opportunity to make his move. So who was this guy? Nothing was stolen from the house, and nothing looked ransacked or the family obviously would have noticed. The family said the front door was still locked when they got back too, so he must have locked it again and went out through that same window to cover his tracks. I'm pretty sure this was before those ring doorbell cameras were popular and I don't think they had any security cameras set up either. I'm not sure to be honest, maybe he was just a drug addict and didn't have a reason for any of it. His eyes did seem pretty crazy and wide open, like he was strung out on something. This happened to me a few years back. I was living on my own in the city and was unemployed at the time, usually out looking for work and trying to stay busy. One early afternoon, I was heading back to my neighborhood after running some errands downtown and boarded a tram that would take me almost all the way home. There was a park that I would have to cross between the stop and my home, but crossing it would only take a few minutes. So I boarded the tram, which was mostly empty. Besides me, there was one younger man in the second carriage and the driver up front in the first. I find an empty two seater, the rows are quite narrow but I'm comfortable. I put my earbuds in and look out the window as we start moving out of downtown and towards home. We pass a couple of stops and don't pick up any new passengers. There had probably been a tram right in front of us who took all the people, so it was particularly empty compared to normal. At the third stop, the doors behind me open, but I don't pay much attention until a stocky man, average height, probably in his 50s with neat, short hair and inconspicuous clothes suddenly sits down on the next seat next to me. The rows are very narrow. This guy is basically trapping me. I can't get past him without his cooperation. He greets me with a huge smile and says hi as he sits down. On this particular day, being down about not finding work and it being broad daylight, I decide I do not want to play along. I just want to listen to my music and I don't like this man's vibe. I tell him I'm not in the mood to talk and he needs to go sit somewhere else. Wrong answer. That man goes from 0 to 100 in 0 0.2 seconds and his face contorts with rage as he starts yelling at me from the top of his lungs. I wish there was an exaggeration but unfortunately it isn't. He was loud. You are a terrible person. You don't clean yourself. You stink of sweat. I didn't. He did. He goes on and on about what an abomination of a person I am and I have sort of a freeze reaction. Inside I am getting very scared. I start looking for a way out but I'm trapped. I look over to the young man hoping he will come to my rescue. I can tell he's hoping to stay out of it but after I've been screamed at for maybe two whole minutes he finally says meekly you better calm down which of course doesn't help. So he just gives up and goes back to whatever he was doing, probably looking at his phone. I am hoping that the driver might react as he has a clear view to the back of the tram and there's no way he's not hearing what's going on, but again, nothing. The stocky man, maybe frustrated that I'm not reacting to his insults, escalates the abuse and starts screaming that he's going to kill me. At this point, I have to do something and unconsciously probably decide that the only way is through. I'm so done with the situation, so before I even realize what I'm doing, I just get up and push past him. It's all survival instinct. Scared that he's going to follow me, I move quickly towards the front of the tram. He gets up and follows me, all red-faced, shouting how he knows where I live and that I need to clean myself behind my ears, that I stink and that he's going to kill me. Again, the driver does nothing. As we pull up to the next stop, which is the stop before mine, I wait until the very last minute before I ask the driver to let me out the front door, which he does. I slip out quickly in hope of escaping without being followed. I don't dare taking the time to look over my shoulder. I just hurry down the steps and away from the stop. I am so scared. Only when the tram has left the station do I take a second to look around me and he's not there. A brief sense of relief washes over me before I start worrying that he's going to get off at the next stop, which is normally my stop, and that he will be waiting for me there. It should have come as no surprise that I do not want this guy to follow me through the park or know where I live, so I spend a good hour just walking around, trying to get my nervous system out of panic mode and staying close to shops where there are other people around before I finally make my own way home.
This happened when I was 21 years old, and I am fully aware I made a lot of poor decisions in my younger days. I am very lucky to have survived, and here's one of my stories. I have just met with a cousin at the mall I hadn't seen in a long time. At this point, I had been living in South America for about a year and had started feeling overly confident. I have been told many times about the dangers of taking a taxi from the street. Some people always take them, and some people never do. It's obviously never worth the risk, but I look obviously foreign, and I should have known better. My cousin says, I I always take street taxis, I'll find us a good cheap one. This was my first time ever taking a street taxi. She finds one and waves me over, looking back, I am flabbergasted as to how I got into an all black car. Again, these cars could just be normal taxis, they exist, but it's even more riskier than taking the yellow ones. The first red flag was how silent he is. After chatting away for some time, we realized it was taking far too long. I could see the smile in my cousin's eyes fade as we both realized at the same time that we are nowhere near home. She asks him, where are we going? and he mumbles under his breath, not really saying anything. We both know at the same time that something is very wrong. I remember vaguely thinking we had just went into a circle and wondering why he'd waited so long to rob us. It had to have been over 30 minutes. He finally gets off a highway and stops the car just past the ramp and we are on a very quiet street. He opens his dashboard and pulls out a gun. I'm terrified to say the least, in that moment, all you think about is surviving. A car drives by and he yells, don't turn your head. He then tells us to give him everything we have. I take off my backpack and even my jacket out of panic. He orders us to hand over our phones, which we oblige. He then says, I will let you go, but if you turn around to look at my license plate, I will come and kill you. He lets us out of the car and we run for it, but we are in a very, very bad area. I'm dressed inappropriately for the area, especially after handing over my jacket. A foreigner wouldn't dare come here. Everyone on the streets was staring at me up and down and one man yells, aren't you going to get cold? I tried to cover myself with my hands as I felt so unsafe. We ask a couple of people to try and contact for help, but what do you know? They have no more minutes on their phone. In South America, it can be very dangerous and very poor. We find no police, but we do find security patrol people. They take us back to their office to contact the police, only for them to tell us we have no data and the phones are broken. So my cousin and I keep walking. It's the middle of the night and we are again in some obscure area. An hour must have passed by now. Then we see a police car and we are running for it. We tell them we had just been robbed and they ask, did you get a license plate number? I reply, no. The police officers shrug and say, he's probably at the club now celebrating all the money he made and proceeded to laugh. I then asked to use their phone to have someone come pick us up to which he says, hurry up, I don't have much data. We get home, but I find out that the person who robbed us used my cousin's phone to contact her family. Luckily, she was already with her parents at the time when they called, but there was a woman in the background crying hysterically, faking to be my cousin and they were trying to get a ransom from her parents. He was never found and nothing was done. I wonder what would have happened if it had just been one of us, and I am grateful that nothing more sinister happened. A week later, my friend and I are ordering a taxi, the safe way of course. While we are waiting, a similar black car pulls up next to us, asking if we need a taxi. We immediately say no. As he drives off, I turn to look at his car, and what do you know, he has no license plate in broad daylight. I'm not insinuating it was the same person. Of course it wasn't, there are over 10 million people in the city. My point is that it happens a lot in South America and never to get too comfortable. This experience made me realize what it's really like to live in a developing country, even if you have money and stay in good areas. You always need to be high alert and no one is immune to the constant fear of Will I be robbed today? Brief setting and context, I'm a woman in my 30s, caring for my elderly parents, so staying in a downstairs room in my childhood home at the moment. The window faces the main street, which is an average residential street in a fairly quiet area. The bed faces the window. I often leave the window open at night since I need it to be cool to sleep, and I haven't really worried about it, since there's a cabinet with an aquarium in front of the window area, not blocking the window from view, and I can reach to open and close it, but it would make it difficult for someone to climb in. My dog, Sable, also always sleeps in the room with me. While she's a sweet-natured, medium-sized dog who doesn't look the least bit threatening, she's a fantastic guard dog in that she's always alert to any noises and will stand her ground and bark and growl if she senses a threat. So I've never really worried about the open window. After tonight, I won't be able to do it again. It started at maybe 3.30, 4 a.m. sometime. I was awake. Since I care for my parents, I often have disrupted sleep patterns and I'm awake at odd hours 
hours. I was reading a book and heard Sable growl, low and deep. Then she jumped off the bed and began pacing a bit, looking up at the window before jumping up at the cabinet by the window, barking. I shouted, hey, we're calling the police, my dog will bite, just in case there was someone there, and went to look out of the curtains to the side. I didn't see anything. I pulled the curtains closed again and made sure to pull the right curtain over, then drew the left side curtain, the one that covers the open part of the window, all the way over, covering the right side curtain too, tucking it down so any wind wouldn't be able to move it. I wasn't really alarmed then. It's a fairly quiet residential street, but there are foxes around that we sometimes hear, and occasionally someone passing by or the neighbor's gate next door will make Sable growl or bark, but she doesn't usually react the way she did this time. She'll usually growl but stay on the bed, and her reaction was much stronger than normal. I thought that even if it was someone scoping out the open window to potentially break in, they'd see now that the room was occupied by a person and dog, and would go find an easier target, but mainly I guess it was just a random noise that she heard outside. I was wrong. It was a good half hour or more later after I'd relaxed and thought I might doze off soon. Then I heard her growl again, a really serious deep and low growl, and I listened, again, thinking it might be foxes or something. But I heard what sounded like deep breathing noises. I sat up and looked up at the window and my heart stopped. The curtain had been pulled back and lifted at the bottom, like someone peeking under it, and I could still hear the heavy breathing. I shouted hey, again, and moved from the bed to the side of the window, so I could see past the curtain, and saw the figure of a man move away from the window to the right towards the front door and the exit of the front garden. Too dark to make out features or clothing, it was just a dark male figure. Shaking, I immediately thought that since I knew he'd moved away and wasn't at or under the window, I reached and pulled it shut, grabbed my phone, and called 911. One thing that creeps me out in hindsight is that it would have taken a few seconds for me to move from the bed to the side of the window, and that was after I'd shouted and he knew he'd been seen. But he must have stayed there even knowing I'd seen him, until I moved the curtain and could see out. Then he moved away. The heavy breathing also had to be deliberate. It was so loud, like someone trying to frighten me. While on the phone with the police, I went around the ground floor of the house turning lights on, making sure the rest of the house was still secure, and it was. Very careful to lock doors and all the other windows at night and everything looked undisturbed. Two patrol officers came shortly before 5am and took the report. They suggested asking the neighbors if they have camera footage and to let them know of a potential prowler in the area tomorrow, and they went to drive around the area, saying that they'd be wanting to know what someone was doing wandering around at 5am, the time the police arrived anyway. Since the dark meant I only saw the shape of a person, no real description, I doubt they can do much. I couldn't even be 100% certain it was a man, but the breathing and the figure I saw instantly made me think male. The outline of his head looked smooth, so either bald or wearing a tight cap, and height would have been probably around 5'8 to 5'10. I'm still shaken, but feeling angry and violated, and wishing we had a camera system now. We'll be looking into that. I never thought anything like that would happen. Don't have any enemies, no recent exes, no one I know of harboring any grudges, since I'm caring for my parents full time now. I'm not out socializing or making any enemies, nor are my elderly and disabled parents. I have to think it was someone who was looking to break into a house, but for the fact that they came back so much later, maybe someone on drugs or having a mental health episode. There's a passage around the side of the house to go from the front to the back of the garden with only a small side gate, meant to keep the dog confined, not designed to keep others out. It would be easy for someone to access against the back of the house. They were bold enough to come back a second time, even knowing a person and a dog were in the room, perhaps hoping I would have fallen asleep by then maybe. This happened a few weeks ago. I work at a gas station and have years of experience in a previous one, so getting this job was a piece of cake. Only this was different as it was lone working. Working 8 hour shifts entirely by yourself. The shifts included night as well. So my shift started early afternoon, about maybe half an hour to my shift this guy walks in. I've seen him before as he entered the shop the day before and randomly asked me if I had any shopping bags to spare. The guy was giving me some uncomfortable vibes but luckily someone else was working with me that day for a short while so I asked them to deal with that guy. My colleague said we don't have anything to spare you and told him bye, the guy leaves. The next day the same guy walks in and I thought, what does he want now? He walks up to the desk and starts chatting to me. He was asking me some advice about his living situation as he told me he used to be homeless. Since to me it's not really my place to give advice, I just shrugged and told him to just sleep on it and think about things. He then left. He didn't enter the store to buy anything at all, just a chat but thinking 
Looking back, I remember that he asked what time I got off and stupidly told him 11 o'clock tonight. I went on with my shift as usual up until about 9.30 p.m. as the same guy returns but with another guy who may I say looked dodgy, all dressed in black and hood up. The guy who entered the shop previously pokes his head into the door and asked if I do phone top ups. We do but something in my gut was telling me to make him leave now, so I lied and told him we do not. So the guy and his dodgy friend hang outside the store for a bit while I was serving customers then until the shop seemed quiet again they both entered the store and looked all around the shop. I noticed the dodgy guy kept his hands in his pockets the whole time and then a thought struck me. I might be getting robbed tonight. So I took some deep breaths and tried to keep calm and just thought of my training I repeated in my head. I thought to myself that I should just stand and be ready with one hand under the desk hovering over the panic button. I thought to myself the minute they pull a weapon out on me is when to hit the button as it's silent alarm and just pray the police arrive on time. Well they just ended up buying a bottle of water as of course I did notice there was someone still outside in their car. I felt a huge sigh of relief thinking they just wanted water, or they decided not to rob me because there's another person outside. They both leave the store but again hang around outside, right by the door. Then I see the car drive away and I thought to myself, I don't want these guys in the store again, not while I'm completely alone. So I flip the switch that automatically locks the main door. Half an hour passes, I had no customers and still the two guys are still hanging around outside. I call my boss to tell him what's going on and to give him a heads up that at some point I'm going to have to call the police and have them move them along as it's making me very anxious. Then another guy shows up and joins the guys all dressed in black and wearing those COVID masks. He also hands his friend's mask too then he makes his way around the back of the store. Then I realize the back door, the one I go out from to smoke. I ran to the back door, slammed it shut and locked it. At this point I was scared for my life as these guys stack around the place to which felt like an hour and a half. I hid in the office watching the cameras. I picked up the phone and dialed the non-emergency number for the police. At this point I was really freaking out. The next thing I hear is my cell phone ringing as a colleague calls me to check in on me. I told him what's happening when I came out the office to take a peek and of course those guys were right up to the window knocking to grab my attention and they saw me with two phones to my ears. They saw me. I said to my colleague on the phone. Then I came up with an idea. I put the phone I had making a call to the police down and kept my colleague on the phone. I said, listen, I'm going to see what they want. Stay on the phone. I'm going to put you on speaker. Stay quiet. Don't say a word. Just listen. If you hear me say the till is slow you hang up and call the police that's me telling you i'm in danger so i put him on speaker and hide my phone on my bra i head to the window what's up guys can i help you guy why is the door locked that's because we're in night mode right now doors are locked but i can surf through the hatch what can i get you they just look at each other and whisper amongst themselves guy we'll just take some smokes and a lighter sure one moment i grab what they ask and they push a 20 dollar note through i grab the 20 dollars and of course check it then i rang them up but as i had their change ready I saw one hand through the hatch. I dropped their change into that hand avoiding contact. Okay thanks. I stared them down and they left. I demanded that my shifts are to be changed to morning shifts after that night or I'm quitting. Back when I was around 17 or 18, I would go out to parties with my friend at night. It was my best friend at the time, Ivan, and his cousin Caesar that would invite me out that night. I had been talking to a friend of Ivan on Facebook about meeting each other. This girl had a birthday party that day and invited us all to join her. So I took a bath, got ready, and my friends pulled up for me in a small car. I said bye to my mom and got in, and we went to buy beer for the night and a pack of smokes for everyone. Back then, I would smoke a lot. My friend told us that he had been in contact with this girl Facebook and that she accepted to come to the party with him tonight. We were all impressed and happy for him. We pulled to her house and parked near a park to wait for her. I remember a group of people walking around the park but since they seemed our age we weren't too bummed out. My friend called her to come out and my friend Caesar stepped out for a smoke. I was sitting in the back not wanting to come out because of these guys outside. They seemed to be asking for trouble because they begun to argue about something really dumb with him. So my friend Ivan told me to step out just to have his back in case anything went down. We went to the party and had a great time. I hit it off with the girl I was talking to and later found out she kissed pretty much every dude that was there before me. Nevertheless, I was still grateful for the opportunity and said goodbye. As we headed back to my house with my friend's date, she seemed very quiet. I knew they hit it off during the party but now looked stiff and even scared. My bud and I were riding in the back to let them have the front to themselves but she was just nervously looking at her phone. When we arrived, she wanted to get out and my friend trying to score points said, wait, I'll walk you in. 
She did not like this and said just go. We were a bit buzzed in the back and wanted to have a smoke so we all stepped outside and watched them go to her door. I remember laughing about something with my friend when the mood suddenly became so dark. She started screaming go now, get out of here. A car pulled out nearly in front of us and people with bats and blunt instruments got off so fast I barely remember how I got back into the back seat. The girl said something along the lines of leave them alone and held him while a bunch of dudes got out. My friend Ivan got into the driving seat and started the car. Thankfully, it started right up without trouble, but a big bottle of liquor then hit the windshield, cracking the top corner. I saw some guys come from the right side of the car where we were standing and quickly went to the other side to let my friend have easy way in into the back right seat. As I turned the corner, I saw this massive looking guy come up to me and barely had time to close the door and pull the lock down. Dude was punching my window. My other friend wasn't so lucky since he actually got hit in the head and had barely made it in the car. He couldn't even close the door because one guy was grabbing his leg. All of this happened in the span of 6 seconds. I acted all out of instinct and thankfully we got in and my friend stepped in the gas while zigzagging in case they would shoot at us. We were all scared and wondered what had happened. As we got back to our neighborhood, my friends were fuming. Both of them knew their way around the fight and could hold their own. Thankfully, I still had some cash left and told them we should go buy some illegal beer at midnight and tried my best to calm them down and convince them to not go back. My friend Caesar had actually woken a dude up in the middle of the night with a phone call and the man was ready to show up and throw down. After a few beers and a lot of talking, I convinced them it wasn't worth it and to just let the night end. I got home and my parents never found out and I just fell asleep. The next few days, my friend Ivan called me and told me that the girl's ex-boyfriend was actually a lead gang member. My heart dropped out of my chest. We had been seconds away from getting beat down and maybe killed by a bunch of people for a date. If it wasn't for our quick reaction and her backing them up a bit, we may have not made it. All I can say is trust your gut and your instincts in the end. It can all happen so fast. Many years ago, before kids, rescue animals, a mortgage, and a husband, I was a travel writer in Europe. I did most of my trips alone. This story is about the first time I visited Prague. I had never been to Prague and the trip was last minute so I had little time to prepare. My travel partner had dumped me in another country and I was determined to make the best out of my trip by visiting a place I'd never been. Upon arrival at the train station, I visited the accommodation office and asked for a hostel not far from the center. In my early 20s, winging it was part of the fun. These days, I'm far less adventurous. The hostel they sent me to was a sprawling, crumbling, slate gray, art decoration building on a nondescript street about a 10 minute walk to Stair Mesto. The inside was probably beautiful at one time, but by the time I checked in, it was full of shabby, mismatched furniture and cheap stained carpet. Most of the light fixtures were broken, leaving everything but the lobby dark and gloomy. It smelled of standing water and dust. I found my room, a double for $12 per night, and made note of the fact that I had a roommate. She wasn't there there, but on her side of the room there was a suitcase, dressed neatly folded across the back of a plastic chair, a scattering of makeup containers on the beat up desk, and a stack of German fashion magazines on the bed. As I had no plans or goals on this impromptu trip, so I spent the afternoon exploring Old Town Square, the Jewish Quarter, and Wenceslas Square. I purchased some Sheck crystal for my mom and painted eggs from a street vendor for myself. I also made reservations for a sunset dinner cruise for one. At around 6pm, I returned to my room to shower, change clothes, and unload my purchases. When I left my room about an hour later, there was no indication that my roommate had returned at any point during the day. After the cruise, I stopped at a tiny bar in Tinska and had a glass of wine. It was nearly midnight when I returned to my hostel, so I was surprised to find that my roommate still hadn't returned. That wasn't uncommon though. Backpackers are a fickle lot. She could have gone on a short overnight trip and just left her stuff behind, hooked up with someone and was holed up at their place, or hanging out at another hostel, so I was surprised but not concerned. I took another shower before bed, however, and was surprised to find that things in the room had changed up in my return. Her bed was deeply turned down, the magazines had moved to the nightstand, and the dress was gone. The strangest thing, though, was the addition of a pink silky nightgown spread across the bed, my bed. Maybe she thought she still had the room to herself. I didn't see how, my shopping bags, clothes, and toiletries were in plain view. I gently moved the nightgown over to her bed and then settled in for the night as I wrote in my journal. I assumed she was 
was in the shower or somewhere nearby, so I expected her to return shortly. After about an hour though, her side was still empty. I needed to use the restroom before I went to sleep, so I made one last trip down the hall. The building was unusually quiet. There weren't the regular sounds of chatty backpackers, the clinking of glasses, or music that would normally leak through the walls. There was nothing. It was hushed like a church after the congregation has left. I found myself practically tiptoeing back. My room was near the end of the hall and I couldn't shake the feeling that the corridor was darker than before. The few working lights were blinking as they struggled to stay lit and it reminded me of a funhouse. A tightness began to fill my stomach and I subconsciously quickened my steps. There wasn't a soul behind me yet, I kept glancing back over shoulder, convinced I'd see someone gaining momentum on me. The only sound was the soft thud of my flip-flops as they struck my soles. I was flooded with relief as I flung open my door, but it didn't last long. Everything was exactly as it left it, except for the silky nightgown which was now back on my bed. Sleep came in fits and starts. I left the lamp on for a while, still convinced my roommate would be right back, but the shadows it cast made the room even spookier. It was too dark with the light off. I'd finally slipped into a deep sleep when I suddenly heard the door open. A man stood in the darkened doorway, the hall light behind him showing just enough for me to see his contorted face. I didn't mean to, he sobbed. You have to help me. Too confused and disoriented to be scared, I sat up, scrubbed up my eyes, and reached for the lamp switch. But once the room was light, I saw that the door was closed. There was no man. I quickly bounded off the bed and went for the door. It was locked. Nobody could have entered without a key, and the hallway empty. I passed the rest of the night fully clothed, sitting up in my bed, and with the light on. Though I'd pay for two more nights, at 7am, I gathered all of my stuff and went down to the reception desk to check out. By the way, I said to the 20-something receptionist, my roommate never returned. I'm a little concerned. She picked up the room key, looked at it hard, frowned, and then glanced at her computer. What room were you in again? When I repeated it to her, she looked back at her screen. Ma'am, that room's been empty for three weeks and it's been cleaned since. We only have six people in the whole building. The hostel has since been renovated and is now a luxury hotel. At the time of the story, it's mid-October, I'm 20 years old and a senior in college. I got out of class at 9pm and headed downtown in my college town to see about an open mic thing that was supposed to be happening at a lounge. And around that time, there was a guy who would play accordion on one of the corners of the main through of air. Didn't find accordion guy, and either the place was closed or it wasn't an open mic night. Don't quite remember. But as I'm walking back down one of the main streets in downtown that heads back onto campus, I came across this very drunk woman begging two other women for a ride home. I think the girls were getting into an Uber or they didn't have space or something. Point is, the other women weren't taking her and couldn't slash wouldn't help her. Mind you, this is a Thursday at 9-ish at night. When she finds that the other women can't help her and I'm walking past, she turns to me to ask for my help getting home. For context, I still have my backpack on. My phone's running low, but I've been at this school and in this town for three years at this point, so I know downtown and campus pretty well on foot. To note, I do not have a car at this point in time. She gives me an address and it's maybe 15 to 20 minutes walk north slightly northeast of where we were at, and I knew the general area where it was, so I was more than happy to be a good Samaritan and walk a drunk woman home who didn't feel safe. I would regret this later. She's incredibly thankful and overjoyed that someone is willing to help her get home. The route we were going to take was super straightforward and I knew exactly where I was in relation to the rest of the town. She says that she has to pee really badly. I reassure her it won't be that long and she'll be back at her place. She says that she was out with her boyfriend and he left her at the bar alone drunk and mad at her about about something. Says she's from out of state. I commiserate with her that what he did was bad. She asked me about what I'm studying. I confided that I was finishing a bachelor's of science in information technology. She's bemoaning this boyfriend that's at home that I'm walking her back to. She keeps trying to walk with me up against my side or slightly behind me and I'm like no walk slightly ahead of me or keep some space. She has a dermal piercing on her cheekbone that's hard to miss. She's getting more and more manic and weird as we walk along. We get about a half a mile into north downtown less than a mile from the address she gave me, and the boyfriend's calling her and being a real douche. I'm about done with this guy from the stuff she's telling me about this and that and the other thing, so she puts him on speakerphone and I tell him to chill out. We're on such and such road close by. His tone changes in an instant. He goes from hostile and angry to surprisingly chill. That threw up a million more red flags for me. She starts saying that I'm going to have a good time at her house. I'm looking for an exit. Every bone in my body is screaming at me to get out of the situation. We get to the end of the road, which coincides 
coincides with an intersection that has a gas station. I say, hey, let's stop here to use the bathroom. She says that she doesn't have to use the bathroom anymore. I'm scared. I tell her, well, maybe you don't have to, but I do, which was true. We go into the gas station. I head immediately to the bathroom and text one of my friends asking if she was working and if she could pick me up or if I needed to call the campus safe ride home program. Friend says it'll be a minute if I'm willing to wait. I agree to wait. I come out of the bathroom and this drunk woman, if she was even actually drunk to begin with, has vanished. Nowhere in the store, nowhere outside that I care to look. I buy a soda and wait for my friend and her friends to come save me, effectively. I'm later told that maybe the woman was affiliated with human trafficking, and to be honest, with the vibes and the changes in tone and the narrative that was being spun around me walking this woman home, and how she just completely vanished on me when I got to a safe place with lights and cameras and such, I have to wonder if that wasn't the plan. I won't ever know for certain, but it certainly scared the ever-loving daylights out of me as a 20-year-old. My friend and her friends pull up and take me back to one of their dorms, and I spend more of the evening with them so I wasn't alone. Forever thankful for three underclassmen for rescuing me from a gas station at 10 p.m. Last year I was on vacation in southern Europe with a large group of friends. We have been there for a while and always took an Uber from our rented house to the city which had very nice bars and clubs. The thing with Uber is, it allows very cheap and flexible transport but it also opened the door to a lot of creeps. I've had Uber drivers who are super cool but also extremely drugged up road ragers who drive like maniacs and think they're impressive but the guy we had that day was by far the worst. It is late evening and Uber picks us up and drives me. 27 year old male, another one, 25 year old female and 24 year old female to the desired old town where we plan to go clubbing and drink. While driving, the driver constantly looks at the two women in the back seat via the mirror. They only told me this afterwards. He kept starting conversations but basically only addressed the girls who left answering to the guys who gave short non-detailed answers, basically signaling that we, one, don't want to talk and two, don't think he needs to know our plans. To us, he seemed way too pushy and he wasn't really that big on hygiene. Meanwhile, we can't wait to arrive at our destination and get out of this uncomfortable but not super horrible situation. But that stuff did not feel this great when this guy didn't stop on the road but instead pulled into a parking spot. He started fumbling with his phone and we were like, alright, weird, but let's get out and left the car. To our surprise, the guy then turned the car off and got out as well. We saw that red flag and just started walking away towards the bar area of the town without saying a word. Cars can't enter the old town. After 400 feet, once we reached the gates, we stopped because this was the meeting spot for the other half of our group, who took a separate Uber, and found out that this guy was following us and stopped as well. You know the classic circle people form while talking, where one guy is just kind of standing next to it because people don't let him in? Yeah, we did that. We started making conversation about how long the others will take to get here, where they are right now, etc. And this guy keeps throwing in comments like he is a part of the group. Oh cool, even more people. This must be a great evening. Then we texted our friends at a group chat that we are changing their meeting place to this bar because the Uber driver is following us around and we want to lose him. So one of us started leading the group at a quick pace through the streets. They are very small, lots of people, high old town buildings all around them. We make turns at every corner trying to lose the guy but he follows. Finally, we reached a big plaza where there were hundreds of people closely together, basically queuing to enter the narrow street up ahead. We pushed through like rude douchebags and successfully lost lost the guy. Finally, we could head straight to the bar after our detour and linked up with the other part of our group. Two hours pass, life is all good. We decide to head to another bar a bit further away because the drinks and prices kind of sucked in this one. We had two drinks in that bar and guess who walks through the door and stands next to the table? That guy. Hey guys, he says. At this point, a friend, 28 year old male, who is good at communicating and frankly quite big, tells the guy that we want to keep to ourselves and have no interest in hanging out with him. Please leave us alone. Fortunately, Unfortunately, the guy says it is no problem and leaves. Unfortunately, at around 3am, while dancing in the crowd at a club, the same guy announced his presence by tenderly pressing his body against the back of one of the girls who he has been staring at through the mirror in the car. The girl's boyfriend recognizes the guy, gets angry, grabs him by the collar, and essentially tells him that if he keeps following us, he will get beaten up. A bouncer sees this and approaches them. I start talking to the bouncer, who is super annoyed by anyone intervening at first, but after hearing how this guy stalked us from this car to this club, he just asks the Uber guy a few questions, then proceeds to throw him out. We stayed a bit longer than we wanted, in hopes of him not waiting for us. After that, we reported the guy for being a creep in the app and called another Uber, which thankfully wasn't him. Alright, but that's it. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my channel, like this video, and comment something down below. But as always, have a nice day.